Good morning and welcome to the 80th Goodwood members meeting here from the glorious Goodwood Motor Spurkit at West Sussex. I mean, it's a glorious day as well. Rachel Stringer alongside me as always is David Green and it's so much better than it was yesterday. If you were here setting up, it was terrible. It was raining cats and dogs and we were really hoping it wasn't going to be the same today and we're lucky. The, the weatherman is on our side, David, today for what is going to be a beautiful weekend here. Yeah, the sun's come out just on cue. We can dispense with the wellies and get on with what will be a very special weekend. The members meeting is a season opener for the really good year, the 75th year of motorsport at Goodwood, ahead of Festival of Speed in the summer and Revival in the autumn. But this weekend is all about pure racing, and we're recreating those BARC meetings from the 50s and 60s. Welcome to Goodwood. Welcome to the 80th members meeting here at Goodwood. Well, there we go then. Members meeting is up this weekend. You'll know that because you're all in attendance, I'm sure. And if you're not, well, enjoy it from wherever you are watching. And then we have Good Woof on the 20th to 21st of May. That is the ultimate doggy day out. I'm really looking forward to watching that this year. And then Festival of Speed on the 13th to the 16th of July. That is the world's greatest celebration of motorsport and car culture. I'm a big fan of that one. And then rounding out the season on the 8th, the 10th of September this year, we have Goodwood Revival, recreating the glamour of racing as it used to be. A stack calendar, as always, David. I mean, Goodwood really know how to put on events, don't they? Absolutely, and it's really hard to pick a favourite throughout this year. I mean, for me, it almost has to be the Festival of Speed. It's going to be a great year this year. As always, there's almost too much to mention. We've got Electric Avenue, Future Lab, Supercar Paddock, and of course, the Hill Climb. I mean, the McMurtry Sperling last year setting the new record. It's going to be a really hard one to beat this year. Yeah, Max Chilton, he obviously set that record as well in that McMurtry. He's actually out again on track this year. Probably not in as a faster car, but let's see how he gets on a little bit later. And we mentioned Festival of Speed. It is such a special meeting. I actually was very lucky uh, last year to get the chance to go up in a sidecar with a legend, that is Maria Costello. And that was a moment that I will never forget. It was a bit of one of those moments. She did a little DM to me on Twitter and said, Rachel, have you got any leathers? I said, no. She said, well, I'm sure you're my size. Would you like to come up the hill? I said, absolutely. It's probably a, a once in a lifetime moment there. So Festival of Speed is very special. And then we mentioned Revival as well. It rounds out the calendar on the Goodwood Motor Circuit. In the autumn, again, such a special meeting, a chance to really relive the glory years of motorsport and everybody get stressed up as well don't they in the style of whatever they want to 50s to the 70s it's a pretty special occasion and, and this year as well we're doing a big nod aren't we to carol shelby it's his would would have been his centenary year so it'll be a lot to, to talk about him and if you guys don't really know his motorsporting career well you will remember him from ford versus ferrari which has graced the big screen recently and david you have a little story as well about him well, yeah, I was involved with his 85th birthday, actually, when he was still alive. And, of course, it's not only a hugely successful racer, racing the likes of Sterling Moss here at the circuit, but modifying those cars, the, the Shelby Culver, Shelby Mustang, and, uh, you know, fantastic guy. Well, I have been told we have some action about to start for you on track, and it's a big global reveal for Gordon Murray's T33 Spider. So, without further ado, I'm going to link to Gordon Murray himself. He's with the Duke of Richmond and Gordon and Dario Franchitti. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Goodwood, the 80th members meeting and the Gordon Murray Automotive stand. And Goodwood is a very special place for all of us and our company. 
T33 was launched here last year. Two years ago, we had the dynamic debut of T50, and I was fortunate enough to get to drive it around there. If you look behind us, there's 10 cars tracking the journey of development of T50, starting off in the corner with George, our Ultima engine mule. Trust me, he goes a lot better and sounds a lot better than he looks. But definitely gets better as you go along the line here. Stopping at PS4, our final pre-series car that was finished recently before production turned to customer cars recently at our Dunsfold facility. Now on the stand here, we have T1. This was Gordon's first car. He designed it, he built it, he raced it, and he won in it. Now this little car has got a lot to answer for. Over here, we have the Duckham's LM. Gordon was paid 250 quid and a scientific calculator by Alan Decadeny to, to design this for the 72 Le Mans 24 hours. I was fortunate enough to race this car last year at Laguna Seca, and I can tell you, it is an absolute rocket ship. But the main reason we're here today is T33 Spider under here. And who better to help us launch it than His Grace, the Duke of Richmond, and Professor Gordon Murray. Come on up, guys. You can clap, yeah. So Charles, tell us a bit about this, this relationship that we have, that Gordon, Gordon has, that Gordon Murray Automotive has with, with Goodwood. Dario, yes, well, it's been, a, it's, it's been 30 years now, a bit more than that, actually. I guess it all started with Gordon and the F1. We all fell in love with the car. We, of course, wanted one until we saw the price tag. You know, that was a bit of a shock. Uh, and um, anyway, we all tried hard, but then the Festival Speed started in 93, and, of course, we wanted more than anything to have an F1 there. And um, Gordon came, which was fantastic, and he brought, the, he brought the F1, but he also came in a rocket, the little car he designed, a silver rocket, which we found parked in front of the stables, which caused a lot of, a lot of anguish for everybody. We tried to get it moved. We couldn't find out who owned it. Eventually, we discovered who owned it, and we tried to get it moved, and it was George Harrison. <laughs> so George remained, or the car remained parked where it was, and George then drove down to the start line and did a famous run up the Goodwood Hill that year, and indeed came many times. So the relationship with Gordon has been a, a long and very happy and memorable one, and we're obviously thrilled to have these fabulous cars here and to have been part of this fabulous um, kind of rediscovery of all these, uh, this wonderful technology and Gordon's fabulous talent. Well, thank you. And Gordon, before we unveil this car, tell us a little bit about it. Tell us about your inspirations and, and just the, the, the tech spec of it and your thoughts on it. Well, as, as you know, T50, our first car, is our sort of spaceship, if you like, the central driving position and the really forward cabin proportions. But the 33 has been a car in the back of my head since I did the McLaren F1. It's very difficult to do classic proportions with a central driving position because the cabin is so far forward. So when we did 33, I poured my heart and soul into it, and it has uh, elements of all my favorite 60s sports racing cars and cars. So right from the beginning, we knew we would do some sort of open top version, uh, the Spider. And what we tried to do here was make it significantly different from the coupe, but actually retain that 60s feel. And I hope you're going to agree that we've achieved that. It's, it's something that the team did a fantastic job on at GMA, and uh, it's something we're very proud of. And of course, once again, being here at Goodwood, you know, we're proud to be a British company, the perfect place to launch a new car. Shall we see it? I think we, yeah, you wanna see it? Okay. Now, Charles, I've spent a lot of time with this car. It's been in Gordon's head for a long time, so we know it quite well. What do you think? Well, it looks absolutely gorgeous, doesn't it? I mean, the moment you see a car, you know whether you... You kind of want it or not, and that looks uh, sensational to me. And as Gordon says, this, you know, the spider make it look like something very, you know, the same, the same language but very different, kind of special in its own right, its own person, and it looks wonderful. Congratulations, Gordon. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Gordon, where's your first road trip going to be? Oh, I think it would have to be um, up in the West Highlands of Scotland. 
<laughs> Those roads up there are really fantastic, and of course, um, we have a house up there, and we're, we're up there a lot. So I could just imagine this whizzing around those roads. Getting that induction noise from the airbox there. Well, thank you so much, guys, for helping to, to unveil this wonderful car. And um, in case any of you are wondering, my, uh, my road trip would also be in Scotland, if you're going to lend me the keys at some point. But um, now, talking about driving, I'm not just wearing this to remind people that I used to be a racing driver. I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go drive T50. Gareth Hurl and I, the chief test driver of, of Gordon Murray Automotive, are going to take uh, T50 for some laps of the circuit. So if you're at the track, get to the track side. If you're watching the live stream, we'll see you in a minute. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Well, that was a very special moment, wasn't it? For all of us here at Goodwood and for those of you watching at home, that has been eagerly anticipated, hasn't it? The T33, um, especially after his T50, which David, I know you know a lot about, but tell us about how anticipated the T33 has been from Gordon Murray. Well, Gordon Murray Design, obviously, he created the famous McLaren F1. And at Revival, we saw that amazing T50. That's the halo car, really. And this is the, what, shall we call it the detuned T33, the slightly cheaper version. And this was a global debut, great way to start the weekend. And at its beating heart is that Cosworth V12. It's been detuned, but it still revs to 11,100 RPM. Absolutely glorious. Probably one of the best V12s ever created in this car. And now, of course, with the T33 Spider, which this reveal was all about, it's the first convertible in the GMA Gordon Murray automotive lineup. And of course, what better way to hear that engine than with the roof down? Yeah, exactly. We'll get a chance to hear and see that a little bit later. And of course, he has the classic manual gear stick as well. It's all <laughs> about that for Gordon Murray. I mean, it's all about light, compact, you know, and purist. And as he said, this is a sort of homage back to his favorite cars, those 60s classic sports cars and that classic design proportions. Well, a hundred, of course, of those being made, and Gordon Murray himself said he'll take a trip up to the Scottish Highlands to give that its debut for him. That'll be a moment, won't it, to see that in action. We get to see that in action in a short while as well, which will be pretty special. But apart from that, we have loads more to bring you as well this weekend. David, what are you really looking forward to, and what should everyone at home have their eyes on? Well, you've got to look out for the Gordon Spice Trophy. It's the renamed Jerry Marshall, so it's those fantastic Group 1 touring cars from the 70s. We'll have two heats today of 30 cars each before the big final tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, I can't wait to see the Halewood Trophy, of course, as well. But there's lots of practices here on day one, starting with the bikes, like I just mentioned, at 10 a.m. in the Halewood Trophy. And the Gurney Cup is at 10.25. That's the 1960 to 66 sports prototypes. Expect to see the likes of of uh, Dario Franchitti in that one, Steve Parrish and Jason Plato. And then at 11.05, we have the SF Edge Trophy, Edwardian racing cars from the 20th century. Expect, I'm going to say, David, flames from those cars. Flames, <laughs> just incredible pre-war cars. And these guys are just brave. They feel like they're sitting on top of the cars. We have the Blitz and Benz, and of course, the Beast of Turin, the 28-litre Fiat. Uh, fantastic car. And they'll be laying flames all down the track. Yeah, Duncan Pitaway will be out, of course, with that one. Then this afternoon, we have the Gordon Spice Heats. They'll be coming up at 11.45 to 12.10. Then we have the demo, don't we? The 911 celebrating 75 years of Porsche and 60 years of the 911. Then race one. The first race of this weekend will be at 2.20, and that is the Halewood Trophy. Uh, then a little bit later on this afternoon at 4.40, we get to see the Tony Gaze Trophy, that's aptly named after the man himself who suggested that this motorsport circuit should be here on which was an airfield back in the day. And then later on at 5.50, we have the Gordon Spice Trophy Group 1 saloon cars that race between the 1970s and 82. Expect a lot of names in that one. And uh, a man who has the course record around here, Nick Padmore, 
he'll be in action as well. So loads going on this afternoon, well into the evening as well. We come off air at about 10 to 8 later. So a action-packed full day for you to really enjoy. And uh, the sun has now come out. The cars are revving behind us. What is not to love, David Green? <laughs> well, it's glorious. Just on cue, the sunshine. If you'd been here yesterday, there was rain, torrential rain. The car parks were full. Cars were stuck. But... It's like the weather gods have been listening to us and uh, we've got the sunshine. Let's hope it stays that way. And it's not just us as well, is it, that are here this weekend. We have our main man on the ground, as always, Ed Foster. And uh, if people came to Revival last year, they'll remember him for a very special reason, won't they, David? Well, I don't think anybody celebrated a win so much. And it was a fantastic win in the Lavent Cup for good old Ed. And uh, I think he's still basking in the glory. He is. We can go down to him right now and see how he's still remembering that moment on track here and how much he's looking forward to today. Well, I think there'll be slightly less celebrating from me this weekend because I'm keeping my feet firmly on the ground here in the assembly area. And this, for me, is where all the action is. All the bikes are here ready for the Halewood Trophy. And this is where all the racers come before they go out on track. So I'm going to be speaking to as many of them as possible, trying to get their last thoughts, what they're thinking about, what's going to happen in the race. And I love this place because everyone is so excited. So hopefully I can bring some of that to the screens this weekend. Everyone does love it, and Ed Foster is just behind us in the assembly area. He'll be grabbing all the drivers before they go out on the circuit. And let me tell you, that's a pretty tricky job. When they have their helmets ready on, ready to go, the visor's down, Ed's the man who has to go and shove the microphone in their face and try and get a word before they go out. Not a really easy job, is it? No, but it's, uh, you know, I think it's a harder job than what he did last year. I think he's done a, a Rosberg, I think one win, and he's out now. So he's back to... Um, interviewing duties but he's got the loudest place at the members meeting some of those engines down there but uh, he'll do his best i'm sure and next out on track in a short moment we do have that track parade from gordon murray in particular there's quite a few of his cars that are going to go out what are you going to keep your eye on i'm not looking for anything i'm listening <laughs> okay. i think if you saw dario last day when he was out with the v10 f1 cars his car almost sounded just as good with that cars with engine so i'm just going to be closing my eyes and listening to that engine yeah, exactly. That is what we like to do, especially when the V12s come out. We got to hear them quite a lot last year. Um, so, guys, this is a, about to happen out on track. It is the track parade for Gordon Murray, of course. We'll just let you listen to what's going on behind us and what you're about to hear on circuit. Enjoy this one. Is that, is that page okay? So, yeah, yeah. So yep. this is the one. So this is the issue we've had recently with the, the voltage dropping. Okay. So that's start of a day. Just heading out for a few laps in T50. This is PS1, the last of the pre-series cars. I've spent a good bit of time in this car recently. We'll just take the first lap nice and easy.
that's fifth gear now. We're just sitting about four and a half thousand revs. So it's a, it's been really a two-year development cycle in 50, and um, cars all over the world doing all kinds of jobs, from driving on the ice to driving in the desert in hot weather, engine development, gearbox development, crash testing. <laughs> now that bit really is not fun at all. When you watch the beautiful works of art just getting crashed, but it, uh, it passed with flying colors. Just warming up the tires a bit. A couple of little damp patches on the exit of Lavin. Uh, she's in fine voice this morning. Yeah, the development process is so much more difficult than making a racing car. A racing car, you just go, is it fast? Is it reliable? A road car, there's so many more parts to it. And the, something I've learned recently with my involvement with Gordon Murray Automotive and just the work that goes into making a car like this. And when you push the boundaries like Gordon has with weight and performance. So we'll go a little quicker this lap. traction control just intervening a little bit into the first corner here, fourth gear. It's definitely got more grip than the historic cars I drive. She's sounding good through the kink at Fordwater. Got the fan on. We're in high downforce mode at the moment, just trying to get a little more grip out of it. Into no name. Such a special corner, such a difficult corner. To the left at St Mary's, we're on the curb just a little bit. I've got chief test driver from Gordon Murray Automotive, Gareth Hill, right behind me. He knows really better than I think anybody. Him, Steve Hayes, our other test driver, done thousands of miles in this car. to Madwick. The brakes are definitely better as well. It's so interesting to drive a modern car with this level of performance round here compared to the older cars. Now, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let you just listen to the voice of this Cosworth GME V12 for a lap. as much fun as I did. Enjoy your day here at Goodwood. Well, thank you to Dario Franchitti for showing us off the uh, the Gordon Murray Velt 
T50. Absolutely stunning car and wonderful to hear. It's Ben Edwards joining you right now and welcoming everybody to the 80th members meeting here at Goodwood. Wonderful to have you all with us, whether you're live at the circuit or whether you're watching us live or on screen at the moment. It's great to have you with us. And Alice Powell joins me in the commentary box. We've got quite a, a commentary team uh, this weekend. And Alice, W Series racer and commentator on Formula One and other formulas, uh, we're really looking forward to what is going to be a fascinating weekend, Alice. Yeah, believe it or not, it's my first ever members meeting as well. So I'm super excited and to, to see all the different types of cars and bikes, of course, that we're going to be seeing over the next couple of days. But I'm glad that the weather has uh, cheered up for everybody. Uh, as uh, David and Rachel touched on, yesterday was pretty awful. We're definitely going to be battling out of the, the car parks. But I think with what we've got on track today, it's going to be worth it. Definitely. And it's interesting actually watching Dario heading around the, the lap just then, uh, mostly dry around most of the circuit. So we could actually see that. A few little damp patches, no doubt, uh, needing to be careful. We're just going to show you some of the highlights from that uh, time where Dario took the car out and gave us a, a little display of what it's like to drive in one of Gordon Murray's cars. We're going to be seeing another Gordon Murray car over the course of the weekend and uh, the Brabham BT52 Formula One car from 1983. We're going to see two of them here. And I gather it's the first time since uh, those early 1980s when they won the championship that the two cars will be on track at the same time. Uh, so that's really going to be fun to see. Uh, there were cars designed by Gordon Murray, Formula One racing cars. And we're going to see Ricardo Petrezzi uh, in one of them and David Brabham in another. So Gordon Murray's uh, heritage of Formula One and then getting into supercars, it's very much a part of the love of of motorsport and of cars in general and i know that's why so many people are here this weekend to just soak up the atmosphere soak up the the love of cars and to enjoy the racing and the bikes and we're going to get the bikes out pretty soon um, i'm very happy to say that james hayden's going to be joining me shortly we're going to be talking through that uh, first practice session of the weekend which is for the halewood trophy but alice there's such a mix of machinery that we've got to get our heads around and just enjoy and the sound as well i mean you were talking about the sound of that v12 a moment ago we're going to have the sound of some cars from the early 1900s coming out on track as well yeah and it's something you don't hear these days do you really in, in modern racing so yeah, that sound of that v12 as it drove past us here i said oh, those were the days those were the days but uh, no fantastic we've also got an array of drivers as well we've got i'm sh can't wait to see quite a, the touring car current touring car drivers british touring car drivers out on track you know, there'll be no love lost between some of them, so they're battles. I'm sure they'll take their battles out onto circuit as well. We see the marshals doing a, a fantastic job of uh, cleaning the circuit. Fantastic, and big shout out to all the marshals who are braving it out there this weekend. Oh, now, this is an interesting little aspect that's just coming out now. So these are a couple of the cars that will actually be going out in the SF Edge race a little bit later on. So these are the old cars that I was talking about, the Edwardian vintage cars. But what's going on here now? We've got a youngster there, Archie, in the uh, going out at Goodwood. He'll be racing for the first time in a, a motor car because he has raced here before in the Setrington Cup and won it. That is the pedal race that the kids do down the start finish straight at the Goodwood Revival meeting. It began in 2012 and he is one of the winners of that pedal race and now he's going to be the first driver to have won the pedal race and then go into the car side of things. So this is great fun. He's part of a family that are very much into these vintage cars. And so he's going to be driving this uh, Mercedes from the early 1900s, which is lovely to see. And we'll see him out in practice in a little while. His father is also uh, driving one of the cars as well. He, I spoke to him yesterday, actually, and he drove down in one of the cars from Wales yesterday. Did 200 miles, including on the motorway, uh, up to 80 miles an hour down the, down the motorway. Um, and I can imagine he was getting some pretty funny looks around. Uh, Archie he didn't actually um, he didn't actually drive down here. Archie came down by train yesterday, but he's getting a, a bit of experience. He has driven this car a bit before, apparently, Alice. But he doesn't he hasn't actually driven this car on this track. So I think this is probably proving to be a little useful demonstration. Yeah, it certainly is. Good to get a little sight to eye, and it's definitely a lot different to a pedal car, that's for sure. But no, fantastic to see, and I think you touched on 
driving the 200 mile journey. I don't know what's worse or, or, or more scary driving one of these on the road or, or around this incredible racetrack, but we're getting some amazing shots here. I mean, just to think that people even race these cars, you know, especially for me with with all the safety, you know, when I started in, in cars, we had to have hands device, whereas those weren't even heard of back then at all. I love the horseshoe there on the bottom left. I don't know if that's the, for luck or something. Yeah, for luck, no doubt. It's the right way up for luck, so that's lovely to see. And of course, this is a very early machine. This is 1903. This is actually the earliest car that we've got in the SF Edge collection this weekend. Um, it's the Mercedes 60 horsepower, identical to uh, the winning car from the 1903 Gordon Bennett race. Gordon Bennett racing was when motor racing first began was the big, big event. Grand Prix racing came up just after that, a few years later, actually. Um, the Gordon Bennett took place in the very early 1900s, and this was uh, effectively the, the same as the car that raced in 1903. Um, funnily enough, that this car has gone quicker in modern days. At the last members meeting, it got up to over 86 miles an hour, uh, which was faster than the land speed record of 1903. So uh, they seem to be getting better and better um, as the years progress. No great surprise there. Um, and you can see there's a bit of pumping sometimes going on for fuel um, on the other machine. And it's lovely to see a bit of action going out on out there as they head on around. This is Ben Collins, his dad. This is uh, another uh, Mercedes. This is the Blitz and Benz, the 1909 200 horsepower Blitz and Benz with an engine of quite large capacity, one has to say. It's, uh, I believe, 21 litres. Um, it's not the biggest that we've got here today. But you will be seeing, and I expect some of you who've been walking around might have already seen um, what's called the Beast of Turin, the Fiat S76. That has a 28 litre engine. Uh, and it's still only four cylinders. So it's remarkable just how big some of the engines on some of these machines are. Yeah, it, it's incredible to see. It really is. And it, just the amount, and that's what I love about events at Goodwood. You know, there's so many different types of cars you'll, you'll see on track, as well as obviously going to Festival of Speed a, as well. And the history, just, just soaking in the history, uh, and especially seeing cars like this, I just think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and a great way to, to really look back and, and absorb and appreciate motorsport, you know, and, and, and the technology and how far we've come as well. Yeah, it is remarkable. This was such an early period in the development of, of cars. And the reason that this, the, the, the trophy, when we see these out practice and then racing, uh, the trophy is called the SF Edge Trophy. That's named after someone called Selwyn Francis Edge, who was a businessman. Uh, and a racer, a cyclist, a record breaker in all forms. But he was uh, he was one of the first people to become aware of the publicity and promotion created by motorsport. And he got involved very early on. He entered motor racing himself with Napier, and he ended up winning the Gordon Bennett Trophy, this big, big race. He won that in 1902 in the Napier. And then he was part of the inauguration of Brooklyn's racetrack in 1907. So. That is why when we see these cars out later, with the rest of the grid, there will be a, 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 a full grid of cars from this period. Uh, going from 1903, as I say, up to 1917, some of that sort of period. Um, so it is very, very early. 1918, I think, might be the, the sort of, oh no, we've got a 1923 Alfa Romeo. That's right, I think that's the latest uh, car to 100 years old um, that will be in the in the group in the SF Edge trophy as well. Um, but yes, SF Edge, this uh, Selwyn Francis Edge, he really was a, a key person in the origins of motorsport and how you could promote your your brand. He was involved with several brands, but Nap the Napier brand in particular, he was a much a part of, and he realized that motorsport was the way to promote it. And of course, for all of us who love motorsport and have enjoyed watching cars, um, and, and appreciate that, the fact that manufacturers deliver on track to us, Alice, that's, that's always been important. It always makes you excited, doesn't it? It does. It certainly does. And to see, to have two great races of these cars, obviously only a five laps each, but uh, they will certainly be exciting. They're returning after a year's break, of course, so it's not the first time uh, recently that we've seen them racing around the track. But just the fact that, you know, we, we say Formula One drivers these days have got to do a lot behind the wheel. I'd say <laughs> stick them behind one of these. I think they'd, uh, they'd certainly struggle. There seems to be a lot going on. But um, no, uh, it's, it's brilliant. And a, a race, actually, that 
that I'm really excited to see. But I think it's so hard to pick which race uh, yeah. out of uh, the, the day, the two couple of days that, that, that I'm looking forward to the most, to be honest, as it uh, comes to a close now. They've taken the, the checkered flag, but it's great to, to get a taster of what we uh, will be seeing later on. So Archie, the 17-year-old, he's on the left there still. He's got the higher, much higher sitting position, hasn't he? And uh, it's probably just get his head it, down, it's, so just in case he's going into the wind. It's probably just as well it's not raining today. He will be getting a little damp out there, um, but thankfully he's staying dry. His dad's got a little bit more protection. The car that was built for land speed records uh, at its time, so it was perhaps good to have a little less drag with the driver sitting quite so high. But it was all elements they were learning at that time. Most of these, uh, a lot of these cars are chain driven. We can see that uh, from on shot as well. Early cars uh, driven by chains. And we're going to see some more chain driven machines coming up in a little while because we will be seeing the Halewood Trophy bikes. They're all up in the assembly area at the moment, in fact. So we'll be seeing them coming out on track. Uh, and just having a look around the track, it does seem to be in pretty good condition. You want to stay off the grass though today, don't you? Yes, I think you'll probably end up speeding up if you uh, if you went on the grass today. Uh, we were all parked, avoiding the, uh, the the car parks yesterday, and actually parking on the circuit. And yeah, there's some uh, there's some quite deep puddles in the in the grass as well. But obviously, everyone's going to be aiming to to f stay fully off the grass. But I'm amazed how how quickly it's it's dried. The bikes are uh, going to still be tricky for for the Halewood Trophy riders. But uh, fantastic weather that we do have now. Hopefully it stays this way for the rest of the weekend. So we're expecting these to be heading in now, uh, having done this little demo. And it's particularly this opportunity for Archie to, to have a run around Goodwood before he comes out a little bit later on in qualifying this youngster who will be the first to have won the Setrington Cup uh, to go into one of the main races here. And there's his dad, Ben, just bringing his Mercedes uh, Benz, the Blitz and Benz, as it is the 200 horsepower machine and uh, six were were made originally uh, two still survive one owned by mercedes and uh, one in the usa and it's lovely to see it running around here at goodwood it really was uh, in its time quite awe inspiring this machine 21 and a half liters 200 horsepower and uh, setting new land speed records when it was around. So well done to Archie, he's made it round nice and safely. And we'll see more from both of these cars a little bit later on. So we're getting ready for the Halewood Trophy, but we're still talking about drivers who've done things like Le Mans. Let's find out more from Ed Foster in the assembly area. Emmanuel Epiro, we've spoken so many times in this assembly area but this is the first time that you're dressed in leathers about to go out on a motorcycle. How are you feeling? Like a, like a junior, like a beginner. But there's a lot of excitement because I dreamt about doing a bike race my whole life uh, in this location with these riders, with these bikes. I admire them so much, especially the road racers. So this is like a dream come true. I, I have a lot of respect for them. I acknowledge the limit of my ability, so all I want to do is, you know, something good and, uh, and yeah, enjoy it. Now, you have tested this motorcycle. How did that go? Well, but the good for test days because of noise restrictions and sharing with cars are really, really short. So uh, I've done a few laps, which, are, which were really enough because from zero to a little bit is already a big step um, to sort of make me feel on the bike. And then after that, actually, I've done a million laps in my, in my mind to, to rehearse and practice. So this was very useful. Um, yeah, 15 minutes of practice qualifying will help. And then uh, the race we see. All I want to say is I have no ambition of proving anything. And I have a lot of respect for, for the riders. And I also want to thank the Russell family for trusting me and lending me the bike and supporting me and helping me so much. Emanuele, thank you so much and the best of luck. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's lovely that Emanuele Piro is going to be uh, racing this weekend in the Hellwood Trophy and the bikes are all warming up nicely. Uh, the two strokes and the four strokes, this combination of bikes that we will see the, out there shortly and they will be allowed out on track for a relatively short qualifying run, first of all, and we'll have to see how that goes. Let's go back down to the assembly area uh, Ed is with Alex George. 
Alex George, you know the Isle of Man TT course like the back of your hand, though I guess Goodwood's quite a simple procedure now. Oh, no. Goodwood's a bit special. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of old school, as you know. Uh, there's not a lot of room on the outside or the inside. You have to be very accurate, to say the least. But it's, it's a great place to ride. There's lots of plastic opportunities. You have to obviously watch what everyone else is doing as well as yourself. And we've got some sunshine. <laughs> Now, the, the, the circuit is probably still a bit damp. Um, I guess you just got to be out there at the end to post the times at the end of the session. Well, the longer you run, the drier it will become, and the more knowledge you will have on the bike of where the damp spots are and what's a little bit slippy and what's not slippy. So the more laps you do, the more knowledge you have for actually competing of what you're going to be doing next. So you're going to do it quicker or slower, or being more cautious and watching the other guys as well. Well, I like it. I enjoy it. Alex, enjoy it. Thanks very much. Lovely. Well, we've got a few more bikes ready to come out. We've got Duncan Fitchett there. Uh, he's going to be pretty quick on this Harley Davidson. That's going to be one to watch. I'm very glad to say that James Hayden has now joined us. Now, James, you've raced here at Goodwood. You've done the revival uh, on bikes in the past. Uh, you're very experienced on bikes. I know you've been down in the paddock chatting to people. How's it been catching up? Yeah, brilliant. Um, it's lovely to see such an eclectic mix of bikes here. You know, we're looking at the Harley Davidson at the moment. Um, you know, that's a flat track engine. Uh, you know, the same bike sort of one day tone. It hasn't been run for a long while. So Duncan there just was a, a bit nervous, but looking good. And then we got obviously the TZ 350s, uh, beautiful little parallel twin Yamahas. Let's just quickly explain. We've got basically two patterns to what this this race is about, haven't we? Just explain to us how that works. Yeah, so you've got the, the up to 1972 754 straight, four strokes. So they are like road bike engines, but they can be in race chassis, but all before the end of uh, 1972. And then we've got the, uh, the the TZ350s. They go from 72 to, to 81. Um, and you're also just allowed a 250 as well, a TZ250 up to 84, which have got slightly better geometry, slightly better brakes. Um, so real sort of mix, but it's, it's, a, it's kind of like, the, obviously the four strokes of the 750s are going to be a little bit quicker in places, but the uh, TZ350s, 250s, they're a bit more nimble, they're lighter. Uh, so it should be a really interesting little balance. Going to be fascinating. <laughs> you can see that the riders getting quite excited about this. We were just talking about uh, track conditions. Actually, they're not bad, are they? Um, it, well, maybe just one or two little damp areas they have to be careful of when yeah, they go out. You've got to be careful. Also, obviously, no tire warmer, so you just got to be careful of those tires. You know, in, uh, that little nip in the air. Um, but to be honest, actually, the sun's come out, the wind's up, so it's starting to, to dry it all. Oh, it's lovely to see. And there's some beautiful bikes down there. And I'm sure you met up with some uh, some good friends of yours. Uh, Michael Rutter, for example, he's racing uh, number 67, the Hadley Honda. Um, he's somebody you've raced against over the years. Yeah, I mean, we started off in super teens together as little teenagers and, you know, made it all through to the World Championship. And uh, Michael, obviously, a great rider, you know, TT winner, lots of British Superbike wins. You know, he's, he's 50 years old now, but he can still put it about. He was on the podium in the British Championship last weekend in the BMW class, so he's definitely a man to watch. Alan Cathcart here. Oh, now, this is a pretty famous bike, the Ducati 750SS. Yeah, beautiful. He's just, um, sort of the replica of the, the Paul Smart Imola winning bike, um, and that was the last one made, and really, really lovely trick thing. Alan Cathcart, obviously, raced all sorts and, uh, you know, very famous right journalist, writer. He's yeah. you know, really knowledgeable... Uh, uh, yeah, very good journalist. Yeah, no, he's got a, a lovely, rider. lovely bike to go out on. So, so the Halewood Trophy involves the Sheen Trophy. So we've got the two yeah. strokes versus the four strokes, but there, but you actually get a kind of separate win. If you're the the top four stroke, you win the Barry Sheen Trophy. Uh, but there are two two races, and you take a combination, don't you? That's right. And the two strokes are the Halewood, um, and the four strokes are the Sheen Trophy, as you say. So uh, it'll be a really nice little mix to see sort of what they've what they're doing you know i know just looking at last year's times or one obviously there is some damp patches but the 128.3 was the the quickest time from qualifying last year but it's going to be important it's a short session you've got to get out got to try and get those tires working early on force some time into them the brakes pick your line find out where those damp patches are and get your head down because you haven't got long at number 23, keep an eye, going out, about to go out, is Gary Vines. Now, Gary was fantastic. He's on the 250, so That's a right. smaller engine bike. But he was fabulous to watch last year when we were looking at this. Yeah, and funny enough, I was looking at his bike quite closely, from beautifully prepared, really sharp, you know, looked, um, yeah, he's out in front already, he wants to sort of get going. And, yeah, he was really good last year, as you say, and it's a, just a lovely little bike, that. 
And as we say, going back to that, you know, those 250s, because they've just got a few more years development on it, you're allowed, you know, it's kind of balances up with the 350s. And it's going to be a really it's interesting to see how this goes out. You're a, you're a bike man. You've written a lot of two-strokes and yep. four-strokes over the years. Now, two-strokes putting out a little more smoke because, because yeah. just remind us, two-stroke is oil and, yeah. and petrol together yeah. mixed in a pre-mix that, that you put in. So they do smoke a bit till they get going, till they're warmed up. You can see like these ones now not smoking once they've cleared themselves out. Um, so they they work. Yeah, they don't have the torque low down of a, a four-stroke engine. So they don't really come on song till eight and a half, nine thousand and he's up to there to sort of 12 and a half, so you have to keep it in that little band. But they're fantastic things to, to ride, and you can hear that really different, sharp, you know, zingy sound. Yeah, and that sound, as you say, the, the two-stroke sound is a unique sound, and we don't hear it much now no. in, in motorbike racing, do we? So not, not at all. When I started, you know, everything was two-strokes. Yeah. I raced 125s, then I raced 250s, and then it's Grand Prix on the 500s, and all were two-strokes, but uh, yeah, that, has, uh, that has changed now. So there we're looking at the four-stroke again. This is the Ducati 750SS. So this is a, a, a bigger engine. Uh, Alan Cathcart, as you mentioned, very, very experienced rider. So he'll pick it up. He's been here at Goodwood many, many times over the years um, in these different categories. They're heading down the back stretch now. So in a straight line, so which is going to be quicker? Is the four-stroke faster at the end of the straight? Yes, yeah, you know, that big capacity. You can't beat capacity, so we just see Michael Rutter. They have a little glimpse of him, 67 on that yellow 750 Honda, Hadley Honda. So, the yeah, the, the big ball um, four-strokes will be quicker coming towards the end of the street. And there's Michael Russell as well. Oh. You know, both of those guys always at the revival and, you know, top, top flight uh, guys. But there's... It don't, you know, there's not loads and loads in it, um, just because obviously the, you know, there's another 10 years of development for the 350s than there was for the uh, four strokes, which ended at 72 for this class. The, uh, the, the bike you were just talking about the Nor is a Norton Manx Commando, isn't it, that Michael Russell is riding, the number 68. Yeah. Uh, it's like a dark red uh, bike. That's right, it's a 750 Commando engine, but it's been put into a Manx chassis, so like a Manx racing chassis. Number 36 there, just going through, that's uh, Jeffrey Vermeulen. And the Nourish Weslick, that's a slightly unusual one as well. Yeah, I mean, there is so many cool bikes out there, sort of different, you know, specials. And uh, we just have a look, number 13 there, you can see without the ferry, and that's Luke Hedger. You know, he's a double British champion. He's won in 125s, he won in the National Superstock 600s. He's racing in Superstock 1000s in the British Championship this year. So, you know, he's going to be a, a man to watch there. Yeah, definitely. That's going to be one to uh, keep an eye on, even if it even if he hasn't got the slipstreaming uh, process on the bike. So they're all heading around, nice to see. Uh, there's a there's a famous number seven, but it's not a very sheen, of course. That is Duncan Fitchard, who's now, riding number seven. That red motorcycle 66 is uh, Emmanuel Piro. Ah, yes. So, yes. I Keep mean, an eye on that, number 66. There is Emmanuele. Yeah, actually, he, actually, he looks a bit, sitting on that, he doesn't look a bit like a, a car driver rather than a rider. Uh, that, he hasn't quite got that. Natural. I mean, I'm just, a, you know, he's, he's never raced a bike before, so the fact he's out here doing it, you know, the five-time Le Mans winner, and what a beautiful motorcycle that is. This is the exact world. You know, the sister bike won the European Championship, you know, in the, at the time, uh, back in 84, and it really is, you know, it's got this all-in-one tank seat um, bodywork, very slipstreamed, very nice, it's really amazing spine chassis. It's a, it's a really trick piece of kit. Yeah, it is a beautiful bike, as you say, and it's one of the later bikes of the whole list, actually. 1986, this bike, which I think is the, effectively the youngest bike of all of them. And he's that well put all this together. He, he's just struggling a little bit. His foot's falling off a little bit. Yeah, he's just got, it's almost like a, like a gear selection problem, uh, it looks like to me. He's sort of just, he is definitely struggling a bit. He might come in the pits. He's got something that's... He's just getting used to it. It, it. it can be awkward, you know, some of these changes. These little 250, 350s, they are so tucked in. And that's the, at the moment, that's the quickest man yeah. on track. That's Carlson, number 24. You can see there, 132.7. Um, we said sort of, obviously, they're just getting their, their iron at the moment. A little oh, bit of a little oh. something. Just, I think that's just a bit of tape. It's probably, he's just pulled that off the radiator. You run yeah. strips of tape to get them at the right temperature, and then they do a little loop for you. So if it's getting a bit too warm, you can get it from the from the riding position and whip it off, and that's what that there. Gary Vine's just yeah. gone quickest there as well, 131.6. So That doesn't surprise it. me. 
He's always quick. Uh, Andy Hornby, Hornby's up there as well. Now, Andy was actually the fastest of the four strokes here last year. But this is quite a nice little battle going on between these two at the moment, isn't it? Scott Carson and Gary Vines. So 24 is Scott Carson. Gary Vines goes around the outside of him in the 250. Yeah, what, uh, you know, that's, that's lovely to one of the, my favourite parts of the track. You know, these lovely sort of right, left, um, it really is a, it's great. You know, it's... Talk, talk to me about riding a bike around here. Uh, it's an airfield circuit, Goodwood airfield circuit. There are not many areas where you're actually braking hard. It's more about flow. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, you know, the corners flow so much. It's very old school and it's kind of fast and open, which I absolutely love. You know, on the, the uh, Revival, a lot of the stuff is flat out. Just going past uh, Manuelli there. Bureau, so they're just kind of coming through. These two are having a really good little dice. They're first and second at the moment. Uh, almost like two seconds clear of everyone else. So um, you can see, but it's all about, yeah, flow, picking your line, making sure you're running it. And on these as well, very much it's corner speed. So you've got to run them through the turn because they don't have much torque. You've got to keep them in the right part of the power curve. Yeah. And presumably that's where the four strokes have a bit of an advantage is, is coming out of the corner sometimes. They've got a little that's, bit, that's they're right. running lower revs, but they pull. Because they've got torque and you, they go from much, much lower down, whereas these will pretty much not run below 8,000. So you've got to keep them singing. So over the line, and Gary Vines is still the fastest. Uh, notice that Dan Jackson's up to third. Now, he won overall here last year. So he's definitely part of the game again. Andy Hornby's in near the top of the list as well as is Grant Goodings he's shown good pace in the past but these two are still battling away as they set the outright paces so far um, I see that Rob Whitty's just moved up there in his Smith Honda CRS that's one of the four strokes so he's just put in a good lap as well yeah and we saw Dan Cooper's moved up to third as well Dan Cooper uh, you know again a very experienced man for the British Championship and he said it's the first time he's ridden a TZ 350s on a 1980 TZ 350G so he's really a uh, really looking forward to it and he's going well in what already you have the names to look out for Michael Rutter as we spoke to earlier he's up to to seventh um, you know representing the ladies Maria Costello OBE she's in uh, 20 22nd at the moment just looking at uh, Andy Hornby here so this is the uh, the bike that, uh, and Andy won the the four stroke element he was in the battle for the outright win as well um, and how it works is that they do two races over the course of the weekend and the, the trophies are then basically handed out as uh, putting the two races together. So you've got to do well in both races. Yeah, that's the crux of it. It's, um, you know, you've got to finish both. You've got to try and really push on because you know, it's all about time. And he slips up the inside there. Yeah, into the back corner. It's nice and comfy though, doesn't he? Looks nice and smooth. Yeah. So important this to get a good run on the straight, get it stood up, fired out. And you, you can sort of see the extra weight in these four-stroke uh, bikes. You can almost see it as they're sort of pitching them compared to, especially the 250s. They, they change yeah. direction so rapidly, don't they? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just a massive difference in the, in the weight of them. Um, but uh, as we can see, he's doing a, doing a nice job there for me at the moment. So coming around to complete another lap. We've got six and a half minutes still to go in this first qualifying session of the 80th members meeting here at Goodwood. Gary Vines is currently setting the pace, but by just a tenth of a second or so um, over the man he's been battling with, uh, Scott Carson. Uh, Michael Rutter yeah. up there. Oh, Andy Hornby's just gone quicker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, that's where we thought he was on a good lap. There is Michael Rutter, number 67. Behind him is Luke Hedger, so two veterans of the British Championship. Michael Rutter, you know, he's really looking forward to this, this race. Oh, there's a problem there for... Uh, Device. Yeah, that's uh, Gary, isn't it? That's a shame because Gary's second fastest so far. He's got his clutch pulled in, so I wonder whether he's just nipped slightly. Sometimes, you know, the, if you haven't got the mixture quite right, you know, they, they can seize, but just noticing that oh, he's still running, but no, it's not. But he had his clutch pulled in, which was um, which was telling. I think he's in neutral now, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to, to, to get that. They are so lovely to work on these things, very easy. You know, they were great in the era because they were cheap they were competitive yeah. they were easy to work on and pretty it started a thousand careers at tz350 because people all over the world bought them and raced them yeah in the in the 1970s they were sort of around 1500 pounds i believe uh in the in the 1970s which was achievable for a lot of people to actually go racing with that's right in a very simple parallel twin you know knocking out sort of 60 70 brake horsepower but light you know and um, a, a really a really nice sort of thing to to, to, to start careers on. 
So Grant Goodings has just set another new pace, 1 minute 30.8. Uh, we see Michael Russell's done a good lap on the Norton as well. In fact, uh, they're changing all quite quickly now. Aren't they just? Yeah. And Russell's up there as well. Graham Higgler's just done a good job on the uh, Rob North Triumph. So that is a TZ350 that, um, that uh, he, yeah, he's riding there. Oh, Higgler. 29.7, the first man in the 29s, and he's 1.1 seconds clear on that lap. That is a stunning lap yeah. by uh, number 50, Higlett. Yeah. That is on the Rob North Triumph, as you say, the T150. Sometimes it seems to me as though the four strokes, they, they often get a really good lap in, in qualifying uh, because they've been able to build up, build up, get a good lap in. But it doesn't always work for them at the start of the actual race. That's right, because also if you've got a lot of you know, you can get held up. And the way they, they, they both bikes want to be ridden in a slightly different style, the four strokes to the two strokes. And the two strokes have a lot of corner speed, a lot of entry speed, whereas it's more important on the on the four strokes to get the thing up and use that power coming out. So they have a slightly different speed at different points in the turn. And that's what you're, you're finding sort of there. So in the first laps of the race, the TZ's going to be up underneath you, you know, going this way and that. That was a bit, that was almost three abreast. He, uh, he had to get out of that pretty quickly. Well done to Graham Higler, who's who set the pace. He really had to get out of it quick there. Yeah, and there he is. You can see he's just going to go around the outside. It's going to be maybe, no, actually, he's timed it perfect to come through here. So it was a 129.7 for Higler on the last lap. And again, this looks like it'll be quite a nice nice lap for him. Has he been best managed to slip past Hedger? Yes, he does. So again, what did he do on that last he lap? Got a bit held up though. Yeah, he had to he lift. Did, did, yeah. cost him, but this looks like it might be a nice one. Very contemporary style. Knee on the deck, getting tucked in well, and uh, that Rob North Triumph really flying there. 1971 bike. Oh, we got another problem. That's Emanuele. Yeah. So it just it just seems like there might be. You know, we saw him just looking earlier on. He was um, just a little few little problems there with the, the road cycle, possibly. Well, let's hope they can get that sorted out over to the marshals he's well off track so he's in a safe place relatively there so that's good news um with just under gear. three minutes to go yeah it's this gear change again you can see him looking at doing this hand so i think it was a selective problem we saw him struggling earlier back at the front this is higlett again this he's had a quite a nice lap this lap because he's had no traffic in front of him and he's sort of he's, yeah it's a track where you want to kind of build build pinch a bit especially when there's a, a damp patches here and there Michael Rutter's on a good lap as well, so we'll keep an eye on him. But uh, as you say, uh, Higlett still putting together a good lap right now. Graham Higlett, number 50, fastest at the moment. Let's see if he gets a, a completely clear lap in this time. He's got a little bit of traffic up ahead of him into the last section here. That was he just got all, yes, he did. Just managed to pinch up the inside. Have a look, see whether he goes any quicker. 129.7 is the best he's done so far. And... Uh, as he comes over the line this time it's a another 129.7 that's pretty impressive he's 200 slower than he was on his previous best lap so he's in good form isn't he he is in good form it's nice to be able to just tick those off just work on your riding you know you see he's going out there around the outside there that is maria costello in the e just uh, alongside yes it's good to see maria costello she's out on a different bike this year to the one she rode last year she's on an rps triumph tried at 1972 bike yeah, beautiful looking thing as well, really nicely prepared. Yeah, that's the number 89, just up ahead here of the, the man who's fastest. There you are, there's Maria, just up ahead on the uh, Triumph, but she's about to be passed by the rider who is setting the pace so far, Graham Higlett. Now that's Dan Cooper, so Dan Cooper's just gone second on that TZ, you know, he's building up, as I say, he hadn't been one of these before, you know, very fast man, whether it's on short circuit roads, and um, he's really flying on the uh, little number 37 TZ250, again, 1980G, and uh, looking good there. Yeah, so he is uh, certainly right up there at the moment in the in the battle. He is the fastest of the two strokes at this stage, isn't he? So we've got a four-stroke top, two-stroke second at the moment. Yeah. It's all nice and close. And a two-stroke third as well, like goodies. And nice mix. Russell, as you say, he's up to, to fifth now. What have we got as well? Rutter, sixth. Luke Hedger for those who follow the British Championship boys, 14. There are definitely some improvements coming through now, though, aren't there? Um, changes as the track. They're just getting more and more confidence now. Yeah, that's it. It's nice just to put laps in. The sun's come out, so it's a bit of heat. The tyres are really at their best now. They're they only going to get this last lap in with 15 minutes to go in the session. There is Michael Rutter. Rutter currently. Oh, he's just gone second. Yeah. So Michael Rutter, 129.7 as well. Look at that. Just 
three uh, three hundredths of a second between him and pole position. And again, this could be a nice lap as well, although he's got a bit of traffic up ahead. Yeah, this is an interesting one. This is good stuff from uh, Michael Rosser. Lovely to see. He's on the Hadley Honda CB750. Well, he's got the checkered flag out, but uh, anyone who's on a lap right now can still potentially improve on what they've done. So the hicklet rutter battle up front, very, very close, virtually identical lap times. Uh, going all the way down the list and this mix of the classes between oh and we just got a new fastest lap there so that's a good time to put in a quick one for scott carson he's done a 129.5 yeah so that's on a again 1981 yamaha tz350 and that is a, a, a brilliant time just a Thumbs dip ahead up. at the moment <laughs> well done so two strokes gone quickest is there going to be a four stroke putting in a quick one at the end we'll have to wait and see not sure I'm seeing any faster laps kind of come through, but who knows? They're coming over the line now. A few more. Oh, yeah, witty. Uh, oh, look at that. All change rutter. <laughs> so, Michael Rutter on that very last lap, 29.1, and he takes it. Dan Cooper gets in there as well. So, it all changes in those dying moments. You know, the track's at his best right now, but uh, what a great time that is, Michael Rutter. That's the man we're talking about. Um, a really, really nice lap for Michael there on the Hadley Honda CP750, and uh, he'll be well chuffed with that. So we've got a four-stroke that has taken pole, yeah. and a two-stroke that will be alongside, second fastest, and then very, very close, another two-stroke alongside uh, with Scott Carson. Um, and and then, then we go down to the, the number 50 bike of Graham Higlett, and that is a four-stroke. So we've got a lovely mixture. Absolutely. It just shows how well, it, in one way, you look at it on paper, it shouldn't almost work as a class, but it works beautifully together with the different ages and the different capacities. It, it is remarkable that the lap times could be so similar between such, you know, bikes that have a, a 350cc two-stroke engine versus a 750cc four-stroke engine, and they're, yeah, they're doing, yeah. those top riders are doing virtually the same lap time. No, that's great. You know, we've got the, uh, the top six all within 0.9, of a second so that bodes really well for an exciting uh, race this afternoon yeah looking forward to that no doubt about it let's hope that the uh, few little mechanical issues get solved as well yeah well these guys yeah, the bikes are very you know they're designed to be race the tz so they're very easy to strip apart it's a bit more complicated for the other stuff there is piro so i'm fortunate to enter his first session on a bike but uh, i'm sure he'll be back I do hope so. Um, we want to see him on a, in a bike ride for the first time, don't yeah, we? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, uh, really impressive. But, uh, let's hope they get the, it all solved. But there we go. So first practice session is complete. And uh, it is Michael Rutter, a very experienced racer, who has taken the pole position on the Hadley Honda CB750. The bike uh, entered by Chris Wilson. And it's a, a bike that has worked beautifully well. Four tenths faster, not a big chunk, uh, than the fastest of the two strokes. And Dan Cooper getting himself very used to that uh, Yamaha TZ350G nice and quickly. Might be the first time he's done it from what you were saying. But uh, Yeah, first, I mean, he obviously grew up on two strokes, yeah. but um, it was the first time he's ridden the TZ350. Uh, that yeah. looks like Luke Hedger. Yeah, it so, is. Um, Problem so, there. Again, he's um, just having a little fiddle with the with the gearbox. You know, again, there are a lot of these bikes, you know, they don't get ridden that much. They come out and uh, you know, we're seeing uh, a few Mark Linton problems. there. That's uh, that's another of the two-stroke Yamahas. A bit lighter to push around. Very much so, yeah. And there is uh, Gary Vines. I'm a bit worried about Gary because Gary was such a superstar. Yeah. He actually has ended up qualifying 10th because he had a problem towards the end, didn't get those fastest laps in at the end. He is running. He's trying to pick it up again, though. Yeah, so, it, I mean, it, when I, as we saw, when we saw him, I just thought it might have nipped up just because he had his clutch in, but he's trying to, you know, he's giving it another go. It's not working for him, is it? No. It's not getting it up and running again. So let's uh, just take you through that list then. Michael Rutter, fastest with the Hadley Honda, a 129.1 ahead of Dan Cooper and Scott Carson with the two-stroke Yamahas, and then another four-stroke up there, the triumph of Graham Higlin. Rob Whitty, he put in a good lap just towards the end there with the Honda CRS. Nick Williamson, sixth ahead of Grant Goodings. Andy Hornby, uh, star from last year, the four-strokes. He's down in eighth place ahead of... Michael Russell on that beautiful Norton Manx commando. And then Gary Vines, who had that problem that you just saw at the end there. He's trying to get it running again. So he'll end up starting from 10th place. Then George Thomas, Jamie O'Brien, Ian Bain, Dan Jackson, a bit further down perhaps than we were expecting there. Luke Hedger, who looks as though he might have had a little problem. Alan Cathcart down there. Maria Costello in that, uh, or on that Triumph uh, Trident. She's down in 20th place. And then uh, down towards the back of the field, We've got a, another 10 bikes there getting ready and lining themselves up 
for what should be a very entertaining race later on. DKW W2000, that's an interesting one. And Sean Anderson, that's down in 27th. Yeah, what a stunning bike. So it's a rotary engine, and it really is so unusual when you look at it. Obviously, a lot of you know, people remember the rotary Nortons that race in JPS colours, but a unique bike. Manuele Piro, slowest in the end, sadly, because uh, things didn't quite come together for him. So let's just have a little look back at some of the highlights of that practice session, getting the bikes out uh, for the first qualifying session of this 80th Goodwood members meeting and seeing Emanuele Piro out on the number 66 bike. Uh, but sadly, it didn't last quite as long as we were hoping for. There was a good little battle going on between Scott Carson and Gary Vines. Uh, people just chucking the odd bit of tape off. But ultimately, very few uh, issues with mistakes in terms of riding they were just a few mechanical issues weren't they yeah it, it, you know it can happen as i say they can be temperamental some of these uh, older machinery indeed well it was a very very good uh, run indeed by several of them but the fastest in the end michael rutter setting the pace there and he will therefore start from pole position for the halewood trophy later on today with a race today and a race tomorrow Welcome back then to the 80th Goodwood Members Meeting here where the sun is shining on the Goodwood Motor Circuit in West Sussex. If you look behind me, the daffodils are not having their finest outing, are they? The weather is being playing havoc to all the flowers on display here. David Green alongside me. My name is Rachel Stringer. For those of you who are just joining us, we've just seen our first official practice session as well in the Halewood Trophy and Michael Rutter sitting in pole position for that race later on at 2. 35. It's always great, isn't it, to see the bikes out on track. They've only got one race this time as well, haven't they, David? Well, no surprise to see Rutter on top there. Not an unfamiliar sight. And, you know, I'm no expert on the bikes, but I just like what James Hayden said. He said, lots of cool kit out there, lots of cool bikes, and this certainly sound good. Yeah, and just to recap then, on your front row for later on, Michael Rutter, Dan Cooper, and Scott Carson make up the front row of the grid. And keep an eye out for Andy Hornby, who's an eighth. He was actually on the podium last year as well. So a man who knows a thing or two about this course. Well, later on as well, we have the Gurney Cup, and that's one that we're always so excited about. It's got the who's who, hasn't it, of touring car legends, indie car legends, you name it, they're in it. They get a chance to drive these amazing sports cars from the 60s, GT40s, and as you say, you've got a lot of entrants there bringing in these celebrity drivers. We've got Marino Franchitti, Rob Huff, Andy Prio, Dario Franchitti, obviously, I just saw him earlier on in the assembly area. He just got out of the, the uh, Gordon Murray car with that amazing V12. He said that was a way to wake up, and he goes, now I've got to get in a GT40 and qualify that. So he's having a great day by the sounds of things. Obviously, there's a lot of action happening on track, but they all actually count towards a point system later on. So we have four house captains, four houses, and everyone over the course of the weekend is trying to gain some points for their houses. If you're not really sure how it works, well, here's an explainer for you. Part of the competition aspect of the members' meeting is to split the drivers and attendees into four separate groups to battle for the honour of what is known as the House Shield. Just like Hogwarts in Harry Potter's youth, there are four houses, and it's even more random as to who ends up where. Each house is named after titles belonging to the Goodwood master, the Duke of Richmond, and there are house captains from famous racing backgrounds. Peugeot Le Mans factory driver in the 2000s, Nicolas Minassian, is captain of House Albigny, which is represented on the shield by the Fleur de Lys. Ex-Formula One driver and Le Mans winner, Jochen Maas, is the frontman for House Darnley, for which the crest is the boar's head. 
Former British touring car ace Anthony Reid is captain of House Methuen, represented by the Lions Head, while five times winner of Le Mans, Emmanuel Ipiro, is head of House to Bolton, which is celebrated by the Harp. Every driver at the event scores points according to how they finish in each race. But it's not just about track action. Anybody who attends the event can dive into some fantastic challenges and also score points. Fancy some laser clay shooting? Or what about axe throwing? Perhaps Skittles is more suitable, or even sheep herding, amongst loads of options. There's also the important house group tug of war, where the house captains take a grip. As usual, there is no I in team. The house shield is about everyone at Goodwood. Nick Manassin, the sun is shining. You're about to go out in the GT40 at the Gurney Cup but you're wearing your members meeting blazer for very good reason, because you're a house captain. Just tell us a little bit about what you're up to this weekend. Uh, what I'm up to this weekend is uh, entertaining, pushing everybody and uh, making sure everybody's having the best of fun. I don't think it's very complicated here <laughs> because it's always fun, good wood. But yeah, it's about interacting with everybody, uh, try to maximize the point because you always want to win. But at the end of the day, it's the taking part that make the, the best weekend. Now, obviously, something you're going to try and win some points in is this GT40. Have you driven this before? Do you know the car? Yeah, I actually raced that car at the six hour last year. And we finished second with Oliver. And um, it's a big competition here. So I think uh, let's see what happens. And it's dry, it's sunny, and uh, let's bring the car to the, to the finish line. Nick, enjoy it. Thank you. Gordon Shedden, I, I've got many notes written down here, but next to yours, uh, your car is very fast, maybe a win. What do we think? Uh, I think it's going to be a great race. Uh, and it's great to see so many GT40s, and I think mixed in with some of the Chevrons. I think we could be in for a, a, you know, a proper race. And you've got Miles Griffiths driving with you. He's also very quick. So what? who's going first? Any, any tactics? Uh, Miles will start, uh, you know, we've driven this car together a few times and the, the partnership and the pairing works really well, so Miles will, Miles will start and, uh, yeah, sw switch whenever we can and, and hopefully we can bring it home and, and just have some fun and, you know, if a good result comes along, then great. That was a 45-minute race. Do you, I mean, these were built for endurance racing. I guess you don't have to look after anything? <laughs> You've always got to look after them, but it's, um, you know, e you know, they're still quite heavy cars. You've got to hang on to them a lot around Goodwood, you know, and, and to get the lap time out of them, it really is big, big commitment, as you know, you know, through some of the fast corners. So 45 minutes of maximum concentration and maximum hanging on. Enjoy it. Thanks. So we're getting ready for the practice to begin in just a few moments' time for the Gurney Cup. And we've got some beautiful sports racing cars about to head out onto the track. And uh, we'll hear some wonderful sounds from them as well from their motors. Uh, so sports prototypes from 1960 to 1966. We've got cars like uh, Ford GT40s, Chevrons, Elvers, uh, Lotuses as well. So a mixture of machinery. Uh, with their owners and co-drivers. This is going to be uh, a, a two-driver race when we actually get to the race itself, a 45-minute race. So, Alice, who's back with me, Alice Powell, a W Series racer and commentator for Formula One as well. Uh, these are some fun cars that we've got out there to watch, Alice. Yeah, and some of them, as uh, Gordon touched on, can be such a handful around this circuit. Goodwood's so fast, such a fast circuit, and we've just been notified that there's some oil flags out, and this will make it even trickier for the for these drivers as well. And some of them, I can imagine, it's their first time driving these cars too. Yeah, I bet, and uh, yeah, hopefully not too much oil. It must have been from one of the bikes, presumably. I can't imagine that it's gonna be huge amounts, but that's where the oil flag is. Um, so they will be wary of it, and uh, coming through on the outer lap so this bit, if it's there, is relatively straight on that section. They're not going through a tight corner there, so hopefully not too much oil down, but it is something they will be very, very aware of. The marshal's doing a fantastic job as ever of making sure everybody is well informed. So they've got uh, half an hour. It's just into St Mary's, actually. Yeah, you can see it, can't you, Alice? Yeah, just about to see it. So good that they put the dust on to, to try and clear it, and also for the drivers to know exactly where the oil is as well. It's not an easy place as I thought it was. Uh, it was a bit further around than I thought. So going into St Mary's, 
Um, the right left is not quite so easy. So we've got some uh, lovely cars out there at the moment. Lotus Ford, number 10. The yellow car that you're looking at there, that's the uh, Katsuaki Kubota machine, which raced in the early 1960s. It was actually purchased by JCB in 1964, uh, raced by Peter Sadler and by Trevor Taylor. The, the Lotus uh, top sports cars of this sort of size weren't always quite as successful. The lovely uh, one of the Ford GT40s in there, the, the number five, that's the Brabham BT5. There weren't too many Brabham sports cars built in the 1960s. They focused a bit more on single seaters. And in fact, only two uh, Brabham BT5s were actually made. And this is uh, one of those two. So it's lovely to see here at Goodwood. It's a, it's a pretty rare sports car, I have to say. And you can just see it's been passed by the number 11 AC Shelby Cobra. We see more of those and the GT40 there. The number nine car, this is the Richard Mines and Rob Huff machine. That could be a pretty competitive car as well over the course of the weekend. Seeing the GT40s, Alice, always lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it always is. And mentioning Rob Huff, he always seems to be very fast at Goodwood. <laughs> in anything. So, yeah, in anything, but particularly he uh, seems to love and take to Goodwood very well. Extremely fast circuit, of course, as uh, oh, this is the best shot. This is the shots we want. Riding on board now on a Ford. GT coming down. The yeah. See how nice and smooth you have to to be with the with the steering here. Heading up the straight, making sure. Obviously, they they only have 30 minutes of practice here, and there's a lot of cars out on track. So important to try and get the best position as well. And here into Woodcut, you really need to try and not be drawn into following the road on the left and try and break as straight as possible. It'll be quite difficult. To, to, to manage to do that, you, you do get drawn into following the road, and especially in these big, heavy cars, it's so important to try and get all your braking done in a straight line. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it will cause you a handful of problems. Well, this is the car we're on board with, is that uh, the gold-coloured car, uh, number 13. Yeah, and it's Sean Lynn who's driving at the moment. It's a car that he will be sharing with Dario Franchitti. <laughs> so we'll see Dario out at some point in this session as well in this car. Um, but that, that's, this is a good uh, combination, actually. Sean is an experienced racer as well, and um, he owns this car. He's done a lot of historic classic racing, Sean, and therefore I would imagine he's going to be near the front, especially when he starts combining with Dario as well. He's just being a little bit cautious at this stage. We're still fairly early on at this point, and um, we shall see how that all works out. But number 13 is the Sean Lynn car. Uh, the other uh, Lynn Frankitti is looking at it. When you're looking at the, I was looking at the timing screen. You've got five and six. Well, it's because Marino Frankitti is sharing with Maxwell Lynn in another GT40. So that's going to. I gonna, was just looking at that. Yeah, it's <laughs> completely going to confuse us because they, they they're actually back to back in terms of lap times at the moment. Uh, we're looking at a different car here, number 23. This is the James Cottingham Andrew Smith machine, and that is fastest so far, uh, 125.2. So we've got a GT40 setting the outright pace so far. They're winners here last year as well, actually, Ben. Yeah, so that, that could, could be good for them. Obviously, they're in good form once again. And it's lovely to see it out there. And a whole bunch of GT40s will all be pushing each other. We've got uh, also well up there is the Gordon Shedden car. As Ed was talking to Gordon in the assembly area just before they came out. So they're also on the pace, aren't they? Yeah, straight out. I mean, they've all had plenty of experience going around this circuit uh, and particularly driving these cars. You can see they're really pushing the number 23 to the limit. Really maximizing, really important to get back to the, the left, right hand side there, sorry. And yeah, not hanging about. So it's still early days in the practice session. We thought everyone's taking a little gentle, but certainly not the 23 as they are at the moment. 1.1 seconds ahead of Gordon Shedden's number 37. A little bit of traffic there, sneaking through on the inside, didn't trouble him too much. That's heading down now, final section of the circuit. Yeah, still putting a good lap together with uh, up front, still with that fastest time, 123.7 at the moment. Let's just see, but this is, as you say, this is, I think, looking like an even better lap. As long as he doesn't get held up, no, that's OK. He manages to get past the Lotus without getting held up in the last section of the lap. Coming up towards the chicane. Working the steering pretty hard. Over the curb, don't get on the grass. No, don't get on the grass. Fantastic riding 
on board now with him down into turn one. So we don't want any big stabs of the brake. You want to be nice and smooth as possible. But look how much work you have to put on the on the steering wheel. Really leaning on that outer edge tyre, getting a clean exit through there. Ford Water coming up next. Some cars it could be flat. Whether it'll be flat in these, it looks certainly on the edge. That's for sure. And then down into. St. Mary's again, another one that's really tricky. Got to try and break, do all your braking and heavy braking in a straight line, get it back to the right hand side, which certainly proves tricky, I think, in any of these cars. What fantastic shots we're, we're getting yeah. now, Ben. Lovely, the really lovely images. You can see how much you have to work at the wheel. The tyres they run on all of the classic cars here are pretty humble in terms of grip, but I like that because you just see the drivers having to really work the steering wheel to, to make sure they hang on in there. Yeah, and it and and this is how short circuit should still be. Is a good word. If you make a mistake, uh, you're certainly going to be paying for it. Um, and it's such a high speed circuit is now as Gordon's had a really handy middle sector there. Uh, lost a little bit of time in the in the first sector compared to the number 23. As we'll find out now, he feathers it through the chicane, foot flat to the floor. Yeah, let's see if these. Uh change at all over the line and uh, a 123.2 so still not quite enough to take the fastest looking here at the number 66 uh, car this is the first gt40 is a prototype development car that was built um, back in 1964 so really the earliest uh, gt40 certainly that's out on track it's one of the earliest that still exists to be honest um, ryan and peter clark who are sharing this car this weekend it is such a special history to this one, but it's so lovely the fact that they go and race it. Right, going off is the Lotus 23 of Michael O'Brien and Cameron Jackson. I mean, this, this should be a pretty quick car with two very rapid drivers. It's perhaps not quite as powerful as some of the machines out there, but they are seventh fastest already. And uh, it's a very, very pretty little Lotus 23C. Let's see if we can find out what happened, Alice. Yeah, quite, so it must have either slightly ran a little bit wide touch the grass on the outside left there and obviously that's going to spin you as you can just doing a good demonstration of how slippy the grass really is to try and pull back onto the circuit yeah weaving around just to clean the tires up as much as anything that's often a thing you do isn't it just to, to get the make sure you've got the grip but just to get there any uh, muck off them so now beginning to pick it up a little bit so no change up front still that uh, number 23 gt40 which is Set the pace, Andrew Smith um, going well at this stage. There we are, still out on track and still pushing, yeah, still, still pushing, pushing by the looks of it. Yeah, you can really see how it floats and flies and dances around the lap, doesn't it? Yeah, it certainly does. You can see really working the wheel, even still. And what makes it difficult, especially with these big heavy cars as well, is it's not flat round Goodwood. You know, you've got to say go up, you go down, you've got camber changes as well, and that really adds to to to, to the trickiness of, of driving one of these cars around the circuits because it, it, it's so tricky. And even oh. the patches of then, you can see he uh, he's still gone purple in in the first sector. You can really tell that he's trying to draw every inch of speed this early on. We've still got 20 minutes left, but uh, it's lost a little bit of time in in that middle sector, probably from that big slide there. Yeah, I'd imagine that um, the drivers will start coming in in a few minutes' time because it's a half-hour session, So you, and you've got to swap drivers and give each other a chance to get a feel for the car, not only to set the pace for qualifying. So it's quite a busy cross-the-line patch right now, but actually, yeah, we already have cars coming into the pits. So, yeah, there is the Sean Lynn Dario Franchitti car, so I think, yeah, Dario's on board. There we are. So, the second time today already here at Goodwood, we've seen Dario on board a car, but this time, it's pure competitiveness that matters. And he's glancing in his, all his mirrors, being very cautious as he comes out, isn't he? Yeah, there's a lot of traffic that's, that's going past at the moment. And the last thing you want is to, to pull out in one of these these cars, speeding down the straight. But he'll still be enjoying it as well, Dario. I mean, he definitely certainly enjoyed his uh, demonstration laps earlier on. Uh, but this is going to be totally different beast to drive, that's for sure. This, this car regularly races in historic uh, racing. It's raced at Le Mans Classics, bar six hours. It's been here at the Goodwood Revival many times. It was a car that was originally sent to the United States, actually. Um, uh, and uh, 
they had a few technical problems with it getting it all signed up initially but it's a very rapid car and Dario Franchitti is doing a fantastic job right now so Ed Foster is with James Cottingham with uh, who will be driving the car that is currently fastest No, they're getting pretty well your your car's currently in pole position um, I guess it's going to get more difficult near the end of the session yeah I mean looking at the pit wall there are a few of the uh, pro drivers on the pit wall so um, yeah I think the session will only get faster obviously the temperature's rising and the track's drying because it's not damp now but there will be some you know lower uh, track temperature um, but yeah I think Smithy was just really keen to get out there and get on with it so uh, yeah I'm pleased to see him at the top and enjoying it and hopefully we can uh, repeat what we did two years ago now it's obviously a two driver race you said there's a lot of pro drivers sitting on the pit wall but you're only as fast as your slowest driver aren't you so actually it doesn't really matter how fast one of your drivers is very true but there are just some really very strong pairings in this race so um, as someone said last night it looks uh, it looks very fierce enjoy cheers thank you well, for now, his teammate Andrew Smith is still fastest uh, with an advantage of all of uh, 0.181 uh, at this stage. But as he says, we are seeing different drivers getting into the cars now. We could be up for some rapid improvements. We're just looking down into the pits. Uh, number three car there is the Chevron BMW B8. There are a few of the Chevrons here. Very, very beautiful car. Um, there's another one actually this is the first time they've had this car out the number two car it's just been rebuilt by OC Racing Stuart Hall and Andrew Kukadi uh, are sharing this car and um, Andrew's about to get into the car he is going to be pretty rapid around here so that'll be interesting to see how they get on with the Chevron BMW that car currently actually is right up there oh maybe it's maybe it was Andrew getting out I'm not quite yeah, sure yeah so they was giving some tips right. I think okay. uh, track tips to uh, to, to let them know what it's like out on circuit but this is a great shot also to see how tight this pit lane is i've never actually been in the pit lane of goodwood before so i walked into it yesterday and i couldn't believe it. i said really is this the pit lane so that adds to the trickiness of the, of doing the driver changes but but as well as the moment you've got cars that are on hot laps you've got cars coming out the pits so i think to expect to see especially if the fastest drivers are going out towards the end now is you know, the track's going to be at the best, plus everybody will be on the oh. Is that Dario having That's a... not at the best. Yes, yeah, it's a is it? um, Off on the grass. Try and spot exactly which car that is in a moment. Yeah, it is the... Oh, no, it's, it's, the it's the Andrew Sorry, Smith. Great. It's the Andrew Smith James Cottingham car. So that's Andrew, I believe. I don't think it has been into the pits yet. Um, oh, well, that's... I oh, know. No. Well... Let's see what's happened. I, I don't quite know what's Can't happened because... see any damage. Yeah. We'll have a little look now. Uh, pulls off. Pulls off. Yeah. So something not quite right. Maybe smoke front left. I don't know if that was just my eyes, but yeah. Clearly pulling off in a, a safe place out the way. No, that's a worry. Yeah, that, that is a worry. And especially with... They're sitting pretty at the moment in pole position, but I, unfortunately for them, expect that to change. Marino Franchitti getting into the number six car now. So uh, we've got both the Franchitti's competing in GT40s here this weekend. Uh, he's sharing this car with Maxwell Lin. And then there's the number 10 Lotus we were looking at on track a little bit earlier on. Uh, Katsuaki Kubota and Richard Bradley who are sharing this car. So that's being swapped around. It's got a big uh, V8. You can see the inlets at the back there. And uh, it's a powerful machine. In fact, it's, it's had some good success um, over the years, this particular car, um, it was particularly super competitive in the 1960s because the Lotus wasn't quite stiff enough, the, 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 the chassis wasn't really quite stiff enough to handle the big American engines, um, but nonetheless, it is a, a beautiful car and they've had some good success with this historic uh, car since sort of rebuilding it and getting it all back together. It, it has won the Goodwood Revival in the past. It's looking at another Lotus here. This is the number 15 car, Tim and Marshall Bailey. Well, we gather Gordon Shedden's going pretty quickly at the moment. Yeah, but not now. Looks like he's uh, got a little bit of traffic going into the final chicane, which will certainly look like that hampered his lap for sure. Is he going to cross the line 123.8? So, yeah, potentially that could have been a lap. 
they would have popped him up to the top of the times. He's still six tenths adrift. Didn't do a personal best either and did lose uh, a little bit of time in that last sector. So for strength, but that's the problem. You're going to have cars coming out of the pits that are on build laps, warming up. In look at the look at the traffic now. It'll probably be uh, a good idea for for Shedden, I'm sure, to to box in the next uh, lap or so. Yeah, it's certainly getting pretty hectic out there at times, isn't it? For for Gordon, three times British touring car champion. Here we are, riding on board with him right now. So this will give us a, another perspective as he comes down towards the Levant corner, hard on the brakes, down through the gear. Let's watch him on exit. Drifting, I expect drifting, and we got a little bit, not not a great deal. There we go, just got to feather the throttle, be so patient. And especially seeing the grass is, is wet today, you know, any slight touch of, of, of the grass, and that can have big consequences. You can see it seems like it's pushing as hard as possible. The car stopped and rotated for Woodcut and finishing the lap through the chicane, feathering it nice and gently through there. A little bit sideways as he's going to cross the line. And go fastest. Ah, good one. Well done. So 122.5. 22.25, sorry, 1 minute 22.253 puts them just three tenths of a second faster than the car, which unfortunately has come to a halt out on track. Now, what will be interesting about this, if both drivers don't get to run, will they allow it to start in its normal position uh, from its qualifying performance? It may well be allowed to. Uh, yeah, I would have thought that. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but it would be harsh not to. Obviously, the car's broken down. Uh, and it's quite early on in the session that it happened as well. As uh, Gordon is still finding his way through the traffic. Not a personal best. Well, personal best, actually, in the, the first sector, but now been pipped by, by Rob, Huff. Yeah, Rob Huff just gone fastest there in the number nine car. Well, you were saying how good he is. And, <laughs> and once again, oh, we've got another car off. Just taking to the grass, hopefully coming back on again. Yeah, it's the Crosby Olsen deal. That's a pretty rare... Uh, unusual car actually built in Ireland for British uh, for an Irish uh, champion Brian Nelson now Huff is still pushing on he's still putting together some pretty fast sequences I think yeah he's done personal best in the first sector but he's a good five tenths off in that middle sector so it didn't go any quicker and again as I touched on the the traffic is it's quite busy out there at the moment. Every car bar one, and obviously the Smith Cottingham car, which is uh, pulled over to the side. But Rob Huff is pushing that number nine. Everyone moving out the way for him. You can see him. You can see him coming as he set a personal best in the middle sector. So I expect him, if he has a nice clean final sector now, to stretch the the gap at the top of the times. Rob Huff, one of the most experienced touring car drivers ever, but he starts his racing career in an MGB and uh, he's sliding it around. Let's have a look at how the lap goes here. Over the line, yeah, it's a better lap, as you say. It's a 121.8, so even faster ahead of the opposition. And that's impressive from Rob Huff in the number nine car. Fastest for now, with 10 minutes still to go. We've got uh, another car going quickly, though, and it is the Lotus. Bradley. Yep, Richard Bradley, so I know him from the karting days. Very fast car or car, doesn't matter what he's driving, as uh, he's just blitzed that middle sector, actually. So I won't be surprised if we're going to see him challenge Rob at the top. Let's see what this... the line now. There we go. <laughs> You're right. One second quicker. 121.3. Well, as I mentioned, it might the Lotus 30 might not have been quite as competitive in the 1960s as they kind of meant it to be, but I think... The way they've managed to get it to work so well now, very, very impressive. And it's had good success here in the past. And he's certainly dealing it, dealing with it very, very well, is Richard Bradley. Let's just watch. Look at how it, it reacts slightly differently, doesn't it, to the GT40? Slides slightly differently. Yeah, obviously it's going to be lighter as well, so a little bit more, more nimble. But he's still constantly fighting the wheel. You can really see. Oh, oh very oh, oh, oh. close to that to the edge of the grass there pushing all the limits and he's actually gone slightly faster in the first sector but the the shedding car has gone even quicker again so close 
So that outside edge of the grass is making me cringe here in the factory <laughs> box, for sure. Because we know how wet it is, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we, we had that walk back to our cars last night, didn't we? And uh, checked out the grass. Um, but yeah, coming down now into to Woodcut, and you can see just waiting for that front end to grip. Gentle on the power. But I think he needs oh. got to oh. That was a bit too much on the grass. He actually yeah. had some wheel spin. Thankfully, it went straight on and uh, slightly quicker. But I, I think Shedden's gonna. The Shedden car is uh, is certainly oh, ooh, not quite. Not Look quite. how close. 0 0.015 is the gap between the Lotus and the Ford GT40. Amazing. Fantastic. And you can see these cars are, that are at the top, or any of them that have been driven around at the moment, Ben. See how much on the edge they are, how hard they are being pushed. For, and it does make me cringe for such beautiful old cars. I just think, please just stay in one one piece. But Shedden again, he's setting fastest first sector. You see on board of him now, even more movement from uh, previous laps ago. So he's dialed in the circuit. Circuit's obviously getting better as well. Just watch him here. Got to get on the power as early as possible. He floors the throttle. He certainly won't need to go to the gym later. He's having a, <laughs> a, a, a good workout behind the wheel right now. Picking up maximum speed down the back straight here and then try to get a good late break. Let's just see whether this is going to be a better lap because he's doing pretty well. Certainly that first sector went well, didn't it? Yeah, he's lost uh, to the best sector, a few t middle sector, a few tenths. Okay, let's have a look then. Good exit, didn't run too wide on the exit. Seven minutes to go. Let's just see over the line as he's staying second. He goes fastest. Oh. He goes fastest by 0 .007. Oh, it's just remarkable. Two so different cars, a Ford GT40 versus the Lotus 430. And yet they are doing virtually the same lap times around here, both incredible. from the 1960s. Yeah, incredible. But the car, the Dario car, number 13, looking quite handy too. And there we go. <laughs> That's gone fastest, 120.9. And it, again, it's so close. So we now have the top three separated by less than a, a tenth of a second. It's, I'm amazed that it's all so close. But Dario Franchitti now has set the outright pace. You're on board with Dario. Let's see how this lap is looking. Stretch of the arms there. Yeah. A little bit more relaxed than the, the shed and car at, at the moment. So possibly uh, being uh, a little bit of a cool down lap to me. Uh, that doesn't look like he's he's pushing and yet he's uh, a few seconds off in, in the first sector. Uh, Shedden's definitely not doing that. So I expect this car to, to come in, I would say, at some point then, because I don't think uh, Gordon's uh, boxed. No, still not boxing this lap, still carrying on. So it stays the same for now. Dario Franchitti just ahead of Gordon Shed, uh, Richard Bradley in third place in the Lotus. Rob Huff up there in fourth position. And then Andrew Smith is set at such a good pace earlier, but the car stopped at the side of the road, unfortunately. And then the, the number two car of Andrew Cucotti and Stuart Hall, that is currently sixth fastest, ahead of the uh, Westian Ben Mitchell. Uh, Chevron BMW, so I think that's the top of the Chevrons, that's running 7th. Marino Franchitti's car is down in 8th place. And then the Cobra of uh, the Shepherds and Andy Prio. So Andy Prio is actually part of that team now. Uh, that's in ninth position. And the top 10 completed by the man we were speaking to earlier, Nicholas Minassian, in another of the Ford GT40s. That's the car he's sharing with Olivier Gallant. Uh, a good mixture of cars that we've got up there. Jason Plato's, uh, the car he's in with Craig Davis, that's down in 15th place at the moment. So just looking at, uh, this is the Westy and Ben Mitchell shared Chevron BMW, the only left-hand drive uh, Chevron B8 that was built, apparently. Uh, it was because it was sent over to Germany for some members of the, the BMW group, uh, senior members of BMW who raced it at Nürburgring and other places in Germany. So they created this left-hand drive version of the Chevron B8 for them. It was a very successful car in international motorsport. 
and British motorsport particularly as well, but the B8 with the BMW engine, two litre engine, became very successful internationally across Europe as well. So that's a, it's a very, very pretty car. Goes across the line. That's currently eighth fastest, that machine. So they're doing well. Maybe not quite the outright pace that we've got up front. Dario Franchitti still holding on to that. We're not seeing so many lap improvements now, are we? No, the, the, the hub car, the number nine, is just uh, sharing some greens on our on our timing screen. Um, so that's, that means a personal best for that car. And purple, which uh, he's done in the, the final sector, means best overall on circuit. So he's popped up now a couple of tenths off from the, the number 13. As we see on screen, the number seven, that's, that's Jason Plato, I'm presume, out at the moment. He'll be looking to move up the order, as we know how competitive Jason is. Yeah, it's not being pushed as hard at the moment. He's, he's glancing in his mirror. I hope the car's running okay. He's not pushing it on that hard at this stage. So we'll have to wait and see whether they can uh, do something with that. Been a slight improvement for the number 15 car of Tim Bailey and Marshall Bailey. Their Lotus Ford has, uh, has moved up, uh, up the order a touch. But up front, it's still the same pattern with the Dario Franchitti car having the advantage by 0.067 of a second. Tiny, tiny margins. Just seeing the uh, Ford GT Roadster just going through there. That's a very unusual car. That green uh, Ford GT with uh, the open top there. That's the Roadster. There was one of uh, just three Roadster GT40s that were built. Very, very rare. It was raced in the 1960s by the like of uh, Bob Bondurant and Sir John Whitmore. And uh, 12th at the moment, 12th fastest. It's not, not the fastest of the GT40s, but it is a very rare car and rather lovely to see. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's being pushed to the limit, getting a kick of oversteer on the exit of, of turn one there. This is now where I expect, and the, the, we're getting some more green, some more colours on our, on our timing screen now. We've only got just under two minutes left of the session. As you can see, most people now will start to, to be pushing. Pit stops, will, driver changes have been done, completed. There's a little bit of a traffic jam still building. The, there's quite a spread of the field. It's very tight at, at, at the top, at the sharp end, but slightly further down, there's a bit more of a spread. So managing traffic as well for, for those that are, the, that are around. You can just see that <laughs> number nine is trying to squeeze through. Yeah, Rob half trying Being to Being very polite. Yeah, yes, he was being very sensible about it. Oh, up over the curb. But, uh, yeah, that will have cost Rob a little bit of time, no doubt about it. So I don't think we're going to see any improvements at this stage. The clock ticking away under a minute now until the chequered flag comes out. But everybody having a bit of fun out there, still getting a lot out of the car. Maybe the tyres are a little bit uh, working. I mean, it works quite hard, not giving quite as much grip as they were in the middle stages of this qualifying session. And for the moment, it's still Dario Franchitti, I have to say, with uh, Sean Lynn, who is looking forward to having this pole position. We shall see um, whether they get it. Oh, and then going very slowly is that pretty little chevron of Stuart Hall and Andrew Kukari. And that car, which um, has been quick, it's sixth quickest overall, but clearly there is some sort of issue with that, isn't there? Yeah, it looks like it. Keeping best, keep out of the way as best as he can. As I said, it's quite busy at the moment on, on circuit with lots of drivers trying to better their time, but keeping out of the way. But that's not good as Gordon Shedden decides he doesn't want to take the chicane this lap. Mm. Overshoots it. Um, you'd only do that if you had a problem, I would think. Well, yes. He's brought it straight and he's not even gone into the. No. Well, in fact, the check flags out, so I suppose there's no point coming into yeah. the pits. I hope, I hope that's okay. I hope he hasn't got a problem with the car there. Um, so, checker flag is out. We're not seeing any big leaps, I don't think. No, a decent, yeah, Richard Bradley's going quite well, isn't he? He's done a decent first sector. Yeah, still half a second off the best, but he seemed to, to be a lot stronger in the middle sector, which he, he holds the time for. As we still see two car slightly keeping out the way. Huff's now taking the checker flag, no improvement there. Keep an eye on the number 10 car, if we can. There's uh, Bradley just set a personal best in that first sector. We see him on the screen now. Gonna have to keep 
has lost a little bit of time actually compared to himself in the middle sector so disappointed for him maybe a little bit of traffic but he's still pushing he's not giving up <laughs> no still sliding around and it's still going to end up with a very good starting position this lotus by the look of things i don't think as you say it's going to go any quicker on this lap let's just see no that's a 120 or 1.5 so a little bit off what he'd already done but third fastest overall that's impressive so we've got two gt40s up front and one behind him but the lotus is going to be in the mix and it'll be very interesting to see how this lotus goes in the race um, versus the gt40s yeah little nippy card watch out for that at the start you know quite quite nimble so uh, Richard won't be holding back if he is the, the driver starting, of course. Um, so fantastic. What a great, great lineup we've got. Yeah, it will be interesting to see, yes, who will start. We'll find out that later on, no doubt, whether it will be um, owners or whether it will be some of the rapid professional drivers. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, that was a very, very closely run contest. And uh, the top four cars are separated by under two tenths of a second with the, uh, the top top three less than a tenth it's, it's remarkable that they've been that close to one another and uh, we have seen a few potential mechanical problems let's hope that they get that sorted out but that's always part and parcel of running historic classic cars um, from whatever period oh dear there's rather a lot of smoke coming out of the back of that chevron now it's worrying and he's actually asking the marshals to come over Ooh, let's hope that they can get that sorted out yeah not a good sign. Nearly made it back to the pitch. You see the marshals now running. Fantastic job by them with the fire extinguishers. Can't see any flames yet, but it looks oh. like yeah, it's, uh, that's not a good sign, is it? No, that isn't. It's burning through the bodywork at the back. Engine sits in the back there behind the driver on these chevrons. It's uh, So that's where is all the heat is from, from the motor. And uh, clearly, oh dear, that's horrible to see how it's burning the fiberglass bodywork. That's a... And you think this car, as I mentioned, has only just been completely rebuilt. So this is oh, the people who've just rebuilt this car is going to be very painful watching this. I'm sorry about that. But um, that's all part and parcel of running race cars or any cars, really, but particularly race cars when they're always under a lot of stress. And there you can see that fiberglass bodywork all melting away pretty much. Yeah, well, I'd say did a good job to try and uh, sort of limp back to the pits, keep some air flowing through it. So he did a good job to get as far as he did but yeah that's uh, not a pretty sight uh, and, a, and a way to end end of the session there so let's have a look through the order then uh, which will be for the start of the gurney cup after that two driver race it'll be a 45 minute race and we've got three four in fact four gt40s in the top five but they've also got that lotus 430 that richard bradley did an extremely good job but it's dario franchitti who set the outright pace then the first of the chevrons that's in sixth place um, and down to the bottom of the top 10 there andy prio in the ac shelva cobra so that's another mix of machinery uh, to look forward to marino franchitti down just inside the top 10 as well uh, then we've got more of the lotus 23s in the next group down uh, including jason plato and craig davis their gt40 didn't seem to be quite as competitive they weren't able to push on that lovely four gt40 prototype as well of peter and ryan clutt and then on down the list um, chris goodwin out in his lotus uh, down in 26th position there uh, a couple of the elvers the smaller cars um, developed in this part of the world in fact in the south of england uh, they're not quite as competitive uh, the attila chevrolet as well carl jones is uh, driving that car this weekend So there we are, the Gurney Cut. And let's take a look at some of the highlights from that qualifying session in excellent conditions. And we saw uh, the number 23, GT40, Andrew Smith, putting in some very, very good laps indeed. We saw one or two errors, people running wide onto the grass, and it is very damp out there. But then we did see that uh, GT40, which was quick throughout, uh, come to a halt. Let's just hope that it is going to be in good shape. The cars that were quick included Gordon Shedden and Rob Huff in their GT40s. Uh, the Lotus, though, was putting in some impressive laps with Richard Bradley behind the wheel. And that Lotus 430 is going to be near the front, but not right up the front because it will be Dario Franchitti in the number 13 car from pole position.
It's like motoring heaven here. It's motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's a sort Just, of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then... <laughs> Ben and Archie Collings, what a wonderful moment this is. We've stopped calling it the Setrington Cup, and we're now calling it the Goodwood Feeder Series. Um, Archie, you're out in the 60 horsepower. You did some laps this morning. How are you feeling? Very confident, actually. Um, I think I'm going to win. Now, Ben, you, it, Archie's been driving this since he was 12, I think. Um, and as we alluded to, the first graduate from the Setrington Cup. Must be a proud moment. And I'm ever so proud of him. Uh, yeah, just it, it, to see him come on from the Setchington Cup as a 10-year-old with a high squeaky voice uh, to driving this car today. It's, it's been a, a wonderful journey. And Archie, is, have you asked your dad for any advice? No, he's, he's not very good. So, um, no, I haven't, no. <laughs> have you asked him for advice? Uh, not about cars. <laughs> well, look, guys, enjoy, because it's a great moment. Great, yeah, thanks very thanks. much. Thank you very much. Duncan Pittaway, as always, you seem to have brought a gun to a knife fight. It's always lovely to see this. Um, it's quite a voyage of discovery, this round of circuit, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, this is horrible. <laughs> it's the fabulous car on the road. It's horrible on the circuit. I mean, it's a little bit too fast for its brakes, and it's certainly too fast for its cornering. In the wet, a couple of years ago, I was on the front row, and then in the race, in the dry race, I just went backwards. So uh, it's great. Um, I seem to remember you worked out that from the chicane to the start-finish line, you were faster than the Cobra. Yeah, I, surprisingly, um, I think just in acceleration terms. So I'm just doing just over 90 as I go across the finish line from the chicane. But then, of course, I've got to lift off there to try and get it around the next to Mount Magic, which, but sadly, you have to lift off so early. But yeah, in a straight line, it's like a freight train. And what's the handling like? Terrible. No, I think it's one of those things, it's like uh, you, when I was a kid, I remember watching Blue Peter with a double-decker bus on a skid pan. And it's one of those things you think, well, it's going to fall over, and it doesn't. It probably won't fall over, but it feels like it's going to fall over. So it's just that feeling of feeling it just doesn't want to be drifting. You just don't want to be drifting it. But the only thing I would say, it's probably the most unenvironmentally friendly car on the planet. And I'd just like to note, we fired it up in the assembly area to bring it in today, and since we fired it up, the sun's come out. So, you know, so it is doing something for the environment. Maybe not the right things. Gre Greta would be proud. Well done. Absolutely. <laughs> Lovely to hear from Duncan Pittaway there as he gets ready to come out in that uh, the beast of Fiat. Uh, but we've got some remarkable cars with us. And Bruce Jones joins me alongside now. Bruce, great to have you with us. Thank you. I hope I wasn't invited because I was around when these cars were new. <laughs> no. Fortunately not. But um, it's one of the treats coming to the members' meeting to get up close to these cars. They don't all do things in logical ways. Lots of things were tried and never, never used again on any other racing car. But there were a lot of really advanced ideas. But, of course, you've got... the large down to the tiny and it really was an age sunbeam suddenly brought in these glorious monoposto cars in 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 sort of 1911 or thereabouts but before with the beast of turin 28 liters we've got uh, ben collings will be out with me a 21 liters under his hood but these cars are just so exciting that moors which in the middle of the screen looks so it's a, it's a not even a barn find it's sort of worse than that but it is when it gets going, that's when the beauty starts. Now, this engine which you're looking at, this is one of several uh, engines that are basically aircraft engines from the First World War, aren't they? Well, there were a lot of them lying around, yeah. uh, ready to be used, and uh, it was thought, in those days, of course, straight line speed was the, the ultimate. It took a while until, the, let's say, that the chassis became small enough and the tyres became good enough to, of course, go around the corners. This race, named after Selwyn Francis Edge, the first British driver to win an international event, that was the 19... O2 uh, Gordon Bennett Trophy, effectively a sort of shorter version of the city-to-city -city race. You entered for your country, only three 
entries per country. And in fact, with the French racing industry being so nascent and so many manufacturers, they rebelled against that. They, we want more than that. So that's why Grand Prix racing started in 1906. That's right, yes. But as you say, it was road racing in those days, wasn't it? It was very much going from cities to cities, thousands, of, or nearly a thousand miles quite often, those big, long uh, races with these sort of beasts, these devices, amazing machinery. But uh, as you say, also, they vary a lot because they had these huge engines, then they started to realize a bit lighter might work better. They were learning so much. Also, they provide brilliant racing. Sometimes we were just discussing it this morning. Were the races ever staged? No. And in fact, I was talking to Marcus Black, who's out in number 16, which is a 1912 Sunbeam. He said, I said, how's the car going? He said, you know what these are like. One lap good, next lap, who knows? And you do see cars going up and down the order. But in terms of the dynamic cornering, you can see someone trying to turn in and the car eventually, a bit like a rather untrained puppy, eventually coming to heel. It is fantastic. Well, let's go down to the assembly area and catch up with some of the drivers there with Ed Foster. Mark Walker, now, usually you drive this to the circuit, don't you? I do, uh, and I've driven it all around France. We went to the uh, Grand Prix circuit at Lyon, 1,000-mile round trip in France. It's, a, it's not a bad road car, but it, it's tricky in towns. It, it's only got two gears, and in bottom gear at Tickover, you're going over 30 miles an hour. Um, but it's, it's surprisingly not too bad. But I, if, I'm glad I didn't drive it here yesterday because I got stuck in a three-hour queue trying to get in, and that, that wouldn't have been ideal. But, no, nope, it's, it's crazy. Land-speed rocker car, two gears acceptable on the road extraordinary and what do the police say when they see you well they haven't caught me yet <laughs> um and is it i mean you said it was nice to drive on the road but i mean you have no idea what speed you're doing um you're very exposed to the elements you must get a crowd of cars around you staring you probably do but in a car like this with two wheel brakes you literally you cannot afford to take your eyes off the road for half a second. So uh, I, I have no idea. I, you, you just cannot look at what the public are looking at. You have to concentrate the whole time on where you're going. My passengers tell me that people are waving, but I literally I cannot afford to uh, wave back. I need to be really concentrating. Talking of concentration, it's, it must be quite a challenge threading this around the Goodwood circuit. Yeah, it's it was quite quick. You know, when on the on the on the, the main straight, you seem to have quite a lot of time to sit there wor worrying about things. Um, but it's a great circuit, and it you know the, the it, I, I only do one gear change on, uh, in the whole race. So I start in bottom gear, and then into top, and I stay there in top for the whole thing. Um, but it's. Uh, yeah, it, no, it's lovely. Uh, it, it, it accelerates from the chicane to the sort of finish line. Uh, there's not much you can keep up with it doing that. Um, um, and it's, it's lovely. It's a great circuit. I, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, please tell us when you're next out on the road, because I know there's quite a few of us who'd like to come and see it. Yes, OK, well, well uh, yeah, maybe next week. <laughs> Enjoy. OK, thank you. Bye. So lovely to see uh, Mark Walker with his uh, 1905 Danak there with uh, the water tank that sits on the top. It's such a strange shape, isn't it? And that radiator, that arrow-shaped radiator as well. I love the way that Mark thinks it, it drives acceptably, but it, it built in towns. It was built for the land speed record. Yes. And it was, it was super light. But that was one of the first cars that sort of went away from the enormous, enormous engines and the huge amount of bodywork to contain them. And it really was a time of just considerable change. But Mark drives that car supremely well. He's such an entertainer. OK, well, we'll look forward to seeing him out there. It is, uh, as you say, land speed record uh, from its time. It was up to, it was the first car to 120 miles per hour, apparently, um, and put together by Alexandre Darak, the man who was a, an engineer, then a businessman, worked in bikes and then into cars, like many of them, actually. They uh, started with bikes and then got themselves turned over. That's a, one of the Hudsons. There's a couple of Hudsons here, actually, built in the United States. Uh, six-cylinder. They went to six-cylinder engines quite early on. Not, not as big, certainly not a, the huge sort of aero engines that we've got on some of the others. Yeah, I, I was having a look at Ian Barmforth's um, Hudson earlier. Beautiful, a Super 6, 1917. It's in a lovely shade of uh, darkish blue. And uh, not all the cars have that level of presentation. We saw the moors earlier. It looked like it being rubbed down with a very, very oily and slightly grubby rag. But I actually quite like that as well. I quite like the notion they might have just been sort of had the chickens blown out of the cockpit and brought here. But of course, that's not the case at all. In fact, there is that number six Hudson on just going off the left of your screen. And alongside is the very moors I was talking about. As you can see, a little bit of rub. And in fact, you might go through the bodywork. 
It's lovely to see the uh, valve springs working away, isn't it? As uh, you don't often see that on an engine. No, I think this is one of the absolute greatest appeals uh, for the SF Edge race, for these Edwardian races, is that so much of the, of the mechanical element of the car is in clear view. And that's before they fire it up and your eyes start to water. Or if you're standing next to the Beast of Turin, you stand back because it puts out great puffs of flame. You're looking at James Baxter here in this rather gold uh, Oakland Romano. Um, this has the Curtis uh, Aero engine as well. He, he only bought this about a year ago. Uh, he managed to convince the man who'd actually, actually rebuilt it. I really want to buy this off you. And he managed to persuade him in the end to, to buy it. And he's, he's, he's absolutely loving it. He's done a few events with it already. What I like, though, is the diversity of events they're in. We talked about the road races, the city to city races. This car won uh, Pikes Peak, which is a uh, from nowhere to nowhere, but up a very, very steep mountain in the States. In it the is very, very steep. I, I have seen it. And uh, in those days, it had no tarmac as well. It was all sort of dirt and gravel. And, but to, to win the Pikes Peak, I hadn't realized it started that early, 1916. Uh, that sort of period is amazing. Well, you think about the achievement of actually getting a car up that hill. Oh, it's not a hill. It's a proper mountain. The person who called it a hill, I remember it was Rallycross racer Martin Shanga called it the Silly Hill. Because I said, how is Pikes Peak? You mean you silly hill? Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine that's an incredibly demanding thing to do. So they're fired up, making very special noises, and that's that's going to be part of, of what's so enjoyable about watching the cars come out. Um, whether you're watching with us online or whether you're here at the track with us, by the side of the circuit, and you will get completely different sounds from this machinery that is coming out onto the track in a moment. Some of them really roaring, some of them a little quieter and buzzing. Um, it, it really is, everything is quite, quite different. Uh, most of them only have two wheel brakes, so that makes life a little bit challenging. This one, as um, he was telling me yesterday, at least does have a, a, a pedal brake that works on the drums on the rear. So there's two drum brakes on the rear. Some of them have got um, a hand device that does the braking. Again, that falls under the category of something very visual. What is that person doing? Oh, the car's slowing down, I see. But uh, this is that concept that, who was the bright spark who thought, why don't we put brakes on all four of the wheels? But uh, clearly their biggest concern, in many ways, that's why the races around here aren't very long, because the brakes do begin to fade. We've got a five lap race today and another tomorrow. Now, one car I think we should really look out for is car number 25, the 1916 Sunbeam Indianapolis. Julian Majoub's had huge success with that. Uh, so look for him making his way towards the top of the time order. Actually, in Julian's case, it doesn't really matter so much. If he starts at the back, he still tears through. And it is the car with probably the longest tail behind the rear wheels. Take a look when you see it. Car number 25, <laughs> an enormous pointed tail. Early aerodynamics at play. I think. There's Archie going back out as well. We saw him earlier on, Archie Collings, the 17-year-old, who's getting his uh, first run at uh, on on the main track uh, in a in a powered car as opposed to the pedal car that he has won at here at goodwood in the past yeah the pedal car race for the austin j40s um always entertaining but many a, a, a young driver will find out that they've grown a little too fast in their days behind there's the sunbeam in Indianapolis with julian majub on board and as you can see they sit so high from the road and uh, therefore it does give them actually a far better uh, line of view into any particular corner when they try and place these cars but again look at how narrow the wheels are the tires you think about tire technology and how many a driver bemoans the fact they can't afford a new set because that's where the performance is but for this lot they will last a long time but they offer next to no grip at all and this this car raced at indianapolis i mean indianapolis was another race that started very early on in the history of motorsport wasn't it i mean i think one of the beauties about uh, as we talk more and more about historic racing is just the numbers numbers game it's 100 years since the first yeah. 24 hours of Le Mans this year and so the celebrations will come at us thick and fast and 75 years since this fantastic circuit was opened and to which we owe a huge uh, debt of gratitude to the Duke of Richmond at the time and uh, the Australian pilot Tony Gaze who suggested the perimeter road would be quite good for cars. That Alfa Romeo that you're looking at there is actually the youngest of this lot uh, it's still 100 years old <laughs> But uh, 1923, we just saw it go uh, through the shot, and uh, it's the Alfa Romeo RLTF, which had a lot of success. Christian Mann uh, is driving it here this weekend. So although it is the, one of the younger of this particular batch, we are looking at a, a very elderly batch of cars, of course, here. But it's a very pretty Alfa Romeo. I like to, Ben, the fact that they bought the car when it was around 25 years old, and it's added another 75 since then in under-man family ship. 
family ownership. So uh, he knows the car and you can just imagine it's great to have a place to come out and race. So the driver's starting to pick up the pace as they come down at full speed or as close to full speed as they dare out of the chicane to start their first flying laps. But as we heard beforehand from uh, Duncan Pittaway, he was mentioning that his mighty 28 litre Ferrari uh, beard was like a Ferrari, frankly, because it would accelerate out of the chicane to the start finish line as fast as an AC Cobra. But thereafter, they would carry on accelerating. He'd be trying to get some braking done before approaching the first of the two right handers at Madrid. See quite a gathering now all together. I actually just saw Mark Walker just up ahead of him. Uh, with that uh, Dadak that uh, we were talking about down in the assembly area, he's, he's pushing on quite well. So some of the drivers do get to sort of sit in a cockpit, others sit right on top of it, don't they? Yeah, brings out that phrase, luxury, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My day, etc. But yes, they really do sit up high. And again, it's fantastic because these are hugely physical cars to drive and the phrase all arms and elbows fits very well indeed. Mark Walker on your screen, land speed record car from yes i'll say it again 1905 the derrick and look at the size of the steering wheel if you had a small wheel you would not get that car around the corner you'd have to be mr or mrs universe to do that but mark very physical and the amount of constant directional change then it is remarkable and a, a car this old 1905 but it's rapidly running around this goodwood circuit it looks like something out of a, a, an old movie, doesn't it? You know, with that, that, that water radiator sitting on the top. You just think, surely it was never made like that, but it was. In, entirely so, but again, just going back to the physical nature for these drivers, look how little support he gets from his seat. He, yeah. It's only the bottom part of his back. You think any modern racing car, the support you get around your shoulders and your torso, um, but he's working hard. Again, he's got to try and find some space on the track. He's just behind the number six um, Hudson Super 6 to be in Barn Fourth. We'll want to get past that under acceleration. To have that clear line that, so you can pick your line through the two right-handers at uh, Matchwick and a great exit from the chicane. That's exactly what he was telling us, wasn't he? How quick it is out of the chicane and it proved it there as he just accelerates down the straight and he's got a handbrake uh, usually on there. You can see he's onto the, onto the brake. It's not on the pedal, I would think. Um, on this car, but he's the, one of the other aspects which you can really see as well, just how narrow the tyres are. So the G-forces, uh, yes, you say, he has no body support. He has a bit of pumping for the fuel, no doubt. Um, but the, the G-forces through the corners are not that high because these tyres are really narrow. No, they're not. And again, you can see, if anyone thinks Goodwood is flat, yes, it's largely on flat ter level terrain, but there are little rises and falls, most notably into and out of St Mary's. But between the first part of Madrid and the second part, the car goes into a little compression. You can see actually just then that uh, Mark Walker was having to adjust the steering because the front didn't want to turn in. Now, the Beast of Turin, never knowingly understated. 28 litres of soar away fun and... Uh, Duncan Pittaway trying to keep his head down and also trying to keep it inside the sort of envelope of the car because you get a lot of flame out of the exhaust. They're on the other side, but you just don't want that uh, roasting your helmet. It is a remarkable machine, nearly two metres high up to the top of the bonnet. And it's four-cylinder engine of that capacity. So each each cylinder is, is seven litres, 7,000 cc. Uh, 7,000 cc for each cylinder, and there are four of them. It just seems unbelievable, doesn't it? And, and it... it did it did what it was designed to do which was set land speed records but but the design and the thoughts of what to do with motor cars did start to change then oh totally and in fact if it's fired up next to you you can almost feel the air being sucked out of the atmosphere to, to feed that mighty 28 liter engine Fiat s76 one of the stars of goodwood you can find them in the special goodwood motor circuit garages just um behind the the pit in building and uh, in fact you almost have to he almost has to duck to get out of it within the garage absolutely back in the racing days they started uh, introducing limits to weights for example that did have a bit of an effect sometimes they would reduce uh, have limits on capacity or well, not so much so early it was more about the weight of the cars wasn't it uh, yes constant but again it's it's still true today constantly change, yeah. changing and tweaking regulations to, to fit how many manufacturers want to play how to improve the breed uh, but certainly people over the years learnt lessons like don't start the small class cars at the front and again fabulous super slow-mo shots you can see the bodywork flexing and the, the sheer heat haze coming out of the side of that mighty beast of Turin the Fiat S76 no wonder it draws the cameras yeah Mark Walker's just gone fastest in the Darak the car that you don't bother writing down what color it is it has no bodywork that is uh, has lapped under two minutes one minute 55.8 seconds Julian Majou is second fastest. Mark Walker still working his craft out of St Mary's into the dip, up the rise towards Lavent, trying to position his car for, again, 
one of those tricks of Goodwood. Corner with two apexes, he's hitting the first one now, in fact, keeping slightly wide, but you can see even in the straight line between the two corners, he's working away to get the car as attached to the road as it possibly can be. Yeah, he's doing a fantastic job, and as you say, having set the pace uh, by a decent margin so far, but you did warn us that Julian Majub would be quick in the in his Sunbeam, and he certainly is. He's, uh, he's up there in second place in the Sunbeam Indianapolis at the moment. Third place currently is James Collins in the Hudson Super 6. And then in fourth position, we've got Ben Collins, who's in the uh, the Blitzen Benz, as the Mercedes 200 horsepower Blitzen Benz. That's another remarkable machine. They are all remarkable, to be honest. But it's lovely to see that. Dunk Pitaway with the uh, the Fear Beast. He's currently eighth fastest, but uh, still setting the pace is this man, Mark Walker. Let's just see if this lap is any different. 155.8 is what he has done so far. Yeah, he goes a fraction quicker again, a 155.6 this time. And, and it, yeah, that's a good advantage. It certainly is. And uh, in fact, Duna Majub had closed the gap. It was two and a half seconds, went down to just under one, and then it's back to 2.2. Now, riding on board, how much bodywork would you like? Have we left it in the garage? No, but this a fantastic shot. Again, you can just see the complexity of, well, it's actually, Ben, it's the simplicity of the equipment in front of the driver. He doesn't need to touch it unless something is going wrong. But you can see now what he's trying to do here is concentrate to get the line a kink at the Lavent straight, which as we know isn't straight. A straight doesn't have a kink in it, but that's what it's called here. He's taking the outside line, and again, you can see not much slipstreaming here. Uh, that's right. There's not much difference between these two cars, interestingly, in a straight line, and he may just be able to squeeze through on the inside. Yes, he can, going past Matt Johnson in the De Dion uh, Bouton Curtis. Curtis. This is Archie, though, the youngster, 17-year-old, who has gone through there in the Mercedes, the number four car. This is the Mercedes 60 horsepower, tremendous history um, of the Gordon Bennett Trophy in 1903. So, very historic machine, and he's doing a fine job so far, hanging on to it. Currently down in 15th place. Let's just see if this lap goes any better for him. Although he had to deal, obviously, with a little bit of traffic, comes across the line now. And, uh, yeah, no, it stays, stays pretty much the same. They're virtually the same lap time he'd just done. Yeah, interesting thing. Couple uh, last year during the um, during this particular race, that car broke the land speed record of the year of its birth, 1903, 89 miles an hour. Maybe it was best not to tell Archie that he's going to be driving something that could almost hit 90 miles an hour in a straight line when you're sitting, well, quite clearly atop on board that car. Oh, he's a confident young man. I think he feels quite happy with it, doesn't he? He's uh, he's thoroughly looking forward to this weekend, having this opportunity to get out in the car. Uh, his dad is currently. As you say, uh, doing a good job as well. He's sixth fastest at the moment uh, in one of the other Mercedes. And we've got 21 cars have all managed to set a pace somewhere along the line so far. We haven't seen Nicholas Pellet be able to set a lap time as yet. I think there was a problem for his car. Yes, he got through the first timing sector and pulled off, which is a shame. That's the car in which Ken L. Liet Guinness drove to victory in 1914 in the Tourist Trophy. It's not racing, but it looks like that. It's official practice, but uh, taking uh, no prisoners there. Mark Walker going past one, two cars, and again, just trying to keep the flow going as he goes through forward water. And again, always needing to have the spatial awareness to know who's around, because these cars don't corner quite as the drivers like it and he was aware there was a challenge from behind so he just moved out of the way and that's the car that's third fastest is, is it not number 66 the uh is it one of the two hudson's james collins on board so interesting they're very close at, they have different performance at different parts of the circuit which always makes for exciting racing this is on board with ben collins so the dad of archie and a very very experienced driver with these cars and owner of these types of car and uh this is going Pretty well for him at the moment, as I say, sixth fastest currently, giving you a wonderful view. It uh, moves around about, weaves around a little bit, chain driven. And the wind really picking up uh, his overalls as he comes on around. Huge exhaust pipes. Uh, those front wheels are wobbling away a little bit, but it all looks okay. I must say, with some of these cars being as tall as they are, I asked one of the drivers beforehand, I said, it's quite blowy today. He said, yes, yes, crosswinds will be a factor. They may help, they may hinder, but uh, again, if you're sitting down low, as some of the drivers are in the in the later cars in the SF Edge race, like the number 23, Alfa Romeo, the RLTF we talked about earlier, Christopher Mann on board. He is almost with, enclosed within the car, just helmet and uh, right arm out of the side. 
and he's going very well. Fifth fastest at the moment. Needs to find six seconds, which he won't do. He'll find some of that fraction um, on this lap. He seems to be picking up his pace. In fact, he's uh, the next car above him in fourth place is Duncan Pitaway in the Beast of Touring. We've still got the number 66, Hudson, in third place. James Collins, second place, still Julian Majub. Under two seconds down on that man who's fastest. Car 200 with Mark Walker on board. The mighty Derek from, yes, let's repeat the year, 1905 and still flying. So across the line he goes, and uh, it was a good lap, but it wasn't quite quicker than the one he'd already done. So stays in fifth place for now. Just a minute and a half to go in this session as these remarkable elderly machines are putting in more and more laps. Now, Duncan Fitzway has got himself into fourth place in this the beast in the Fiat, just waving someone through. It is their awareness of other cars is, is fascinating. You have to be so few. Hardly any of the cars have mirrors on them, of course. They didn't have mirrors when they were racing. And uh, you've just got to have that total awareness, more like being on a bike, really, than in a car. It is, but obviously, with almost all of them sitting above their cars, they do have quite clear line of vision should they find a point where they can turn slightly in, the, in one of the tighter corners, for example, to see Czech, who's uh, coming around behind. So Duncan Pitaway in fourth place uh, takes the inside line, and Ben Collins goes around the outside. Car number three, the fabulous Blitz and Benz, the 200 horsepower car from the one of several from the Auto and Technic Museum. Yeah, it's lovely that they bring these cars to Goodwood that we can actually see and hear them rumbling along. Um, and they don't have huge amounts of power, as we tend to think, but they have a huge amount of torque, they, these huge engines. They really pull away. Very low revs. A lot of these engines will only rev to maximum of sort of 2,000 revs. Yeah, exactly. It's it's very hard to get your head around, but they've been doing things very differently. In fact, Ben Collins has been doing things not just very different, but uh, rather better. He's just improved last time around. Third position at the moment he's got to find another two and a half seconds to challenge Julian Michoud brilliant shot back to see the office for the day for Ben <laughs> Collings and you can see like all of these drives just constantly adjusting you don't put it in and rely on the tyres and the downforce because the tyres offer very little and there is pretty much no downforce whatsoever no not at all that was something that didn't come along for quite a while wasn't it but uh, as you say this this picture the images that we've got from on board this Mercedes are absolutely fabulous and as the weather is brightening up even more here today it is a lovely opportunity as we see the checkered flag now coming out on the sf edge trophy and so top of the charts at the moment having taken the checkered flag one minute 55.6 is mark walker but julian majoub who's second fastest he's nearly two seconds down but just banged in the fastest first sector of anyone in that sunbeam indianapolis car number 25 he's still got at least half the lap to go but i'm starting to think that mark Mark Walker may not take pole position in this official practice. Let's see. That's a good point. You did warn us right from the beginning that Julian could be setting some pretty rapid times in the Sunbeam Indianapolis. Uh, his middle sector is good. It's not the fastest of all, but I think you're right. He's going to be up there again. He is currently second fastest. His gap is 1.9 seconds, Majou. There he is. So let's just watch. Let's just see the end of this lap. Is this going to be enough to actually snatch pole position? He comes into the chicane. Looks calm, looks as though he's enjoying himself. Out to the curb, I'm not sure. Let's just see how the exit goes. Is this going to be enough to snatch that pole position as he takes the chequered flag? Yes, he does. Well, well spotted there, Bruce. He's done it by, what, six-tenths of a second? He did, and again, it was neat and tidy. That's Julian doesn't seem to have to work this car quite as some of the others do, or maybe it's just he's got great tyres and he has so much experience with this car. And uh, Julian, always competitive, as is Mark Walker. Ben Collins uh, would be delighted with third place yeah, too. But that was a move up, wasn't it? Uh, it? It was. It was a couple of laps ago. Didn't quite achieve any improvement on the final lap. But again, interesting, very interesting. It's only a five-lap race, but to be at the front at the start is one thing. The other is, the thing is getting off the line. We talk about these cars having torque, so it should be their advantage, but that's often matched with an enormous amount of weight. So it's always a mix-up, the SF Edge race off the grid at the start of the race, but we have not one, but two of these races this weekend. That's going to be special. It is. It's going to be great fun to watch these cars racing against each other and seeing if they can make it all the way to the end. The number nine car, a bit further down the order, down in 17th place. That's the Bentley 3-litre. But this is really a version of the original Bentley racer uh, that, that didn't fully exist, but that has got parts from it, from those original uh, Bentley TTs. And, of course, Bentley went on to tremendous success in motorsport, in Le Mans particularly in the 1920s, didn't they? Uh, they really did. They dominated. The French had many, many cars in the race, but the Bentleys, they just seemed to find their happy hunting ground. 
course, uh, this weekend we've got a special celebration for, for Bentley coming up very soon indeed. But uh, again, a great mix of brilliant cars and driven really very well. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you have to admire the bravery. If anyone is prepared to take cars like this out on track, no harnesses, um, safety so different from how it is in modern motorsport. And yet they love being out there. They're careful, they're cautious and they have delivered some very good laps indeed. And it's Julian Majub who has come up with the fastest time by half a second here in the end. On that very, very last lap, he put together a great little sequence to snatch pole position. So here we are, let's take a look at how the uh, grid in theory will line up. Mark Walker, second fastest in the dark. Ben Collings, uh, who improved in that cream-colored Benz 200 horsepower, the Blitzen Benz. James Collins, good job in his Hudson Super 6 and the huge Fiat, fifth fastest in the end, ahead of Christopher Mann, uh, James Baxter, Neil Goff, the top 10 completed by the Mercedes and by the Hudson Super 6 of Ian Balmforth. Rob Hubbard next to up, uh, Archie Collins, the youngster, he was 13th fastest in the end. Marcus Black in his Sunbeam down in 19th position. Andrew Howe Davis in 20th place in the Straker Squire TT racer. And that's uh, our top 20 for the SFH. Let's just take a little look back at some of the highlights of that. Just so lovely to see these ancient machines getting out on track and showing us uh, what they could do. They certainly all started off fairly gently, built it up gradually, uh, but it was good to watch. And Mark Walker in particular was pushing all the way really from the start setting initial pace then collings in the mercedes the museum owned mercedes this one he put in some great laps particularly towards the end he went third fastest at the end we thought that walker here would end up with pole position because he held on to that top spot for quite a long time in this remarkable darak 200 horsepower v8 engine some 25.4 liters engine size absolutely massive but a car from 1905 but the fastest in the end uh, was Julian Mazur. So it's great that uh, it looks as though most of the cars didn't have too many technical problems. I think one or two had, but uh, they will hopefully get that sorted out for when it comes to uh, the races, the two races that they will be doing over the course of this weekend. Well, at least they'll have access, easy access to the engine bay because it wasn't an engine bay, there was just an engine back in the Edwardian racing days. And uh, again, the camaraderie in the paddock will suggest if anything is needed from other, other crews, they will do their best to get the cars out. But a really, really good run there from Julien Majou. But uh, yes, you said a couple of cars had problems. Uh, number 12 was one that didn't make it the whole way through to the end. Talked earlier about number 44, Nicholas Pellet in the Sunbeam. Uh, tourist trophy and number 12 was the the morse that we saw from oh, the outset yes. with the um charlie charlie martin's car with the uh well exposed everything <laughs> exposed everything yes and unpolished uh, shall we say yes yes very a very original form um but it's a shame i hope i hope the car's all right i hope they can get it rough and running we want to see as many of them as we can out there but it's always going to be a question as to whether they will make it so uh Alice, uh, who was with us in the commentary box earlier on, is about to go out on track. As you can see, Alice Powell is going to be driving this Porsche with uh, David Green alongside her, who presents uh, for our coverage over the course of the weekend. And it's a nice opportunity for Alice to go and show us what it is to drive around the Goodwood circuit. They'll be filming this on board as well. And this will all be uh, part of what the uh, TV crew are putting together for this weekend and explaining everything for everybody who might be watching. It's lovely to have you with us, whether you're watching online or whether you're here at the circuit with us. Um, and we're about to see Alice go out, just do a, a couple of laps with David and they can have some fun and see what it's all about. And we're going to see plenty more Porsches coming out later on. There's a, a Porsche demonstration that's coming up later. We've got other great events too. The GT1 demonstration this evening, I think, all three of us might be working on that. Actually, uh, Bruce, you're going to be with me. Harry Benjamin is going to be taking over from me in a in a few moments' time, so we can all chat about the uh, the GT ones as well. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be very evocative. Hopefully, the weather will stay fair, and we will have them going properly into into sunset. Because yeah. of course, you think about the races they competed in. Yeah. Well, you uh, you were at so many of the Le Mans at that time. I was, and I did racing. the uh, FIA GT series when uh, it was becoming 
great, great fun. Good. He said. Well, Including great. some strange tracks. Helsinki, that was a, a weird one around sort of nowhere. Wow. Wow. OK, well, let's go back down to Ed Foster now. Tom Christensen, Guy Smith, next to the 2003 Bentley. This car must bring back so many happy memories from that victory. Let's start with you, Guy. Yeah, it's um, it, what a beautiful car. Uh, I think every time we see it, um, it brings back so many great memories. Uh, it still looks beautiful today, you know, almost 20 years on, um, but it looks, uh, it looks absolutely fantastic. So Tom's going to get to drive it today, so uh, um, hopefully he'll, uh, he'll enjoy it and have a good day. Tom, talking of beautiful, we've just been commenting on your jacket, which is one of the original 2003 jackets. Yeah, and obviously not a tight fit, but that was modern 20 years ago, and I was touching on it. It's 20 years since uh, since we won with that great uh, great car at the race, which also with uh, I'm uh, honored to serve as Grand Marshal for the 100th um, anniversary or centenary at the 24 Hours of Le Mans this year. So there's a lot of things to to celebrate and um, and look back at. At the same time, you also have a, a very hot race coming on at the at Le Mans this year. A lot of uh, a lot of manufacturers, a lot of boardrooms and uh, car manufacturers around the world have got the idea that uh, that we need to come back at Le Mans. So it's it's really fantastic. Uh, you drove so many cars in Le Mans, but when you get in behind the wheel, does it all suddenly fit and make sense again? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. It actually, it, all these senses come back to you very, very soon when you are back in the car. And you can just the engine, the build up, all these things, and then the sensation of what comes through the steering wheel and the paddles. It comes pretty, pretty fast again when you are back in the car. And obviously, with Bentley, with the history, uh, fastest lap at the very first race with, with John Duff in 1923. And then winning the following year, the first victory for Bentley in 1924. And then you have it again, 27, 28, 29, 30. And then there was a little bit of a gap until the, what we call maybe the modern Bentley boys. So we also could get invited into the Savoy Hotel to have a, a great celebration. God, it must be it must be amazing to be part of that history because of all the manufacturers out there, Bentley has such a long and illustrious history, and this being one of their high points. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, just saying, I've been reading a lot of the, the the books about the Bentley boys, about the history, and I think when we all got involved with the program, we um, you know we kind of really felt a responsibility to kind of do the, those those guys justice. Um, and I think we you know we've done that. We had a, obviously a fantastic race. I think we also had a lot of fun. I think um, you know Tom Dindo and the, the other guys. We really enjoyed our time at Bentley and uh, certainly had a lot of fun. And um, I'm obviously very you know great honour for me to share a car with this Le Mans legend. Um, and uh, sure. yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely a great time. Guys, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Jake Hill, this, this race is a firm favourite with the fans, but I'm guessing for you as a driver, seeing you drive this last time, this must be one of your favourites as well. It is amazing, yeah. I mean, once the Jerry Marshall, now the Gordon Spice Trophy, it's a fantastic race, and the members' meeting is my favourite meeting, really, of the whole year. So cannot wait to be back in this car, um, and obviously qualifying coming up now, so get stuck in and have a bit of a go. Watching last time, do, does a Capri kind of reward aggressive driving? Um, more so than the big stuff, you know, the, the big Camaros and Mustangs, you have to be a bit smoother with it. There's a lot of car to move. The Capri is for sure a much more nimble car, better on the brakes, but obviously not as much power. So um, to get the lap time out of it, you do have to hustle it quite hard. There's no mistake about that, but I like to think I do a pretty good job of that. Hustle it quite hard in front of the owner. Exactly. No, Rick Wood, obviously the... Um, yeah, the one and only, you know, he's, he's built an incredible Capri and uh, I'm very thankful to him for letting me drive it. Cheers, Jack. Enjoy it. Thank you. Ollie Bryant, you're about to go out, just getting strapped in. Um, 
Do you have to do a bit of a master reset every time you drive this? Because it, it's not really like anything else, is it? Yeah, it's certainly a bit different. You know, it weighs weighs a, weighs a ton and uh, certainly doesn't stop as well as most other cars that I race. But it's uh, always fantastic to drive. Um, last year I was sharing with Darren in the two-driver race and uh, unfortunately had an engine problem early on, so we had to retire. So uh, just doing it on my own today with the heat and then uh, hopefully get through to the final tomorrow. I guess qualifying is that bit more important now because you haven't got the longer race. Yeah, I think it's certainly, yeah, that would be important. I mean, they're very wide cars, these, so you certainly want to be near the front. Otherwise, uh, getting past would be tricky. So, uh, yeah, the plan is get out there. I'm, I'm unfortunately down the back of the queue here, so I'll be uh, have to find my way, get a bit of space and uh, try and get a clear lap in. But with only 15 minutes, you haven't got time to uh, spend too long planning for that. No messing around. Good luck. Thank you. Well, great to hear from uh, some of the drivers down on the ground. Welcome back to uh, the commentary box. Uh, and my name is Harry Benjamin. Uh, pleasure to uh, guide you through the next bit of action alongside me, Bruce Jones. And, uh, well, Bruce, I think if uh, you're a fan of Bentleys, uh, well, you found the right place to come. Uh, celebrating, well, 20 years since Bentley's sixth victory at Le Mans, about to come up with a couple of spectacular cars on demo. One we've seen before, which is the winning Speed 8. And, of course, one you haven't seen before. It's the latest and greatest. Oh, well, let's, should we spoil the, spoil the fun? Let's do. It's going to be a Continental, but a really rather special one. I must say, when I took to covering GT racing uh, back about oh, half a dozen years, it was great. And those Bentley Continentals, they didn't look like racing cars next to some of those. They seemed to be so large, but by gosh, they could corner. And they were such popular cars and great success. About 2018, I think they were top of the charts in the GT World Challenge. And again, the, the, the heritage that started back in the 1920s. Bentley were a little bit ambivalent about racing, but they took to it. Le Mans became their happy hunting ground. But then, of course, 2003, one of the sleekest cars ever to compete at Le Mans happened not just to win it, but a 1-2. So very much looking forward to this uh, Bentley demonstration. It, we two laps plus an in-lap. And the beauty of the demonstrations, Harry, at Goodwood is um, it's not a little parade. They're encouraged to drive not at full speed but close enough for the engine note and the car to behave as it should a racing car well th this is my first ever goodwood members meeting i don't know if i should be saying that out loud or not but already just walking around the paddock and seeing the huge difference in uh, cars and machinery from bygone eras you know and i know we're going to focus on the bentleys but they do catch your eye a little bit they're just a little bit separate from everything else they just sort of have that glint the green livery as well it's just something about a bentley that does linger your eye for a little bit longer well it does and to be honest of course british racing green was uh, predominant in the 1950s and then of course with sponsorship coming in suddenly the lotuses weren't in that color anymore so it was great to have that color back and they actually stood out by not being gaudy if you want in the pit lane and i remember they their garages were down by pit in and uh, they just really as the sun hit them worked very well indeed it was lovely having history repeated but in a sort of continuation it, it was Bentley it wasn't we've got quite a few uh, marks coming in that are just reinventions of previous marks that doesn't get a tick in my box but Bentley rock solid 100 years and great to see the cars oh well, we uh, heard Ed talking to uh, Guy Smith a little earlier on of course one Le Mans in 2003 with uh, Bentley alongside Bernardo Capello and Tom Christensen who was also down there too so which one drives the car we're still wait to see but uh, either way there's going to be some pedigree behind the wheel oh absolutely um, I believe Tom actually said uh, put his hand up that he's driving it today so we'll find out who's driving it tomorrow but they'll all be looking to do that now my appetite was wetted, but it'll have to be held a little longer because the Bentleys are now going to go for their demonstration after the cars you can see on the screen right now. The cars, the mighty touring cars from 1970 to 1982 in the first of two heats for the Gordon Spice Trophy. Well, that would make a little bit more sense considering we heard from Jake Hill as well earlier on too, just before this. So, yes, well, after 10 successful years, I think it was, for the Jerry Marshall Trophy, it's... Uh, well, the Goodwood's Group A touring car race uh, has had a bit of a makeover, really, hasn't it? Um, and after a decade of commemorating the life of a touring car legend, uh, we are now uh, commemorating the uh, the life and the celebration of the life of seven-time uh, British Saloon Car Championship racer and four-time Le Mans class winner, Gordon Spice. So the Gordon Spice trophy on the way. So two heats, as you say, for uh, Group 1 saloon cars of a type that race between 1970 and 1982. And uh, it's brilliant just to see the crowds filling up as well around this magnificent Goodwood track. The action has been non-stop so far and should be get, get, getting going in just a few moments. I must say, Harry, uh, the first 
of the revived members meetings uh, eight years ago, the 72nd members meeting. Uh, one of the hits was the Jerry Marshall tour, uh, touring car race. And the reason for that, for a lot of people, it was the, they hadn't heard the cars. They were put away when they were no longer current and didn't really race anywhere since. And for me, it was the engine notes. I remember the sound of the 3.5 litre Rover V8, but it was the harsh bark of the Ford 3 litre engine in the Caprice that I'd just sort of forgotten. But it was the, the, one of the theme tunes of my childhood. And uh, certainly for a lot of people, you tend to race in historics. The car that was your favourite car when you were, you know, in your teens, possibly your 20s. And a lot of the people here are of that particular vintage as well. Great to see Ludovic Lindsay here in one of many Capris in the, of course, in the liveries of the time. The Fabergé livery, Brute 33 sponsorship on that and not that car alone. That's what I love about being here at the members meeting so far is even though some of the liveries on the cars may have changed over the years, you know, a few of them have been restored to those original liveries that race and it really brings that a brilliant sense of nostalgia uh, as well. You can, you can see one of the uh, the Bentleys just in the background there, but that's coming, don't you worry, we'll keep that one up enough um, as uh, we await uh, in the assembly area to get up and running. Uh, and we heard from Jake Hill earlier, he's out in the 1980 Ford Capri 3.0 OS, uh, the uh, six-time touring car winner, so look out for him as well. Now, of course, just to highlight, uh, it's being done differently this year. We've got two heats. The first one for the big bangers, that's the Camaros, the BMW 530i, the Capris, the Rovers, etc., etc. And the second one is for the cars with smaller capacity engines. We're talking Triumph Dolomite Sprint, Alfa Romeo, Alfa Sud, VW, uh, Golf GTI, the Minis and the Fiestas. However, the first 15 from each of these will go through uh, in the race this evening. We'll go through to tomorrow's finale. So we'll have that lovely mixture that is always such a feature, the big and the small competing for a touring car race here. Absolutely. And some brilliant brands and manufacturers on display as well. We've got BMW, Chevrolet, Camaros. We've also uh, got, of course, Ford Capris, as you mentioned, Bruce. Uh, quite a lot of Ford Capris, I should say. So you'll certainly be seeing them out on track. Mustangs, we've got a Rover uh, 3500 as well. A uh, few of them out on track. So there really is something for everybody out there as uh, session gets underway 14 minutes on the clock and of course uh, they often say the cars are the stars but a lot of the drivers are the stars as well drivers have talked from the touring car days long ago in this championship are back to play with their machinery plus as we just heard from jake kill some of the very best of the modern generation but this is a one a lot of people were putting their hands up for and it was great for a reason for these cars to be sort of disinterred from their sort of dormancy and come back racing again and uh, again you can just hear the hard engine notes of the capris the more mellifluous sound of the larger three and a half litre in the lump in the rovers as well but they're going to get some heat into their tires it'll take a lap or two they've got 15 minutes in which to go and set a time and uh, you expect of course the camaros to be very very quick in a straight line they've got the biggest engine as all but then you've got the ford uh, Mustang Boss, the 302, tucked in behind. That's not short of horsepower either. No, another one to look out for as well. The number 88, that caught my eye. Uh, the, Ro the Rover SD1. Uh, that's actually the 1982 French touring car winner. Uh, and uh, it's actually run on synthetic fuel. So there we've got sort of uh, some of these uh, more retro cars of the era. Advanced technologies being brought in and, and creating a bit of a hybrid technology. Yeah, well, that's actually been a feature about the past two or three years. Uh, I noticed, I think, there's a Delage running into in, in the Nuvolari trophy race and so on and so forth. So great to have this modern mix, and maybe it's something they might all need to do in years to come. But right now, the horsepower is being applied. The first car to cross the start-finish line was car number 24. That um, is uh, Graham Scarborough in a Capri. Not necessarily the fastest, but he was clever enough to be first in the collection area, so first out on the track, but certainly... The Camaros, you can see the heat is in their tyres and they're now starting to venture towards the edge of the circuit. This is in the period Oymig uh, livery. One last year, the Z28 Chevrolet Camaro, Jack Tetley. The car that was actually on pole at uh, the Spa 24 hours back in 1978. It's got pedigree, it's got horsepower. Question is, Harry, has it got enough grip? Well, absolutely. The time is starting to come in as well as we uh, get the uh, first few sector splits. But we are following uh, that number 28 car, as you say, Bruce, the winner from last year, um, and was actually driven way back in the 1978 Spa 24 hour race as well. Pole with uh, Hedy Hems, and she actually became the first Dutch touring car champion, too. So this car uh, with a lot of pedigree behind it too uh, coming through at the moment the number 28 and it's actually jake hill who uh, sets the first lap time goes quickest we're in the 127 sevens to start off with hill to the top ahead of whitaker and scarborough but uh, plenty more lap times to come as i said the driver's waiting to get heat in their tires but not jake hill he was confident enough to go around 2.3 seconds faster 
than car 19, which is uh, Mike Whit Michael Whitaker in one of the Rover three and a half litres. Scarborough, Graham Scarborough, car 24 is third fastest at the moment. The times are going to keep on changing, and so they do. The white and black Ford Boss, Mustang, Boss Mustang of uh, the Hart family is up into second place. Olivier Hart driving Father David's car. So he's 1.1 seconds down on Jake Hill. They're the fast duo at the moment. Here is Jake Hill. We're watching him now in that Ford Capri Mark III uh, looking very good. The car is actually an exact copy of the 1980 Racing Capri race. That Spa, many of the original parts being used. Uh, 7,800 RPM, four-speed gearbox, max speed with uh, 138 miles per hour that you can get up to on that. Will he get round that uh, in this... Uh, Tricky. Goodwood is tricky, and he's going purple even uh, first sector, second sector. No, he's not. Well, he's just had to back out two cars up ahead of him there, maybe taking longer to get heat in their tyres. He's going to possibly die through before the chicane. This lap has been wrecked. He's just come up behind Rennie, the ex Rennie Metcher, uh, French Championship winning rover. That maybe won't obstruct him, but it, this is an opportunity for David Hart and another of the Boss Mustang drivers. Uh, Fred Shepard to see what they can do. They're second and third at the moment, but it is about a lot of cars on track and they do take quite a lot of space. They do, and that's the thing I've noticed so far about this Goodwood track is it, it looks so much fun. And you were mentioning earlier how, you know, it may, you may think it's quite flat as well, but actually the undulations too, as we see Jake Hill and the rear of that Capri getting all out of shape coming through the right hander and then getting blocked. And you can see there uh, a bit of frustration being shown through how hard he's working that steering wheel down the inside through the chicane and he'll have to go again but it's a bit ominous for Jake Hill at the moment he was purple in sector one and sector two before that and is still fast ahead of Whitaker Hart Tetley and Shepard uh, currently the top five nine and a half minutes left well Michael Whitaker was in the uh, Sanyo livery uh, rover he's 0.8 of a second down in second place and so many great liveries the Belga and Bastos liveries famous of course in the Belgian race the Belgian brands the Spa 24 hours and the Belga Capri being driven beautifully at the moment. It's about bouncing it. Nick Jarvis driving that very, very well indeed. But car 19, the fastest of the Rovers, second fastest overall. He's improved in the first sector, but isn't as fast as Jake Hill. The gap he's got to find is eight tenths of a second. He may close that gap, but Jake Hill is on a cool down lap after that traffic. But the next one from the 1-2-3 Gitan Livery Capri will be the fast one. Again, you can just see he's got past the Rover on that lap, the Marlboro Rover. Jake is stuck in traffic, quick traffic, but he's the quickest of all. Now he's moved ahead of another of the Capris. He has clear track ahead of him. He's found that space. Let's see what Hill can do. He was following Jack Tetley's progress as well in the uh, Chevy Camaro. He's currently in fourth position. He was looking very fast, but I think he might have had to bail out of his last lap. So uh, keep an eye on Tetley as well, currently in fourth. Uh, Rob Huff just behind him as well in fifth. So time's changing all the time, and we've got a car in the barrier. It's the David Hart. Sorry, Olivier Hart driven uh, Camaro nose into the barrier, having gone in tail first. That was third fastest, and that will um, cause, well, we'll see what flags are put out. They have clear line of sight, but the car is in a position that, from which it needs to be moved. Red flag, I'm not surprised, yeah. because Woodcut, you've come all the way down the lap and straight, you're trying to hang on, and then suddenly, if the car's parked on the outside, absolutely the right decision. Eight minutes of uh, qualifying remain. However, the red flag is out. So let's just refresh, Harry. At the top, we've got the 1-2-3 Capri and Jitain livery for Jake Hill. Fastest by eight tenths of a second from the number 19 Sanyo Rover of Michael, son of Mike Whitaker. And uh, Olivier Hart, third fastest, but with his tail in the rubber on the outside of the circuit. Then Jack Tetley was starting to wind it up. You picked that one out nicely, Dave. Uh, Harry and Jack Tetley there up into fourth place. But they've got to get a move on because eight tenths is a gap between first and second. The next group of cars... They're up to one and a half seconds uh, down to car number 17 is one and a half seconds down on pole. It, that is in seventh place. So an advantage for the race, the, the practice leader and the rest have got to play catch up. But of course, it's only eight minutes and 12 seconds remaining when they get out. Some of that will be gobbled up by the outlap and then getting the heat back in the tyres. The and space. then. There we go. Well, good to see uh, Olivier out of that. Uh, number four Camaro as well, uh, looking like he's taking a big bit of damage to that rear end and, and the front then going into the tyre barrier. So there'll need to be a little bit of work by the marshals done to just uh, rejig that barrier too. But red flag, everybody slows down and we'll come back into the pit. The time stops, but we hold at eight minutes and 12 seconds remaining. I was keeping an eye on... Um, uh, Graham Scarborough through that session as well. He's also in the, he's the 81 uh, Capri, the number 15. He was looking very fast, but then quickly got shuffled down. And it shows actually just how quite 
tight it is in that mid pack. A couple of tenths here and there, and you go way down. He's currently in ninth, but he was up in third at one point. He was. He was the first driver out of the pits. There is Jake Hill in the pit lane, and uh, the Rick Woods crew will be uh, geeing him up. He doesn't need geeing up. He's driving that beautifully, but we did have that amazing tail out moment. Great for the cameras, great for the viewers, not so great for Jake. That was going to St. Mary's. So obviously that lap was a bit of a waste. And then, of course, Harry, he got traffic, traffic at the yeah. end of the lap. But, you know, it's the same for everyone. That's part of the good wood magic, isn't it? But I think you can see a little bit of a smile behind that helmet there for uh, Jake Hill. And uh, we're thinking uh, it might take a little bit of a while because you can just see how much it's not so much getting the car out, but it's replacing all the tires in the barrier, too. So uh, no one's run over to the car yet. Driver is out, um, but we can uh, hear from Jake Hill now, who we just saw a moment ago. He's down with it. Jake Hill, things seem to be going pretty well so far. Um, the car looks as though it's going very well, although quite sideways. Very sideways, that's how we do it. But yeah, I'm uh, absolutely loving it, Ed. You know, it's so good to be back in this car. Yeah, those opening few laps, we, you know, we wanted to be at the front of the queue just so we could get a bit of space. And obviously that's worked in our favor. So I believe we're P1 at the moment. Um, but yeah, still a bit of time to go. Everything's good, all attempts are good. I'm happy, just enjoy myself. How much is the traffic a problem? Yeah, it is a problem for sure. I mean, you know, there's, there's a massive variety in, I guess, drivers and cars um, on this grid at the moment, but um, it's, it's cool, it's part of it, you know, that's what it's all about. And yeah, just really enjoying it. There's some really quick guys behind me at the same time, so see if we can just stay here. Jake, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Right, let's see who else we can find. Um, how, let's, sorry, we're gonna squeeze on down. Um, we've got Ludovic Lindsay here. Let's, let's head on round here, Lee, follow me. Um, it's all quite tight in the pit, pit lane. Ludovic, I'm gonna try not to dent your door. Um, yeah, so, yeah, he's absolutely fine. Um, how's, how's the car going? Feels great. I was a bit nervous before because I haven't done any testing this year, and uh, it's just magic to be out there again. Just lovely. It's going great. Going great. Now, a lot of us kind of know you from winning the very first race, the very first revival in the ERA. Um, quite a broad, broad spectrum of cars you race, isn't it? I've been so lucky. I've been so lucky. I mean. Every, and even this is probably, in a way, the least valuable of all the cars, but probably as fun as the most expensive car. It's just, um, and against people like, you know, Jake Hill and all these sort of people, Rob Huff, I, I don't know, it's just magic to be here. And, you know, first time out this season as well. So I feel, feels great. So you haven't done any testing with this? No, I had a, a nasty skiing accident and then I've been away. And so um, this is it. This is my testing. Well, testing seems to go quite well. It was cheaper, isn't it? <laughs> I'll enjoy it. Thank you very much. Right, let's, uh, before I dent everyone's car doors, lead, why don't we carry on down, see who we've got here. Uh, let's come in from the other side. I think we've got James Thorpe in here. Um, yeah, how are we doing? I'll tell you what, Lee, you can probably get up on the, on the pit wall. Um, just, we're, we're just having a, having a look at all the time. It's, not taking it seriously. Everyone's taking it seriously, aren't they? That's you looking at the, uh, the the stopwatch. We pretend that we don't take it seriously, and then we get in the car, we take it seriously. And how's the car going? Uh, yeah, good. She's a big old bus, and uh, the brakes are rubbish after two laps, but it's fine. I didn't think you used the brakes in this. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to. Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and there's obviously quite a lot of other Camaros on the grid. Do you, do you try and stay close and, and watch what everyone's doing in qualifying? Um, I'm just trying to see where we are. I'd like to be in the top half, so I race tomorrow. That's my, that's my only goal. And I suppose that because it's a two-heat job, we've got the smaller engine cars coming out next. The key is just top 15, whatever happens. Yes, exactly right. That's my plan. Yes, yes. Best of luck. Thank you, thank you. Right, I think the marshals are still standing still, so why don't we carry on, see who else we can find. Um, follow me, let's, let's head a little bit further back. I think that's Mike Whitaker here. We spoke to him in the assembly area so we can see, excuse me, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, let's try and squeeze in. Sorry guys, having a very important, look at that, the service down here. They're even moving the car. Um, Mike, all seems to be going pretty well. Yeah, car's really good, really well prepared. Brakes are good, handling's good. She's just a little breathless on the straights, you know, against some of these other things. But yeah, it's going well, actually. 
I was about to say, usually as a racing driver, you come up with a whole host of excuses and you were listing all the wonderful things about the car, but you, you did blame the engine then. <laughs> well, no, the engine is as good as you can get, but it's, uh, you know, three litre V6. Um, but yeah, really sweet handling, flat through Ford water with a bit of a wiggle, which wakes you up on a Saturday morning and world's best racing circuit to do it at, so it's brilliant. I mean, it's a wonderful way to wake up, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. You don't need caffeine. <laughs> Mike, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Right, let's go and see Rachel, who's talking to Gordon Murray. What you make of members meeting? What brings them back each year? Under a minute, can you confirm or deny that happened? Well, I actually wasn't here, but my team manager, Herbie Blash, was. And I was speaking to Herbie yesterday, actually, and Herbie definitely remembers it. But uh, I think I took it with a pinch of salt because that is such a fast lap, you know. So when it happened, I was shocked. <laughs> shocked and pleased, I'm sure, yeah. as well. And, I mean, we've had such developments, haven't we, in the F1 cars today. And Adrian Newey actually said that there's so many restrictions that you have yeah. to put in place. Would you still want to be developing F1 kinds of... Well, apologies uh, if the audio was uh, a bit in and out there, having a few technical issues. Uh, so we'll pick up. Still under red flag conditions here for uh, the car in uh, in the barriers. That is being dealt with, so all pause for the time being. Uh, but brilliant to hear from uh, a few of the drivers down there. In uh, that's a bit of a, especially when two cars side by side, a bit of a narrow pit lane. But Ed doing a sterling job to get to those uh, drivers. Uh, brilliant to hear from uh, Ludovic Lindsay. Uh, keeping this is this is his testing session even though he's raced some pretty decent things in the past he has raced right across the board and the fact this is 25 years since the first goodwood revival and he was there winning that first race in the inaugural meeting that i like that level of history and continuity but yes the pit lane is super narrow we saw someone sitting aboard a stuart graham car we've done better than that we've now got ed to catch up with the man himself with stuart graham Stuart, I've just seen you wind, not even wind the window now. It's got electric windows. Surely you can lose some more weight out of this thing. Well, of course. Yes, but you see, I, I make up for that. <laughs> you do. I mean, you're very slight, but it's... I can't believe it's got electric windows. What other... Have you got aircon in here as well? No, and the radio's not working either, so... <laughs> you need to speak to the mechanics. I know, I do. You're quite right. <laughs> it must be like an old friend, this car. Well, it is really, yes. And, of course, Nigel had sold it. So, I mean, I wasn't driving it this weekend until the very last minute, and I got a last-minute call. Would I, you know, pop in this? So, um, here I am, unexpectedly. I was coming, but not to drive anything, which was quite relaxing thought, really. So, suddenly, I've had to get myself programmed into race mode again you know well some surprises are better than others aren't they oh yes it's all good fun it's wonderful i mean it's lovely to drive this thing you know it's great fun and we enjoy it and let's face it to get out there at goodwood is what we all look for isn't it Stuart, thank you cheers ed right lee if you can stay with me let's let's come down this way so i can see the shepherds father and son let's uh, speak to just interrupt everything sorry Bill, do you get more nervous watching Fred race or racing yourself? Uh, well, it depends on my bank manager's on the line telling me how much I owe. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's always worse outside of the car. After I've been driving for about 500 years, uh, I have to keep myself awake on the track. So I'm alive when I'm off the track. But, I mean, Fred's been doing so well with this car. and He was on the podium last year, so I guess expectations move, don't they? Uh, yeah, uh, everything's changed. The regulations have moved around to penalise some and not others, and uh, we're carrying a lot of weight, so he's got a bigger job to do. But he's good enough boy for it. Right, well, let's have a word with the man himself. I'm, uh, there's nothing worse than sitting around in an assembly area and someone coming to put a microphone in your face. Fred, how did the car feel? Uh, it, pretty good. The balance is nice. Uh, I think there's a lot of understeer out there. I think it's a bit greasy. Um, so I think Jake's up at the front. I would expect that probably with the Capri. I think, I think that's the car for the conditions at the moment. And your dad alluded to the fact that these Camaros are carrying a little bit more weight this year. Can you, do you notice that? Uh, I've certainly noticed it in this. Uh, brakes tend to fade. Trying to get it stopped is a difficult situation. Um, the balance is, is always nice. They're always nice cars to drive, but the lap time just falls away with weight, definitely. And is that, that is the weight in your passenger footwell. I don't know if Lee can see in there, but I guess the good thing about adding weight is you can add it where you want it. 
Uh, I guess so. Um, I'd rather just not have it at all, of course. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's it's what it is, and uh, you get on with it. And uh, it's a it's my little friend. It's my passenger I'm taking around. That's how I'm thinking about it. Fred, it could be worse. You could be carrying the weight all the time, like me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, enjoy it. Cheers. Thank you, Ed. Right. I think we've probably got enough time. Cheers, Bill. Uh, so, yep. We've still got a little bit more time. Oh, we've got Jack Tetley here, who's a former winner of the race. Um, very light, snazzy windows here. I won't touch those. Jack, how's it all going? Uh, apart from the fact that my brake pedal's going to the floor, um, everything's dandy. Yeah. Isn't that supposed to happen two laps in, not at the start? Uh, yeah, it seems to happen quite a lot in this car. Now we're about three and a half tonnes. It's uh, making the problem a bit worse. Yeah. And I can see, we were just talking to Bill in front of you. I guess that's your weight, your extra weight next to you. Yeah, I've got some in my pockets. Um, That'll be your wallet, isn't it? I've secreted it all over the place. Yeah, I'm a second-hand car dealer, so we do that. Um, if the brake pedal's going to the floor, I'd, I, are you hoping it's going to come to you? No, I think it's going to make me faster, if anything. Yeah, no braking. Right, well, look, Jack, enjoy it. Cheers, thank you. Right, I did hear a whistle there, but I think we're still okay, so I'll carry on. Um, we haven't talked to anyone in a Mustang yet, so we've got Craig Davies here, um, who had a great battle with Jake Hill, was it last year, year before? Oh, nearly lost the door there. Craig, how are we doing? How are you doing, Ed? Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. How's the car feeling? Um, we have got a problem with third gear. We're just kicking out of third gear, which is a real shame. So um, we've got to go out, just see how, stroke it round for a bit of qualifying and see if we can fix it for the race. Yeah, it's quite an important one, that, isn't it, for Lavent? Here is just what you need, yeah. So as soon as it goes in, it just kicks out for some reason. We've just had it all rebuilt and everything, so it's a bit of a shame, really. See if we can fix it, though, Ed, eh? <laughs> well, you'll just have to get a bit, bit stronger in your left arm, holding it in. Yeah, that's the trick, mate. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Best of luck. Like a one-hand paper hanger in a gale. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it. Well, look, I think we're just about to head back out, so that's all from the pit lane. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, engines are revving up and we're back underway. Green flag conditions uh, to get this uh, first uh, uh, qualifying uh, section done uh, and dusted. Jake Hill currently leading the way and leads the drivers out of the pit lane as well. But uh, fascinating to hear some of the issues that some of the drivers are carrying there. We just heard from Craig Davies, slight problem with third gear. Not really what you want, just as the session restarts. And I said just beforehand, there were eight minutes and 12 seconds remaining. Nothing of the sort. They've abbreviated it to just a five-minute restart. And for the last cars out of the pit lane, they'll only get four. So by the time you factored in an outlap that's probably going to be about one minute, 45 seconds, you can't afford to make a mistake on your full first full flying lap. So well, we've already seen that the fact is it's just not making a mistake, but it's how quickly can you get your tyres up to speed? Can you find the space on the track? You know, 30 cars down from one now. We've got one out. Um, how much can you find the space around this, you know, 2.4 mile track, 3.8 kilometres? Jake Hill certainly struggled in the early stages, managed to get a lap time in, but we know he can go a lot faster. And here, already struggling to find a little bit of track. Well, time. he is. We've got the two fastest cars in the first part of qualifying together. We've got the one, two, three, Jatan Capri in front, Jake Hill. Then we've got uh, tucked in behind the Sanyo Rover, Michael Whitaker driving that. But what I did espy in the pit lane was that uh, we know that Jake Hill, current touring car superstar, has a good history in the sport, but I spotted the drunk person who was talking through his door. His father, Simon Hill, for whom these would have been the cars of his childhood. This has been the stuff that he forced, he imbued into Jake. But Jake's having to keep on his toes here because certainly Michael Whitaker is very much enjoying the view. One of the triplex rovers has peeled off, so the restart wasn't good for them. I think that was the last one out of the pit lane. Uh, so very unfortunate there. That could be Adam Brindle, let's not guess, but I think it could well be his car. OK, well, we'll keep you up to date on that when we know a little bit more, but certainly uh, Hill and Whitaker, one and two, currently on the timing screens, have three minutes or so to try and better their times, along with everybody else in the field as well. OK, Jake Hill was actually being challenged by the rover. Now he's starting to wind it up and pull away. You could just see the attitude of the car. Just remember, Jake said sideways is how these need to be driven. Of course, the driver's in the, the heavier heavier than they were before. Camaro's, oh, oh, over, around, and is he going to touch the barriers? That is yeah. very unfortunate. He just started to pick up the pace, got to St Mary's, but unfortunately the track went right, and he didn't do it enough. Oh, dear. And the grass is definitely still... Oh, that's a big, big lot of damage to that front left as well. That is not going anywhere anytime soon. 
it's easy to forget the grass is still absolutely soaking wet in some parts of this track as well from the, the torrential rain we had yesterday. So you dip a tyre, you dip anything, and you are going flying. Let's see how it unfolded. He just lost the rear coming into the right-hander, and around it goes. Well, even in the dry, those barriers come, the, the tyre wall comes a beckoning very quickly. But you could just see, we're just commenting that he was picking up the pace, got the tail out. He knew he wanted the tail out a bit, but not that much in small increments, Harry. Zero to hero, or this, in this occasion, the other way around. Well, that's motorsport, isn't it? Fine margins define whether you win or lose. And unfortunately for Jake Hill, that looks like it's going to be an early end. But what does that mean for the rest of the session? Well, it looks like they're carrying on still. No, it's a red flag. Red flag, so uh, not too surprising there. And you can just see how disappointed he is. But he's red flagged it, but he's the guy in first. So <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom, but unfortunately with a red flag in two minutes, 11 seconds remaining, it's going to be tough for anybody to try and improve. And we've got another car out as well. well. That's Stuart Shelley Graham, Camaro. Late, late, late replacement for Rob Huff. But, you know, that wasn't done in the way Michael Schumacher Monaco all those years ago. This was uh, not to obstruct anyone else. He was clearly pressing on. In fact, his uh, time through the speed track was the fastest of all as he wound it up onto that first flying lap, having had the outlap from the pit. So Stuart Graham has uh, uh, probably wisely detected, again, having someone who's driven a car before, he raced that and fabulously so to win the Taurus Trophy many moons ago, but uh, he must have detected something. Second red flag, I'm sure, with two minutes and 11 seconds remaining, that must be that for qualifying. I would imagine so. Well, that was uh, Jake Hill's Ford Capri out, and there is Hill, uh, and we have seen confirmation on our timing screens that the session will not be restarted. So that is it uh, for Heat 1 here for the Gordon Spice Trophy practice session. But uh, at the moment, Hill out, but at the top of the timing screens ahead of Whitaker, Hart, Tetley, and Rob Huff, the top five, and you can just see the stricken car there. How quickly are they going to be able to, to repair that, Bruce? Well, Rick Wood's guys are excellent. This is their bread and butter. I think uh, Jake's not just disappointed. I think he's been quite winded because that was a real whip around. And uh, when you hit, hit the tire wall, it suddenly, you know, the car breaks a little bit, decelerating forces there. But I think the overriding sensation for Jake would just be disappointment. Just really starting to wind it up and go for it. And alas, into the barriers there. When I say barriers, I mean it's the tire wall quite clearly behind the retraining retaining uh, rubber wall. So it will not be restarted this session. We're waiting for confirmation of those qualifying positions. But as we understand it, car number one, two, three, Jake Hill's tattered and battered Capri is at the top of the charts. Let's take a look at the a replay again. Just starting to wind it up. Went to St Mary's and how much is too much? Well, that was too much. Round they go. Couldn't get the car to turn in to that first part of the corner quite wide you can take a wide line into that first apex but then it gets harder and harder to get it across the right to swing left but uh, on this occasion it was uh, quite clear that the tail was wagging the dog anything to do with tires do you think not quite being in the white right window for, for Ooh, what gives you that idea harry yes entirely so i thought he was brave to pick it up he's had the sanya rover almost catching him but then he suddenly as he approached ford water was clearly going for it by the time he got to the next corner around it went and uh, the huge disappointment on uh, young Jake's Hill. He will bounce back. The car, let's hope, will bounce back for uh, an overnight rebuild. But then again, no, it doesn't need an overnight rebuild. It's supposed to be racing this afternoon in the first of the heats, don't forget. So they haven't got time as their friend. No, they haven't. Well, uh, it was uh, uh, certainly glory to uh, not so much glory for Hill at the end of the day. Uh, but red flag, that has ended that session early with two minutes on the clock. Cars making their way back to uh, the pit lane and then being pushed back uh, into uh, their positions back in the uh, Park May and uh, Paddock areas. Well, this is how it ended then. Jake Hill on top in that Ford Capri, 127.7 ahead of a, a Rover with uh, Michael Whitaker and a Chevy Camaro, with their leading Chevy Camaro of Olivier Hart, who was also out early from this session in third in front of Tetley, Rob Huff uh, and Olivia Oliver Bryant, the top six ahead of Shepard, Thorpe, Scarborough and Ludovic Lindsay, who uh, we heard down in the pit lane using this as a bit of a testing session, having not raced in a while, but a top 10 starting uh, position is not too shabby. Whitaker just behind him in the Ford Capri, then it's another Chevy Camaro, Stuart Graham in 12th. Uh, John Spears in 14th of the Ford Capri. Uh, BMW 530i, Nicholas Padmore down in 15th, head of sleep. Thistleweight Davies, Fowler and De Borman in 20th. Just in front of Nick Jarvis, Adam Brindle in uh, another Rover 3500SD in 22nd. James Colburn, Welby, Means, Jarvis, Saunders, Bravel and Jack Young in the Volvo down in 29th and a little bit off the pace of those in front of him.
Well, let's take a look back then. It was Jake Hill off to a very good start in that Ford Capri, really ringing the reins of that uh, Group 1 saloon cars, all of a type that raced between 1970 and 1982 here in the Gordon Spice uh, Trophy. And the number 19 was certainly keeping him, uh, Michael Whitaker, uh, at an arm's length, but closing, closing, closing all the time. A few mistakes made in the end. Red flag central. And a session that had to end early because of Jake Hill finding the barriers. And around he went. Not the best end of the day, but he was fastest. We're now on to heat two of the Gordon Spice Trophy for the smaller engine cars. And there are few drivers and cars better known than Swifty and this Mini. Um, I don't want to know your lottery numbers, actually, because if you were that lucky, it would have carried on raining. <laughs> I know. I saw that yesterday. and It was like, why wasn't that? Well, actually, it's not today. In the small car grid, I think we'd, there's some real quick cars here, and we can have a fantastic race the, this evening for our heat two. But it's tomorrow. You know, when we're all mixed in with the big cars, that's when we've got to do the rain dance. And we're looking for a nice little shower just as we're in the collecting area. Fantastic. Perfect. And when you're in this heat, is there quite a lot of drafting? Uh, yeah, I had a bit of a spicy curry last night, so I expect there'll be a, a bit of drafting. <laughs> Honestly, Swifty, I, I sometimes despair. Um, what, which cars are you looking out for on this grid then? Uh, I think we have to look out for Jim uh, and Tom. So we've got uh, Jim in the, in the Golf, which is obscenely fast. Uh, and the Scirocco being that just a little bit more slippery. Um, so, yeah, this, the, the quick escorts, you know, we, I think we should be top 10 top six if we're lucky i think so but we'll see i'll be giving it my all uh as you can see through the winter it's been a long winter and i've eaten and drunk on my whole body weight in food and beer and everything else so i'm a, I'm a healthy 10 kilos heavier than i should be but i've worked out that'll hold me down on the right handers perfect of which there are quite a lot here so you're fine yeah yeah i think it's good yeah. keep it pinned <laughs> enjoy it cheers mate Let's take a look at the Goodwood circuit, largely unchanged since its heyday back in the 1960s. 2.36 miles of an unforgiving circuit. The grass banks are close, the grass verges are even closer. Heading off the start, you head first towards Madgwick, an off-camber, tricky right-hander with a bump at the apex. It is so, so important to get the line right and get a good exit as you charge up towards Fordwater. 
a daunting right-hander. Again, off camber, slightly dropping downhill at the exit as well. It is incredibly high speed. Up towards St. Mary's. First goes right, then go left. Don't be too greedy with a curb on the left-hand side and that'll put you offline. The track drops slightly downhill and then back up again towards a double right-hander of Lavin. Getting a good exit and traction out of here is hugely important because that leads you onto the fastest part of the track. Through the little kink, heading towards Woodcut. A long, long right-hander with the apex seems to take an age to get to. The back of the car always edgy and then you get hard on the brakes for the chicane. We've seen many an incident there with drivers getting just a bit too greedy with the curb and the walls of the inside line. Get all of this right and you will be the winner across the line. Mark Burnett, we, we get all sorts of commentators' notes, but what I love about yours is if you've got some racing driver excuses in there saying this is 10 or 15 kilos heavier, than a normal Mini. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is that what I wrote? Yeah, well, it's true. It's true. And we've got to have an excuse, haven't we? Yeah. Isn't it more stable because it's got a longer chassis? Uh, do you know what? I think that's got as much to do with the person behind the wheel as it has the length of the car. And uh, you've had a bit of bad luck with this car, but uh, have you done a bit of work on it? Yeah, we've done a lot of work. Uh, cars, for all intents and purposes, it's been completely rebuilt. Um, and we did a quick test a few weeks back, and all's good, so fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So um, is it, do you try and tuck in behind someone with a the, with the Mini? Uh, for sure, yeah, yeah. You want to get a bit of... Um, if we can get behind some of the bigger cars coming out of a corner, then we're definitely going to get a bit, of, um, a bit of drag down the straights, which is going to help those lap times. Yeah. Well, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Well, there is the uh, stricken Jake Hill uh, uh, Ford car being uh, taken away on the back of the flatbed truck. That is what brought out the uh, the red flag or the second of the red flag that we had in the Gordon Spice Trophy Heat 1. Uh, that brought it to an end a few minutes early after we already had a previous red flag too, which uh, cost us quite a, a big chunk of time. But a lot of work to be done on the front end of that car, certainly in time for later on, whether they are able to do that. Well, it's going to be a race against time. It is, and the time will be... We'll have to have it in the collection area by about half past five this afternoon. Right, our attention, Harry, needs to turn to what is happening next. We love the Gordon Spice Trophy, so we've got uh, two sessions. The second session is for the smaller engine cars, but it doesn't matter if you finish in the top 15 in either of the races for these this evening. They're the heats, and then we'll have, as Nick Swift said, the little ones combined with the big ones later on. But uh, while that uh, pulse-setting but rather slower-looking Capri right now is uh, taken back, Rachel is down mingling with the great and the good, with the public. But it's always lovely to see a young fan as well at members' meeting. We don't see too many of them, but we've got Charlie here alongside his dad. And you can probably see from Snetterton on his cap where these two are from, obviously from Norfolk. Yeah. I mean, Dad, just tell me about um, your love of motorsport and what brings you to members' meeting. Uh, my father was uh, was racing driver when he was younger. He built his own car. Uh, and this sort of age of car is something that I've always really liked. And we've got Charlie's into it quite a lot now. At Snetterton, he's like a marshal. He's not wearing his marshal's overalls today, but normally he would have his overalls and his flags with him. Uh, and we've been going to races there ever since we moved up to Norfolk. Uh, it's our favourite circuit. I've now got the chance to race a car there now, finally after waiting and waiting and waiting and being able to finally get something. So we're really enjoying the ability to do that now as well. And we've come here because a friend of ours is a is 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 a, a is a member. He comes to the members' meeting, the festival, and the 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 revival. And we thought this was probably the best one to bring Charlie to, as he's quite shy and he doesn't like huge huge crowds. So that's our choice. Dad, it sounds great. Charlie, quick question to you. Obviously, we just heard all about your different hobbies and being a marshal at Snetterton. What are you most excited about today, being here at Members? Um, theme racing and how they form up on the grid. Well, you're going to see a lot of racing. And yes, get yourself down to the grid as well to see that start finish line because it's pretty special. Well, thank you so much That's for right. chatting to me. Have a lovely day and a lovely journey back to Norfolk as well, guys. Thank, thank you. you.
Thanks, Rachel. The one thing I have loved about uh, being here at the members' meeting so far is how much access you can get. You can just go right up to some of these cars and properly get your nose in and chat to those who are running it, who have entered it, and just find out way more than you ordinarily would at many other types of events like this. It really is the key. Of course, among thousands of people here today, you've got the dyed-in-the-wool racing fans, you've got some who may have flitted in and out, and those who are complete novices, there really is something for everyone, but the accessibility is exactly that, whether you're looking at cars, motorbikes, the stars, the drivers, the crews, the whatever, but again, just look down in the, in the collection area, we've got uh, two Bentleys down there, rather different shaped Bentleys, this is our Bentley demo, and it's coming out ahead of the second of the two Gordon Spice races, and history it's in front. It's the 2003, 20 years since Bentley won the Mall for the first time after a break of a mere 73 years. Well, we teed it up nicely if you were with us earlier on, and uh, it, it now comes to fruition. Uh, and this is uh, all part of marking 20 years, as you say, since Bentley's sixth victory at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, and, uh, well, also 100 years this year of that legendary race. So Bentley has uh, created a limited edition of Continental GT Coupes and Continental GTCs, which you can see on just on the left-hand side with the uh, iconic number seven emblazoned on the front grille and so many... Um, aspects of the Continental GT car that you see in the foreground have been inspired from the number seven uh, Bentley uh, Speed 8 uh, that is uh, making its way around. Now, despite it wearing the number seven, it is actually the number eight car, but let's not worry about that because they both did pretty well. Yeah, the number eight car actually came home in second place. So not just a win for Bentley after 73 years since its previous one, but a one two. And the drivers that finished second were Mark Blundell, David Brackman, Johnny Herbert. But, of course, the winning crew was Guy Smith, his first win at the Moor. Dindo Capello, the first of his many wins at the Moor. And Tom Christensen, well, it was win number five. Halfway to his tally of nine wins overall. This was the third year of the project for Bentley, the Speed 8 project. And if you put the initial car from 2001 alongside this current one, the 2003 car, the one on the track at the moment, they don't look very similar. They had to really repackage the car, make it more streamlined. The the engine, the um, cooling duct on the top was removed from the roof and put two little snorkels, one either side. You can see them just above the number sevens on either flank of the you car. You just don't get cars that look like that these days, I don't think, do you? you especially with the, the how it dips down at the back on the rear wing as well and how big actually that rear wing is too uh, on on the speed eight it's just fantastic to see i think it's, it's tom christensen at the wheel as you say isn't it so a man who certainly what well, mr le mans it certainly is uh, but so many parts of that car as we were saying inspired in the continental uh, gt uh, so the interior details of that car certainly echoing and uh, they've got the winning le mans reeves emblazoned within the continental GT. They've replaced the 12-hour analog clock with a 24-hour clock. It's nice that little bits like that, which are really paying homage to the Bentley, as well as the exterior with the uh, the racing green uh, uh, on the uh, carbon fiber uh, styling spec body as well, and the the black uh, with a subtle pinstripe moonbeam too. All being directly inspired by this, and you can just see it quite clearly. They're running uh, in tandem around this Goodwood track. But you know, I, I really think the history. We're racing people, so the history of any manufacturer is exciting. To to us but Bentley it runs very deep and I remember meeting a whole load of people who'd driven down to Monza about five years ago in their Bentley Continentals to come and watch the Bentley Continentals GTs going out racing so they love it too so any little touch that brings the racing history the pedigree into their, their cockpits the cars they drive on the road is very very dear to them good to see now Tom Christensen the nine-time Le Mans winner starting to wind up that speed eight so low so sleek and in fact right now we're looking forward to potentially the most exciting Le Mans 24 hours for a very long time with one name in particular that's come back to play Ferrari that will draw people in the the tickets were sold out in about uh, five and a half minutes flat as long as it takes me to fill to eat a, an entire baguette I reckon that's about the time but uh, certainly it's big time racing again in uh, the World Endurance Championship, and I cannot wait for June. It certainly feels like the beginning of a golden era, doesn't it, for, for sports car racing, with all these manufacturers coming back in. It's still not quite there, because we've still got more coming in for next year with the likes of Lamborghini and things like that, and also uh, in tandem in the IMSA Sports Car Championship in America too. What can we do to tempt Bentley back? Well, just my very thought coming up, because they're one of the manufacturers that are just right. They've got that Le Mans fit,
and uh, it would be fabulous. So never saying never, and it may well be the teams that have uh, put their nose in front, like Toyota this year, will, of course, have the advantage. But if Bentley could go back to Le Mans, that, to me, would be absolutely magical. It certainly would be, wouldn't it? Well, uh, as we see, it's been a flash of through. Christensen certainly starting to ramp up as well. I think out of his Le Mans wins, I want to say six of them were consecutive. I think that's part of the record that he uh, he has as Mr. Le Mans. Uh, but I'm sure someone might correct me on that. But uh, that's what I believe it is off the top of my head. But just seeing this car just spectacular in the green as it starts to get... Well, our, our commentary windows are a little bit tinted, so uh, the, the weather outside is a little bit uh, of an illusion to us, but I think it's just starting to get a little bit darker, a bit of a grey cloud coming, so you can see the headlights starting to make more of an impact, but uh, certainly better weather than we had yesterday with the pouring rain, uh, blue skies out as well. So a little bit overcast, but the Bentley, well, it's pulled away from the Continental GT, that's for sure. Indeed, as it came out of the chicane, it was behind, and then before it, long before it got to Badger, it occurred Tom Christensen had put clear air between them. So a fabulous looking car run by a man we miss enormously, John Wickham, who passed away early this year, managed so many teams, but I think uh, his Bentley moments were some of his very fondest in a good 40 years in motorsport. So Tom Christensen out of the chicane and brings it in, and yes, it has got a little darker, the lights are ablaze on front of the Speed 8. Great to see that again and see it on the move, and also really exciting to see the fabulous looking Continental, now, only just now coming through the chicane behind. I'm sure a lot of people here will be taking a sidle up towards the Bentley enclosure to take a look at that. And perhaps, as we heard uh, from other manufacturers, uh, this is a place where order books can be filled. And I'm sure Bentley would be delighted to have a chat with you. Absolutely. Well, as that Continental pulls in, uh, each of the, the new range being powered by uh, the Bentley W12 engine, the most successful 12-cylinder engine of the modern era. So you're not just getting elegance and style, you're getting uh, power and performance too from a Bentley. So uh, get your cameras out if you see it coming in. And uh, I think we are about to get underway. As the Bentleys pull in, it's time for Heat 2 for the Gordon Spice Trophy. Uh, Group 1 saloon cars of a type that race between 1970 and 1982, but uh, compared to Heat 1, which we saw a little bit earlier, these are the smaller engined cars. And we've got a whole range for you to feast your eyes on from Mazda's Ford Escorts, Alfa Romeo's, a couple of Triumphs in there as well. VW's at the classic Mark uh, 1 Golf GTI out there from 1979 too. We're currently following that Mazda RX-7. Uh, that's Alex Taylor at the wheel. That's from 1981. Bit of smoke coming out of the exhaust pipe, but a striking livery as well with the yellow uh, and the blue underside too. It's actually quite a lot of smoke coming out of that exhaust pipe. Uh, that really rather is. Now, of course, in period, people are going, is that really a touring car? Look at it, it's a coupe. I suppose you could say the Capri was a coupe, but not to the full extent. And the Mazda uh, did things differently, but hugely successful. 1980 championship winner in a Mazda RX-7. Win Percy, 1981. Championship winner in a Mazda RX-7. Win Percy. It certainly was successful. And Tom Walkinshaw was runner-up back in 1979. Also in one of those RX-7s he ran so successfully. But here we are again. One of the feasts of touring cars is the diversity of machinery. There we've got an RS2000 Escort hunting down a, a Mini 1275 GT, and they're both passing the Mazda. I suggest you might be... Let's see if that Mazda comes in. It certainly was smoking. He's backed it off. Yes, I had to do a little bit of a winch there as the Mark 1 Golf GTI picks up a little bit of the grass traffic management around this Goodwood track has certainly proven difficult as we saw in Heat 1 with Jake Hill coming across on multiple occasions. Uh, we're looking at the number 44, that is the VW Mark 1 Golf GTI, Jim Morris uh, at the wheel of that. That was campaigned uh, back in 1977 in the British Saloon Car uh, Championship and raced by John Morris in the 81 and 82 uh, Championship in the final years. Uh, of the Group 1 era, a third in 77, second in the championship in 78, and another third in 79. So a case of oh so close, but never quite there. But just look at how much he's ringing that golf in the rear end, stepping out. He's loving life down there. Well, stays in the family, but uh, we heard from Nick Swift. He said, look out for Jim Morris in the black uh, golf. And I must say, its handling looks exquisite. It's adaptable, but it's pretty <laughs> Four square on the track, so uh, it's looking very handy. We'll wait for the first flying laps to come in. At the moment, Nick Swift is fastest, but or he's top of the time charts. That's because he was the first one out of the pits. But Jim Morris is faster than him through that first sector. So keep an eye on that number 44 golf. 
course, it's only a 15 minute session. We only have 12 minutes remaining. So a bit of traffic ruining one lap. And the worst thing is if you get it ruined at the chicane, it also could ruin your exit, which then affects the next lap. So all these drivers, the experienced ones, are going to be wise to that, making space you think for you themselves. Have time and then suddenly it's all completely gone away from you, hasn't it? And you can just see the golf coming under, uh, well, the Mini coming under pressure in front uh, from the, uh, the golf as it crosses the line. That was the uh, number 60 uh, Mini uh, GT with Nick Swift at the reel, who starts his lap as well. Uh, if you missed heat one, well, this is how it works. Two heats of 30 cars each qualifying uh, for uh, on Saturday for our final on Sunday. So there are three exciting races over the weekend. Going back for those who are with us uh, at the 78 members meeting. That's the format we use. We've had heat one, heat two currently happening at the moment. And the top 15 from each heat will make Sunday's final. 11 minutes uh, just about remain in this second fourth spice trophy. We heard uh, beforehand from Mark Burnett, he's in the only estate car out there, which is the little uh, mini Clubman Estate 1275 GT. Marshall and Fraser livery on board, great to see that, alongside one of the glorious uh, Alfa Romeo GTV 6s, the Alpilati sponsorship, but it's great to see so many cars in the period livery. In the background is the red data post uh, M uh, Metro, the Austin Metro HLS, number 77, Malcolm Harrison on board. Of course, they were campaigned hugely well by uh, Richard Longman and Alan Kerno in period. Yeah, well, the, and this, uh, well, the club that we were following, that apparently was built specifically for the 78th uh, members meeting by uh, Mark Burnett, who is out the wheel. Um, lap time's coming in thick and fast at the moment. It's Morris in the uh, number 44 VW Mark 1 Golf. Here he is currently leading, and Swift is in P2 behind him, but he's using him for all the slipstream he can get as we have a car pulling off. That is the Ford Escort of Kerry Michael, uh, the 1981 Ford Escort, and a huge amount of steam uh, coming from the underside of the number 46, that's the Triumph Dolomite Spirit, Colin Sota uh, at the wheel as well. So whether that's an issue, I'm not sure. You can never quite tell uh, with these uh, vintage cars sometimes. Well, it looks a little bit oily coming out of there, and it could be a problem for other people. What I was about to say at the start of the lap, uh, Nick Swift crossed the start-finish line in the lead of the, the fastest two cars, and uh, behind was uh, Jim Morris. Jim Morris had pulled ahead. I was about to say, Nick's going to hate giving a slipstream to Jim, but it's gone the other way around. That is the brain working. Uh, for Nick Swift, but certainly for that number 46 dollar might I think guide it back to the pits and stay off the racing line if at all possible. So really unfortunate there uh, for one of those two all yellow Dolomites. Great to see them out there, but not in that sort of um, condition. That's it, Colin Sota doing a good job of getting out of the way. I've uh, commentated on him before, doing a bit of uh, Ferrari classic racing as well. So uh, owns a couple of uh, uh, vintage Ferraris. He certainly has a penchant for uh, cars of this era, but right now uh, the Triumph Dolomite not going uh, so well for uh, Colin Sota, who uh, didn't even get a lap time on the board. He did, but it's all the way down, uh, currently in 25th. Fastest lap time, as you can see on screen, uh, is from Morris in the number 44 Golf. That is a 1.31.2. Uh, just under seven and a half tenths, the gap too swift to be sort of trying to use it for that slipstream. Divine Shepherd and Deep, the top five, with uh, eight and a half or so minutes on the clock. And can Sota get out of the way through the chicane? just about but it's almost hard enough to get out of the way let alone set a quick lap time on this track uh, well the track never wide here but uh, certainly when he gets the chicane again it's narrowed down but still puffing away but it's over and out for colin sota doesn't drive into the pit lane he's driving into the paddock he might want a quick fix because that race will be this afternoon and of course it's a heat he'd love to get in the top 15 to enable him to get in tomorrow's final. But right now, it's uh, Jim Morris leading the way by seven tenths of a second from Nick Swift. It's VW Golf GTI from 1275 Mini. And in third place, car 63 of David Devine. It's uh, one of the uh, RS2000 escorts and uh, placing himself up the inside one of the data post uh, Ford Fiestas. That's car 51. That's Alan Man Racing, Simon Goodliff at the wheel. Again, tucking in to get one slipstream, but the RS2000, more grunt, should pull away. And David Devine just found a good bit of time, actually, uh, in the middle sector, but uh, he's getting closer, stays in third. He'll have another go at it with uh, still over seven and a half minutes uh, on the clock at the uh, moment uh, as we follow the, uh, the number 63 Ford Escort RS2000. That is David Devine finding a little bit of traffic just has to take the high side and make his way through carry as much momentum as he can in the uh, the shell sport red and white liveried rs2000 escort 
Right, we started the session, Harry, with 28 cars. We've had a couple of uh, cars having a little bit of trouble, but right now there is quite a gap between the fastest and the slowest, which does make two slower cars could really compromise one of the fast runners' uh, best lap as they're trying to keep it clean, keep out of way, and improve their times. The fastest time so far, 1 minute 31.2 seconds. Jim Morris, the black number 44 golf. He's about to start another lap will he improve not this time around he won't uh, close but, to his best but not at his best well i was going to say kerry michael uh, who is uh, right down the order at the moment going quite fast but not fast enough in the number 10 ford escort as uh, we see another one cross the line is it an improvement no as we cut back to uh, the 44 morris car up front sitting pretty at the moment seven and a half tenths the gap near or about yeah he had to actually had to back off quite a lot on the last lap because of traffic maybe want to cool his tires down and think about it but it's about making space when you potentially the fastest driver you've got the performance there to deliver but don't let other drivers block he's got another car up ahead of him as he goes through some areas over the rise into the compression wants to get past that dolomite before they get to Lavin, but he's only being shown the outside or in fact the tail lights on that car got very close up the inside he goes but his line was compromised the lap will be down by two or three tenths i'd suggest uh well two or three tenths i think is something he'll take or that could have been a lot worse uh, it looked like they both didn't quite know where each other were going to go but they made it through and uh the golf continues its way round and who doesn't love a golf gti but that left hand king there they really do like taking the curve and uh, kicking up the mud onto a little bit of the track don't they uh, using the track for all it's worth in uh, the uh, 44 car and uh, the rain keeping at bay for the time being and uh, that handling we were talking about for this mark one golf you can just see how much the rear end steps out but he's still able to carry that momentum through and we'll uh, switch from a golf to an austin metro shall we uh, this is uh, malcolm harrison in the uh, number 77 and uh, he is currently in 10th spot uh, uh that's near on they're about five seconds off the pace at the moment, but steadily making his way around in his Austin. Yeah, I was about to say he's one of the few in the top, one of only two in the top ten who are improving, and then suddenly the green near the top of the screen, Nick Swift has closed the gap. He's still second fastest. He's just over half a second down on Jim Morris's goal. So it's the number 60. This car actually has... Uh, that's in second, sorry. That's, sorry, Bruce. This car actually has about five class wins, I should say. So although it's five seconds off the pace at the moment, it was uh, one of the original works data post cars driven in the 1982 RAC uh, British Saloon Car Championship finished runner-up so excellent pedigree uh, with Harrison and Malcolm at the wheel switch back to number 60 number 60 second fastest uh, Nick Swift going faster and faster the trademark hopping of his car as he changes direction constantly into Lavent he goes first part of the corner nice and neat and tidy he'll be looking up the track what is in head of ahead of him nothing much so this is the dream ticket unless he could have a slipstream this is as good as it gets for Nick he'll be winding up what's the target one minute 31.2 can he do a one minute 31 it comes down to small margins he would be desperate the pride the bragging rights sir, for the next five hours if he can take pole position well he's certainly seen cool calm and collected down in the pit lane before the session with uh, ed speaking to him and you can just see the concentration on his face as he uh, blasts that mini gt through the right hander how much more time can he find for uh, swift currently in second the personal best in the middle sector let's see if he can carry that momentum through out of the chicane and across the line you can see him pumping his fists can he find any extra time he can but it's not quite enough he closes the gap by a few tenths of a second but he's still got about three and a half tenths to find if he wants to topple morris in the number 44 golf Two other people starting to make moves. Car number 69, another mini, that's Harvey Deeth. He's fifth fastest, but he's banged in the fastest middle sector of anyone. It's about getting the three sectors all together to achieve your best lap, but it's still sitting at the top. Jim Morris, the number 44 golf. How much time have we got left? Just over three minutes. It's this lap and one lap beyond for the Chargers. Car 34, good to see the Triumph Dolomite not kicking out too much smoke. That's down middle order at the moment. 16, don't, remember, don't forget, you need to get in the top 15 in this evening's race. So he'll be there or thereabouts to have a shot at that. Car 34, Tim Clark pushing that one on. Yeah, on the bubble at the moment, just outside of the top 15 is Clark Clayson as well. And uh, the number 10 we saw, uh, which did have a good turn of pace, but now suddenly finds itself down in 18. That's the uh, one of the Ford Escort RS2000 cars as uh, we continue to watch the uh, the Triumph Dolomite of uh, Tim Clark. This is from uh, 1974, uh, this car. And uh, a quick glance at the timing screen. How is he doing? Good in the first sector, losing time as the lap goes on. Two and a half minutes just under on the clock can he find 
any more time. No, he can't. Stays outside of the top 15. He'll need to find some more time if he wants to make it through to the final. A reminder, it's the top 15 of this session that progress. One and a half seconds covers the top five. It's the golf at the top. Jim Morris, second place. Nick Swift in his mini. Third place, car number 63. Next up, David Devine going so well in the Escort. Now, not float smoking as it was at the beginning. It's the Mazda we saw right at the outset. Not number two, it's number zero two. It's Trent Alex Taylor. And it's a replica of the Percy car, a two-year build. So hopefully that uh, smokiness was no problem, but it's picking up the pace. So that's Nick Swift, I think, peeling into the pits there. It's certainly one of the minis in the, the Patrick Motorsport livery. Yeah, he's coming to the pit, so he's going to challenge no more. So is Jim Morris check at the top safe in that position and Taylor in that uh, yellow and blue Mazda goes up into eighth place he's improving but I think that target is getting harder and harder David Devine now is the driver who has to challenge Jim Morris two minutes one minute 20 seconds remain good lap from Taylor there as we uh, continue to follow that yellow and uh, blue Mazda those are actually the, uh, the colors that the car ran in the first half of uh, the season with uh, Wynn Percy until the Motel sponsorship came in and changed the colours, but as you say, it is a direct tribute to Wim Percy's 1981 uh, British Saloon Car Championship winning entry. Uh, let's have a look at the number 90. We haven't seen much of the 04 Commodore. Peter Fisk at the wheel, uh, and that is, uh, yes, the number 90. So he's, he's quite a way down. He's finding a, finding a bit of time on this lap. Can he find, though, uh, the 10th he needs? He's down in 20 seconds, so he gets to find a good chunk of time with just 40 seconds on the clock. It says Pete on the tail of the car. It used to be driven by Pete Hall, Industrial Control Services Racing. And the fact that uh, Peter Fisk has the same first name was one of the reasons he was encouraged to buy the car. Right now, he's out there enjoying it, moving it around. And great to have cars that were there. They weren't always right at the front end, but it was, again, great manufacture variety in the day. And that period livery too. ICS on so many cars. Of course, Andy Rouse uh, famously ran with them for quite some years. He's found himself right up behind the Triumph Dolomite of uh, Miles Porton. Now, these two do know each other. They do, they do a lot of Ferrari classic racing together. Uh, so there's a good bit of friendship between them. But on the track, it is all fierce rivalry. But I wonder if uh, Peter Fisk might be a little bit annoyed that he just came across at the Triumph Dolomite in the wrong part of the track as they take the chequered flag. So the Ferenza in the pits, didn't see that much in the day, but great to have that DTV livery, the silver with the red, white and green stripes that, of course, Jerry Marshall used so famously for so many years. Uh, now it's the race named after fellow touring car racer Gordon Spice. And the sun is coming out, and so is the chequered flag. And Jim Morris appears to have taken pole position, the number 44 VW Golf. There is the chequered flag. Conditions looking absolutely fine. And well done, gentlemen. You got through with that. Not one or two red flags. Well done, you ran through clear. Yes, heat two, a lot cleaner than uh, heat one for the Gordon Spice Trophy. The top 15 progress out of the uh, 30 cars uh, that were able to take part. But this one in heat two was the quickest of them all. Jim Morris here with a 131-203 takes the chequered flag. Doesn't improve his time on that final lap, but uh, gets to take the flag at least. Starting quickest uh, in that uh, BW Mark 1 Golf GTI. 1979 so a, a wonderful collection of uh, cars in this uh, second heat and one car that was a bit of a sleeper but it moved up also from the Jim Morris stable but driven by Tom Shepard was the Scirocco Scirocco and that moved up into third place right at the end just a whisker over a second slower and the number 44 other Morris car the Golf that's taking pole position just missing out as well uh, the Triumph Dolomite of Tim Clark ended up 60 just in front of the uh, uh, the number 14, so that would have been the Alfa Romeo. We didn't see too much of the Alfa Romeos, actually. Paul Clayson uh, ended up just missing out as well, along with that number 10, which did have good pace, the Ford Escort uh, of Kerry Michael. So they, unfortunately, uh, just uh, missed out, as we pick up on uh, what you were saying, Bruce. The uh, uh, Scirocco making its way around the uh, VW Scirocco GTI. Tom Shepard at the wheel of that in the 45. Ended up third fastest, uh, just over a second back from Morris by mere thousands. And it has to be the most understated car. It looks they've just put a few stickers on it, and that's your lot. The, uh, Jim McGuire racing car, but third fastest, it's clearly very nicely prepared, that VW Sirocco. Certainly is. Well, they'll make their way uh, back into the uh, pits and the uh, paddock, and uh, we'll continue watching that uh, Scirocco with... Uh, uh, third uh, in the British Saloon Car Championship uh, 1982, third in class with a, a win for that Scirocco. And uh, Tom actually, who's driving the car, built the car originally when he and uh, John Maguire were business partners. Um, so uh, that car certainly 
proving to be a solid build as well as they uh, restore and repair it from its uh, bygone era from 1982. But this Heat 2 were Group 1 saloon cars between 1917 and 1982. If you saw Heat 1, these are the slightly smaller engine cars uh, that we've seen out on track as uh, 1 and 3 in the timing spots make their way back in. And uh, we get a bit of a, a lull on track, but uh, certainly a busy couple of hours uh, on this Goodwood track. A whole range of uh, saloon cars. We've had Bentleys on offer as well. So uh, look left, right and centre. And if uh, you like your history uh, all the way up to your modern day, well, the Goodwood members meeting is certainly one that will please uh, all ages and all generations. We've seen the fans getting a, a good glimpse uh, down in the uh, paddock as well, getting close up, and that's what I love. It's all about accessibility these days. And if you're able to get to Goodwood, I mean, just not just enjoying the beautiful land that we're on as well, but all of the the opportunities outside of what you're seeing on the track too, just make it the icing on the you put the icing on the cake, I should say. And Harry, you probably noticed this as well when you walked around the paddock many, many other languages being spoken. It's a hugely international draw, not just to be here, but uh, to watch from all around the world. Hugely diverse, it's uh, brilliant. Um, but here's how the Heat 2 ended. So top 15 went, go through to the final. Jim Morris, the quickest of them all, 131.203 in the VW Mark 1 Golf GTI, just ahead of the Mini GT, Nick Swift, who was uh, using Morris for all the slip gene can get, and that Scirocco. We were watching right at the end, Tom Shepard putting in a really good lap time to get up into third ahead of David Devine, Rupert D. Uh, with the Ford Escort and the Mini rounding out the top five. A couple of Ford Fiestas too. The highest Alfa Romeo, Ben Colburn, uh, up in eighth ahead of that Mazda RX-7, the blue and yellow number two car. Alex Taylor up in ninth, just in front of Harvey D in 10th in the Mini. And the Clubman Estate, the only estate in the field with a 135.6, uh, decent lap time up in 11th ahead of Lawrence Warp in the Mini and David Green, uh, Toyota Corolla actually didn't see much of the Corolla, did we? But good laps I'm getting through into the top 15 uh, in 13th spot ahead of uh, Harrison and Peter Smith in the Ford Escort. Just missing out though in the Triumph Dolomite, Tim Clark, Paul Clayson and Kerry Michael, uh, along with Mark Wilson and Mark Bevington rounding out the top 20. Then it was Ken Clark, Timothy Morley in the uh, two Triumph Dolomite Sprint cars. Peter Fisk, who we saw having a few issues out on track too. Uh, I think he called it an early day in the end, along with Colin Soto, who was right at the bottom of the timing screens, uh, who definitely pulled off in 27th. Uh, he was just behind James Alexander and Miles Poulton in 25th with uh, Tim Crichton in the other Triumph Dolomite at the back in 28th. Well, let's relive uh, this Gordon Spice Trophy Heat 2 then, and it was a frenetic start, a remarkably cleaner session compared uh, to the bigger engine Heat 1 Gordon Spice Trophy. We have Group 1 saloon cars of a type that race between 1970 and 1982. It was a clean session, but it wasn't without issues. Uh, it was Michael, it was Kerry Michael and the Ford Escort, uh, along with many other cars, the Triumph Dolomite of Colin Sota, uh, smoking and trying to keep out of everybody's way, and he just about did so. Uh, the going quick, were certainly the Minis and certainly the VWs as well, particularly the Mark 1 Golf and the Scirocco. And in the end, it was the number 44 Black VW Golf GTI, Jim Morris, who was fastest. It's like motoring heaven here. Motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's a sort of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then. <laughs>
Next up, the Porsche demonstration, uh, celebrating 60 years of the 911, and there really isn't a better 911 than, th than this one. Tom, this is kind of a car that you raced against, isn't it? Yeah, it's a fantastic pleasure. This is a Le Mans winning car from 1998, and with a, a yellow Atelier and Magnish. It was a great fight. I was with a, the open top BMW uh, V12 LMR, and now to be welcomed, that can only happen at Goodwood with the Porsche team and with the mechanics working on the car back then. That's a, that's a fantastic privilege and opportunity. But And what a car. This is the one, the winning chassis. And have you called Alan to get any advice, or are you just going to see how it goes? No, I will call him after, I promise you. Yeah. Well, look, enjoy. Thank you. Sam Hancock, there are fewer better views probably than Tom Christensen in that GT1, the 98 car. But the 911, it's, it's really to blame for so much success, isn't it? It's just, it's just got, it runs its, its, its thread through motorsport history in so many different incarnations. And I just love, I love the lineage. I love that it goes back so far. I love that I'm sat in such an extreme version of something that has its roots so many decades earlier it's it feels it feels very special to be honest it's a big privilege a big honor to be sitting in a car like this right now i mean you're a big car fan i have visions of you wandering down the 911s this morning in the paddock <laughs> it's very true but i think i think if i could pick one this or the one that tom is in would be the one i would take home for sure not the 73 targa w winner uh, i I'm, in, I'm into the gt1 stuff in a very big way i i just think it's very, very special. Enjoy it. Thank you. Well, a spectacular display awaiting us there to celebrate all things Porsche, but particularly all things 911 over the next 10 or so minutes. 60 years of the 911, 20 racing Porsches or so on display, making their way around uh, this Goodwood track shortly. And the 911 really is one of the most significant, it's perhaps one of the most recognized sports cars uh, throughout history. Yes, in many, many derivations, Harry. And uh, as, you, as you'll see, when the cars get out onto the track, they come in all shapes and sizes. But the essence of the 911 is knitted in, and may I say, in that martini racing livery that uh, was on the flanks, of course, of the Porsche 917s uh, to start with and then moved on through in the 9083s and um, just great to have it out here. But we've also got the, the Porsche 935s and the most modern ones in this display. We take it up to 1998 when, of course, uh, they really started to succeed with the GT1. Uh, such a, a great car. But again, the constant change. There is the car of which I speak, car number 26, uh, the cars that raced at the Mans with such success. Longer, lower, wider, meaner. That's motorsport, it's development. It certainly is. Well, uh, we are pleased uh, for Goodwood to be celebrating both 75 years of Porsche along with the 60 years of uh, the 911. And uh, we have got a couple of absolute beauties that we're going to focus on. We were sort of uh, looking at the Porsche 911 Carrera RSL 2.8 uh, to start with. That was the number eight uh, Martini livery car described as uh, the most extreme version of a 911 you can possibly get. Uh, and then we have also the uh, the number 26 Mobile One livery. I think that's Tom Christensen, yes, at the wheel, uh, getting ready to go. He's, he's having a busy day so far. Uh, and this, uh, this, well, this really, uh, due to its success, I suppose, saw the end, really, of the GT1 uh, championship because it absolutely blitzed the field in this. And uh, the 1998 Le Mans winning machine uh, with uh, Yannick Dalmas, uh, Alan McNish and Stefan uh, Ortelli leading a 1-2 finish for Porsche. So the immense success beating the likes of Mercedes uh, out of the way along with uh, uh, and BMW as well. And uh, we have the number 40 three as well out on track uh, making uh, that's the Moby Dick uh, Martini livery car the Porsche 93578 uh, being brought by uh, the Porsche Muse uh, Museum the ultimate evolution on the mid 1970s Porsche 935 designed by uh, Porsche technical director Norbert Singer as the ultimate aerodyne rule bender bearing only a passing resemblance to the standard car as you can well see you look at that and you wouldn't immediately think it's got uh, its roots based its roots based in a, a 911 but nicknamed Moby Dick because of its huge white uh, wide body and uh, 
the domed nose so brilliantly displayed there by our uh, camera operator. And you can see just how sleek the car had become, the longer tail, the, the rear wing, the, the splitter at the front. That's why this car was capable, not just capable, achieved 221 miles an hour down the Mulsanne Strait in the days before the chicanes were installed uh, at the one-third and two-third points. But it's long, it's low, it's lean. You all have your chance to look at it in the paddock. If you look underneath, you'll find there's a lot of air there's a lot of bodywork hanging over not a lot at all but the downforce was the game the goal and it really was achieved but uh, it was a car that required a massive amount of attention lightweight super fast frisky what i found super interesting was that porsche never really intended for the rear engine 911 to be a racing car yet here we are with so many iterations of it but I think it was really from the early 70s they started developing a, a series of purpose-built competition models that would really go on to, to sort of win and star around the world and consequently, well, make Porsche's decision for them that, oh, we should probably go and race these 911s and, and uh, develop them as much as we can. Well, huge success at Le Mans, but didn't, it took a while to come, but actually they were already achieving uh, in the 1950s in the smaller engine classes and uh, the Saab, but uh, sights and sounds, liveries from the past, uh, just great to see them here in what is now full sunshine at Goodwood for the first day of the 80th members meeting. It's a packed agenda and for a lot of people these cars very evocative. The white uh, Porsche just outside of the Jägermeister orange 911 sets off uh, just waiting for the Brumos livery car to go white with those broad blue and red stripes up its nose has yet to leave the pit lane but again for American fans that's a very special team for them. Some big winners represented in this Porsche 911 celebration here uh, at Goodwood as well. As we mentioned, the 1998 Le Mans winning car. We've got Sebring 12-hour uh, winners, Daytona 24-hour winners, and uh, uh, driving the 1970 Target Gloria winning car is Mr. Le Mans himself, Tom Christensen, who uh, we saw just a few moments ago. Many martini liveries as we cut back to the number eight car. Uh, many number eight cars in this so it's uh, really displaying uh, the livery to tell the difference and on board is Karun Chandok uh, and uh, the former Formula One driver and uh, working on the, the TV this weekend gets to have a go he's also uh, I think going around in the Brabham uh, F1 car a little later on as well so he's really getting his pick of the bunch but you can just see how hard he's working that uh, steering wheel Karun having a great time of it yeah you can see he just hung, hung back a little bit there and then banged it through the gears and uh, he'll be hating every second of this Karun such an enthusiast such a student of motor racing and of course coming from uh, India's sort of leading motor racing family absolutely imbued in the history of the sport waving to people around the circuit this is a demo but of course he'd like to get uh, that bark from behind he, Tom uh, Christensen of course is driving the car that uh, went on to as you say dominate GT1 it was lower le leaner meaner than the competition and came out on top Karun's got a bit of pressure on him though because he was telling us in the truck that uh, that car is worth near about 10 million so uh, certainly he doesn't want to ring that too hard as we just see the uh, the number 26 once again at the hands of Tom Christensen in his iconic uh, Le Mans helmet as well, uh, demonstrating that Porsche for all its beauty around this uh, track. The uh, race winning 1998 Le Mans winning car, of course, the 911 introduced back in, well, 1993 initially, I suppose, in the Group 5 days when Porsche switched focus. Um, uh, well, that was the later iteration, I should say. Uh, the zero behind it is an interesting Porsche, though, as, uh, of course, the course car has to be a Porsche, too. It, it does, indeed. Uh, why not? And again, looking at some just fabulous liveries going down through the pack. But that is, on the right-hand side of the screen, is the actual car that won at Le Mans in 1998. And they did it with a with the real young bucks there. You know, Helen McNish and uh, Stefan Ortelli just getting stuck in, along with Laurent Daiello, who mainly won the Monaco F3 race once upon a time but was largely seen as a touring car racer but uh, Porsche have long been supporters of young drivers and if the young drivers hang on to the reins uh, well enough they can be kept on for a very long time indeed but uh, looking at this car you do have to squint to see the 911 within the shadow is there somewhere but what a success nowhere near the fastest car at Le Mans in the year in which it won but they drove within themselves a little bit cars were more fragile back then uh, and the young bucks got it right and so who says you can only win with experience you can win with uh, as long as you're prepared to listen to your team chief and uh, always clear lines of um, 
how should we say, direction in any works to you. Yes. Well, absolutely. You squint close enough and you can see the, the 911 uh, base and the inner heart of that Le Mans winning vehicle. We talk about the 1998 winning Le Mans. Some of Porsche's greatest wins have been at Le Mans. We go back to 1979. It was a one, two, three, four finish for the 911 derived Porsches, even though the favorite works 936s. Um, well, they were the favourites, but they ran into trouble, which allowed the heavier privateer round Porsche 935 to, to come through. And uh, a 1, 2, 3, 4 of the 1979 uh, Le Mans. Fantastic to see a run of 935s going through the chicane. The two uh, George Luz cars, the ones with the yellow band on the red nose. Uh, again, just you could see the evolution even within the time. The front became less bluff. It became uh, smoothed out entirely. And 43 was one of the cars we were looking at, of course. That's... Uh, Moby Dick. Moby Dick. <laughs> Easily spotted. Uh, the uh, 935 dash 78, if we're going to be uh, picky about it. 900 horsepower, 221 miles an hour. He said that's what it got up to uh, on the Le Mans three mile Mulzan straight. You can just see why it's called Moby Dick if you weren't here right at the start. It's the sloped nose, the big white bodywork at the back. I'll tell you one way you can really chart the progress of uh, Porsche in racing. A couple of years ago, Derek Bell did a book, All His Porsche Races, and you realise he hardly ever raced more than a half a dozen races in any of the models before they were evolving into something else. And uh, so, again, he said certainly some of the 935 derivations he was driving in the States in the IMSA Championship were a little bit eye-opening, huge amounts of turbocharged horsepower, and some of those circuits are... Uh, had about as much, uh, even less runoff than you'd find here today. So uh, Derek rode the Porsche tail, and of course, so many wins at the Mans. Well, they speak for themselves. They certainly do. Uh, but outside of these, we've got a lot of um, Porsche 993 GT2 Evo cars out there as well, uh, and they often come with quite a striking livery. We've got the uh, the class and art car. Uh, that's the red, white, and blue uh, number 11 car. So look out for that. That's uh, was uh, driven and raced in the French GT Championship uh, by uh, Francois Lafon and Jean-Pierre Jarrier, a name that might be familiar to some, uh, to win the overall title uh, back then in 1988-99. That's driven by uh, Robert and Clive Offley at the moment. We've also got uh, the PlayStation livery from 1997, the Comrade Turquoise uh, Motorsport car. That's another 993 GT2 Evo uh, from 1996. Only six ever made of those and raced uh, back in Daytona in 1996. The Coca-Cola car uh, is the second in the picture just going through as well. Uh, another striking uh, livery which uh, was um, uh, finished first in class at Sebring uh, back in 1983 and has a great history seen today fully restored after being uh, in an American collection for, for many years uh, and that's uh, Henrik Lindbergh in the wheel of that. Yeah, again, it's just great to see these various liveries. A lot of them we haven't seen this side of the pond. You might have been to the more every year, but not seen the Coca-Cola livery car per se or whatever, but uh, certainly uh, great to see the mixes. But that, we were talking of the 993, the GT2 Evo. That was a time when um, sports car racing became GT racing again, and the prototypes started to sort of make way for more and more. And you know what? That has ensured the history of uh, sports car racing because uh, when... The manufacturers start to drop out. You need the wealthy amateurs to come in, get a pro driver alongside them. And to me, that's the essence of sports car racing. And it's certainly the numbers swelled and Porsche's bank balance didn't do, do too badly at all. And again, they've always had an eye to selling cars uh, in which people can not only drive on the road, but also they can have the racing version and then they can do the branding for the mark. It certainly can. And just in front of this uh, Martin livery car, we've got the uh, number eight, another number eight to look out for. Uh, that's uh, the red and yellow Weisenberg Tools car from 1977, another 935, but uh, the 77A, Mark de Siebenthal, at the uh, wheel of that. They make their way round for uh, another lap. And the Jägermeister car, too. It's just so many iconic liveries, really. You, you can't help but, but stop, because the 911 is such a distinct shape. But then add on top these brilliant liveries ranging across the years, and it just adds a little something extra. No, it really does, and uh, a bit of luck. Up, lock you up coming into the chicane. You don't want to hit the two Jello uh, Porsches. George Luce's uh, team, who did so much the development of the 935, but the Martini Racing number, number eight, uh, gets uh, a wound up very nicely, and that's Karun Chandok, who luckily doesn't have to explain why he hit the back of the second of those two red and yellow Porsches ahead. He'll be enjoying this very, very much indeed. 911 RSR, of course, that's what he's driving, a turbo version from 1974, but the RSR, you know, again, you look through Porsche history, what letters go well after the number? It's 911, and RSR certainly does it for me.
Now, you mentioned the Brumos Porsche uh, earlier as well. That's the uh, 911 Carrera RSR 3.0. I believe it's Neil Jarney at the wheel of that, the, uh, the 2016 Le Mans winner. Uh, so uh, certainly the pedigree in the field and Porsche has certainly brought up and made careers out of so many uh, professional races and you go all the way to what they're doing currently now in something like the Porsche Super Cup and they have the Porsche Junior Programme and they really do allow drivers to almost do their, their apprenticeship and their internship and then get that opportunity to go up the GT ladder and then now can progress in any way they want. They've got Formula E Avenue now if they want to go back into single seaters or uh, of course the wide spec of GT and, and previously they were able to go to uh, the LMP1. Yeah, and now they're in, in hypercar, and uh, so for a lot of drivers, it's, it's sort of cleared the way. The cream of the drivers of the GT Championship have managed to get works drives, and they will hang on to them as long as they can. And uh, again, it's great. You need progression in motorsport. It certainly is. And uh, there is Karun making his way around. Karun Chandot, former Hispania racing driver, Lotus as well. And uh, now you'll see him as a Formula One pundit too, and uh, he'll be doing the, uh, the members meeting program. So he's uh, enjoying time out there in that 911 Carrera RSR 2.8. There was a brilliant story that Karun told once. It's, of course, he was the second Indian Formula One racer ever behind Narain Karthikeyan. Uh, and I think recently, uh, or not recently, maybe in the last couple of years or so, they both found themselves on the same flight. It wasn't an F1-bound flight or anything like that. But what are the chances there? The two out of the entire Indian population, the two to only ever race in Formula 1, found themselves on the same flight. Well, maybe the numbers are actually in their favour. But uh, for Narain Karthikeyan and Karun Chandog, I think it came as a surprise to both of them. Still, that's what happens when you travel first class, eh? <laughs> you can tell Karun that. Uh, there's the PlayStation livery there, looking uh, like it's uh, ramping up a little bit as it comes in uh, to... Uh, oh, he's still heading through the kink and onto the straight. The Gran Turismo brand on the back. It's proper retro stuff. The retro PlayStation logo there. And uh, in the 160 black livery car, Porsche. It does make me feel slightly old when been going to the mall for quite a long time when cars like this came out to play but again it was great from my point of view to have the gt cars alongside the prototypes in there you know they stuck out at the mall with prototypes only for some while but the health came back it was reinvigorated with the gt makes what i also find so fascinating and you can see it a little bit with the uh the gt1 98 and the evo that are running out with, with the 911s and and, uh, and the like the 993s here and you see it today in modern day sports car racing in the World Endurance Championship. Unless you're here in person, you see them in person actually. These GT cars are bigger sometimes than, than the, the GT1 and now than the hypercar and, and the LMP1 type cars. You know, and I, when I first realized that, I was a bit shocked. It looks like the TV images are being distorted at times as well, but they're not. And if you haven't had a chance to see it in person, get yourself down to a racetrack if you can, because it is just remarkable how much they can squeeze in and how fast and small these cars can be when compared to the GT cars. Oh, oh God, absolutely so. But uh, it's, a, it's a treat. The car, I think the cars are now coming in. The, the checkered flag has been flown and uh, we see them again. But uh, great to have them here. We've also got the GT1 demonstration this evening at uh, 7.30 to 7.45. Hopefully a glorious uh, sunset to the, the west of the circuit. And uh, we could see those cars because, of course, so many of them raced into the night in the great sports car races. And... Uh, Again, the assembly, I walked through the paddock this morning and went, oh, didn't know where to look when I was looking at the GT1 display. And uh, just looking at our commentary box window as well, the sun really is coming to shine out here uh, at Goodwood for the 80th members meeting here at the Goodwood Motor Circuit. 2.4 miles, 3.8 kilometres, nine turns, depending on who you talk to and depending on what you count as a corner. But I'm saying it's nine. Of course, uh, the revival here as well. Many of these cars can be seen there too from... Uh, 1998 that was uh, has been going for but uh, the members meeting back for uh, another go this year and certainly pleasing hopefully many of you watching around the world wherever you may be or if you are here watching on the big screens as well a massive welcome you can get in touch as well on social media let us know what's caught your eye and what you're enjoying as the last of the Porsches make their way back into the uh, Park Ferme and then the paddock area you can see just how busy it is there. Everyone wants to get a little glimpse of the Porsches coming in as well as a huge array of uh, cars on display. We've got the likes of the Jim Clark Trophy, the Hellwood Trophy coming up as well, along with Threlfall too. What I love is that uh, the, the global appeal of a meeting like this, and I've just had a, a message fired to me probably a few minutes ago, yeah, a couple of minutes ago, uh, from the States, saying uh, you're talking of the Porsche 
GT1. Of course, one of them flipped at the first Petit Le Moyne, 1998, going over the crests and rises. I now remember very well. I had forgotten that. So thanks very much for letting me know. I presume that's from Jim Rollo stateside. So uh, good information. And uh, of course, not every car in racing ever gets away unscathed. And Petit Le Moyne, that has grown and grown. What a great event that is in the autumn in the States. Absolutely. Well, uh, Karun Chandok had a pretty nice time out in that 911 Carrera RSR 2.8, and uh, Ed's caught up with him. Karun, you do get to drive some pretty fantastic cars, but this must have been really wonderful. It's pretty amazing, really. You know, I think, uh, uh, you know, one of my journalist friends, Andrew Frankel, reckoned this is one of the most important 911s ever built. Uh, there have been an awful lot of 911s built, so... Um, you know, drive the car that won the last ever Targa Florio as a World Championship event. Um, it's just, it's brilliant. It sounds amazing, Ed. That's, the sound is exactly how the eight-year-old me with the poster on the wall thought it would sound like. And it's obviously, it's just a demonstration, but do you get a feel for what it would, would have been like? Yeah, you get a little bit of a feel. You know, we, um, we get to, we at least get to play a little bit and get a bit of speed going. And, you know, you just try and, Visualize, right? Driving this thing for 24 hours at Daytona or, or the Targa um, is, it must be pretty hard work because it's not the most comfortable place to be sitting. Um, but yeah, just a, a brilliant car. Green, I'm very jealous. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers. Well, a celebration of the world's greatest sports car and its most successful racing variants from 1973 all the way through to 1998. The Porsche Demo had everything, celebrating all things 911. It was absolutely fantastic to see the array of colors, the array of original liveries as well that make up 60 years of the 911 as we also celebrate 75 years of Porsche and this spectacular track demonstration really having it all. We heard from Karun there just talking about his 911 Carrera RSR 2.8 that was the Martini livery number eight but we also had Tom Christensen out on track two in the Porsche 911 GT1 uh, along with uh, the Moby Dick car two so many a Porsche up for grabs <laughs> Well, the first race on track later on, James Hayden, is the Halewood Trophy. We had the first practice session a little bit earlier on, and it kind of threw up a, a couple of interesting results, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, what's fantastic about it is we obviously got, you know, we got the Formula 750, the big four-stroke 750s, and we got the little TZ 350s and 250s. Yeah, you know, there was three 250s, 350s in the top six, and three 750s. But it was Michael Rutter, you know, the TT winner, British suit bike expert. He put it on pole position on the very last lap and looked really good. Yeah, it was pretty close, wasn't it? I'm just looking down here at the grid for later on. Michael Rutter pole, Dan Cooper second, and then Scott Carson make up the front row there in third. It was Graham Higgett, though, who was leading for most of it. What do you think he lacked in the closing stages? Well, it was difficult this morning because it was quite cold. The sun came out. There was a few little damp patches. And talking to the guys, there was quite a lot of wind as well. So he just sort of, I think, to his time, as the guys were just getting a bit better and better. Yeah, the last lap was the best lap of the, the whole session. So yeah, that was the time to get it in a quick time if you could. Were you surprised at how quick Michael Rutter went to put it on pole? Did that surprise you? Yeah, I mean, you, you knew they'd be there, thereabouts. I mean, they got into the 28s last year, you know, and even the 27s in the race, so there's a bit more time to come. But it was slightly tricky, you know, a little bit damp, a little bit cold. So 
they'll get quicker and quicker. But I think Michael looked really comfortable. Yeah, I spoke to him, he said, I hate two strokes, I'm not buying the two stroke. Um, but he looked good on the Hadley Honda and he just sort of came through, picked his time. Yeah, you know, I was impressed with Dan Cooper in second. He'd never ridden a TZ 350 before. So for him to jump on that, put it in second. And it's a beautiful little bike, really sharp, well prepared. So um, I think we should be in for a really good race. But Goodwood is all about that. You don't really know what you're going to get. You're going to jump on something new, just have a go. But talking about past results then, we had Andy Hornby. He sits in eight, so third row there. He actually came third last year. Do you think that experience will stand him in good stead later on? Yeah, very much. I mean, it's important to get a good start here because there's so many um, riders. So that makes a real difference. If you get held up and have to come through, that, that makes a big chance. So he could be on. Also, look out for Gary Vines, number 10. That's the first 250. And he had a problem in qualifying. He was, you know, one of the fastest until he had to retire. So I think we might see him come through as well. Yeah, he's sitting on row four there. And James, I said, your results in the Halewood. You've never competed in it. Why on earth not? You're so competitive. Obviously, <laughs> don't race anymore, but you did back in the day. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've done the revival and the Festival of Speed. I've just not been to this one. It's my first time. Absolutely loving it. Obviously, having grown up on two strokes, you know, 125s, 250s, 500s, I'd love to come and have a crack. So uh, watch that space. Watch the space for James Hayden next year. Quickly putting on the spot who's going to take the win today in uh, this first, uh, first session on track. I think Rutter's looking good, but uh, I think I'm going to go with Rutter. He's going to go with Michael Rutter. OK, to take the win. Obviously, we get to part two as well tomorrow of the Halewood Trophy, but it's coming your way at 20 past two. One of the many things to look forward to, but and what we've got out now is also one of the events, I have to say, that I'm really relishing this weekend. Bennett Woods uh, and Alice Powell back with you in the commentary box for now. And Alice, what I'm really excited about in this event is the driver list that we've got for driving Ford Lotus Cortina. So these are all Ford Lotus Cortinas from the 1960s. And what we're basically doing is celebrating 60 years since the car was created. But what a driver list we have. I know, it's absolutely incredible. We've got ex-touring car drivers, touring car champions, Le Mans winners, IndyCar winners. There's just a, such a fantastic list of drivers as well. Formula 3 winners. Just looking, looking down at it, that every single car has got someone that you need to keep your eye on. So I'm expecting it to be very close. You know, the history of, of these cars racing around this circuit, you know, if we go by the history, then we're going to get some fantastic racing. Indeed. Well, Jim Clark, uh, superstar of the time, uh, was brilliant in one of these. In, the, in those days, Formula One drivers drove everything. Uh, and this was included. Now, you're looking at one of the really original cars, number nine here. It's an original race car. Uh, it was uh, prepped in Italy. And it's an original shell as well. Some of the cars are rebuilt versions of road cars of the time, but this was very much an original race car, which is lovely to see. Uh, Jeremy Bailey, I think, is in the car at the moment. Tiffany Dell is going to be driving it as well. So he's the star driver for this car. And every car has got a star driver, which is lovely to see. It's also, thankfully, this one, quite a distinctive colour because the standard colour is the white and green. But there we've got, there you are, there you've got the standard colours of the Ford Lotus Cortinas. That's uh, pretty much how they normally came out. But we do have some varying colours uh, to just keep a little bit of a watch on as well, which is fun to see. And we'll try and work out who's in which. Now, this is uh, the quick car we saw there was the Darren Turner Craig Jameson car. That's that's one we definitely want to be keeping an eye on. But you will see some very, very competitive drivers uh, in this race. They don't get a lot of time in qualifying. Um, so I know they've got to hop in and hop out fairly quickly during this qualifying session to swap with their other drivers. And um, we'll just have to see how that all goes. But uh, yeah, very very exciting to watch beautiful cars as well this was actually the beginning of the relationship for ford and lotus to go together and of course later on it would uh, help with the cosworth ford engine all that sort of thing so so many lovely things to keep an eye on um, steve soper was uh, went quickest a moment ago ben Klukas' uh, car has now gone quickest and i think that that could be a pretty rapid machine actually with uh, the for how this goes, uh, Ben Klukas and Guy Smith in that uh, number 711. That's going to be an interesting one to watch. But yeah, this was the, the liaison between Ford and Lotus in 1963 when the car first came out that went on to um, more production in racing, not just these cars. But these were remarkably successful. And they're very elegant, fun cars to watch, aren't they? Yeah, they are. I, I checked out uh, on YouTube some quite impressive onboards. Uh, it must be said of 
of these cars going round, and I managed to actually go out and do a, a lap of, of my first ever lap of, of Goodwin. And I must say, what a fast circuit! And, and having to drive one of these round is yeah, incredible. Very, very jealous of these drivers, and uh, it's going to be competitive. 100%, it's going to be competitive. You've got some extremely deadly um, lineups as well. I think probably one of the most deadly ones is the Matt Neal and Gordon Shedden. Obviously both the touring car champions as well. So yeah, there's plenty of names to, to keep an eye on. So this is the fastest car at the moment. No, it was a moment ago. Sota's just gone quicker. Let's just see if they get it back again. Uh, as he crosses the line and nope, stays second this time. That was a 32.2 as opposed to a 31.7. So the Sota car has gone fastest. It looks to me as though Guy Smith is in that car at the moment, sharing it with Ben Klukas. They will give us a, a starting order, but they can pretty much do what they like in qualifying as to who goes out in which car first. Um, we've got the Rob Huff car up in third place at the moment, number 70. Alex Brundle's car up in fourth position currently, and the Mark Sumter Chris Goodwin car up into fifth place for now as well. Both uh, rapid racers themselves, so we'll see how it all goes. As I was saying about these 1500cc uh, twin cam engines, it, it was an engine that basically Lotus developed a Ford engine into a twin cam. They changed the cylinder head design and they came up with a, a fantastic engine, basically. Um, and nowadays, they actually, on all of these cars, I learned yesterday, they have to they limit them to just over 8,000 revs because some people were getting them up to 9,000 revs in the modern day. Um, but they all cars now have an electric limit on them, so it's fair for everybody. You only basically get 8,000 revs. Still sounds quite impressive, doesn't it? Very impressive. And you can see already people chopping and changing positions on track. It's almost like it's they're racing already. They're not going for a fastest <laughs> time, but that's not the part of the game now. Definitely trying to go for the fastest time to the 97, just crosses the line and goes even quicker. So a gap now to the 711 car by half a second. And actually now Brundle pops up into P2. Yeah, Alex Brundle going quickly there in the number 33 car as well. But as you say, that was another very quick lap. Steve Soper in the car at the moment. Uh, Mike Jordan in the number five car. So we'll keep an eye on Mike. Now, what is very interesting is that uh, the Jordan racing team, which is run by his son, Andrew, nowadays, they prepare a lot of these cars. And he was telling me yesterday they've got seven cars out that they've prepared for this weekend is pretty impressive number of cars they do a lot of the prep work and uh, neil brown does a lot of the engines on these cars as well oh it's all getting a bit tight to the chicane just about finding some space i want to get into a clear run here um but yeah so but also they're up against team dynamics these days it's just like touring car days because they're also restoring and rebuilding cars we're seeing a few come in already yeah exactly so team dynamics as well they'll be uh, very competitive because they have got, as I touched on earlier, the Matt Neal and Gordon Shedden yeah. in the number 25. So they have got a great lineup, two touring car champions. And, you know, here's a great view of the very tight pit lane as drivers chopping and changing already. We've still got a good 20 minutes left of the session, but we've got some drivers now. There's out. Mike uh, is trying to get, he's battled through the traffic, so just trying to get a good run now as he goes through St. Mary's 1 into St. Mary's 2. Track really drops away on the exit there, so you, you think you've got plenty of room and the exit's then right upon you. So Mike out, not necessarily setting the lap times, or the, the time is green uh, alight at the moment, but he's found perfect track position now. Steve Soper, uh, uh, still the fastest at this stage, on 131.219. Second fastest, the Alex Brundle car, number 33. That's the car that he's sharing with Julian Thomas. And then third fastest at the moment is the Guy Smith Ben Plukas, number 711. But we are likely to see a few changes. But it's a, it's a huge grid of Ford Lotus Cortinas celebrating the 60 years since they all began and then went on to some success. And they were driven in the 1960s by some real superstars. Now, there's a fun coloured car as well, isn't it? That's the number 68 car. Uh, Sam Tordoff and Michael Cullen, who uh, are sharing that car. In fact, this is an ex-rally car, um, Circuit of Ireland. It competed in the rally uh, in 1965, and quite a lot of uh, Ford Lotus Cortinas were very successful in rallying in the 1960s. So it wasn't just being on track, it was also being off track sometimes. 
No, exactly. And it, it did a little bit of rallying at the start of that shot we got of the car. It was uh, on the grass, so uh, having to drag it back on. The grass is still fairly wet, so we've seen a few drivers uh, in previous categories run out on the grass. It's not going to really dry too much now, but uh, fantastic looking shot now as uh, the car comes down the very, very long straight, extremely long in one of these these cars, down into to Woodcut now to eventually complete the lap. As we see, is that the number, number, one. number one car? Yeah, Tom Christensen's going to be in this car. I don't think he's in it now. Uh, he's sharing that with uh, Patrick Shovlin. So that's one to watch as well. And this is back to the um, Darren Turner, Craig Jameson. Well, this is quite a, an emotional story that we learnt uh, coming into this event. So, um, Craig Jameson and his wife Karen, uh, Goodwood supporters for many years, they decided they wanted to get involved. They've rebuilt this car. It took them five years to uh, rebuild it. And it's very much a memory of Craig's dad, who he remembers as a kid, his father. Well, in fact, I don't know if he remembers it. He was born the day his dad bought a Mark 1 Lotus, uh, Mark 1 Cortina. I don't think it was a Lotus Cortina. But the sad news that um, Craig's wife involved in this, Karen, died at the age of 47 uh, in 2021. So this event is marking her memory. This car being out on track is, is, mem is memoring, remembering uh, Karen, which is lovely. And they're up to sixth place, I gather. So that's a pretty good start for them at the moment. Maybe Darren is in the car in that case. Oh, off on the on the They're rallying for the rally car. Yeah, the rally car, as you said. Uh, I don't think it's going quite right, though, is it? No, it looks like that's intentionally pulling off in a very safe place. So really unfortunate end to the session for, for the number 68. I'm expecting the driver to, to pop out. So uh, Marshall's having a look. But back to the action on track as Darren Turner's getting a nice cheeky little toe from the number two car. Uh, Colin Turkington down the straight, but I don't think that's Colin driving the car at the moment. I think it is Darren in the other car, though, isn't it? Because he's certainly yes. flying along now. Yeah, doing certainly well. Is. Certainly is. So, uh, yeah. Oh, 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 that's interesting, isn't it? You hop that curb. Yeah. What happens? And he's Very going quite bad. sideways now. Yeah, he certainly is. A little bit out of shape, so he could obviously couldn't get it all the way back to the right-hand side for St. Mary's two. Um, that might actually, maybe that is Colin behind. There's another car. Uh, off uh, doing a little bit of sightseeing at number 33. Alex Brundle car, that's, I, don't know, I think that Alex is in it at the moment because they're second fastest at this stage. So, uh, yes. Yeah, it looks like he's uh, that's, that's Alex's helmet. So, taking a little trip off road. So we, we're seeing Darren now heading down to, to Woodcut, the hard braking zone, one of the hardest braking zones on the circuit. He's just drifting around <laughs> such a tricky corner. Must be fun for you, Alex, actually talking uh, about Alex on track rather than talking with him, because yeah. uh, he does a lot of commentary as well. You both do a lot of commentary, but he's enjoying himself being back on track, I think, this weekend. Yeah, I think he'd certainly uh, enjoy more being behind uh, behind the wheel. So uh, great thing to see. I know he's been doing quite a few of the historics. He was out at Donington the other weekend driving alongside Abby Eaton. Uh, and Darren, he's not, he's not holding back, is he? I'm surprised he's not popped up into... Uh, to the top of the the times lovely shot that because i saw the front wheel just lifting off the ground and there are there are some fantastic photographs over the history of jim clark with the front wheel you know ford lotus cortina off the ground and you could just see that a little bit there it's sort of memories in a way it's rather lovely so the steve sofa car is still fastest uh, up to second place now though has come andrew jordan in the number 44 car um, that's no surprise at all. Another touring car star, but the man, as I mentioned, who's been in charge of a lot of these cars being um, restored, rebuilt, ready to go racing. We're looking at the number 51 car. Neil Yarny is uh, part of that car this weekend. Huge experience, of course, for Neil. A slightly different type of machine to many of the cars that he's raced over the years. And he's going to be sharing this with uh, Ambrosio Perfetti. But for the moment, it's still Steve Soper fastest. And so we are beginning to see some good laps coming, but nothing quite as quick as that 131.2 that has set the outright pace of this. There's only 14 and a half minutes to go. We have seen quite a few swapping drivers already, but I imagine there may be a few more coming into the pit soon to swap over. The qualifying is going to be crucial. It's going to be such a competitive race, this, isn't it? Yeah, it's probably going to be one of 
the, the most competitive ones, as now we see coming down oh, straight. Oh, just gone fastest. Look, that's Andrew Jordan. There we go. So, obviously, he knows these cars pretty well inside out. I've got the indicator on. I don't think that's intentional. He's obviously had a fight in the wheel at some point. But I, I love these shots of the, these cars. The drivers are just such on the edge through this extremely fast circuit through full water now. This is going to come into St. Mary's one, coming up to a little bit of traffic as well. Just moving a lot underneath the brakes. <laughs> Nibbling the kerb, he's not afraid of that. Gets it nicely back to the right-hand side for St. Mary's too. Oh, he just looks like he's showing off, doesn't he? What control? Sliding out to the white line, but no, nowhere beyond it. This is a fantastic lap, fastest in the first sector again. Right out to the edge, but not going out. This is beautifully driven, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You can tell here he's had great experience with these cars and and circuit as well. He's probably just playing free. Please, can the traffic move out the way? Going to ruin the end of his lap. We'll see him fly through sector two to see how he gets on. Another personal best in that sector. So heavy on the brakes, down into Woodcut, drifting it all the way around. You can see the front wheels, all the control that and input he's having to put through the wheel as he comes into the chicane. He's going to be lucky with this last bit of traffic. Get a nice, neat run out, and I expect, Ben, I expect him to open up that gap at the top of the times. Let's have a look. Can he go quicker again? So, yes, he does. You're absolutely right. So he's done a 31.1. He's now done a 1 minute 30.9, despite not getting the perfect entry down into Woodcote, because he had to go in a bit tighter than was ideal for him. There you are, that's what happened. He had to go in tight. He's beautifully done. Incredible, what a shot, what a shot. That's how those cars, these cars should be driven, isn't it? Yeah. Right on the limit. Very, very impressive. I was talking to him about these cars yesterday, and he was saying, um, scrutineering, uh, they really analyze that you've uh, set these cars up correctly. Uh, wheelbase, for example, they don't only check the length, the, the wheelbase is the correct length, but the positioning of the wheels relative to the bodywork. So he says that uh, sometimes in the past people have really moved all the wheels as far forward as possible to make it almost into a mid-engined car to get the weight back. Um, but there are strict rules now, and it's all done here at Goodwood, and they measure it all, and it has to be absolutely to the millimetre. You're not allowed beyond a certain line. Uh, there were a few adjustments being made yesterday. Yeah, and sure it should be. You know, we want close competitive racing that we usually get here at Goodwood, so we don't want people, people let naturally, you know, teams try and uh, push the rules and interpret the rules different, but great job here by the scrutineering side um, of Goodwood. We see the, the Prio car now, number 13. Lucky, unlucky for some. <laughs> yeah, nice livery though. It's a slightly different livery on this car as well. This was an Australian uh, touring car racer in 1964 and 1965 so slightly different look to it but uh, these cars really did work were raced all over the world uh, as they became so successful and it's fantastic to see that and this one is certainly going to be one to watch as well with Andy Prio and Sean Lynn sharing it over the course of the weekend and 12th place at the moment okay so hopefully they'll find a little bit more performance if they can but for the moment, it's still Andrew Jordan sharing the number 44 car. Oh, but we've got a good lap going on right now in the number 57 car. So Mike Gardner and Josh Cook are sharing that. So Josh Cook may well be in the car right now. Another touring car star. Let's see uh, how that goes because, yeah, second sector still fast in a straight line. Uh, yeah, it's just gone fastest, number 57, slipstream down the straight over the line. That was good timing. Yeah, fantastic time. And Josh has got, if anyone gets to see it, a brilliant helmet. I don't know if you've seen it, Ben. Of, uh, sort of almost looks like you're looking at him. This is the side of his face on the side of a helmet. You've got to see it to, to believe it, but a fantastic time popping up to the top of the time sheets. Oh, it's good to see, isn't it? Let's watch him a little bit. Let's compare. Still lots of work going on on the steering wheel. So this was when he came up to the chicane. Not ideal, thinking, oh, my goodness, I want a good lap. I don't want to be held up here. But he judged it well. He did judge it very well. Got a little bit of a toe from the number 20 uh, onto the, uh, the main straight. So it looks like to me, from judging uh, the driving that's going on track at the moment, Ben, is sideways. I think it seems pretty fast <laughs> if we're going from uh, watching... Uh, Josh Cook and, and Andrew Jordan's driving style in these. I think that's fun to see, and that's what I love watching, actually, in classic uh, racing, 
you're always sort of taught, aren't you? We know, you know, driving quickly nowadays, being sideways is not the fastest thing, but in older cars, it really can still work. Yeah, certainly can. It's probably a more fun way of, dr of driving, isn't it, surely? Going, going sideways can be fun. But uh, Josh Cook now heading down into the chicane, not setting the world alight on this lap, but the Jordan car, number 44, has just set a personal best in the first sector. So keep an eye on that because he has made a decent improvement in that first sector. So be heading down into sector two now. As you can see, oil from previous races uh, eventually fading away. Back with the Prio car. Have they made any types of proof? Not at the moment. Oh, they have, sorry, yeah, jumped up to P6. So one second off the pace at the moment. But there's the Andrew Jordan car now as adjustments in the cockpit to his helmet, like he's on a Sunday drive, driving down that very, very long straight. Where he'll hit heavy onto the brakes into Woodgood Corner. Not an improvement in that middle sector, but if he can pull something out on this last sector, he could pop up uh, and, and jump the 57 car. Well, let's see how it goes for Andrew. 2013 British Touring Car Champion, the man who's taken 26 victories. Well, he's going to back it off now and bring it in so that he can swap over which does make sense they've done well but uh, it is josh cook and remember josh cook is the superstar of thruxton he loves fast circuits it seems to suit him well here at goodwood too doesn't it yeah it does they're fairly similar i would you know from the lap i did earlier i thought well this reminds me a little bit of castle coon but at thruxton those fast on the edge you know you've got to get your head up look look ahead and plan ahead because they all the car corners approach you very, very quickly as the, the 97, the Sopa car now. I think this might have been a swap now. I think Mark, yeah. I think Mark Drain is probably in the car now. I think Steve was initially setting those quick laps. Um, so we shall see how that changes. We're, we're going to get some different drivers in, so it's still possible we're going to see some changes. I notice Tom Christensen's moved up to 13th. I think he's only just recently gone out. Uh, there'll be a few others who may just be jumping up the list as we've still got seven minutes to go. Oh, there's a lovely slide uh, coming out, keeping it under control so far. And that is the number 51 car. So that's the uh, Neil Yarny car. He's certainly getting to grips with this, I think. Yeah, it definitely looks like it. So the timing screens now, quite a few greens popping up. We've got in the 777 car, so 777 car, Jake Hill. Um, who had a bit of an off oh, earlier yeah. on that, yeah. um, in one of the, the classes he was racing in. So hopefully he's put that behind him now. Set a, not a bad first sector, but something's gone a bit amiss in the middle sector. So I expect, Ben, that we will see some, some quicker lap times, and this probably won't be our final order. No, it could well change before the end, but we've seen some... We have seen very impressive lap times already, as you say. Uh, so there is the triple seven that's coming over the line of Jake Hill. So let's have a look and see how Jake is getting on. Don't sure that it's. Yeah, I don't know if it's Jake in the car at the moment. Not sure, it might be, but um, we shall see. He's certainly hoppling yeah, around. It's Jake. I think it's Jake. It's new yeah. helmet he's got for this year. Running yes. with the Laser Tools team, in British touring cars. See, now this is the area where it went, it went wrong for him earlier, isn't it? Yeah, so it looked like earlier he was just a little bit too heavy with the brakes coming in through that and he hasn't lost confidence, he hasn't lost confidence <laughs> hitting the curb there, but nicely through there goes, goes Jake. Definitely hasn't lost any confidence at all. It's not quite as quick through that first sector as you kind of need to be at the moment. In fact, we've just seen a, a fastest first sector again from uh, Josh Cook. So Josh is on another rapid lap. He's already set the provisional pole position time here, but Josh has just done 28.6 through the first sector, which is four tenths faster than uh, what we've just seen Jake Hill do. So all the cars are different, of course. All are, um, some are beautifully prepared to the very highest level. Some are more original versions of their cars. That looks like an A-frame rear chassis, by the way. Um, they do vary a little bit. They were, the original cars were built with the A-frame rear chassis, uh, rear suspension, and then they went abruptly back to uh, a normal axle with semi-elliptic springs on them because it was more reliable that way. And uh, so there was a change in the order of these being built. 
Just looking there at the number 25 car, uh, the Matt Neal Gordon Shetton car. This is an amazing combo, <laughs> the two of them. But at the moment, they are down in sixth place. So we shall see if they can get a bit more. I think it's Gordon in there, isn't it? Yeah, looks like it. Oh. Who's that taking, uh, deciding not to go into the, the tie barrier? Great choices. Typical touring car fashion on the exit there. It's either Matt Neal or Gordon Shedden. I think it might be Gordon Shedden using a little bit extra on the track going onto the grass, but they stay in sixth place for now. It's the Team Dynamics car, of course. They'll be hoping to move slightly further at the field. They're certainly used to running at the front of touring cars now. It's Gordon has a little cheeky look in his mirror. Not too bothered about the traffic behind. All focus on eyes ahead. Cook, even though he did set that purple first sector, didn't go any quicker, but the Jordan car now, number 44, has set near enough uh, yeah. s uh, a personal best, but pretty much matching the, the fastest time in sector one. Good point. So this could be another good lap here from Andrew Jordan, who at the moment is only less than a tenth away from that top spot. So how's his second sector going? Is he going to get reason? I think it's reasonably clear. I don't think he's got traffic in front of him. Just looking from our commentary box as well. He's got a completely clear run, I think. Oh, actually, no, there are a couple of cars up a bit further up ahead, are there? No, he's coming to the chicane. He's fine. He's clear. And let's just see what this lap is like. 26.8 in the first sector. And over the line, is it enough? No, not quite. That's a 31-0. Yeah, so lost a little bit of time, lost over half a second, actually, to, to the best in that, that middle sector. Uh, back with the, the Shedding car, who on our screen is not getting any sectors for them. So we just have to have a little patient wait as we, the 107 car of Chilton, behind the wheel. Is that him at the moment? May well be, Max. Is it Max Chilton in the car at the moment? I'm not sure if it is Max in there at the moment. He's uh, sharing it with uh, Pedro Macedo Silva. And, but it is going pretty quickly at this stage. They're currently in uh, 15th position. As you say, the Jake Hill car hasn't really moved up much. That's still down in 16th position at this stage. We've got uh, Manuel Piro car down in 19th place. Yeah, the Chilton car just going, setting a personal best in that first sector, about a tenth and a half off the fastest first sector time. So if you keep an eye on them, they're in sector two now. Great shot bit coming through. Is that St. Mary's one? We at? No, I'm in a different part of the track there. Uh, they got actually a good sighter in front of them of the, the Gordon Shedden car, so yeah, getting, getting in the good, toe of that. Yeah, it's a good opportunity, isn't it, to chase at what well, is a quick car, we know already. Um, see whether he can get just that little bit more pace out of it. Everybody, oh, off has gone the number six car, that is the Henry Mann Karun Chandok car. <laughs> didn't see who was driving that. I didn't see quite. It's Karun. <laughs> oh, it is Karun, it's Karun's crash helmet. So Recognise the colours, so... Thankfully, he hasn't actually hit anything. Just had a little spin onto the grass. Let's see what happened. St. Mary's. Oh, uh, it had already gone here. Corner, yeah. So I think he's either maybe just ran a little bit, carried a little bit too much speed into St. Mary's one, and then just before St. Mary's two. Oh, yeah, just flick back. Yeah, just flick back. <laughs> but uh, looked like he'd done that on deliberately, pulled out of the way nicely, but he's back going now, which is great. Yeah, he's on his way. Only uh, less than 30 seconds to go. Are we going to see any last-minute changes? We have seen the uh, Matt Neal Gordon Shedden car uh, up to fourth place, so that has been a slight improvement for them on a 1 minute 31.5. Decent first sector going on for Andrew Jordan at the moment. Oh, and uh, pulling off to the side of the track, that's the Mark Drain Steve Soper car. So that is the car that Steve was driving earlier and set the pace in the initial stages of this session. And now that car has pulled off. Can't see smoke anywhere, but clearly there's something mechanical that is not right. So they've had to pull over. The checker flag is just about out, I think. And uh, so the session is coming to an end. Uh, Jordan didn't manage to improve. He had to back off, actually, I think. Oh, he's actually you know, he's just coming around now. Let's just have a look at this. I don't think we're going to see too many changes. Over the line he goes. 
and he stays in second place. Yeah, that was a 133.9 in the end. But the difference between first and second, just 0 0.088 of a second, and that just gives us some indication of how close a battle this race is going to be, particularly being a two-driver race, um, with some star drivers in every single car, but also some privateer entrant drivers, some of them with experience, particularly when you look at the McNeil Gordon Shedden mix, um, and the guys Smith Ben Klukas mix, but then others where you've got a mix of you know genuine Lotus Cortina fans, but not necessarily top top racing drivers. No, but can still pedal a car for sure, and certainly competitive. Disappointing that the had a yellow flag out in the the last lap there. It did uh, by the looks of it ruin several laps of uh, some of the others, so no one was able to make improvements, but. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a competitive field, even though the time might not necessarily. OK, the front two are very, very close. Um, but, I, you know, it will be competitive throughout the race. It's, it's a long race. There's lots of things can go wrong, especially uh, in that tight pit lane. You know, pit stops are going to be really, really key. Uh, and, and so can the start. You know, these are very experienced, very competitive racing drivers. They will be gunning for it at the start. So I expect... No carnage. It'd be nice not to see any carnage, but uh, it would certainly be, be close. And a lot of them are touring cars. And what do they like doing? Rubbing wheels and uh, wing mirrors as well. That's right, yes. <laughs> I hope you don't end up with too much damage on them when there's some lovely history to some of these cars as well. But we shall wait and see how it all works out. But it's been a, a fascinating start. And it's the uh, touring car stars right up front with Josh Cook taking pole position by a tiny margin from Andrew Jordan in another of the full field of these Ford Lotus Cortinas. Steve Soper uh, in the car that's qualified third fastest, and then the Matt Neal Gordon Shedden car is up there. And I think because of the strength of both drivers in that, uh, we will have to consider that starting from the second row as very much a potential race winner. We will see uh, when we get to the race itself. But that's the car that has taken pole position. Well done to the number 57 machine, Josh Cook and Mike Gardner. They've come out really well in this one, and they will have that top spot for the start of the race. Lovely to see. So let's just confirm qualifying for the Jim Clark Trophy. Cook and Gardner taking pole position from Dickinson and Jordan by a tiny, tiny margin. Steve Soper nearly the same level of time. Then uh, we've got Matt Neal and Gordon Shedden. Alex Brundle's up there. Then Klukas as well. Um, Darren Turner's car that he's sharing with Craig Jameson, that's in eighth position. Giuliani was 10th in the end in the number 51 car. Further down the list, uh, Mark Sumter and Chris Goodwin, they were 13th. The Jake Hill car was 14th ahead of Tom Christensen, interestingly, and the Max Chilton car as well. Uh, we've also got uh, Dario Franchitti's car down in that part of the order, down in 17th place. Piro, 19th. Uh, Blundell down in 20th position. And then further on down the list, We've got uh, the other uh, Frankitti there, Marino Frankitti. He's out in car number 544 with Jack Moody. Uh, but that one not going quite so rapidly on this occasion. That is a, a new build car by SMTG Motorsport. Didn't quite get the performance they were hoping for. Uh, Tiffany Dell down towards the bottom as well there in 29th place. So let's take a look at some of the highlights from that uh, lovely qualifying session for the Ford Lotus Cortinas. And we saw some dramatic moments, didn't we, Alex? They're, they're really sliding the car to the absolute limit and popping over the curves as well. Yeah, we certainly certainly did. The 82 car there, Darren Turner. I think whether that's the fastest way to drive them as uh, he was feathering through the traffic. Obviously, lots of cars on track here, but there is the Andrew Jordan car showing off what he can do, getting it sideways, drifting around the corners and nearly pipping into P1. But this is the car that did it, Josh Cook. Number 57 has taken pole position for the Jim Clark Trophy.
It's like motoring heaven here. It's motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's a sort of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then... Michael Rotted, doesn't matter what age of machine we put you on, but you're always quick. But I think these guys are quite close behind you. Yeah, I think there's about six or seven of us, which uh, within like a second anyway, but it's, it's uh, always going to be close. You know, bike racing around here, it does, uh, it does bring out good racing. And you don't, you don't have to run across the track this time to start, so you probably breathe a sigh of relief with that. I was going to say, walking up the paddock is bad enough, so running across that track, but, you know, um, yeah, it's the first time I've been on the bike, so, uh, yeah, we've got a few issues with um, a bit of fuel in and a misfire, so we've got to keep it in, like, a, a real small power band, so it's, uh, we'll see if it goes all right and see if it finishes the race. A bit worried about it, really. So, theoretically, there could be more time to come. Uh, yeah, but everybody, you know, everyone goes quicker, so everyone's got issues, you know. These are old bikes, and uh, we all have to play around with them and try and get the best out of them. Enjoy it. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you, but what I love about all you riders is you, you just drop into the conversation that's the first time you've been on this bike, and here you are on the front row. Yeah, yes, uh, first time I rode a TZ uh, 350 um, this morning, so yeah, yeah, it was just uh, nice and steady away, really, just bed myself into it and make sure I don't break it so that it's, it's good for the race this afternoon. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it, it should be good. And uh, you know, these bikes were so successful. Do you get an idea of why when you ride it now? Yeah, I was, I was surprised at the speed of it, actually. It was quite surprising. You know, Goodwood is a, a very fast circuit. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I was really surprised with the speed of the thing. And, um, 
the handling, you know, it's a it's a race bike at the end of the day, so you know that it's going to go around corners well. So uh, yeah, really really chuffed with all of it. Really good. Best of luck. Thank you. Cheers. Let's take a look at the Goodwood circuit, largely unchanged since its heyday back in the 1960s. 2.36 miles of an unforgiving circuit. The grass banks are close, the grass verges are even closer. Heading off the start, you head first towards Madgwick, an off-camber, tricky right-hander with a bump at the apex. It is so, so important to get the line right and get a good exit as you charge up towards Fordwater. A daunting right-hander, again off camber, slightly dropping downhill at the exit as well. It is incredibly high speed. Up towards St. Mary's, it first goes right, then go left. Don't be too greedy with a curb on the left-hand side and that'll put you offline. The track drops slightly downhill and then back up again towards a double right-hander of Lavin. Getting a good exit and traction out of here is hugely important because that leads you onto the fastest part of the track. Through the little kink, heading towards Woodcut. A long, long right-hander with the apex seems to take an age to get to. The back of the car always edgy and then you get hard on the brakes for the chicane. We've seen many an incident there with drivers getting just a bit too greedy with the curb and the walls of the inside line. Get all of this right and you will be the winner across the line. Scott Carson, it all seems pretty close on the starting grid, so I guess it's all to play for. Yeah, no, definitely. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be an interesting race, I think, especially at the start. Uh, be a good few laps, you know. Um, yeah, I think it's half a second between first and fifth, so it's going to be good. Yeah, can't wait. But, it's, it's, I mean, it's a short race, isn't it? So you can't make any mistakes. Yeah, so seven lap race, so get your head going straight away. A um, couple of laps, try and assess and go again, you know, so, yeah. It could be quite frantic, yeah. yeah. Best of luck. No, thank you. Cheers. Part of the competition aspect of the members' meeting is to split the drivers and attendees into four separate groups to battle for the honour of what is known as the House Shield. Just like Hogwarts in Harry Potter's youth, there are four houses, and it's even more random as to who ends up where. Each house is named after titles belonging to the Goodwood Master, the Duke of Richmond. And there are house captains from famous racing backgrounds. Peugeot Le Mans factory driver in the 2000s, Nicolas Minassian, is captain of House Albigny, which is represented on the shield by the Fleur de Lys. Ex-Formula One driver and Le Mans winner, Jochen Mass, is the frontman for House Darnley, for which the crest is the boar's head. Former British touring car ace Anthony Reid is captain of House Methuen, represented by the Lion's Head, while five times winner of Le Mans, Emmanuel Ipiro, is head of House Torbolton, which is celebrated by the Harp. Every driver at the event scores points according to how they finish in each race. But it's not just about track action. Anybody who attends the event can dive into some fantastic challenges and also score points. Fancy some laser clay shooting? Or what about axe throwing? Perhaps Skittles is more suitable, or even sheep herding, amongst loads of options. There's also the important house group tug of war, where the house captains take a grip. As usual, there is no I in team. The house shield is about everyone at Goodwood. And it's early times in this 80th uh, members meeting at Goodwood this weekend, but the battle has started already in the House Challenge. And we can tell you that Tor Bolton is currently leading. So, uh, Emmanuel Ipiro, uh, the uh, captain of that team, he'll be happy, particularly as they were the House winner. Ah, oh, sorry, uh, it's Darnley, right? Yes, Darnley just slightly quicker, uh, slightly more points, sorry, two, three, seven, eight. So my mistake there, Tor Bolton, uh, two, three, five, nine. So it's Darnley, it's not Emmanuele Piro's team after all. It is the Darnley team, uh, which is in charge at the moment. Current captain is Jochen Mass, so he'll be happy about that. Uh, but it's all still pretty close. It will result, of course, or, or as we go through the weekend with the results on track, but the results off track as well, as people have some fun and games around the Goodwood circuit. So uh, that's part of the fun this weekend, but there's so much going on. Let's go and see what Rachel has discovered. 
Well, members meeting really does bring fans from all over the world. I've met Paolo here from South Africa. Uh, welcome. I mean, what's your experience been of the 80th meeting so far? Thank you, Rachel. Um, that's been fantastic. It's lovely. Um, I, I get to come along as a friend of a, a of a member and um, it's just wonderful to see all the cars you don't get to see all this back in South Africa what's your pick of the bunch this year that you've got to go and see oh um, it's normally the, um, the the saloon cars that, that draw my attention and in terms of being a South African a, a big fan of Gordon Murray the legend himself of course of course it'd be lovely to go and even go and say hello to him one day but I, I, ha I saw him I think I was here two years ago and I saw him and uh, it was just a wow moment. And aside from the cars, what else makes this event so special? Well, I think the effort that the uh, that goes into the whole event. I mean, you get nothing like this around the world, really. It is very special. Well, Paolo, thanks for chatting to us. I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's lovely to have fans from all over the world coming to Goodwood this weekend. And we are now building up to what is going to be a fascinating first race. And uh, it's actually a beautiful afternoon as well. James Hayton has joined me in the commentary box. James, we are thoroughly looking forward to uh, the Halewood Trophy coming up very shortly. Yeah, very much. I mean, really tight. Top five within half a second. And uh, it is close. We've got two strokes in the mix. We've got the four strokes in the mix. So really looking good. It was this man we're looking at, Michael Rutter. He put it on pole, but he's got a little misfire that they can't quite get rid of at the moment. So he's not sure how much that will affect him. Very interesting. I was looking at the lap times that they did. So 129.1 was his pole position. I was comparing that with the cars. Funnily enough, the, the Gordon Spice Trophy um, is right in between what they were doing in the Ford Capris and like the Volkswagen Golf GTIs. Uh, it's that sort of level of pace. It's pretty rapid around here. Yeah, it is. And yeah, they'll probably go a bit quicker than that. You know, I wouldn't. If I think we would certainly see 28s, if not 27s, in the uh, in the race. Uh, we look at number 24 there, Scott Carlson, and he was really flying as well on that 350. Um, and now with Graham Hicklett again, another man you know, on the four strokes. Remember, we got two different classes within this. We got the the Sheen Trophy, which we're looking at there, which is the 750 bikes, Formula 750, you know, up to 1972. And then we've got the uh, the Hellwood Trophy, which is the light little 350, 250 Grand Prix bikes, and uh, really trick things yeah it's going to be fascinating i noticed actually that it's five all in the top 10 on the grid <laughs> five four strokes and five two strokes so this was when they were out in qualifying earlier they were the first bikes out or the first machines out on track earlier on today but it was right at the end that we saw some rapid laps yeah that's right well just like now the conditions were getting better and better the sun was coming out the wind had dried most of the damp patches so it was about staying out there and also the type of circuit that goodwood is you, know, you need to work at it roll it down build your confidence re-familiarize yourself with it so yeah the, the last laps were the best uh, you've raced here plenty of times around Goodwood, so you know the track. Um, when that, when you get into that first lap, what are, what are the sort of big challenges, really, of getting it right? I mean, firstly, obviously, no tyre warmers, so you've got to balance that really get going. You know, you've got to get going, you've got to pull some tyres, but not do too much. Also, you know, you've got to just try and get away with them because you don't want to lose too much time in that last lap. Yeah, no, I can imagine first that. Lap, well. Yeah, and we could have quite a, an interesting battle between the four strokes and the two strokes, some in quick in other areas. Uh, the number 20 bike that we're looking at there now, just getting ready to come out onto the track. It's going to be, it's going to be an interesting time. That is uh, uh, Anthony Hart, and then next to him we've got uh, Jimmy May on another of the Yamaha 350. So this is another of the two strokes. They're a water-cooled uh, two stroke that the Yamaha produced in the 70s that worked so well. Wasn't yeah, it? that's right. Parallel twin. You know, they put out about 60, 70 brake horsepower. But the really important point you have to remember: these are 115 kilos. The big super bikes are 220, 230. So they're twice the weight and they've probably got another 15 20 brake horsepower at most so it's a quite a different style the four strokes have got the torque so they drive off the turn slightly easier but the lightest two strokes they're more nimble they're easier to ride but they've got a narrower power band they haven't got anything really below eight and a half so you've just got to keep them singing well, there you are there's a four stroke that's uh, a cb 750 honda um from 1971 so slightly earlier so just to remind you that the four stroke you uh, the, the the latest sort of four strokes around 1974 um, whereas the two strokes were going up to the mid 1980s here um, yamaha really were incredibly successful we do have a 
Harley Davidson 250. In fact, Harley Davidson had some success in the 70s, although it was more of an Italian designer who was involved in that, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Iraqis and it, yeah, they got that. We also got, you know, they've just got such a the, the Yamahas, the 350s are all TZs out there, and they were just such a great bike. It launched thousands of people's careers because you could buy one, you could be competitive. They were cheap to run, easy to work on. So people absolutely loved them. And the racing was tight, it was close, and it was fair. So as we're seeing you know, here today, the amazing thing is that they balanced this with the older four strokes, um, you know, with the heavier four strokes, but with the bigger capacity. And they're amazingly evenly matched. Just looking at the number 12 bike there, that's uh, Ian Bain on another of the Yamaha TZ350s. We shall see how that goes as we get into the race itself. It could be a very, very uh, hardball battle. And the other thing we've got to remember, and I want to see whether he makes it, is Emmanuel Tiro. Whether he, he had a problem with the bike earlier, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And um, certainly 45 minutes ago when I was in the pits, yeah, that engine was out. It was split apart. Now, they can get these things rebuilt amazingly quickly because they're designed for it, but fingers crossed. OK, well, let's wait and see. The bikes are coming around now to head towards the grid. They get an outlap and uh, then they will be coming onto the grid and then we will get our first race of the weekend underway it uh, promises to be pretty exciting whoever wins today obviously can celebrate the victory but it won't be the overall win for the weekend because they'll do another race tomorrow and it is the combined result that will apply to the overall result so uh, if you only have one good race it might not work out you've got to have two decent races but obviously if they do well today they will celebrate a little bit or getting too carried away Lovely to see them out there. Just taking it fairly steady on the outlap. Don't be rushing around at this point. No, that's right. Yeah, the two strokes you can see them just sort of smoking a little bit whilst they, uh, you know, whilst they get going, clearing themselves out. We look back there. There is Carlson. We said he's on the front row in, uh, uh, on in third spot and looking really, really good behind him there. Number 37, Dan Cooper. He's another man to watch. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're watching him, no doubt about it. Dan Jackson's a bit further back than we expected because he went well here last year. He's down in 14th place on the grid. Yeah, there's a few guys are back, you know, also Gary Vines, uh, he's yeah. in 10th, number 23, he's on the 250 bike, and uh, he's, uh, there, there he is, just going through the picture now, and he had a little problem with his bike, uh, so they've got it rebuilt, and again, he's a man that I think will come through a little bit. And there's number 13, Luke Hedger, double British champion in uh, 125s and uh, National Superstock 600s, he's on the Triumph there. Smoking a bit, looks more like a two-stroke than a four-stroke at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> should, well, shouldn't fingers be crossed for him. Yeah. He did have a problem earlier, didn't it? Um, he was uh, pulled out uh, right at the end of the session. Um, and I have to say, I haven't seen Piro out there yet. I haven't seen the number 66 bike out there, sadly. So I'm not sure we're going to get him out there. Um, that's a little bit of a shame. So they're coming around onto the grid now, beginning to line themselves up. We'll have three on the front row, and then two, so it's an alternate. 3-2-3 grid. It's going to be so important. Seven laps. Oh, someone else has died in the pits there. Seven laps. You've got to get a got to get a good start if you can because you can't afford to give too much away in such a short race. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's uh, everybody getting keyed up for this first race. It should be great fun. A little bit of a breeze blowing, but we've got a sun cloud around, but it's a beautiful day compared to how it was yesterday. Thankfully, they weren't uh, having to do practice yesterday in the pouring rain. It was just a question of getting here, getting the bikes prepared, and that's what they've done. So you're looking at the front row there. On the right, you're looking at Michael Rutter, number 67, with the yellow and blue front end. Uh, in the middle, 37, uh, that is the second place. That's Dan Cooper. And then if we just move out a little bit more, you'll see the number 24, Scott Carson. There it is. So there are your three front runners, 24, 37, and pole position for 67, Michael Rutter. On the second row, we've got Graham Higlett, number 50, Triumph. And we've got Rob Whitty in the Honda. So we've got uh, three four-strokes versus two two-strokes on the front two rows. And you can hear them just revving up nicely as we prepare for the start of all this. Bikes all getting nicely fired up. And won't be long before they're given the message that this race can get underway. We just need to keep a little eye out on what's going on. We've got a minute's pause before we will see the bikes actually get it going. So they don't want to over red at this stage, do they? No, that's right. You've got to be careful with these two strokes here. Want some air going through that rad to, to keep them cool. 
So hopefully they won't keep them there too long. I think you can see how the riders are looking around saying, come on, we're all together, let's go. Because normally you want to try and get a, a bike race off fairly yeah, quickly. Very much. Just getting some people off the pit wall as well, making sure that they're nice and clear there. As we look up towards the top end, there's Rob Whitty on the Honda CRS, an experienced rider. We're all set for the start of the Harewood Trophy here. This is the lineup on the grid. It's Michael Rutter, Dan Cooper, and Scott Carson who are on the front row together. Then Graham Hicklett and Rob Whitty. We've got a mix of four strokes and two strokes. The Yamaha TZ350s are all two strokes. When you see the Triumphs and Hondas, they are four strokes. You've got this battle between the two. The Halewood Trophy is the overall race. Uh, the Sheen Trophy is all part of that. And whoever wins in the four stroke class wins the Sheen Trophy. But this is a two day race because whatever happens today, they then have to do it again tomorrow. And uh, they're just getting around for another lap to bring them round onto the grid. We've got somebody struggling a little bit to get off the grid there. A couple of Harley, Harley Davidson down at the back. And it does look as though Emanuele Piro is not making the start of this race, I'm afraid to say. Had a problem earlier on. Uh, this is the uh, rotary engine bike, isn't it? It is. It's the DK DKW. So, um, yeah, the rotary engine, a really amazing piece of kit. Whether or not it didn't like sitting there for... For a while, unfortunately, he's pulled it aside, but we'll wait and see. Really important on this outlap, get your tyres warmed up, get your brakes, and especially as they've been waiting, just get a bit of air through that radiator, um, just bring the temperature down a bit. Well, James, I know you, you love racing around here on motorbikes. You've done it on many occasions. Would you, if you had the choice, would you be now going out there on a, on a, on a 350 two-stroke, yeah. or would you be on a big four-stroke? Which would you prefer? 350 two-stroke, yeah, okay. yeah, or a 250, yeah. Lovely little nimble live things. Lots of fun to race, really pure, they're built for racing. They're just a slightly different thing, and it's been a, a long while since I've uh, thrown my leg on one of those off and taken it around the track. Yeah, well, it's good fun. It's lovely to see them out here. And the sound, the sound is unique. We don't get it very often on circuits now, except for classic racing, really. Very much, you know, very that crisp, high revving. Um, yeah, they're, they're really interesting things to ride, and again, built for racing, so they just do what they're designed to do, and they handle beautifully, they, they stop nicely. It's a really nice, light package. But how easy is it to lock up a, a, for a seize-up a two-stroke engine? In the old days, seizing up yeah, a two-stroke was a, a common thing. It was, you know, but it's about getting them jetted right, you know, plug chops, looking at the plug, getting the coloration right, you know, your, your, your needle position, your main jet, you know, all these were really critical things in, in getting the best out of a two-stroke. So, Michael Rutter on pole position. You've raced against him over the years. Many times. We started off as little super teens and made it to World Superbikes. So, yeah, and he's you know, been fantastic. He's won TTs, lots of British champion, um, yeah, British championship wins as well as BSB. And uh, we've got uh, some really top riders alongside. Dan Cooper uh, on the Yamaha. He really was impressed with how it's gone on this bike. It's the first time he's ridden this particular bike. Uh, so, he's on the middle of the front row. Scott Carson on the uh, outside of the front row. It's actually the inside. They, they do it the other way around to the cars here. So pole position up on the outside, looking from this side on the left-hand side, heading down towards Madgwick Corner as we get ready for the start of the first race at the 80th members meeting here at Goodwood, a classic event. And we're on for a classic motorbike race. Race underway, and it's a great start from Michael Rutter initially, but a good start from Scott Carson as well. Number yeah. 24, but also Graham Higlett. Graham Higlett, number 50. He's made a brilliant getaway. He did for the second row, really timed that right. Um, it was actually uh, Dan Cooper who just bogged it down a little bit, easy to do on it. But oh. look at Carson around the outside, bike just shaking his head. That did look a bit scary, but he's still there. He's still there. Scott Carson is leading it with Higlett back into second position now, having made that brilliant start on the four stroke. It's a two stroke bike that is currently leading, just beginning to pull out just a touch. Uh, Dan Cooper's running in third, another of the Yamahas. Yeah, and you saw uh, 23 there, Gary Vines. He was just going around the outside. Oh, he's having a little look on Rutter. He's done well. He was 10th on the grid, but felt he could come through, so we'll keep an eye on him. He's first 250. But it is the 350TZ with Scott Carson, number 24, out in front. Yeah, I'll be watching the lines, there's no doubt about it, because he was so impressive here last year on that 250. Oh, <laughs> someone's all, it has to look like a bit of oil coming out that oh. bike. And uh, that's, uh, that is, I'm pretty sure, that 
It's number 15, I think it is. I think it's Dean Mitchell. All oh, right, he's off the bike. He looks fine. So, but unfortunate, the way to get things going. The Scott Carson's made a really good getaway. This Dan Cooper in the second place now, with Graham Higlett still there in third. Yeah, he is. He's just uh, Dan Cooper just slipping up the inside. You can see that uh, Carson's really got his head down. He can't let him get too far in front. As they're coming to just sort of cross the line, and that was number six as well, wasn't that? That was Nick Williamson. He's had a good start. Michael Rudd's had dropped out a bit from pole position. He's still up there. He's still in fourth position in the yellow bike with the number 67. I think what you're seeing again is a little bit of this misfire. You know, they were struggling to diagnose it. They changed plugs. They were looking all over. They've gone through the carburetors, but they couldn't quite find what that problem was. We'll keep an eye on him. And there, yes, there's a good battle there between the 350 and the 250. Yeah, Gary Vines, the number 23, that is the 250, and it's not as quick in a straight line, but boy, it's quick around the corners. He was so impressive here last year. Let's just have a look at what happened if we can. Oh, went uh, early there. It did go early, so, um, you know, just that's really cold tyres, first lap. Um, he's just, just gone a little bit hard, and unfortunately down he's gone. Yeah, we're right, it, was, it is the number 15 bike that went down, so uh, Dean Mitchell, so, but it's all OK, I think. And uh, we're back to the battle up front. Yeah, Rutter's got past uh, uh, Hicklett, so Rutter now up into third. So the man who was so quick in qualifying is beginning to pick his way through. And Hicklett, who made the fantastic starts, coming under a little bit more pressure now from Nick Williamson. Nick in the Yamaha, on the Yamaha, trying to get past. Can he do it under braking? Is this where the two-stroke can break a little later? Yes, it is, and he's just about to, he's muscling it out, but he'll have the inside line. He's, he might try and square him off back to the ish game, but not quite. Scott Carson's doing well up front. He's got over a second gap now, so he's beginning to open it up a little bit more as he goes over the line, setting quick lap time as well. Yeah, it's up to two and a half seconds. Yeah, 127.3, so yeah, it's a really quick time. Spoke to Carlson after practice, and he said they were just changing the jetting on it, just getting it running a little bit sweeter, and he's obviously got it. He said it's all about getting the tyres going quickly, and he's done that really well. He has done that well. Fantastic job, no doubt about it. Just looking down in the background there as well, we've got uh, Dan Jackson. He's beginning to, to catch up on the number 55 bike, so did well last year. He had a bit of a poor qualifier. I don't know whether they had a mechanical. There it is, number 55, uh, white bike, uh, rider in black overalls and black crash helmet. Yeah. He's definitely moving up. Yeah, so TZ250G again, but that one's got a Harris chassis. So it's, uh, you know, they were Harris and Spond and a few manufacturers built different chassis at the time. It's the number 55 we're talking about, and uh, he's going really well. Yeah, he's doing a good job. Chased by Rob Whitty, who was one of the uh, second row starters on one of the four-stroke Hondas. So he's still in the mix as well. But yes, keep an eye on Dan Jackson here because whatever didn't quite work in qualifying, it looks like to me they've solved it. It's going much, much quicker in the race. And he's getting on to that lead group, even though Scott Carson up front has got himself a very useful advantage so far. Look at this, he's already swept past Graham Higlett. Yeah, that was really nice round the outside. Looks like he might have cost himself a fraction of time coming out, but it's, uh, in front of him is going to be Williamson next. Yeah, that's right. Nick Williamson is his next target. Overtaking here, which, what do you feel on a bike are the best corners, the best areas to get past? Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, there's, you know, there's a, there's, the nice thing about Goodwood is there's a couple of fast, different lines, so you don't always have to follow. Um, and that's, so there's a, yeah, there are different places you can pass. You know, I like passing and come through this little right kink now, and then we come into that the right there. That's all I found a really good spot into the next left as well. Come up the inside there. Oh no, oh, not again. Gary Vines has got another problem. He's still running. You can see he's still running, but he's got something. So we thought he uh, might be back in the action. He'll be disappointed. But uh, unfortunately, his race is over again. That's the TZ250, the 84 bike of, uh, of Vines. But this is your man out in front, Carlson. And I tell you what, Dan Cooper might just we'll keep an eye on that gap. Uh, that last lap, there was a tenth of a second between them. They were the only men uh, in the 27s. Yeah, that's no, interesting. Meanwhile, uh, Dan Jackson's really picked up well. He's up into fourth place. Here he comes now, and he's chasing after the pole sitter. He's passed him already. It's flying down the straight there. Michael Rutter passed immediately by the man who qualified down in 14th place, and he's now got himself up into third place. Yeah, and he's looking really good, isn't he? Oh, we've got another problem as well. Oh dear, a few little mechanical issues going on. Not a surprise, of course, with classic machinery. Um, so our top two 
come through. Carson Cooper and now Dan Jackson in third place. Is he, let's, let's watch this lap, especially to see if he can close the gap. Because that lap was a pretty quick one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a very quick, he was quick, you know, quick on that race. Dan Cooper as well, he took 0.6 of a second out the leader. So Cooper took 0.6 of a second out of Carson, two seconds. But it was a really good lap from, um, from, from Jackson there. He's leading a, a, quite a train of bikes here. And they're all trying to stay with him. Yeah, as we said, it's, it's a difference in style. You know, these are such light bikes, the, the 350s, you know, 115 kilos compared to 230 for the big super bikes. But uh, they, it's all about keeping them singing. But Michael Rutter, whether he's missing a bit in and out, he seems to kind of drop a bit and then sort of come back a bit. So I think it might be a, a bit intermittent because he's not, he's not been able to drop him yet. This is a sort of double apex right-hander that comes back onto the straight. Can you get on open throttle fairly early there, or do yeah, you really have to wait? You, you, you kind of you run it really to wide, then you kind of roll it a fraction, because it's all about, you've got to get the run out. You know, the first bit just leads, it's all about the exit onto the straight, because you get a good run down here, it makes so much difference. And this is probably the best passing place on the track, and you can see Higlett there just slipping up the inside of uh, Michael Rutter to become leading four-stroke in the race in full spot. Yeah, and that's a good point, to be leading four stroke uh, because that is part a uh, separate part of the competition in a way uh, the two strokes are up front at this stage let's have a look at these lap times i tell you what cooper has really closed the door as well remember it was 2.6 oh yeah it's down to 0.6 26.8 126.8 he was 1.4 seconds quicker than the leader so cooper has really picked it up i mean that's one of the quickest laps i think we've seen on these bikes that's very impressive i can tell you what also andy hornby's on a bit of a climb up the ladder too he's in sixth place now bike number 42 see it coming through yep. he's just done a 127 so something's coming to get but this is as you say the battle for the lead look how close it is yeah we thought he got away he had 2.6 seconds but he's rolled it off he dropped into the 28 and dan cooper behind him was just getting quicker and quicker so on lap five <laughs> it's going here dan cooper is nearly on him Remember, this is a seven-lap race, so there's not a long way to go. We're on lap five. Yeah, I mean, it's a back marker oh, coming up. You've got to be ruthless with these here. You've got to get through nice and clean. You've just got to... They go, oh, you're really easy to, to cost yourself some time. Yeah, we're actually on lap six, so uh, when they get to the end of this lap, there'll be just the one lap to go. Now, has... Jackson been able to find any more time not quite he had that surge in the initial stage but he hasn't been able to get away from this group and go chasing after the top two so it looks as though we've got kind of separate battles they're doing a bit of lapping as well so you've always got to be a bit wary Tom Snow on the that's the Harley Davidson 250 actually interestingly that he's just gone past look how close they are again as they come through the chicane and go over the line to complete six laps and go on to their seventh Oh, now he's got to really try and find a way through. It's all about slipstreaming, keeping that speed up, getting tucked in. He's got a good drive there coming out. He might be able to have a little look on the right hand and coming up. Depends how, has he got the slipstream? Oh, not quite. No, he can't quite do it there. Not a lot between him. He's probably a little bit lighter as Dan Cooper. Lots of back markers ahead as well, so he's got to pick his moment. Yeah, and last year that had a big bearing on the uh, results as well, actually, back markers, to, to find the right space. It's never easy. It's never easy. It's much easier to be the lead guy as well, generally. Um, so he's lost a fraction of time there, but it looks like Carlson's going to go straight through. Is Dan going to go around the outside? Yes, he is. <laughs> so I tell you what, though, Carlson did a great job to get around that first one. And he might just well have given him a little bit of breathing space. Yeah, that might have helped Scott Carson to hold on for victory here. They've still got a few others to try and find their way past. Dan Cooper is keeping up the chase. The gap back a little longer to Dan Jackson, who's still holding on to third place. Andy Hornby's moved up to fifth now, so he has done very well. But it's not going to be enough to go challenging after these two, I don't think. And it does look as though Carson is really well sorted, having started from third on the grid. We had an interesting getaway at the start. Hands out, it is victory for Scott Carson. He takes the first win of the weekend here at the 80th members meeting. Scott Carson beating Dan Cooper in the end by just 0.3 of a second. Yeah, and what a last lap from him, 126.7. So he really got his head down. He knew he was under pressure. That's the man, number 24, Scott Carson. But what a great job he did. Dan Jackson has finished in third place. Andy Hornby then has won the four stroke. So that's good news for him. Yeah, he did well. Yeah, Hicklett there and Rutter, I think, with that misfire, just dropping down to seventh. Yeah, so, and it's great, clean race, good 
fighting right up to the end of the race, but it is Scott Carson who can celebrate the victory today. Well, it's lovely to see Scott managing to hold on there, but it was a good battle, and uh, Dan Cooper pushed him hard. They were together on the front row. It got a bit separated at the start. It was a, all a bit changed with that great start that Graham Higlett made, diving through between them. Michael Rutter, as you said, I, it's interesting that you knew about that, that, that slight engine problem they had, because I think you're absolutely right, because he had the pace in qualifying, just wasn't repeated. Didn't yeah, I and mean, he, he seemed to sort of be there, thereabouts, and then drop off a little bit, and this, you know, an intermittent misfire could be so awkward when you're riding, especially on a motorcycle. Yeah, very but, difficult. Uh, no such problem. I mean, the two strokes, that was a, a good show for the two-stroke boys here today. So that top three were all the two strokes, all TZ350s, but it was this man, number 24, Carson, who... Like you say, he got out in front and then he seemed to kind of go off the boil a bit. Dan Cooper did a magnificent job to close him back in, but he responded. And what mega last laps they did. That was uh, Dan Cooper's 126.6. Yeah. Uh, Dan Cooper on that last lap. And uh, they both did 26. It's very impressive. Yeah, very good indeed. And there you can see the uh, uh, the time for the race. Uh, 10 and it's an average speed there, just under, just under 100 miles, miles now. That's impressive, isn't it? It is, and what's great as well, because they both finished just 0.3 between them, so that really sets up tomorrow's race. Remember, it's a, an yeah. aggregate. The two race times get added to together to get the overall winner, and uh, it's going to be really tight between those two. It is indeed. Andy Hornby won the Sheen Trophy uh, for four strokes last year, and he's in the right position at the moment because he was fourth. But the, I think he was the first of the four strokes, wasn't he? Yeah, he was indeed, and he's 0.4 ahead of Higlett. So again, it keeps the, uh, the 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 Sheen Trophy of the four strokes really tight. That's a good race. point. Yeah, yeah, that is very close actually. I hadn't realised they were quite that close when they came over because there were several bikes together there, weren't there? Yeah, so, that's yeah. right. They were just yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that'll be um, that'll be good. There he is. Be very very happy with that. You saw how happy he was. He crossed the line. There's nothing better than getting a race win. So how many of these two strokes get stripped down tonight? Having done, having done, I'll ask you that later. I'll ask you that later because we've got a chance to go down to Ed, who is uh, with our winners. Scott Carson, I'm going to jump in here, guys. I'm sorry to interrupt. Blimey, Scott, he, he didn't make that easy, did he? He didn't, no. He pushed me to the end. Um, oh, it was fantastic. Um, had a little bit of a tyre issue at the end. It was getting a bit hot, a bit squirrely, but... Uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed that, thoroughly enjoyed that, yeah, over the moon. Is that why you backed off a little in the middle of the race, because the tyre? Yeah, I didn't back off, I just had a few real big slides, and um, I thought, oh, I'm in trouble, but no, it seemed to be OK, so no, it was really good, enjoyed it. Congratulations, wonderful ride. Yes, thank you, thank you. Right, let's find Dan Cooper. Dan, I'm sorry, we'll let you get your helmet off and gloves and all of that stuff. Um, you just needed. You're, you're getting used to these things now, aren't you? Yeah, like I said, uh, it was my first time on it this morning, and even then, I was getting faster and faster and faster. And I started to catch. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know his name. Scott, Scott, is it? Yeah, I started to catch him at the end. I really, the last two laps, I really, you know, got right up on the back of him. But I just ran out of a bit of time. You know, a few back markers got in the way, and uh, yeah, it just sort of scuppered my chances a little bit. But hey, I'm I'm really pleased to to get to build with the momentum, and tomorrow will be a good race. I was going to say, you'd be looking forward to tomorrow now. Yeah, yeah, I want to, uh, yeah, we've got, to, we've got to go one step better tomorrow for sure. Good luck. Thank you. Right, let's uh, head over here. Dan Jackson, um, I think you'll go home happy tonight, 14th to the podium. Uh, I can't complain with that. We've had a lovely morning, let's say, the best way to describe it. Uh, engine seizure in qualifying this morning. Um, quick engine change and literally 10 minutes before the race we struck it up and got out there so little practice and an unknown engine so happy with that can't complain hopefully I'm nearer these guys tomorrow an unknown engine but clearly one that works yeah somewhat <laughs> can't complain <laughs> so yeah no happy with that the team's done a great job running around and running to the campsite to and fro and yeah managed to get us out there and happy with the result so congratulations thank you very much 
Well, it was a very entertaining race and uh, well done to all of them. But Scott Carson taking the victory by just three tenths and we've got to go into another race tomorrow at the aggregate result. So that could make a, a huge difference. Dan Cooper so close at the end there. Dan Jackson moving up so well. Andy Hornby, the first of the four strokes in the RTS Triumph Trident uh, ahead of Nick Williamson. But another four stroke there, Graham Higler, not far behind as well. Uh, and Michael Rutter as well. So there are separate battles that will be going on in tomorrow's race. Uh, Jeffrey Vermoulin was the 10th home and uh, we had a, a pretty much a full lineup uh, just one or two mechanical problems sadly uh, Gary Vines was one of them ones out Alan Cathcart a uh, famous racer and writer on bikes he finished down in 17th position um, Luke Hedger with that Triumph Bonneville hasn't been working perfectly for him but he was in a strong 13th Seb Perez down in 20th place on another of the two stroke 350s and further down the order there, Duncan Fitchett with the Harley Davidson 750. Doesn't have particularly uh, quick laps around here. Michael Russell struggling a bit with the, uh, the Norton as well. But some great racing going on throughout the whole grid of two strokes versus four strokes for the Hellwood Trophy. James, let's just take a little look back at some of the highlights of that uh, race because the start was pretty crucial, wasn't it? Yeah, you can see Dan Cooper just bogged down a little bit on him and uh, he just couldn't get away quite as he wanted. Higley got an absolute fly, number 50, uh, to come through and lead it. So it was a great start from him. Yeah, but then Scott Carson was very impressive on this opening lap, the man who went on to take victory, and he quickly kind of opened up a bit of a gap, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he did. He was so confident on the kind of the cool tyres. He would got them up to temperature well. He really knows his limit, and he was able to push the hardest, and he actually did. He kind of won that race in that opening lap in many ways, getting that advantage. Thankfully, although we had an incident, no, uh, didn't look like anybody was hurt, so that was good. And there were very few actual incidents. There were one or two mechanical issues, uh, but it was a great, strong race up front. And we saw this uh, battle uh, as the race developed. Number 55, Dan Jackson, who started in 14th, really getting up amongst the leaders. Yeah, we just spoke to him. He did a great job after that seized engine. He looked so confident again. We, we hadn't really considered him too much after qualifying, but it was back down to these two at the end. It was Dan Cooper, 37, Scott Carlson, 24, and Cooper came all the way in, but with the back markers, he just couldn't quite, at this point, I thought he was going to make a move somewhere, but he couldn't quite do it. But the gap is tiny between them, and yes. they've got another race tomorrow, so it's all about that. Fantastic race, uh, the Halewood Trophy race, won by Scott Carson here today, by this tiny margin over Dan Cooper, and they will be fighting once again when we get into the Halewood Trophy tomorrow. And well done to Andy Hornby, who was top of the four strokes, but he'll be in his own battles when we get into the second race tomorrow. It's like motoring heaven here. It's motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's a sort of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then... <laughs> Thank you.
Steve Parrish, the motorbikes are on track. Something's wrong here. You're yeah. standing by a car. You're absolutely right. And Michele Pirro is out there on a motorbike. We should be out there. Sorry about the noise, but you're right. I've decided this weekend, I thought the weather was going to be cold and wet, but it's beautiful. And I thought a car would be more sensible for a man of my time of life. So I decided a car. And luckily, Nick Fennell here, who's got Hasu Racing, lovely Lotus 23B, said, did I want to share the car with him? So that's exactly what I'm doing. Well, the two questions are, why are you doing it and why is it taking so long? Uh, well, I did race trucks for a period of time, but I still love my motorbikes. I'm out there, I should be out there watching them, but I've got to get in my car in a minute. But I'll be back on a bike, don't worry. I'm just testing the waters a little bit, and if I'm pretty useless at it, it'll never want me back again anyway. So I'll see what I can do today. Well, you said that the world's turning this weekend. Emmanuel Perro's on a motorbike, and you said his wife's doubled his insurance. Does that mean we can half your insurance for this race? Uh, yeah, that's I never thought about that. Actually, my, my wife will probably go and downgrade my insurance. Hopefully, we're, uh, we'll do all right on that. But really looking forward to it. It's a cracking little car, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun. Have you had any practice? Just this morning in a bit of damp conditions, but it, what well, can possibly go wrong? What can possibly go wrong? It's glorious sunshine. Steve Parrish on four wheels. Best of luck. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. So we are now building up towards the Gurney Cup for the beautiful sports cars of the early 1960s. So you're seeing a, a group of Ford GT40s ready to go racing here. But we've got the Chevron BMWs as well. Uh, we've got Lotus Fords, a real mix of machinery, some very stunning cars indeed. I'm glad to say the number two car is back out. We saw a, what looked like a fire in the back. It wasn't a fire, it was an overheating and they've managed to repair it. And uh, so that's good news. Excellent that they've got the car back out. Um, Dario Franchitti is going to be part of this, and the, his car will be starting from the top spot on pole position. But uh, we had a chance to catch up with Dario a little earlier. Dario, you've had a busy day. You had a, you had an alarm call with the uh, Gordon Murray, and then you moved on to something even more hairy. Yeah, exactly. We launched T33 Spider, jumped the T50, jumped in the GT40, and then the Cortina. It's been a, uh, it's been a busy day. I saw you when you got out of the Gordon Murray. You looked a very happy, a somewhat, uh, somewhat woken up man this morning. Yeah, it was, which was great practice for getting in the GT40 because this thing is quick. All these GT40s are rapid, and you've got to have your uh, your wits about you. So it's a bit early in the morning for that kind of stuff, but yeah, it's a wonderful car to, to drive and to share it with Sean. It's really special. We just talked to Gordon Chen there. He says these things are so quick, and uh, I'm getting that impression. Oh, they're, they're rapid. I jumped in it the other day. I'd been at meetings up at Gordon Murray, and I came down here with half an hour to go and testing, jumped in it, and went straight out, and it was like just mind-blowing the, the the impression of speed and especially here at Goodwood too so uh, yeah it's an absolute privilege to drive it and this this two two driver format works really well for the crowd I think doesn't it it does exactly I was saying to Gordon you're not you're, you're not starting he's like no I'm, I'm not starting that's good we're not together we might meet at some point in the race but um he has a lot of uh, there's a lot of spicy drivers and cars out there well, well, the, the theme is all the pro drivers just going for glory and the checkered flag. Isn't that the rule? Uh, that wasn't the discussion Sean and I just had about his car. We're, we're here to have fun. I mean, there's a competitive in instinct, obviously, but um, this is an old original car. We want to just look after it. Well, you're in a good place to start. Well done for that. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the race. Thanks. Cheers. Well, it's going to be fun to see Dario out uh, in this race a little bit later on, uh, but it will be his uh, teammate, if you like, Sean Lynn, who'll be starting the race in the car that will be starting from the top spot on the grid. We've got one of the Cobras there, that's Bill Shepard driving this car, and Bill will be uh, sharing that with Andy Prio. So Andy Prio will take over a little bit later on. That car um, did a pretty good job in qualifying. They are uh, lined up in 10th place on the grid, in fact. One of the other uh, GT40s, the number 14 car, and uh, that's uh, Joachim Volk of Kraken and Simon Hadfield uh, are sharing that car. So I think Simon will do the second run a little bit later on. As we look at the number 27 car as well, um, which did have to change the number actually before the start of this. So it was originally entered as number seven, but it's number 27. That's the Andrew Newell, uh, David Forsbury uh, car that is ready to be heading out onto the circuit in a moment to line up on the grid for what promises to be a pretty exciting uh, sports car race. Alice Powell is with me once again. Alice, uh, looking forward to this coming out. We've got some pretty serious mid-engined machines all ready to go flat out around the Goodwood circuit. Yeah, we certainly have. So it looks like the basis, no offence to the second drivers, but the second of the drivers will be starting uh, the races. So you'll have the much more experienced drivers coming up after the pit stop. So it'll be an interesting start. 
hugely competitive field. We saw some very, very close lap times being posted at the front of the field. Some darker clouds forming in the sky at the moment, but hopefully the rain does stay away as everyone just sits and waits patiently, gets everything warm before they finally head out and uh, make their way around to the grid. Yes, hopefully we'll uh, end up with some more good weather conditions and that these cars will all be working well. This is uh, a lovely machine, the number 194. This is a very rare Roadster GT40. In fact, the car is just heading back out or onto the track now to come around onto the grid. Chance to get the tyres uh, a little bit up to temperature. It is predominantly the owners and entrants who are in the cars for the start of the race. Um, one or two... Uh, talented drivers obviously amongst them because some of them are quite experienced uh, but we also have Andrew Kukodi who is in car number two um, that will be starting from third row of the grid so we'll see how he gets on in that number two Chevron BMW and most of the more professional race drivers I think will be appearing in the second half of the race so we'll see how they all get on in that second part but here they go all coming out onto the track now in this mixture of sports prototype racing cars from 1960 to 1966 in the Dan Gurney Cup. Dan Gurney was the American um, who was the first of uh, three drivers to win in sports cars, Formula One and NASCAR, and uh, he won in Indy cars as well. He won Le Mans in a Ford GT40, Mark IV back in 1967. He was, uh, he was at the time second at the Indy 500, four wins in uh, Formula One, including the only ever Porsche F1 win. So Dan Gurney is the man we're celebrating through the name of this uh, particular race. And sports cars were obviously very key to him as were the Ford GT40. And the, the GT40 was massive for Ford, taking on Ferrari at the Mall and failing year after year initially. And then finally having a, a fantastic uh, series of victories with it all coming together for them in 1966 and then winning again in 1967, 1968 and surprisingly in 1969. But we've got a car uh, going very slowly there, obviously a mechanical issue. Hard to see, is that number 25? Yeah, it looks like the, it. the number there. It's the Hibbert's uh, car, Michael and Andrew. Um, unfortunately, I think it's there. Lotus, yeah, it's the Lotus 423 that is struggling. Looks like it's the engine's not running or something, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks like he put his hand up quite early on, pulled over to the side. Uh, so it looks like, yeah, the marshals might be able to, uh, well, either give him a bump start. He's waving his hands as if to say, nope, that's it. So maybe he's lost all power. So hopefully it's near an opening in the tire wall so he can get pushed. So here come the fantastic marshals now. Off to hopefully, unfortunately for him, push him off the side of the racetrack so it won't uh, won't delay this session too much oh, that's a great shape that car has actually done well in historic racing recently in the HSCC guards trophy uh, in recent years taking a number of victories but uh, clearly something has not quite worked out for them on this occasion so it will take a few minutes to get the car out of the way are they gonna have to get it towed or can they get it to uh, a safe spot let's hope they can get it out of the way nice and quickly so that the cars won't be sitting on the grid too long before they actually get to start the race. Ah, disappointing for them though. Shame they're not going to be able to get that race underway. So, uh, we are looking forward to these cars setting off shortly and it is going to be uh, the GT40s on the first two spots of the grid. Sean Lynn is going to be starting from the car that he's sharing with Dario Franchitti. And then we've got a car that will be driven by Gordon Shedd later, but it's Miles Griffiths, who's a talented driver, actually, a very talented driver. So Miles starting from the middle of the front row. And then we've got the Lotus on the outside of uh, Katsuaki Kubota. So he'll be also potentially very quick off the line, I would think. There we are, there's a, a lineup on the grid. So you've got the GT40 on the left, the pale blue and red colours, very familiar GT40 colours. That is the car that Dario Franchitti will take on later, but Sean Lynn will start the race in. Miles Griffiths will start in the middle there in car number 37. And uh, Katsuaki Kubota will start on the outside there. And Richard Bradley will take over. And he was he was very quick, Richard, when he got into that Lotus, wasn't he? Yeah, he said the Lotus was looking really good. Really nice and, uh, and nimble. Um, you see Gordon Shedden watching on there, all smiles. Exciting times, ready for, for the race to get going. But yeah, Richard, he'll be one to watch, certainly, when he comes uh, out on track, experienced in uh, 
in endurance racing. And as we see, yeah, so they didn't manage to find an opening for for the number 25. So the good old Goodwood recovery truck, <laughs> done many years by the looks of it. Um, we'll uh, be towing that, I presume, back to the paddock, probably not into to pit lane, because I think it's going to be too long for them to sort whatever a problem it is to get the car out for the race. Yeah, it is definitely going to take a few minutes, but uh, everybody will be able to settle on the grid. And then they may, I wonder, get another formation that we'll just have to wait and see exactly how they decide to, to run this. Uh, so GT40s, uh, top two on the grid, then the Lotus 30. There will be another green flag left, apparently, so we will see them uh, go back out. And that Lotus 4 that sits on the outside of the front row, that was uh, the first Lotus. You can see it on the right there, the number 10 car, the yellow car. First Lotus with a big American engine, basically, because... Um, the Ford 4.7 V8 engine, as used in, in GT40s, funnily enough. Um, same, same engine, pretty much, as you see in the cars alongside it. But it was modified uh, up to about 350 horsepower when it was created. But the problem with that car when it was racing in the 1960s was that it lacked torsional strength. There was a, a backbone chassis a problem, uh, if you like. The, the chassis design was actually inspired by what Lotus did with the Elan. Um, and they had to strengthen that chassis. They did modify it over the years, and they did get it better, and it is now a much more competitive car. There it is, that's the one I'm talking about. It was sold to JCB. It was driven by Lotus Formula One driver Trevor Taylor. Um, it was also a, a, a sort of design, the chassis design, that became uh, the Europa later on. Um, Jim Clark raced one of these at Aintree, uh, first outing with the Ian Walker team and had a second place. He did actually have a win at Mallory um, in 1964, but there wasn't much opposition. And um, when they got into some more serious opposition with this car in the 1960s, it wasn't one of the most competitive. But we have seen it win here before at the Goodwood Revival. Um, so we will wait to see with great interest whether it's going to be four GT40s or Lotus running up front. And we've got plenty of other beautiful cars to keep an eye on as well. The Gurney Cup is all set to get underway with these beautiful sports prototypes of the early 1960s. We're looking at the front row of the grid at the moment. Sean Bin will be starting from pole position in the uh, pale blue and red coloured GT40 as we get them on a green flag lap once again, just to make sure everything is running right. We did have a car pull over, sadly, one of the Lotuses uh, when they did their original formation lap, which was a little bit of a shame. But the start of this race, of course, will be important when it happens. But they're going to get a run initially, a green flag lap, just to warm everything up, get the feel that they want to out of these cars. Miles Griffiths in the middle of the silver GT40. Then the Lotus, that big powered Lotus, similar engine, a big V8 engine in the back of that open top yellow Lotus. And then we've got Chevrons. We've got Elvers down towards the back as well. We've got some beautiful machinery, some other Lotuses with less powerful uh, mid-engines, all part and parcel of uh, a tremendous collection of cars. And Alice, I I if you were racing today, I bet you'd really be quite happy to be in one of these, wouldn't you? Oh, I certainly would. Any one of those spectacular cars and some great racing that we're expected to see. I mean, they just look stunning. You know, the, the history on this grid. I mean, of any of the grids that we've got here this weekend at, here at Goodwood is incredible. And some fantastic drivers lined up, not just in this in this series as well, but in the other races too. And all competitive. Okay, they're all old cars that they want to, to look after, but at the same time, competitive edge takes over and uh, they all want to win. So I expect it to get quite interesting at the front because obviously times were very, 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 very close in qualifying as well. So this is a, a tremendous lineup of cars. Let's take a look at how they actually will be uh, starting in the order. So uh, Sean Lynn starting on pole, he's sharing that with Dario Franchitti. Miles Griffiths starting in second, sharing that with Gordon Shedden, who will come into the car later. And Katsuaka Kuboto is starting. Richard Bradley will take that car over later. So you've got two GT40s and the Lotus on the front row. Two more GT40s on the second row. Rob Huff will be taking one of those later on. Further down the order, though, you get a bit more of a mixture. The Chevron V8, uh, there's V6 there as well. Lotus 4, 23s, and across the Oldsmobile. That's an unusual car. That's down in 20th place. But that's part of the, the joy of these sort of events, is we get a different 
types of car. Again, the Brabham BT5, but an unusual sports car, the Tira Chevrolet. So we've got a mix going all the way down to the back of the field there. Good conditions. You have to say the track is in pretty much perfect condition. Yeah, I still wouldn't venture off onto that grass. Still looks fairly, fairly slippy. We've seen in the previous classes, as I was riding on board now with the number 37, Miles Griffiths, just weaving left to right, trying to build the tire temperature, use the brakes. You can hear them squeaking underneath the pedal as they'll line up back on the grid. Yeah. Plenty of temperature in the in the tires. And leaving a little slide there at the end as well. <laughs> so this is a good warm-up, getting uh, that tire temperature up, making sure everything's working. This is always the moment where the heart rate starts to come up, even for the drivers as they prepare for the start of the race, trying to get off the line well. And it could be a chance here for Miles Griffiths from the middle of the front row to try and beat Sean Lynn down into the first corner. But with, it, with Katsuaka Kubota on that, uh, Lynn the Lotus on the outside, that's going to be pretty rapid off the line, I think. Just depends about getting the right amount of wheel spin off the line. We've got two GT40s right behind them as well. Uh, Andrew Kukodi as well, is uh, he's back on the third row, one of the Chevron BMW B8s, very talented, experienced driver. Um, and he is one of the sort of professional drivers that we've got in the first part of this stint. It is a, a two-part race. Um, they will be swapping drivers around halfway through. And we've got some very talented drivers coming on, including, of course, Dario Franchitti, who will be taking over the car that is starting from pole position. Uh, but plenty of other rapid drivers, Nicholas Minassian, Rob Huff is going to be taking over as well. Andy Prio is going to be coming into it. But Andrew Kukotti is in the opening sequence of this race. OK, everybody in position, flying from the back. We're ready to go racing. Look at any cup, he's underway. What a great start it is from Sean Lynn from pole position. That was just about perfect. He lit it off the line. And I think everybody's got away pretty cleanly. And uh, he's he going to hold on to it. And is Griffiths is trying to get up the inside as they go into Madrid. But it doesn't quite work for him. So it is Sean Lynn who is leading. But it is a great start from Andrew Kogani. I said keep an eye on him. And he has come up from the third row of the grid in that blue and orange. No Chevron there. He's up into third place. Yeah, what a fantastic, whatever problems they had, it was unfortunate for the Lotus, who just tried to sneak up the inside, as now the number 37, very brave on the brakes, but he's done it, but watch out, behind, oh. on, abs, oh, he just ran on a little bit of oil, slightly wide there, it's going to be now a drag race down the straight, but fantastic race, it's unfortunate there for the Lotus, though, who just got nipped, but he's still in the battle. Yeah, it's still there, but what a, a good move by Miles Griffiths, that was brave stuff, but he's now taken the lead of this race, the number 37, and the man who started so well, Sean Lynn, finds himself down in third. Then that Lotus has started on the front row, down to fourth, so Kubota now in fourth place, trying to hold off the rest of the field. Everybody chasing Andrew Kukoni, and still battling here with Sean Lynn. This is for second place. But Andrew, that uh, Chevron probably not quite as quick in a straight line as the GT40, but so light and small, very neat through these tighter corners like the chicane. Yeah, there seems to be maybe a little bit of debris on there as well. Someone's maybe ran over it. We've seen there in the background, but a nice, healthy lead. A great first lap from Miles Griffiths there. But down at Sean Lynch will be looking now ahead going, oh, I need to get past, need to clear the number two car of Andrew Cacoldi because he'll be wanting to track down number 37 right now. But it's all fairly clean and tidy for now, Ben. It is. So let's just take a look at that move again. This was how the lead changed. This was pretty brave. It was very bait. I mean, because it's you don't want to go too deep on the brakes there. So we're going to see an onboard now. He just gets a little bit of oversteer through full water, pulls it out. Is there a gap? There certainly is. Oh. Played on the brakes. You can see just the car just wanting to rotate. And lovely, easy stuff, made it look easy. Oh, there's a problem there for the number 95 Chevron. That's the uh, Westy Mitchell car. Whether it's a mechanical problem already, whether he ran wide, I'm not quite sure. But uh, no change up front. Miles Griffiths is still leading this from Andrew Capote in second place. And Sean Lynn in third position. Sean quick down the back straight here. He always gets closer to the Chevron, but then hasn't quite got the speed. The Cobra is going well at this stage as well. Interesting to see the uh, Bill Shepard number 11 Cobra in sixth place. He'll be take, uh, handing that over to Andy Prio. It's actually fifth place because uh, the Mitchell car, I think, has just dropped out. We shall see as they come around. And there's the number 194, that very rare Roadster GT40 1965 car. 
They only made about three of those with those open tops uh, racing versions. And it's lovely to see here, it here at Goodwood. So yes, the Mitchell car has dropped out, as I mentioned. Yeah, it looked like that the Mitchell oh. car was actually trying to adjust the mirrors. The number 16 pulls off the Steve side of Parrish. the road there. Oh, that's a shame. We've lost Steve Parrish from the race. Yeah, so very unfortunate for them. But yeah, the Mitchell car was adjusting the mirror on the left-hand side whilst on the grass. So I wonder if there had been some kind of contact at all there, Ben. Um, so we might get a replay. I'll have a little look. But out in front, they've spread themselves out a little bit. Uh, maybe thinking ahead, trying to save save the tyre life. Yeah, that's right. And of course, they will be handing these cars over to other drivers. We've got a nice little battle going on here. Uh, let's keep an eye on this one. So that's the number 17 motors. Uh, that's the Michael O'Brien Cameron Jackson car. And uh, just trying to make a little bit more progress as they come through the field. It's done well so far with it. Uh, it is Cameron who's in the car right now. Very uh, competitive young racer. And it's a good driver lineup, the pairing of them with Michael O'Brien as well. So they, it's just that they're, they're not as powerful as something like the GT40, but he's not going to give up. He's going to try and go for a late lunch. Yeah, they've made some good places because they started down 14th on the grid. Brave to try and make it through the chicane. No, better off. Slots in behind. We'll try and get the run out down to Madrix into turn one. Getting in the toe. Looks like, hasn't quite got the legs down the straight and might even come under attack from the... 194 behind, but he's looking very, very handy behind the wheel at the moment. The car up ahead is the car that Jason Plato will be taking on later on. Uh, it's uh, Craig Davis in the car right now, uh, but we've still got some other good battles going on as well. There's the Cobra coming under a bit of pressure from two of the GT40. So the Cobra is one of the few cars in this that is a front-engine machine. Ooh, that was a bit tight, wasn't it? As the number eight <laughs> car, uh, Olivia Gallant, trying to find some space to get past, has a bit of a wobble. Yeah, so he just I don't think he just saw him there on the right hand side and there is a bit of oil down as well. So we saw that at the start with the number two car, but a nice little battle going on here. Number 11 making his car as wide as possible. So this is for fifth position and it is very close at this stage. Bill Shepard just holding on with the Cobra ahead of two GT40s, which is pretty impressive. Olivier Gallon uh, in the number eight and then uh, in the number six car, we've got uh, Maxwell Lynn, who will be sharing this car, his car with Marino Franchitti. So the two Franchitti brothers will be out in a little while. Mel Shepard really fighting the car. Oh, that was a bit of a slide there, uh, but has been held together by Max, who's got it all together. So they're all chasing after that Lotus as well. This is really all oh, a fine focus for fifth, but for fourth position in theory, up front. Still a good lead for Miles Griffiths in his GT40. He's got an advantage of 2.3 seconds. Last lap, he was about seven tenths faster than Andrew Pogoni. Uh, Andrew doing a great job in that Chevron. It's so good to see it running after uh, it had a problem earlier on and they had to get a fire extinguisher on it. And I didn't think we were going to see it uh, back out on track. But thankfully, it is out there racing well. Oh, but again, it's again. close. Yes, is he going to get run slide wide? Is that going to allow Max to just edge up the inside, it's going to be a drag race down, the heavy braking zone, the car's moving around all over the place, but it's so nice to see uh, different types of manufacturers battling, and battling so closely as well. Well, let's see how this uh, continues. Down the straight, the Cobra still has good straight line speed, there's no doubt about it. You can see he's not under so much pressure as they come down the straight, but coming down into the braking area, perhaps the GT40 will have just a little bit more, it certainly closes up, closes up, closes up! Oh, Bray, I'm thinking that's Bray round the but he might have got the cut back into the chicane. It's not a corner you take two by two, and he's done it. Fantastic. Sold the dummy. That was very, very well done. Uh, no doubt about it. So Olivier Gallant has uh, got that car up past the Cobra. It's the car he's sharing with Nicholas Manassi, but the Cobra's coming back. Straight line speed is impressive. Trying to have a little look, but no, can't quite make it. Has to hold back. Yeah, Bill thought about it and thought better of it, I think, but he's now going to come under attack as well from a, the number six car. Yeah, that's Maxwell Lynn in that car at the moment. And he's seen how you can do it, but can he repeat it? Can he find the same path? Oh, he's going to have a look. Is it all? Oh, I thought he was going to have a little look into St. Mary's, but he thought better of it again. So let's see if he just tries to time it a little bit better. Not quite there yet, but uh, well, he's got to 
got to have an opportunity now. This is always an important part of the lap, isn't it? Because you're coming onto the long straight. You've also got that markers to deal with. Let's just have a little look at that, how that all came about again, Alice. Yeah, so the number 11 took fairly normal line, maybe a little bit tighter, and then, yeah, slotted down the inside, nicely done. And the thing is, with when trying to race all different types of cars, is they've all got different uh, sort of positives and negatives around the circuit. So where your car might be strong, another car might be weak and, and vice versa. So it's really trying to work out quite quickly where the strengths of your other cars around you are in order to make that, that move forward. So they've caught up to the back of the Lotus now. So that'll be interesting to see the differences there. The number 11 definitely got more power compared to those around them down the, down the straight. So then it's there that you need to try and capitalize by making the move into the corners. And there's some lovely sound and, and vibration around the lap as, as we've got these types of cars. Big, big V8 engines in the back of the GT40s. Um, and they are making a lot of noise. Same in the back of that yellow Lotus, a very similar engine. And, and as they come past our commentary position, you can actually feel the, the, the floor shaking a little bit, that vibration that these big V8 engines, it's a beautiful sound. It's something you don't, you don't really tend to hear in modern engines. It's very much a part of the 1960s. Oh, it certainly is. It certainly is. You know, at one point, I'm sitting on this chair, especially at the start when they all went past. It was the vibrations galore. But now it's it's brilliant to see and and some battles that, that are just there's everywhere you look at the moment on track. There is that battles going on, which is also fantastic as well. Yeah, we've got the number three Chevron. We had a couple of Chevrons together there, actually. The number 27. That's a that's B6, a slightly earlier car. The Andrew Newell and David Forsbury shared car. Um, so we've got the Coleman car just up ahead of them, uh, number 15 getting out of the way, that's the Lotus 23B uh, from the Baileys, Marshall and Tim Bailey, just getting out of the way. These Chevrons are uh, very, very pretty machines, as we mentioned, uh, Derek Bennett, ex-racing driver, he created the Chevron brand in the mid-1960s, and it, it took on fantastic success in, in British sports car racing and then indeed into European racing, where they got the BMW two-liter engine in there, about 200 horsepower, so lots of horsepower to play with, and swept the board uh, in, in the British club racing form formula, that's no doubt about that, and it was successful in Europe. Drivers included Brian Redman, John Burton, people like that, and there's a, another chance, perhaps, to go for the outbreaking. Yeah, is he going to do it just about down the inside? But they got Chris Harris in the number 77 car looming as well. So where you need to attack, you need to defend as well. If you're in the middle of that sandwich, Chris Harris now on the charge down to four water. Is he having a look up the inside? Yeah, just about. I don't think the number three saw him there. Had to jink out. So, yeah, lovely move. Brave stuff there from Chris. Yeah, Chris Harris sharing that car with Chris Goodwin. He'll be taking it over at some point. So, back to the fourth place battle now, the Lotus of Kubota sharing uh, with Richard Bradley. And now under a bit of a serious pressure from Olivier Gallant in the GT40. We saw him make a move earlier, now he's going for the inside! Oh, thankfully, Kubota saw him come just at the last moment. Yeah, he looked like he went slightly tight, Kubota, into there. So, around a little bit wide, it's a very long corner there at, at Woodgut and tricky braking zone, but Olivier... Yeah, he's not, not not afraid of sticking his nose no. in, and he certainly did that there. So, <laughs> car looking very strong, but now we're going to see the replace. You see, the Lotus slightly tighter, got a little bit out of shape on the brakes. And I think, yeah, he took his uh, number eight there, took the advantage, slotted it down the inside, and he just about managed to hold on to it on the exit. But uh, it might all be changed soon because the pit lane opens in around about three minutes, Ben. Right, OK, so we could see some uh, a busy time in the pit lane coming up. It's a pretty small pit lane here at Goodwood, so you, they have to be very cautious. There are strict rules on the speeds that they come in, and uh, you can't just... Yeah, there's a minimum pit time as well, so you shouldn't have to rush it, but it is important to try and get it right. So, Kubota still holding on to that position. Well, they He's got lost one position, but he's still trying to hold on to that fifth position now. Uh, whether he's going to be able to do that from Maxwell Lynn, we shall see, uh, because Lynn is getting a little closer now as they come down to that same area, which is certainly proving to be the favourite overtaking opportunity. Let's see whether you know, he's not quite as close. No, not quite as close. Lotus still naturally takes a slightly tighter line through there compared to the cars around him at the moment. Now in through the chicane, but there's a close battle now. It's going to be more three-four car battle at the moment. 
Because joining in is the number 17 car, the O'Brien car. Yeah. So number 11 has dropped back a little bit, but now we've got the uh, the O'Brien car in the mix as well. Oh, it's gone wide. Maxwell's gone wide. And uh, yeah, he's just about got it back on again. Oh, that could have easily gone wrong there. Um, thankfully, he kept it out of the barrier, but that has gone wrong in a way because he was challenging his position and now he's lost a couple of places. Yeah, and uh, you make a mistake here at Goodwood, it can either pay or pay badly. For him there, it, it paid to position. Ah, oh, no. Problems for the 29 car, that's the Julian Draper, Carl Jones, Attila Chevrolet. Um, it may be a mechanical issue, I'm not sure. Um, pretty sure. Spin, it looked a little bit sideways on the grass, so we'll right. see if we can get an update. But on board now with the number 37, I would say got a nice clear track in front, but already come up to black markers as we saw the uh, blue flag. Did you see how close they get to that tyre stack at the chicane, feathering it through. Yeah, it'd be interesting. They'll be coming in fairly soon now. A lead of... Yeah, the lead is actually only that's a actually, second. It was, yeah, it was three seconds, the yeah. previous snap bend. So that's the problem with back markers um, and endurance racing. This is an endurance race, I guess, at the end of the day. You get caught wrong with the, the back markers and your gap that you think, yeah, I'm a nice, healthy gap, can be uh, shrunk quite quickly. And that's what's happened here. Yeah, it definitely has come down. Although now he's beginning to pick it up just a little bit more. And... Uh, yeah, Maxwell Lin has dropped down to eighth place now after running onto the grass. We saw that uh, just a few moments ago, so he's, he's lost several places. He's now uh, still there. There's another car just being lapped at this stage. That's the uh, Elva BMW, the Mark 7S, another pretty little uh, British-built car. But not quite the same pace as the Ford GT40s, that's for sure nor indeed for the Chevron, which is running very, very quickly at this point. Now, I think we are going to start seeing some pit stops pretty soon now. The pit window is open, so let's see who, which cars are going to be uh, coming into the pits. It was a good lap last time around by Mars Griffiths, a 122.277, so uh, it still did work out. Now, let's see, anybody coming in just yet? Yes, they are. He's coming in, but uh, Andrew Cucotti staying out there. So coming in as soon as the pit lane opens up and he's going to be handing over to Gordon Shep so this is going to be a good chance for Gordon isn't it yeah he looked very handy in practice um, so we can see him there on the right hand side pulls up there's not much room in this pit lane at all to barely open the, the car door so he hops out in goes Gordon nice nippy quick chain quick belt change to adjust the belts adjust the seats buckling them in it's very hard to strap yourselves in there uh, you always look at it and go why is someone helping you very difficult in race cars uh, no oh number eight number eight gt40 that is the oliver olivier galant car that he is uh, getting ready to hand over to nicholas minassian that of course made some good places and gordon shen is on his way so this is a good situation for gordon there's no doubt about it in that car having the lead from the early stages is anyone going to be able to catch up with him? We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I mean, that uh, car stopped on the right-hand side there, so I wonder if um, we might see a, a safety car at some point. Obviously, yellow flags double waved at the moment. As I can see out of the commentary box window, he's out of the car and running down back towards the pit lane. So it might be OK, because it's not in a dangerous spot. Um, as Gordon now getting to grips with uh, hopping between one type of car to another type of car. But uh, experienced driver, so I know he can definitely adapt quickly. Yeah, he'll be, uh, he'll be on it straight away, Gordon. We all know how talented he is and uh, raced many times here at Goodwood, taken plenty of victories here at Goodwood over the years as well. Um, extremely experienced driver himself. So that's the other GT40, the number 13 car that Dario Franchitti is now clambering aboard. There you are with Dario. And there's still a chance for Dario, but uh, he will need to really put in some very rapid laps if he's going to be able to do that. But there is Gordon Shedden at the moment. Obviously not leading. Andrew Kokodi is the race leader, but uh, we shall see. Let's go down into the pits uh, and join Ed Foster. Miles Griffiths, everything seems to go pretty dreamy for you out there, didn't it? 
yeah, I sort of got the drop, um, or, or they got the drop on me at the start, but managed to get back into the lead on the first lap and then just tried to get my head down and filled a bit of a gap, really. So got a bit mugged off with traffic at the end, but that's how it goes, same for everybody. It's, it's quite an audacious overtake, I'd say. Really? Well, it looked great. <laughs> there was definitely a gap there, so we went for it. And is, it, is this the worst bit now, waiting and watching? Uh, not really, when you've got somebody like Gordon in the car. Um, you know, he's an out-and-out -out professional and uh, we're doing a good job, so hopefully it all holds together till the end. Great drive. Cheers, thank you. Well, we're back on board with Dario Franchitti as he's getting up to pace in his car. But we'll have to see in a lap or two just what the gap is between him and Gordon Shedden. Um, there is the actual race leader. It is the number two car, the little one, the uh, Chevron BMW V8 with Andrew Kukori at the wheel. This car has been recently rebuilt and they had that little overheating problem in qualifying, but it's running beautifully at the moment, I have to say. It's really looking very, very good indeed. And Andrew has got himself in this group quite a decent uh, advantage. Mind you, quite a few of the people who were close to him have now made their pit stops. Yeah, so he, he's 25 seconds in the lead at the moment. But as you said there, Ben, quite a few have made pit stops. But they've definitely done a great job of tidying up the rear of that car where it seemed there was fire overheating at some stage. And it looks like actually they've uh, done a good job with the with the tape, taping it at the back. So uh, good old uh, gaffer tape works wonders, it does for sure. Um, that window, the windows, the way they float in the air a little bit, that worries me a touch, the driver's window in particular. Yeah, yeah. looks like it's uh, slight, maybe that's just, uh, he's done that intentionally, but a bit of air, <laughs> open his windows up a little bit, maybe it's a bit hot in there. But um, yeah, still a few cars popping in down to pit lane, but Gordon Shedden now on your screens it'll just be uh, there's no radios so they can't communicate uh, like in this modern day endurance racing so he'll just have to wait and see now when uh, everyone's on their pit stops whereabouts he is yeah you could see in the background there you could see frank Hitty's car so uh, the gap is around four seconds at the moment between these two i believe so they're not this isn't for the lead yet but they are the first cars that have made pit stops so that's what we're looking at those that have made pits up there, look, there's Dario in the background. So not far away, but whether he's going to have the pace or not, I'm not sure. Andrew Kukori is staying out there for the moment before he comes in to hand over the car to Stuart Hall in a little while. Stuart won't be quite as quick, so we shall see where they end up later in the race. Uh, for now, we are still keeping a close attention on that battle between Gordon Shen and Dario Franchitti. Good lap time from Gordon, wasn't it, that he just did? Yeah, it was. I mean, there's about half a tenth between Gordon and Cacoldi at the moment, so it's still very close out there, lapping at a similar pace, but it's going to be the traffic. Uh, as we mentioned before, the blue flags are out, uh, and uh, like, people are moving out the way, but it can still hinder you, so you just want a, a clear run of the, the traffic, but lapping at a very similar pace at the moment. Well, it's all working very well for the moment for... Andrew Kokori, such a, an experienced racer himself over the years and involved in, uh, in preparing cars, running teams, all sorts. Rob Huff has just uh, set a new fastest lap, though. Rob Huff in the number nine GT40. Um, Richard Mines was in the car earlier on, but now it's Rob, and we know he has tremendous pace here. So let's see how he gets on. Yeah, he's always pretty handy around here at Goodwood. Um, enjoyed success. And, uh, yeah, he's had set the fastest lap by uh, a good few tenths to, to his nearest rivals. So, uh, yeah, you can see him smoking a little bit out the back, I think, there, Ben. So hopefully that's uh, nothing that's going to hinder them for the rest of the race. But, uh, yeah, he's always quick round here and also very experienced as, as well as lighting up the timing screens, as we expect, is the Lotus, the yellow Lotus, Richard Bradley behind that wheel now, just gone purple in the first sector and by a nice little margin as well. Right, yeah, he was quick in qualifying too, wasn't he, in that uh, yellow Lotus. Uh, bit smoky, as you say, from Rob Huff, Rob Huff's car here, but it's, uh, it is working okay at this stage. Now, the gap between the two that have made um, their pit stop just a little while ago, uh, down to 2.6 seconds, 
So, yeah, still got a race on between those that have made a pit stop. A, a big lead for the man who hasn't yet made a pit stop. Oh, and we've got a spin. Oh, what a shame for the number 10 Lotus. The race leader is Andrew Kukori, who has a big lead, but that's because he hasn't made a pit stop yet. So he's been doing a tremendous pace, matching the pace of the four GT40s that have made their pit stops already. But we do think that it's going to be Gordon Shedden once everybody's made the pit stop. But we have just seen a big moment, a big spin. Let's have a look. Oh, that's where it went wrong. And he'd just gone purple, purple as well in the first and middle sector. So absolute nightmare there. He managed to keep it going because he has crossed the line, but did lose around about 25 seconds from, from that spin. So that would have dropped them a little bit further down the order, but it definitely was lighting up the timing screens. Uh, as the Cody car still lapping a fairly consistent pace, uh, slightly actually two seconds quicker than Gordon Shannon on that last lap. So uh, seems to be dealing with the traffic pretty well. Uh, still got 20, just over 20 minutes left of the race. So obviously they will have to box at some point to change. As here doesn't look <laughs> quite a busy <laughs> area of track there. But there, the silver GT40 is the one that we are focused on. That's the Gordon Shed. Oh my goodness! He had to go across the grass, take it. Oh no, he's lost it! He's lost it! The man who we thought was going to have the lead. Oh, he's into the barrier as well. It all went wrong. Lapping back markers. That's where it went wrong. Yeah, just because it gets so busy, he's so desperate, he knows how close he's trying to start the car. Doesn't look like there's too much damage to the rear of the car. Could just be bodywork, but went slight, well, was forced really uh, onto the grass. But I just think it's, it's going so quick down that straight. It looks like it's okay. Might have a few flat spots from the spin, but that might have cost him the, the win there. Oh, what a shame for. Gordon Shedden, because we knew there was a battle going to be developing with Dario Franchitti. Um, and it, now there's Andrew Piccotti, so he is the actual race leader, but now that he makes his pit stop, this will put Dario Franchitti into the lead. Franchitti was catching Shedden, they had already done their pit stops. Now this car is making its one and only pit stop in this race, and uh, Andrew's been very, very rapid. Uh, it now gets handed over to Stuart Hall, and Stuart is an experienced racer. I'm not sure he's going to have quite the same pace. So whether he can battle to be up front with the likes of Dario Franchetti, we shall see. Now, what is going to be fascinating is how far has Shedden dropped back and is he going to be able to pick back up? Because we know Rob Huff in another GT40, number nine, is also flying along at this Yeah, point. so 25 seconds Gordon lost from in that last sector from that spin and Huff has just gone purple in the first sector as well. And again, by a good half a second between Frank Chichi as he just goes through the Sukain now. So he is going to pit, it's going to be so close, but yeah, definitely pipped him coming out of pit lane. Yeah, so he goes through, there's the pit lane exit. There is the, the golf colors. Uh, GT40 effectively coming through, and that is the lead. Dario Franchitti in the blue and red car coming through one of the slower cars further down the field. That is our race leader now. Um, the car that uh, started up front on the pole position thanks to the lap that Dario did in qualifying. But let's just see what happened with Shedden here again, Alice. Yeah, so the, the, I can't work out which black car it is on the inside there. And I just think he just, because he went on the grass, his tyres were a little bit down, but it's still wet on the grass. You can see he knocked the 150 metre polystyrene board there, just went to hit the brakes, turned in, yeah, just lost the rear of the car. And he now is 19 seconds, as we see the onboard there. He's hard on the brakes, so just praying, please stop, please stop. So that was lucky that it was only a, a brief touch. He lost 25 seconds there, Ben, and he's now 19 seconds behind the lead. So wow. I think he would have had at least three or four seconds margin on, uh, on those around him. So yeah, quite unfortunate there. Oh, poor Gordon, but as you said, I'm sure you're right. He had not get the wet tyres, it just threw the braking. But Rob Huff has set fast his lap. He is absolutely flying at the moment. He's currently in fourth place, but he's a little way behind Shedden. But then Shedden, Shedden will do, a, I think, a careful lap or so, just to make sure the car's feeling all right. But it seems to be running okay. You can't see any damage on the back of Gordon Shedden's GT40. 
So hopefully he's going to be able to push on as well. At the moment, the car that was leading uh, during the pit stops, uh, the Chevron, Andrew Cucotti, that of course is still up there at the moment, but that will have dropped back effectively, I'm pretty sure. So we shall see over the next few laps how that changes. The potential podium here, we've got a few other cars still uh, racing hard. So there is Rob Huff, number nine. He's the one who's set fast his lap. Huge experience in touring car racing, both in the UK and all over the world, world touring cars. And uh, also he's always loved historic racing, having started out in an MGB in his youth. And he still loves racing classics every year at some point. Always quick here at Goodwood. There is our race leader, though. It is Dario Franchitti, and the lap times are pretty consistent, aren't they? Yeah, so he's been quite consistent. Obviously, he's had experience of endurance racing before, so dealing with, with the traffic is something he'll be used to, but the Rob, Rob Huff car, sorry, he's actually lapping a good second and a half quicker, but he is about 32 seconds off the lead, so... Um, yeah, Dario then gesticulating across the line, so I don't know whether it's at the traffic, but it does look that he's got his front grille is full of grass. Can you see that oh, yeah. on your screens there? That might have been from the grass that uh, Gordon shed and went over, so I, want, I wouldn't be surprised if that's getting quite hot. Then. Interesting to see. So this car is still running second. That is some eight seconds behind. And then there's another... A uh, gap of 14 seconds to the Gordon Shed GT40, and then another nine seconds back to Rob Huff. And uh, another good lap from Rob on that lap. He did a 121.9, quick, much quicker actually than anyone ahead of him. I think it might have been traffic was partly as well. So we'll just have to see how that all goes. But uh, yeah, it's all going on. Drivers being changed. A chance for us to catch up with some of them. Let's go to Ed. Andrew, you had an absolutely cracking start and then obviously a pretty fantastic first stint. Yeah, I mean, it was always difficult to know where the, the, the B8 would, would be uh, relative to the GT40s, because I think it's the first time they've had them here. So, yeah, it was it was great fun, to be honest. Great great off the line. The car's good off the line. And I just do the best I could in the first stint. And now a nervous sort of 15-odd minutes waiting. Yeah, I just have to see if we can hang on. I mean... Obviously, the way it works on drivers, I guess some of the slower ones were in our layer, and yeah, let's see. You just don't know, but it was been great fun anyway. Fantastic race. A great drive. Well, good to hear from Andrew there after his excellent performance in this car a little bit earlier on. And now we'll see how Stuart Hall manages to bring it home. It is still in second place at the moment, and he's actually doing a, a decent job. That last lap was a 124.7. That's very appreciative uh, lap. There's similar sort of pace, isn't it, to the GT40s around? Yeah, certainly is. As uh, Richard Bradley now settled back in, he's set uh, purple in the first sector. But uh, Dario seems pretty comfy out front, he's stretching his lead a little bit. We've seen how quickly that can change with uh, traffic and what have you. Um, keep an eye on as well his front grill, grass in the front, so we'll see how he copes with the temperatures. He's got Richard Bradley behind him, but he is a lap down. And, and car number two, drive-through penalty. So an infringement for car number two. That's the Cacoldi Hall car. Oh, oh, what a shame, a pit lane infringement. So was that timing in the pits? We're just looking at a lock-up replay there. But yeah, we just learned that there is a drive-through penalty for uh, the Andrew Cocotti car for whatever happened in the pit lane. So whether it was speed in the pit lane, whether it was um, they did the pit stop too quick, I don't know. But obviously they have been picked up for something. Yeah, so they'll get that message with uh, a black flag. Uh, we hung over the pit wall to see out the commentary box window and it's a drive-through penalty board underneath. As I said, no radios and he's just set fastest in the last sector as well. So. I'd expect him to be, uh, well, he has to do it within three laps, Ben. So uh, he has three laps to uh, to go through and some more penalties flashing up on the screen. Car 13 and 27, 10 second penalties. Too many people were working on the car, apparently. That is the cause of the penalty, certainly on the first one. But as you say, um, some, and has some separate penalties, some 10 second penalties to car. Oh, car 13, the race leader has got a 10-second penalty, less than the minimum time stop. 
Oh my goodness, so <laughs> this wow. is and this is all gonna change. We know car two, so the top two cars that we've actually got on grid, that one, number 13 you're looking at, that's just been told we've got a 10 second penalty. Car number two, the car that's running second, that's got a drive through penalty. Okay, so this is gonna put Shedden back in front. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it, it will. Uh, well, is it? Because at the moment, the 10 second Gordon is around about 20 seconds behind, 25 seconds behind, I think. So that spin did cost him. Um, as we can see now, there's a very slow, very, very slow uh, drive through penalty. Drive through penalty. As you can see, there's a guy there on the right hand side that had a, a speed gun just to make sure. That, uh, that he wasn't speeding down the pit lane. He folds back out 24 seconds behind the lead. Own Gordon Shedden's only 2.8 behind him, so uh, he still kept on to track position, but that would have been possibly the, the win for them. But actually, I was just sort of looking at it again and realizing that this 10 seconds is only going to be added after the race. Actually, Frankini can still win this because he's 24 seconds ahead. So as long as he keeps that kind of gap, even with the 10 second penalty, he's actually going to still end up with a comfortable victory, isn't he? Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, luckily for him, you know, the get short and say that again. Gordon Shedden had the uh, the spin, and uh, the number 10 car there on your screens, Richard Bradley, who had the spin out of Woodcut. He is uh, lighting the time screen, so his last lap there is about two seconds quicker that of Dario's out in front and we saw him actually overtake and uh, sort of unlap himself as well so either driving with anger can sometimes make you go quicker but we already know that Richard, Richard was uh, a very fast driver a little adjustment to his middle mirror there so really disappointing for the number 10 car because I think they would have been in this in this battle but this podium battle for sure Absolutely, it feels like everybody's handing this to Dario today. Uh, but it, a 10 second penalty added at the end of the race. It's not that he has to come in for a, uh, a stop for 10 seconds, which of course we do see that in some forms of motor racing sometimes that you have to come into the pits, do a stop for 10 seconds and then come back out again. That would have cost him the win. But to add 10 seconds to his overall time at the end of the race, which is what I'm being told it will be, um, he will, he's got plenty, he's got plenty. He's got 26 seconds advantage at the moment over the uh, second place car. Uh, in fact, that will be different, I think, when they come round over the line again next time. So, yeah, he's in a good position still here, Dario Franchitti, as he comes through to lap some of the other cars. There's that, uh, that beautiful Roadster, the GT40 Roadster of the uh, Mercedes Silver family. And then he's got another few cars to pick his way past, but he doesn't need to rush, does he? he? He can just take his time. Well, yeah, I mean, he needs to, I'm sure he'll have the gap, I'm sure. I can see the pit balls hanging out over the side of the pit ball, so he'll have the gap there. He'll be aware of the time penalty as well, and I'm sure he's clever enough to work out the, the, the gaps. But he's dealing with the traffic, like he doesn't need to rush. You know, we see Gordon uh, having that, that error and being forced out onto the grass as we're going to ride on board now with the battle for seconds. So you can see Gordon's closing up from to the back of, of Hall at the moment, setting bare, fairly similar lap times. Uh, it's not much to, to, between them, but it will be the test will be when they, they catch up with that traffic that, that's not, not, not far in front of them. This is a lovely onboard view. When you've got a battle that's going on for second position coming up here, you're on board with Gordon Shetton. He's in third. The car up ahead of you is the car in second place. Different styles of car to a certain extent. Big Ford GT40. This was Stuart Hall just getting a little bit sideways a moment ago. But he's putting together some beautiful laps, as you said, Alice. His, his uh, last lap was a very good lap, 122.8. So he's really putting the laps together extremely well in the Chevron. And Gordon is having to work hard at this to close that gap down. A little bit of slip and slide as he comes through Levant. And we know the GT40 is very quick when you come out of this corner. But can he close that gap up a little bit more and have an opportunity? In the background, you can see the silver GT40 still not quite on a terms with the Chevron to be able to get alongside. We've got the fourth place car not far behind as well. You see, there's Rob Huff. He told us how fast he was going earlier. He could become part of this. And he still is. He's just gone green. So that means a personal best for him in the middle sector. But so is Gordon Shedden. So Paul is uh, struggling a little bit in that first sector, had a good middle sector. We'll see what the last sectors pop up now, but uh, it goes purple, actually. So 
times are all so close, Ben. They're all pretty much lapping at the same speed, apart from Rob Huff there. He just, he's in the 121s, whereas you've got Hall and Shedden in the 122s. So Huff has got them in his sights and is chasing them down quickly. Yeah, I'll tell you what, though, Stuart Hall's doing a fantastic job in that Chevron at the moment. He's really putting the laps in beautifully well. Uh, let's see if he can control it with Gordon Shedden so close behind. Gordon having had that problem earlier, that mistake by getting on the grass and then losing control. There are more back markers coming up and we saw how that affected him before. This could affect any of them as they come up to overtake. And Rob Huff with his lights on in the background as well. He could be in this fight for second place. I think there's no problem for Dario Franchitti, even with his 10 second penalty. He's got a 24 second advantage over this battle. But we are going to enjoy a fight for second to the flag. Yeah, second and uh, third as well, because Rob Huff again setting a very good first and middle sector. But it's going to be about dealing this traffic because there's quite a little bit of traffic. Luck could be on your side as well, depending on where you can catch them, because it looks like Shedden, it's not felt from there. He's caught uh, one of the back markers in the middle of the chicane. But Stuart Hall knows, he can see Gordon. He's got his lights on now, typical touring car fashion with the lights on. Whether he can flash them is another thing. But uh, closing the gap for Rob Huff, he's closed that gap again. You can see they're braking pretty late. There's a little lock up on the front left on both those uh, cars. Um, yeah, you, Rob Huff, I think, used the traffic well there because it, that helped him just get a little closer again. So these three are fighting. Getting through this traffic is going to be so crucial. He gets away, go through on the inside. That's a relief to Stuart Hall, who does that beautifully and doesn't lose any time. He's certainly cutting his way through traffic pretty effectively at this stage. But it's always a hard one to predict. We've got just over five minutes to go in the Gurney Cup. It's looking very comfortable for Dario Franchitti up front, but it's all still open for second, third and fourth places here. Yeah, and Shedding that Huff is right on the back and nearly pushing him along. It's been a, a, a great cut here for, for Paul, but he's boxed in a little bit in the background there. Look at how close Huff is to but Shedden in the so background. close, but it might just be that Rob Huff will be have to wait for the next lap as they come into Woodcut now. But, or, or is it? They've caught this bunch really quickly going into the chicane, and it might look like, again, Shedden's going to get caught. He's gone down the inside, feathered it through. It's going to be a drag race up the main straight, Ben. It is, yeah. This is a chance to Rob Huff in the red GT40 to get past Gordon Shedden. They're both oh. lapping another GT40, which is much further down the field, and it's keeping to the inside. It's giving them space to go around the outside. So they've got a clear run, have they? She yeah, Rob's having to go right around the outside through Madrid. It's not easy to do that, but he's done it many times in the past. Oh, puts wheels on the grass, just about gets away with it. My goodness, it's all a bit uh, too free. Do they, do they know he's being lapped? I'm not sure. I can Rob is uh, shouting, I'm lapping you, move out the way. He's lost a little bit of time to uh, to Gordon in front. Still four minutes left to go, and with his previous pace, uh, that gap will close pretty quickly. Very, very strong in the first two sectors. But it's fell well for Stuart Hall. He got a little bit of a gap there from Shedden, uh, but there's more back markers that they will be coming up to as well, as we're finding what we're seeing on screens now, the race leader, and I think, yeah, he's uh, pretty safe. I hope I've just not commentators cursed him. Touch wood for, for Dario and his team. Um, yeah, nice gap from them. Yeah, absolutely, even with the 10 second penalty. I noticed his pit board has got a lot of figures on it. I think they're trying to explain to him, you know, yes, you've got a penalty, but uh, yes, you are leading this race. Your advantage is such and such, maybe. I don't know if they're doing all that on the pit board, but there were lots of uh, numbers on it. And Dario's in a very good position, but this is a wonderful fight. But still, Stuart is holding on. He's got that gap a little bit more, I think, than it was last time, up to 1.6 seconds this time. And then Rob Huff chasing after them as well. And this little group, is there going to be any change? I think the traffic a little clearer at this point. But when we get onto the last lap, who knows? We might suddenly be back into traffic. On board with Gordon Shed. How can he find just that little bit more pace that he needs? How are the tyres feeling now, I wonder? Because they've done a lot of laps. Yeah, they've done a lot of laps. A lot of load, a lot of high-speed corners here. And they're all, I mean... Tires seem to be doing all right, Ben, because they've all oh. set their personal best. Somebody's and... made contact and thrown bodywork onto the yes, track. So I wonder if either they've made contact with the wall, because that's a lot of bodywork that's off there. So we might lose our fantastic battle. We'll see a replay now. 
have a look at what happened here. Oh, oh. it just flew off. The bodywork yeah, just yeah. flew off the number three, was that number three six car, I think. Yeah, one of the Chevrons. That's the Nick Thompson, Sean McClurg car. Oh, my goodness. I don't know whether they're going to uh, allow them to... They may just put a yellow flag up at that area. Um, maybe the racing will continue. Let's wait and see. Just under two minutes to go. That's all there is. I don't know if Gordon's going to be able to do this. Yeah, I mean, Rob's gone uh, quicker than him in both the first and second sector. All paid by a tenth in each. Uh, the yellow flag, let's hope they just stick with the yellow flag and we don't lose this exciting end to, to the race. But Rob Huff's just set the fastest lap of the race, that last sector, a good half a second quicker than Gordon Shedden. So the gap now down to just half a second. Well, absolutely fantastic. Let's see whether they can keep it going all the way. Rob Huff is just tucked in behind Gordon Shedden. These guys have had plenty of races in uh, touring cars over the years. Look at that rear, whole rear bodywork section missing. How sad, but they're still going. That's good still news. looks good. I like that. You can see, really see into the back of the car. But here we go. He's two tenths quicker, three tenths quicker that previous uh, sector one time. So it's given a little bit of breathing space to more because Shen has got his mirrors full of the red GT40 of Rob Huff and he's right on the back of him now. But Gordon's used to this, used to close racing in British touring cars. So he's just gonna try and make sure he keeps it nice and clean and place his car where he needs to. Well, I'd say Stuart's doing a, a, a really good job right now, but Gordon Shedden is gonna have to protect. That's because Rob is determined to find a way through if he possibly can up towards the chicane so difficult to make a lunge here and Shedden's breaking late enough that the car was really sliding around these two are going to have a huge fight in the remaining time they're going to get another lap in here and, and it's Rob moving one way then the other tries to go to the outside Shedden will protect down the inside now what about the exit can you get a better exit out of here let's hope they don't touch yeah it's so close need to get your exit so Gordon did a great job he's on the so much oversteer on the exit now into Ford Water not a simple corner, especially in one of these cars, but he's nicely done there. But Rob Huff has got a really good run. He's showing his nose. Gordon's experienced enough to know to what he's doing, what tricks he's trying to play on him. Through St. Mary's 1 into St. Mary's 2, you can see them working the wheel so much. And they'll be aware this is the final lap. So only a couple more opportunities now for Rob Huff. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one here. Can he find a way through? It's coming up to the last chance. It's looking good for Dario Franchitti, despite the penalty that he has been uh, given. A 10-second penalty at the end of the race. It will still allow him to win this race by more than 10 seconds over everybody else. Here comes Dario Franchitti. He takes the checker flag and takes victory. Sean Lynn and Dario Franchitti. But the battle in the background is still going on. We know that second place, oh, look at this. Rob Huff almost alongside Gordon Shedden. But Shedden's still third at the moment. Rob Huff is trying to get the better exit all the way to the line. Second place, Stuart Hall's done a brilliant job in the Chevron. Across the line, though, the two GT40s. Shedden just holds on to that position by 0 0.063 of a second over Rob Huff. What a wonderful battle. Well done to Stuart Hall, who raced with Andrew Capote. Experienced racer, Stuart. He's done a lot of endurance racing, uh, GT racing over the years, uh, but he did a fantastic job there. But Dario Franchitti has taken victory. One of the stars of Goodwood has done it again. And uh, he will be so delighted about that. He loves this event. He loves Goodwood. He's been busy all day long so far, but he and Sean Lynn have taken victory in the Gurney Cup in their beautiful Ford GT40. So they're just celebrating on the way back now that they've managed to do this despite all the dramas in that uh, race, picking up penalties and whatever else. Um, but it has all worked out OK. And he, he, that was a lovely reaction from him in the car. Yeah, it certainly will. So he'll be glad that he had the pace, even though that 10 second penalty he still won by 8.8 .8 seconds. But fantastic job by both Dario and Sean but what a battle we had for the final podium position as well. Fantastic racing all round. Yeah, very, very good. And uh, Andrew Kukoddy and Stuart Hall 
did a superb job with the Chevron to get home in second place. So it wasn't a GT40 dominance in the end, even though it looked like it might be. And uh, Gordon Shedd, that error that he made, partly because of going through uh, slower traffic, having to go to the grass, and that uh, started the whole sequence off. So sadly for, for Gordon Shedd and Miles Griffiths, they didn't quite get the victory, but they have ended up with a podium finish. It's still a, a big result, and thankfully the car was not damaged. It still had good performance. Well done to Rob Huff, who, though he didn't get a podium, he did get fastest lap. Uh, so 124.1.4. Uh, that was impressive indeed that he managed to do. Mar uh, Marino Franchitti was with Maxwell Lynn in the car that finished in fifth place in the end. Uh, the Lotus that we saw earlier that Richard Brandy was so quick in but had that little mistake. He nearly got sixth place but just missed out by four tenths of a second. Let's take a look at the overall results then. And uh, Sean Lynn and Dario Franchitti. Now that is uh, taking into account the 10 second penalty. So in the end, they won by eight seconds. They won by uh, 18 across the line, but uh, eight if you take the penalty. Uh, Kokodi and Hall, fantastic, and the Chevron in second place. Griffiths and Shedden just holding on to third by the tiniest margin from the other GT40 of Richard Mines and Rob Huff. Marina Franchitti and Maxwell Lynn were in sixth place. And then we had more Chevrons, the Lotus, the Richard Bradley Lotus uh, that had the spin, that was down in seventh place in the end. And then the uh, top 10, uh, completed by the number 77 car. Actually, that was good. Chris Goodwin and Chris Harris, they moved up well after qualifying hadn't quite gone to plan for them. They got a 10th place finish in their Lotus 4 23B. The Davies Plato uh, GT40, that finished in 12th position. And on down the list, we had quite a, a mix of machinery. Some of the Elvers in there as well. The Brabham BT5, that finished down in 18th place. And uh, another of the Lotus Fords, the Bailey's car, that had a problem towards the end and uh, dropped out a little bit. And we did see some reliability troubles, but that's always the way with classic cars. So let's have a look back at some of the highlights from that race. And Alice, it was fun really all the way through, wasn't it? Because uh, it's a longish race, it's a two driver race, but right from the start, they were pushing hard. Yeah, they certainly were. Nice clean racing from the start as well. And this was where it changed. So the move down into St. Mary's one, really moving about. Uh, the Gordon Shedden car that was being driven at the time by Miles Griffiths managed to sneak through there. As we saw, ah, so that's, that's our answer. That's what happened to the 95. Uh, a spin off there, and that's why they had to then readjust the, the mirror. <laughs> but some fantastic race. And here where we saw number eight just sneaking through by the skin of their teeth. Uh, and then we got as well the, the all car. They did a fantastic job. A really good race by them. Yeah, Andrew Cucotti was flying, wasn't he? But he was, everyone else was making those earlier pit stops. But Stuart Hall was just as quick as Andrew, actually. Um, he's got just a, a very high level of experience in motorsport. Both of them have. And it was lovely to see the, the, re the sort of stir they had. A big lead at that stage. But then after the pit stops, it was a slightly different story. Then we saw this, this error from Richard Bradley, which was a shame because he was just getting back up to pace in the Lotus. It was just after he'd taken it on. But then this was the big moment. Gordon Shedden thought he got past the back markers, but, but going on the grass, he then had no grip on the brakes. And you can see him bracing himself, bracing himself for hitting the barrier. Thankfully, when he hit it, it was just a narrow, sort of light touch and it wasn't too much damage. And out of it all, despite a penalty for a mistake in the pits, it was a big advantage for Dario Franchitti and Sean Lynn. Dario Franchitti. So let's I mean, go down to Ed and hear from our winners. Dario Franchitti, what a race. Uh, did you, you didn't have any idea about the penalty, I guess? Uh, no, they were just the, the guys were putting the gap up with the penalty, I guess. And I was oh, quite happy just cruising along here, nursing the gap. And then I see them do this. I thought, uh oh, <laughs> so I went a little bit quicker. But we were just, yeah. I, I, Sean did a mega job, mega job. And, um, you know, I started to put a bit of pressure on Gordon in traffic and he you know, he just got squeezed onto the grass and, and round he went. So after that, it was a little bit calmer. And what a day, what a day at Goodwood. I mean, he said, yeah, started off driving the T50, qualifying this, Cortina, RSR, winning here with Sean. That's so amazing. Sean, what a fantastic result. Oh, it's the best result I've ever had. I think it's just amazing. So happy. And the start, I mean, Daria put it onto pole position, which put me under so much pressure. <laughs> I was like, you know, you, you know you want it, but I then, do I really want this? And then with the, I had a great start, and even then I surprised myself, and then I thought, 
okay, I'm here. And then the two cars overtook me because I was half asleep. And then I just ha tried to hang on to the back of them because I just knew I had to, you know, stay within some caching distance of Dario so he can do the hard work, which he did. I think you both did the hard work today. Well done, both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Right, let's crack on down here. Uh, Lee, follow me, and let's see if we can find second place, Andrew Cacordi and Stuart Hall. Um, it's a wonderfully Scottish podium, this. It's, it's fantastic. Andrew, we had a chat in the pits, but um, what a result. Oh, fantastic. You know, I, as I said before, we just didn't know where we were going to be and just had to push like mad. Qualifying, it felt quite good. We seemed close enough, and yeah, great result. He, he drove really well. He was under a lot of pressure. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I mean, you had obviously had the drive through. Did you think it was all gone then? Never give up, man. No, 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 no. Well, you know, I see Shedden and I see Huffy behind and I was like, well, you know, I've just got to give it a go. And I, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't try, you don't, you don't, you don't get there, do you? But the car was fantastic. The boys did a great job. Andrew had a great start. So, you know, what a race. Great fun. Congratulations, guys. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Cheers, mate. All right, we've got third place here. Blimey, you guys. Look, Mars, let's start with you. A fantastic start. Everything seems to be going pretty well. Yeah, yeah. For, you know, my stint was uh, fairly straightforward. You know, it wasn't that I wasn't trying or anything, but just uh, tried to look after the car and uh, hand it over to Gordon in, in fine fettle. So. Gordon, I mean, it's a lot of your life must have flashed before your eyes there, but then to hold off Rob at the end, it was uh, certainly a few highs and lows. Yeah, no. no. It was, it was all happening. I think if I got nine lives, I've only got seven and a half left now. It, it all went a bit, you know, in the, I don't know what the GT40 was, but it, it just kind of started coming across the front of me in the braking zone at the end of the straight. And you can big speed then, you know, 160 miles an hour. And as we all know, the grass is wet. So it turned into a bit of a toboggan from there. So lucky to finish. Uh, you know, good little battle with Huffy at the end there. Uh, you know, he had some good pace in that car, but, you know, managed to hang on to a podium. So, yeah, what could have been? Well, exactly, but you've got a podium, so things could be worse. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, Mel's did a great job, and just, you know, the luck didn't kind of roll our way in that race, but that's, that's sometimes the way it works. Well done, guys. Thank you. So let's just take a look at this again, Alice. It was pretty scary, wasn't it? It was, but as he said, that grass is wet, but that's the problem. Like, you've got people that, that are having their own race, so even though there's, there's the traffic he said about the other... GT40, the black one there in the middle, uh, and then when he came in to hit the brakes, tyres were wet, and uh, there he goes. But he was lucky. He did. He, he admitted he was lucky. Could have come away with a lot more damage. Fabulous stuff. Well, very, very enjoyable. And uh, it's time to move on to our next race. So I'm going to hand over to Harry and uh, Alice. I know you're going to continue on. Uh, we're looking forward to the Formula Juniors being out there. Very lucky. Another day in paradise. If you were in any part of the world, this is where you want to be, sitting on this grid. Right, Rog. Yeah. Welcome back to uh, the commentary box here uh, for the 80th the Goodwood members meeting. Uh, commentary change. My name's Harry Mitchell. Nice to be back alongside racing driver extraordinaire Alice Powell. Um, you've just had a pretty hectic race there, haven't you, Alice? Uh, ready for a bit of Frelful Cup action? Yeah, I, 
I mean, it wouldn't be a good one without these, would it? Uh, well, absolutely not. Uh, if you don't know what these are, well, this is new for this year. Well, the Threlfall Cup is for certain. These are front-engined Formula Juniors from the late 1950s all the way to the early 1960s. And it wouldn't be a good one event, really, with that little set of celebration of uh, where all racing drivers really began their careers back in the day. And the cars as they await in the uh, assembly area may look small, uh, but get up close to them and they are mean machines and the battles are usually very, very close uh, with all of these drivers taking part, uh, regularly battling in historic racing around the country. And if you're looking for a bit of variety in your racing, then this is certainly the one for you. Uh, and the racing is uh, uh, usually about uh, 20 minutes long. This is the uh, official practice for the Threlfall Cup and uh, named after Chris Threlfall, a British saloon car racer and a very successful Formula Junior racer. But I mean, Alice, they are small, but they look and can be very mighty. Yeah, they certainly can. Always produce very close racing, a returning event, um, and they're heading out of the, the pit or the assembly area. Now only 15 minutes of practice, so really not very long for, for the drivers to get sort of into the track conditions, which are nice and dry uh, and, and plan to be dry for, for the rest of the day, pretty much. So uh, 15 minutes to, to get out, get themselves acquainted with, with their machineries, and yes, I'm excited to, to see who comes out on top of the racing that's going to happen with these tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, they head out onto the track, and as you say, it's not that to get up to speed with things. Of course, the track evolving all the time, very different kind of track to what we saw uh, this morning. But as we've seen throughout many of the racing actions so far, you dip a wheel onto the grass, you run wide, and it's already uh, going to be a, probably a trip to the barriers, depending on the Goodwood track that it is also wet. So that is something for our uh, Formula Junior uh, Threlfall Cup races to be wary of. And we have a huge uh, collection in the field as well. We're looking uh, on the right hand side, the number 33, uh, all in silver, which uh, makes its way through. That is a Terrier Ford Mark IV Series 1 with uh, Chris Drake at the wheel. Um, also, something to catch your eye as well. Look out for the number 43. Now, that's an Elva BMC 100, uh, the number 43. Now, that has been entered, and I believe a change to the driver entry. Uh, that is a Guy Verhofstadt. Uh, and a little nugget of information that the production gallery told me earlier is that he is the former Belgian Prime Minister. Oh, wow. Didn't okay. expect that, did you? No, I definitely didn't. Well, we'll try and, didn't. So, try and hunt uh, him down. Let's uh, try and find him on our screens. But uh, no, that's fantastic to have. Uh, could you pass him as a celebrity? I'm not really sure, but I guess. Well, certainly uh, in the Formula Junior category, I think I think we can. But uh, I think he may well be racing as well. Because I think Laurent Demu, uh, who was supposed to be in that car, I think there was a slight change to that. But we'll try and get up to speed on that. But uh, a wide selection. We've got uh, Hillwoods in there. We've got Elvers, Alexis Fords as well. So uh, difficult to sort of. Uh, take a look and see what the differences are. But there is your former Belgian Prime Minister, the number 43, Guy Verhofstadt, um, certainly entering that car, the Elva BMC 100. I think that, a, I can't tell, is that a bit of a dark green or is it black? Yeah, I in, think we'll uh, go for a dark three. Yeah, somewhere in between. Uh, but he's uh, being chased down at the moment by the number three. That is Justin uh, Fleming in the Lola Ford as well. So. This really is, we talk about grassroots racing and historic racing, this really does take it right back to how racing drivers used to begin their, their car careers. Yeah, and they, they look like a fantastic piece of machine for, for back in the day to, to get into your single-seater career effectively. But many of these drivers have experienced driving these cars. They do drive them around the country. So uh, we see them all trying to get some space like i said they haven't got very long there's already only about 11 minutes left of the session so you've got to really try and crack on as quickly as you can there is the number 32 car ray mallet driving uh, that at the moment yeah that's a, a u2 ford mark ii from uh, 1960. quite a boxy looking car compared to the rest of them much more squared off at the front and to the side it's really a bit of a long rectangle uh, with a slightly wider rear. Uh, but the one thing I love about these cars, especially when you know they're open wheel, open cockpit, is you can really see how hard the drivers have to battle around this tricky track. I think it's it's so undulating, there's small kinks, and it is a difficult track to drive at the best of times. Yeah, it certainly is. And high speed, we've seen so many of the categories previous today that 
very small errors can, can send you into the, the barriers and you don't want to be going to the barriers in any car, especially these, as we see some drivers trying to figure out positions, get the best gap uh, on track, some doing it a little bit slowly than, the, than others. Um, but all out there to, to obviously try and better their time. We've got 28 drivers out on the, this track at the moment as well, so it's very busy out there. It certainly is, and uh, we found throughout uh, a lot of these series so far that track management, uh, traffic management is certainly one to uh, uh, manage the 33 uh, silver uh, Formula Junior car. Uh, threads the needle through, uh, the time's coming up on the board at the moment, and even gets onto the grass a little bit. Shake of the head as well. Playing with fire a little bit there for the number 33, Chris Drake. Uh, but first time's coming onto the board at the moment, it is then at this car, the number 33, Chris Drake, with the fastest lap time at the moment. It's about a tenth and a half clear for the 132.486. Then it is uh, Malik in the number 32. That is a U24, that's Ray Malik, and the top three rounded out. Uh, that's the number 12, and that will be Stuart Roach in the Alexis Ford at Mark II. But with just under 10 minutes remaining, if you want a little bit of a history lesson, I suppose you're wondering, the, the this was the grassroots of the beginning, I suppose, of car racing careers. A lot. You can compare it similarly, I suppose, a little bit with, well, there's so many formulas these days. You've got Formula 3, Formula Regional, Formula 4, all the way down as Malik goes fastest and finds a tenth and a half gap clear uh, of Drake. So Drake drops down, Malik goes up. But this was uh, the racing series that has had some pretty big names at the time. Jim Clark, uh, of course, uh, two world championships to his name in Formula 1. You also had the likes of John Surtees uh, and Denny Holm all taking part uh, in Formula Junior to kickstart their car racing careers. And it was uh, believed back in the day the Formula Junior was set up as a bit of a response to the uh, Italian Formula 3 500cc series that had started and then the British manufacturers started to, to take over. No one can prove that but uh, they decided that that's probably what they wanted to do. Um, okay we're looking at the number two this is Mark Woodhouse and the Elbert BMC 100 uh, on the timing board at the moment he is currently in sixth uh, as Malik and Drake battle out with the purple sectors um, and that is uh, all the way down to uh, the, well, it's 1.3 seconds covering the top five. Waterfield uh, in that number 24, that's the Hillwood FJ, rounds out the top five. So they're trading the sectors here as Malik now has a little bit of a healthy lead, but he lost a good seven tenths to in the last sector, so possibly still more to come from Malik in that last sector. Only eight minutes left to go, so time is flying by for these drivers out on track at the moment. I think I may have got ahead of myself with uh, Guy Verhofstadt being in the car. According to our timing screen, it is Lawrence Camus, but certainly Guy Verhofstadt has entered the car, uh, and many across uh, the group of uh, members meeting this weekend. Wherever you're watching, I hope you are enjoying it. A huge a collection of classic cars, race cars, all up for grabs with some brilliant racing so far. We'll get to see uh, these Formula Junior cars in race trim as well across the weekend. But uh, certainly Mark Woodhouse here really battling with that Elba BMC as we uh, take a look at the uh, red and white 14 Formula Junior. That's another Elba BMC. This time it's Charlie uh, Besley uh, at the wheel. Uh, he is down in 12th at the moment and not finding any time on this particular lap. Perhaps setting up to go for a faster lap time. Malik finding more and more time. Uh, he's uh, now got a gap of 1.1 seconds to Drake. So uh, Ray Malik is flying out there with just over seven minutes remaining of uh, the Throttle Cup official practice. Yeah, so quite busy in the background there, traffic. So I wonder if the number 14 of Charlie got a little bit of traffic on that previous lap. It does look like there's busy sections of the circuit and it's quite difficult with not very much time to, to really get yourself out uh, of the of these tight spots as the number 33 car of Drake has uh, found the traffic and he, he has previously just popped up a lap, a good four tenths away from Malik. So he has closed that gap down. Just saw, yeah, the, uh, the number 10, uh, Blue, 1959 uh, Stanguilini Formula Junior car. Michael Gans trying to find a bit of room on the track as we uh, have another look at the uh, the 32 of Ray Malik, still fastest in that quite distinct looking Formula Junior car. I think it's fair to say it has a bit of a, a cylindrical rear, 
but then a very squared off uh, body up until the, the front grill. So look at just look around at the uh, the number uh, 132 just in front of it. Two very distinctly different looks with the Formula Junior cars. Yeah, the number 32, according to our notes, was uh, built by Captain John Howard, who was a good friend of Arthur Mallet, which is Ray's father. And John allegedly lived at the house of the family home for six weeks and ate just beach root sandwiches in order to save budget uh, for the car bill. So I've so never had a beach root sandwich, but maybe I'll have to try one. I've had a beetroot burger before, and I was left disappointed. Okay, well, maybe you should try a beetroot sandwich, maybe it'll be a bit nicer. Well, at least building a race car, you want to do anything you can. And look at this, you think it might be a bit of a race going on at the moment, going through the chicane. Malik is not going to find any time right up behind the traffic in front of him. Uh, his first sector wasn't particularly uh, uh, lighting up the timing screen, so he may well just have to settle and try and find uh, a clean gap. But look at this, so you've got the number uh, 12 going through there, that's the 11. Is for that Stuart Roach, uh, all in orange, uh, heading up this pack at the moment. So uh, that's from 1960. Uh, it used to be pale blue, uh, but now it's been returned to its original orange livery that's been owned for uh, over 25 years. So the upkeep on that, absolutely brilliant. With, uh, it making its way through the right hander now as it starts to clear out a little bit, and then comes Malik, and then we have another look at the, the silver bullet almost in the number 30 of uh, Chris Drake. So he did go in that previous lap, set purple in the last sector, not had a brilliant first sector, so again, I don't know whether he maybe got some traffic, hard to deal with, but they haven't got very long left, four minutes, just over four minutes left of the session, but actually looking at him now, he's got a little bit of clear track, I say that, looking out the side of our country box, Caesar, I've jinxed it. There is a, a few slow-moving cars in, in front of him. He's just caught them up in the wrong place as he starts a, a new lap. Set a personal best middle sector, but as I said, he was quite a bit down in that first sector. So frustrating for those racing at the, the, the sharp end. Lots of different types of cars, as you said, Harry. Lots of different drivers out there to maybe just to enjoy going around this Goodwood circuit. Uh, and enjoy being at uh, this event, which is a fantastic event. So many different people here, young, old, enjoying seeing some, some great racing and some fantastic cars. Certainly is, but uh, this one, definitely one to watch out for. Currently sitting second at 132, but this was the overall winner of the Formula Junior World Series in 2017 and 2018. So Chris uh, has had some very good success uh, with this car. It's the only uh, Formula Junior with downdraft carburetors on a, on a Ford 1100 engine as well. One of only three built. So uh, Chris Drake screeching around that Terrier Ford Mark IV Series 1 Formula Junior car from 1960. Currently in second, trying to find a bit more time to catch up uh, to Ray Malik, who currently is sitting pretty at the top. And... Uh, that car has won, uh, the number 32 at least, has won in some very difficult conditions before, uh, around the Nürburgring, and a very wet uh, Nürburgring too, um, along with the beetroot sandwich build. Number 10, Michael Gans, maybe a slight lift, unless that's what it's meant to, probably sounds really awful to me, that's what it's meant to look like, <laughs> but I don't think it is. The slightly lift at the front, looks like they maybe put a little bit of tape on the front there, yeah, so uh, the tape's come off ever so slightly on the front of that car. As you can see, when it goes to brake, it drops down. When it goes down to the sh down the straight, it, it, it pops up. But he's got a good pinpoint behind him now because he's got the fastest driver on the track. Ray Mallet coming past him now, so hopefully for him, he'll be able to tag onto the back of him and uh, be dragged along to, to move a little bit further up the order as he's in sits in eighth position at the moment. Well, I've already seen uh, big bits of bodywork flying off cars in races. I think we had that in the last race, didn't we? Uh, uh, so uh, they'll be keeping an eye on that uh, number 10, Stan Guilini, Formula Junior of Michael Gans, which as you write this day, this is currently occupying eight spots, but continuing to pound in the laps is this number 32, Ray Malik, still at the front, uh, almost four and a half tenths clear with a 129.849. Then it's Drake, uh, Roach in the number 12, Morton, the number eight of Waterfield, uh, in the number 24 uh, in the Hillwood Formula Junior, currently rounding out the top five. So uh, a nice uh, mixture of uh, Formula Junior 
brands and builds occupying the top 10 indeed and uh, of course this will set the grid for our racing later on in the weekend so fiercely competitive and just over a minute of this session left it really does kind of fly by yeah it does no one really making making moves on the time is a few personal bests that are popping up here and there number 24 car of tom waterfield driving at the moment as he got a little bit of traffic in front of him as well so it seems to be wherever we look at the moment there's cars everywhere lots of lots of traffic really hard to manage so maybe a few drivers might feel they're not able to show their real pace here out on track because it's difficult to manage the traffic but number 10 Gans has just dumped, jumped up to sixth place so he's gained a good second on his previous lap and I guess that will be he's had a helping hand from Malik showing him uh, showing him the way we've got a hand up from the uh, number six uh, driver and that is Gunther Leidig just uh, getting out of the way as we watch uh, the number 18 it's the U2 Ford Mark II that's Eric um, Eustacen making his way round and he is uh, currently a little bit further down the order in 15th so uh, that is the time clocked down to zero and currently Ray Malik at the top and nobody else is really finding too much time I think Waterfield found a little bit of time in that first sector but tailed off and then went into the pits uh, so that is certainly day done for Waterfield Gans making good gains up into sick uh, Longdon takes the checkered flag in eighth for the time being as we have a look at the uh, white with the black trim 66 Formula Junior car. That's an Elva BMC of uh, Nile McFadden. And uh, it's really the number 32, though. Ray Malik with a 129.849. But it looks like they're all going to have to be chasing down. Yeah, they certainly do. As he's going to come along now to take the trekker flag. The trekker flag is out. And there's no one else improving anywhere near his time Harry so I think it's safe to say for Ray Malik he'll be uh, keeping occupying the the P1 spot as Drake has taken the checkered flag as well so is Roach in, in P3 so you see there on your screens Chris Drake I'm sure he'll be quite happy but he was setting purple set very quick in that last sector so maybe he's just not quite got the break in the first couple of sectors and there's your your third place driver of uh, Stuart Roach so he'll be happy I'm sure with with third place and uh, yeah some exciting racing times may not be as close but like I said there's a lot of traffic out there so it's quite difficult for these faster drivers to, to manage that with so many cars on track at one time certainly is it'll be fascinating to see how they do it uh, uh, a fourth spot for uh, Alex Morton in the Condor Ford the 1960s2 Formula Junior car that's the number Eight car. He found a little bit of time on his uh, last lap, but uh, that just cemented his place uh, in fourth, uh, four tenths behind Roach in front of him. But not too much separating the top two, at least, and certainly the mid pack uh, looking tight all the way uh, down, really, to the bottom. To the bottom. Um, but certainly a competitive session in that midfield as they uh, take the checkered flag and make their way back into the paddock. And. Uh, that number 12 of Roach, a 131.8, will be starting third, all being well. No major offs, no major incidents, all kept it fairly neat and tidy during that session. Yeah, it was, it was good, especially seeing that there was so many on, on track. You see the yellow flag waving now, so they'll bring it round just before the pit entry. They'll all turn right, all line up in the, in the Park Ferme. Well, they'll get their instructions where they'll be able to go back. You see the recovery, uh, good old recovery vehicle out going out on track. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to, to tomorrow, to the, to the race. Uh, only one race of these out tomorrow, but a, a lot of people are going to be on track at once. Certainly will be, and it's good to see uh, uh, these lot getting out too. But uh, let's get confirmation then of the results after the uh, official practice for the Thrill Full Cup. Ray Malik topped the session with a 129.849 in the U2 Ford Mark II. Just ahead of Chris Drake, great battle between those two to watch out for tomorrow. Then it was Stuart Roach in the Alexis Ford, Alex Morton and Tom Waterfield rounding out the top five in this Formula Junior category. Gans, Fleming, Woodhouse, Longdon and Ray in the Scorpion rounding out the top ten.
Tom DeGrees, Colin Nursey and Graham Barron were the next three races, just in front of Besley. Uh, Eustacein, McFadden, Sykes, Lackford in the Elva BMC was 18th, just in front of another Stang, uh, Guilini Fiat in uh, 19th, and uh, Laurent Demuse just behind them. Mark Haynes was 21st, and uh, then we had a great mixture, really, of Formula Junior cars, all the way down to the Volpini Fiat Formula Junior, Roger Woodbridge uh, in 29th spot. Well, let's take a look back then at the first bit of action from the Threll Fall Cup, the uh, front engine Formula Junior cars between 1958 and 1960, a fairly clean session. And certainly it was uh, this number 33 uh, silver bullet of uh, Chris Drake that was punting in the early laps and going fastest, but a great battle uh, with Ray Malik as well, topping the times in the end in the number uh, 32 Formula Junior car. That was a U2 Ford, but certainly, Alice, crucial track time for these races. Yeah very short session for them to qualify for their positions but there is your pole position driver for tomorrow in Ray Malik. Ray Malik will start first for the Threlfall Cup. Well, that just uh, brings to an end uh, the Threlfall Cup action. Uh, but we have certainly got a lot more to come for you, including uh, some very historical races and uh, ones that you'll be very familiar with, including this, the Brabham BT-52 Formula One car. Forty years ago, one of the most beautiful Formula One cars that was created did an early season test here at Goodwood and set an unofficial record. It remains the fastest lap time done around this 2.4 mile circuit. It is the Brabham BMW BT52. And what a stunning machine. It was recorded on the stopwatch, but it wasn't officially recorded or written down. Nobody seems to have found it, but it was under a minute. The 401 record from the mid-1960s when there was official racing here, 1 minute 20.4, set by Sir Jackie Stewart and Jim Clark. And a few years ago, a 1989 Formula One car did a standing start, 1 minute 9.9 .9 seconds. But to do under one minute around this Goodwood circuit, absolutely remarkable. Is it true? We'll never quite know. One of the most striking visual aspects of the BT-52 is the front end. It really is arrow-like. You've got this pointed front wing, creating downforce, of course, and one of the key aspects of that year, with the loss of ground effect and the way that Gordon Murray shifted the radiators to the back, the downforce from the front with his very clear front suspension was crucial. He also moved the weight back as well to get better traction out of the back of the car. But this pointed front end is always a very significant aspect to the BT-52. Herbie, you were a part of the team when this car won the championship with Nelson Piquet in 1983. It's a stunning looking car. How does it feel to be back with it? Yeah, when you look at it, what a beautiful looking car. It's so small, so streamlined. And yeah, for me, this was maybe one of the best Brabham designed cars that we, uh, we had. And obviously very successful. Very successful indeed. Now, under this engine cover is the BMW turbo engine. And that was the first year, I think, that it ran the whole season in the car. The year before, you'd run it in the car sometimes, but then the, it wasn't always reliable. But it all came together that year. Yeah, well, first of all, as you say, going back the year before with the engine, it's a little four-cylinder turbocharged engine. And, yeah, we had so many issues. And, yes, uh, we didn't use it for the whole season because we were still using a Ford. But the turning point was the Canadian Grand Prix with the BMW engine. We actually finished first with Nelson, and our second driver was in our Cosworth engine, which finished second. So that was the big turning point, and fortunately we came out on top. Now, Herbie, 40 years ago, this car tested here at Goodwood. Do you remember that day? I do remember with the circuit manager being extremely excited, jumping up and down. Whether it was actually the minute, I've been told it was the minute. Unfortunately, I've been trying to go through all of my old uh, documents, but I can't find anything that actually says. But I would like to believe that this car lapped here in under a minute. It was certainly capable. 
Oh, it's remarkable. And you were there when it happened? Yeah. All right. It's lovely to see you and thanks for being with us. Well, it's lovely to see the old girl again. <laughs>
certainly so. Well, uh, this, of course, being driven uh, by uh, the son of the founder, Jack, David Brabham, uh, Ricardo Patrese too. I believe Karun Chandok is going to have a go in this as well uh, tomorrow. So uh, he certainly had a good uh, lease of life with these cars. And we can see one of the Brabham just zooming past our commentary box. Oh, well, that was David Brabham really starting to wind it up. Ricardo Patrese is still getting up towards the point at which he might press the loud pedal a little more loudly, but the car looks great. But David, certainly as he goes through, the two Madricks will be accelerating down into the sort of slightly lowering sun as he goes to Ford Water. No problem, it's flat, David. Honest. <laughs> of course, this uh, in honour of uh, the greatest lap of Goodwood. And uh, if you uh, uh, missed that uh, introduction, VT, from uh, from Ben and Herbie Blash uh, around the Brabham, a mythical part of the history of not just Brabham, but Goodwood uh, itself, when uh, the story goes that Brabham used the Goodwood motor circuit to test its brand new F1 machine uh, with Nelson Piquet, and supposedly, the story goes, a lap in under a minute. Will we see that today? Probably not. Absolutely, we will, will <laughs> not. But uh, Herbie Blash is still trying to find a mythical piece of paper. There is somewhere. You'd certainly remember if there was a, a target like a minute you went below. If you're told they went below, you can be sure they were. And as he pointed out, he could have gone faster still. But this is also to point out how the Goodwood circuit, with its variety of corners, was a very, very popular place to go testing until, alas, um, noise restrictions brought it to an end. But all the top teams, of course, uh, Bruce McLaren tested all his McLaren cars, and so did so many people. And in fact, it was in the sort of late 80s, it all got rather wound down. But certainly Brabham really enjoyed using this circuit. And David Brabham himself, son of Sir Jack, pressing on out of the chicane, he goes accelerating past the pits. And it's that hard, flat sound of the, of the four-cylinder turbo, very, very purposeful. And we have flame, ladies and gentlemen. You can see the light reflecting from those flames briefly as he went into Madrid under the rear wing. That was rather good, wasn't it? That was lovely. Uh, he's certainly pushing. I think it's fair to say, brilliant to see uh, David Brabham getting uh, up to speed more and more with every lap that goes by. Of course, this is a, a very nice wholesome moment as well because it reunites uh, the, this car with its designer, Gordon Murray, and of course, uh, the, the, the engineer, Herbie Blash, who is still working in F1 today. He's the, the senior advisor to Formula One's race stewards. So uh, certainly Formula One very much staying with him throughout his life. You can see the sparks coming back up on the rear once again at the Brabham as he makes his way up the hill. Right, lovely little stories come from our man downstairs, Ed Foster, said, uh, Ricardo Patrese, I hadn't realised this, has never been around Goodwood before. It was shown around by Craig of the content team in a four-door with everyone else parked on the track yesterday. So we'll cut him a little slack to um, find his way. Won't have been sitting in this car for decades. So, what a beast. Go on, we won't let you have 1,200 horsepower, we might let you have 800, but to learn this track that is far more technical than you think. But now we have them together, and again, the little, as uh, David Brabham backs off, you've got the flames coming out of the back of the second of those two cars, and brilliant camera work to pick up the reflection of that on the underside of the rear wing. Look at these two in tandem through the chicane. You don't get to see that too often these days, do you? How fantastic, as they both wait, make their way down at the main straight and into Turn one, Madwick, and, uh, and that was the check. Nice swimming. Yeah, well, that was the checkered flag. And may I just uh, make a little brief personal mention? If my late colleague Andy Holbury was to be here today, his hero was Nelson Piquet. This was his ultimate car. So, Andy, miss you. Boy, you'd have enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, away from uh, David Brabham there as well too the fans and it, whether you're watching online wherever you are in the world or you're here at trackside i think this transcends uh, the pictures that you see it certainly brings that feelings of nostalgia and even if you're not from this era of formula one not watched it uh, it can certainly uh, resonate as you don't see these kind of machines too often anymore certainly two of them on track at the very same time and one of them in the hands of a former formula one driver ricardo uh, patrese of course six wins uh, across the board for him and the likes of uh, shadow arrows Bravham, of course, Alfa Romeo, Williams, Benetton. So a seasoned Formula One driver at the wheel. And, of course, David Bradham, too. Yes, he didn't get as much of a, a bite of the biscuit, no. it must be said. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's such a bloodline. The cars look crisp. And for the photographers around the circuit, to have them together in this amazing spring, late afternoon sunshine, well, they're going to go home happy. And I'm sure as you wave to the drivers, as they wave to you, as they go around the circuit on the slowing down lap, the BT52 Brabham loved in period. I think loved even more now we've seen them all over again because, as ever, with all forms of motorsport, the shapes, the sounds, they keep on changing, the circuits keep on changing. Thankfully, Goodwood has not. 
and uh, of course the cars they just suddenly jump back out at you and it's great to be reminded of what was the very best car of 1983 a, uh, a proper demonstration of 1980s turbo formula one power here uh, this afternoon uh, at the goodwood motor circuit uh, as we uh, celebrate the fastest lap of goodwood ever and uh, hopefully Herbie Blash will find that little piece of paper that can prove the lap time that Nelson PK did in under a minute all those years ago but brilliant to have uh, the Brabham uh, BT52 here for the 80th members meeting a uh, spectacular view as they make their way now slowly into the chicane and will then make a, a right hand turn and back into the paddock and if you are here it's absolutely go along to the garages just at the top end of the pit lane keep walking and you won't miss them uh, and there's usually a little bit of a gaggle of people surrounding these Brabham so certainly if you can get up close and personal it's certainly one to have a look at and they'll be doing it all over again tomorrow. You can be sure they'll be allowed a little more power as they feel their way in. Great to have these absolutely priceless cars on, out on the circuit where one of them clearly made a very, very special bit of Goodwood history. Well, as the uh, Brabham's make their way back, that is where uh, they're based. We'll uh, take a look back at some of the highlights of that spe spectacular demo celebrating the Brabham BT52 Formula One car. The mighty Brabham, a spectacular demonstration of 1980s Turbo F1 power. Son of Sir Jack, the founder, David Brabham at the wheel of one of the BT52s and Ricardo Patrese, former Formula One driver, six time winner in the other, running in tandem and spectacular scenes, Bruce. Well, the cars were super, super fast. And just looking at that uh, slow on, head on shot, you can see they were super stiff as well. So they'd have been pretty uncomfortable, but enormous fun uh, to drive. But uh, another piece of Goodwood history here for you all to enjoy, reliving the life of the Brabham BT52 BMW. It's like motoring heaven here. It's motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's a sort of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then... Well, that was special to watch, but I'm sure it must have been even more special to drive. Ricardo, you haven't been in that for a while. What was it like yes. <laughs> to do five laps around this historic circuit in that yes. historic car? Amazing. Okay. I discovered that this is my car. I won the South African Grand Prix. The chassis is my chassis. I jumped into the car and the position was my driving position. Surprised that I, it could fit me after so many years, but... It, Really, I felt comfortable immediately. First time for me here in, uh, in um, good to the circuit, so I had to discover the circuit too. But, uh, you know, the, the most important thing is that I, I got some tears because, of course, uh, it's, uh, 
is a card that gave me a lot of satisfaction. It wasn't something you were trying to get times out of them. We were talking about Nelson Piquet, the fastest lap here at Goodwood yeah. Circuit, under a minute. What do you think you clocked? I don't know. <laughs> I, I was slow. It, it doesn't matter how quick I was. The fact is that I could drive again in a beautiful place like this with a lot of fans. That is the most important thing. I hope that the fans, that they, they, they saw this uh, uh, demo, demonstrations, uh, they like it because two, not only one BT-52, two b 52 in the same place in the same day I think is something special is only because of uh, the Duke uh, that uh, has uh, the passion and also the, the possibility to get this thing uh, on is fantastic I think uh, really is a uh, is something that uh, is in my heart <laughs> Well, let's bring the Duke in then, because this is the man that makes these events happen. They're so special. Ricardo there saying driving in that car made him bring tears to his eyes. I mean, how is it to evoke such emotion in a man like this? And you're responsible for that. No, well, I think hearing the crowd as Ricardo and uh, David went round, was, uh, everyone was cheering and clapping. I think everyone was very emotional. I mean, these are such great cars. Uh, you know, Ricardo hasn't sat in that car since October 1983. He still fits, he said as well. He gets, well, look at him, he gets in it perfectly. And uh, he's become a great friend, and it's great to be able to bring, you know, bring them back and pop them in the cars again. And everyone, you know, remembers what it was like when these these cars were producing something like 12 to 1500 horsepower. Ricardo had the big turbo on as well. He was he was in full qualifying trim. Pretty frightening, pretty frightening around there. Unfortunately, I didn't match the circuit. Otherwise, maybe if, if we do another time, I, I get a little bit of training. Uh, and then we try. <laughs> the first time for him to go out, obviously, on that as well. It, it, you know, you just make these events possible, and the audience and the drivers just love it. It's so special. Well, it's great they want to come. Great they want to come and do it. And very many thanks to BMW and, of course, to Bernie Ecclestone for sending both these cars. Because without the cars being here, we wouldn't have anything. So very, very generous of him. Very generous of everyone to take part and make it happen. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to Ricardo and David as well, wherever he went for taking those uh, tremendous cars out on track. And we can't wait to see them back in action tomorrow. Thank you both very much. Brilliant to hear there from uh, Ricardo Patrese and uh, uh, the Duke of Richmond uh, celebrating all things Brabham BT52. Uh, now we move on though uh, to the uh, Trofeo Nuvolari for sports racing cars of a type that raced up to 1939. So we are uh, we are going back uh, quite a bit here. We're celebrating uh, the great uh, Tazio Nuvolari, uh, and uh, this year marks 90 years since the Italian won the RAC Tourist Trophy, Le Mans 24 hours and the Mille Miglia uh, in a single season. So uh, that is a, a pretty spectacular feat. We've got the likes of Alfa Romeo's, Bugatti's, uh, Delahaye's all battling out uh, and uh, easily, I think, some of the most elegant racers that uh, have attacked uh, the likes of Le Mans are heading around this Goodwood Motor Circuit. Yeah, and being driven with considerable gusto. And the person we're looking at now, Richard Bradley, was fantastic in that bright yellow Lotus. He's gone back in period, but he loves doing that. He's in the number 41, the Red Dragon model from 1936, the Aston Martin speed model, but the Red Dragon version, owned by Alan Middleton and pedalled with complete gusto uh, by Richard. So he's pressed on very, very early. A lot of the other drivers take a little longer, get the feel of things. And there are a trio of gorgeous red Aston Martin Ulsters uh, entered by Nick Mason's crew, 10 tenths limited. There's his wife, uh, Nettie Mason, Annette Mason, looking down, but the cars were lined up alongside each other and getting so much attention in the paddock. A little bit of water leaking out of that. You sometimes get the people prefer to top up a little too much rather than not enough. Makes sense. OK, the practice session isn't entirely long, but uh, 10 tenths, they know their cars, I can tell you that. They certainly do. And this one, we're looking at the, uh, the red, has uh, been recently restored to a spec last seen uh, in 1936 at the uh, Arts TT race. So uh, that makes me say at the wheel in that 1935 Aston uh, Martin. In Ulster, but they really don't get very long. Already less than 10 minutes to go. First lap times on the board already. A 142.847 from uh, the 41, and that was the Aston Martin Speed Model, the Red Dragon, as you were mentioning, uh, Bruce. That uh, is Richard Bradley at the wheel. He's fastest, uh, and he's uh, got well. He's nearly about five seconds faster. But these were the first few lap times, so they're starting to uh, come in thick and fast now, with just nine and a half minutes. It is a lot of water that is leaking out the front end uh, of uh, that Aston Martin Ulster, though. So. Uh, might be a little bit of a cause for concern, but well, uh, she's carrying on round. Yeah, looking down a little bit, checking the gauges, but of course her crew in the pit lane can look across at the giant screen across from the pits. They'll see as the car's being focused on that uh, it is leaking a bit, and in fact it looks so... Uh, 
Nettie has backed off and maybe coming round slowly. She was definitely looking at her gauges there. Right, back to the top of the field. It's still Richard Bradley by just a whisker under five seconds. From the number 70, the great-looking Alta two-seater sports car with Gareth Burnett, who's such a superstar, unsupercharged model, used by... Um, Tony Gaze when he was based here in World War II and then of course that along with uh, Freddie March led to the formation the foundation of the circuit here on the old perimeter road so thank you great to have the car that links the foundation of the circuit Absolutely, uh, the number 59 has just slot itself uh, up into fourth uh, position and that is uh, the I'm struggling to find. Oh, that is the Fraser Nash TT replica. There we go. The number 59. That's uh, Robert Beebe at the wheel of that. So a uh, good lap time there, just in front of the uh, the number 47. Take a look at the inside wheel of the red car. Look at that bounce coming through the right hander. Almost the entire front end bouncing. The suspension. I'm not sure is quite designed to bounce that much. But that's uh, that's the number 27 once again. But it's a uh, James Wood in the uh, 10 10 entered Aston Martin Ulster. So it's another Aston. Uh, but the bounce on that, I've not seen anything quite like that before. Uh, no, I'm not entirely sure that all is right. But James is a really, really safe pair of hands in that, and he'll have detected if there is a problem, and he certainly won't want to uh, take any risk. We're bringing that in if the number 27 is in trouble. The number 17 sister car, that's the third of the 10 tenths Aston Martin Ulsters, and that's Holly Mason Frankiti. And of course, the reason a lot of them are called Ulsters is you mentioned the TT race. It's moved around the Tourist Trophy race. It was on the Ard circuit in Northern Ireland in Ulster. Fabulous road circuit, but uh, very scary indeed. But uh, Aston Martin Ulsters, great looking cars, and they really did. Uh, secure an awful lot of victories in the time. Yeah, you certainly are. Holly uh, finding a little bit of time on that lap as well. She makes her way around that car, the 1935 Mini Milia, uh, first in class, uh, in line four cylinder, 85 horsepower, uh, top speed, 102 uh, miles per hour. And Holly's taken part in classic events all the way back uh, since 2006, so uh, certainly loves uh, a classic car around the track. You can just imagine the conversation at the, uh, at the supper table with Marino on <laughs> one side, Marino Franchitti, uh, a driver, second generation Scottish racer who, who they know their motor racing history. You can sit down with Marino, you can sit down with Dario and talk history till the cows come home. One person who's not waiting for the cows to come home is Richard Bradley. He was just under five seconds clear. He's now only just under two and a half seconds clear, but Richard pressing on, he had a whole gaggle of um, cars to get through on the eck between Fordwater and St Mary's. They weren't hanging around, but he certainly was uh, going far faster. In the background, you can see um, the tall Talbots, the, the pea green cars, two, two of them together, and he got past them, and they are towards the top end of the field, so you can imagine how competitive uh, it is at the front. And great to see, to my eye, the prettiest cars in the field. David, David Cook, former rugby international, he brings some brilliant cars here in the Louis Chiron tribute livery. The Alfa Romeo 8C Monza's great cars. And, uh, you know, actually, this is about the most normal car, if I could put it that way, that uh, David races. He loves the Exotica and certainly the, the cars that you don't really tend to know so much, the obscure versions. But look, he's a big man, hunkered down over the wheel, uh, former flanker there in the 1970s just trying to get a bit of a slipstream or whatever he needs but at the moment David is um, down in 12th position he's 10 seconds down on the ultimate pace but it must be said the pace set by Richard Bradley is very very special indeed it heading is, for pole it's hard not to notice in that gap coming through the chicane those two Talbots they are just so distinctly different they're bigger and uh, that was the uh, which I think that was the number six Talbot that we saw initially as well that was uh, Nicola Pellet at the wheel of that uh, that's number 50 uh, number six yes uh, but they're just the, the difference in shape and size there it is in the foreground just making its way through uh, past as we focus on the, the blue alpha uh, again another brilliant thing about the group of members meeting this is all supposedly you know one car class of sports car racer but the difference is from brand to brand to manufacturer to manufacturer uh, as we have the uh, the number four as an aston martin ulster of uh, edward bradley finds the grass that's father of richard and uh, richard will have bragging rights not just because he's uh, going to be heading to pole position but he didn't bring any grass home attached to the back of the car but uh, edward sort of sowed the seed of a uh, motor racing fascination and Richard who's been was brought up in the Far East in Singapore has uh, been coming on now the car that's second fastest is Gareth Burnett number 70 the Alta two-seater in the pit lane on it doesn't appear to be up but certainly conversation uh, going on he in turn is one and a half seconds clear of oh we haven't mentioned his name yet Patrick Pat Blakeney Edwards superstar in Fraser Nash he's in a TT replica third fastest 
And uh, this was a car that was actually entered in the very first race that Silverson held in 1948. Big year for racing circuits. Certainly is, isn't it? Well, that uh, that second place car as well that is in the place recently won the uh, that's the uh, the Alta Two Seater you were mentioning recently won the Flying Scotsman Rally and major pre-war races as well. Spa, Donington, Snetterton as well. Uh, spent 50 years though of its life uh, in Australia before being uh, brought back uh, to the UK to race. Uh, the last Alta built before World War Two. So just highlighting the the heritage that is amongst uh, these uh, sports car races in this. Uh, Trofeo Nuvolari uh, practice session. But one of the wonderful things, Harry, about um, historic racing is a lot of these cars were deemed out of sorts, pushed away to the back of garages or barns and left, but the advent of historic racing and the growth has led to them being brought back to life. And, and some cars you think, how did they end up on that continent? There was no racing of note on that continent, but uh, so they were, and the stories to find them are a legend, but uh, just great to have them back out here doing what they're supposed to do. Right, new new fastest lap from Richard Bradley. He's gone out to 2.8 seconds clear, 1 minute 42.3 seconds. Gareth Burnett, the answer in the pits, 1 minute 45.1. And then Pat Blakeney Edwards, 1 minute 46.7. Who else is on the move? Car number 20 uh, being driven very well indeed. It's the best of the Talbots in the hands of Michael Birch. Phil's just gone up to third. Oh. He was fourth, I looked down, he's gone up to third. That's a car uh, fitted with an Alpine rally body. And it's worth pointing out, the, the Torbots were really successful uh, on, on the bumps and the banking at uh, Goodwood, but also they're big cars, they're robust enough to do the rallies. And the interchangeability is something that obviously in modern day has been lost. Doing a good job of uh, just letting some of the uh, cars on the fast laps going through as well. Just the one mirror on the right-hand side for a lot of these cars, if they have a mirror at all. So your spatial awareness has to be so good, uh, not just around here for, uh, for demo purposes, but also racing around the car. Now, Harry, look at the driver of car number 20, the tall, but does his helmet look vaguely familiar to you as a, a modern-day Formula 1 fan? It does look a little bit familiar. Would it be that of Rubens Barrichello? Yes. It's Michael Bertuccello. There you have it. <laughs> right, OK. So not Rubens Barrichello, though? No, no. <laughs> well, unless he feels like it. Unless he feels like it. Well, uh, a Barrichello tribute helmet, then, uh, certainly uh, out there. Uh, so what has Barrichello ever done good with before? He no, but I tell no, not that I remember, but I tell you what, he would adore it. The trouble is, he, he can't retire from racing. Every time he sort of thinks he'd now concentrate on the career of his son, Edward, Eduardo, he doesn't. He then goes and races in the series in, in Brazil, and he's over in Europe following his boy. But give him half the chance, or more than 52 weeks in the year, he'd be here. I think he'd be a great addition. It would certainly, and uh, the, the closer you see uh, on that helmet, the more you can uh, tell. It certainly is uh, a lovely uh, copy. But uh, I think Rubens has got an, another child as well, who's uh, karting as well. So he's certainly got his hands full, uh, Rubens Barrichello. But not here today, as we focus back on the action. We're just over a minute remaining of this uh, Trofeo Nuvarali official practice session. It is still Bradley uh, up front in that number uh, 41 Aston Martin speed model, the Red Dragon, uh, with a 142.381 in front of the number 70, the Alta two-seater of uh, Gareth Burnett. And then in third place uh, in the number 20, and that belongs to the Talbots of Michael Birch. Well, I mean, Richard Bradley hopping around in the car, he keeps turning around. Is, is he trying to find clear space so that he can hang back and really throttle it out of the chicane? Is there a problem with the car? I don't know. His last lap was five seconds off his ultimate pace, but he's got clear track ahead of him. This first sector time will be revealing. But I think he just wanted to build as much space as he could in ahead of him to really go for it. That is the sort of the nature of Richard. He can't help himself but be competitive. And a clear track ahead of him will be his friend. He can pick up one or two cars, but OK. Will he go below, below 1 minute 42? He's clear by 1.6 seconds because Gareth Burnett back out on the track after his pit stop just improved last time around. So the tweak was a good one. Certainly is 1.6 seconds, the gap at the moment between the top two and the grass that was kicked up earlier on. Uh, a little bit on track, but it's off the racing line as we get another look at the, the Talbot. But uh, session has timed down, so last laps remaining. Uh, the timing screens aren't completely lighting up, so Bradley might be in luck here, but you never know until it's over. And uh, smoke coming off onto the grass for the number 21, Aston Martin Ulster. That is uh, Annette Mason. Was that the one where the water was leaking? Absolutely out? so. So poor Annette there. She was in the top ten, but has uh, fallen down a, a little bit. But uh, clearly, looks like the visor is covered in water as well. Just to look like a specks were on it. So I wonder if it's all just gone a bit kaput. And uh, she has stopped on the grass. Uh, well, as the checker flag has come out. So uh, 
good timing. Uh, there yeah. flat. I mean, I think I think the difficult for Annette Mason, she's one of the first cars out. That's why her name went up into the top 10. She's in fact down at the bottom of the time now because I think after her first lap, it was all slowing down while the water was leaking out of the car. There's a trail of it on the entrance to St Mary's. Ooh, uh, not where you want to find it. And in fact, it does lead to cars on the grass and you go wide, wide and wider still. Much at Paul Ricard, you have the graduated lines on the outside. She's parked on the exit, that's Annette Mason. Obviously leaked something nasty and you could see the, the, the way the grass was cut. The dri you know, drivers going past band one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but hauling it back in before entering the field. Yeah, that was uh, Patrick Blaney Edwards in the Fraser Nash uh, finding the grass and on cue from the marshals, the slippery surface flag is out so uh tread carefully on your in laps and i think everyone would have got the picture there and you can see annette uh, just in the top right uh, of your screen unfortunately stranded there so uh water leaking from the very start of this session as she liaises with the marshals to decide the best way to uh, get out and uh get that car back hopefully to the paddock uh for a bit of a repair job and uh, we've got another slow sports car as well not quite is that the 36 uh i don't think there is a 36 so it's probably not the 36 but i can't quite see which number that is but that has stopped just on the entry actually uh, where that uh, water stream is so the marshals telling everybody to slow right down i don't know if that's had a spin and then just stalled but uh, either way that's off the track number 21 one of the three glorious 10 10 centered Aston Martin Ulsters off the track, steaming away, and Nick Mason out of that. But uh, no debating who ended up with the fastest time. Richard Bradley by 1.6 seconds. Gareth Burnett, who gave chase, was delayed in the pits, but got that outer close enough to possibly provide a challenge in the race. Perfect conditions in the sky, as it's very sunny here, but not so good on the track with uh, whatever fluid was put down at the entrance to St Mary's, a corner that's hard enough with a regular circuit. Absolutely, it is. Uh, but everybody else seeming uh, to make it back to uh, the paddock as uh, the marshals tell once again everyone to slow right down. And they begin pushing um, Annette back uh, and off the circuit completely. Uh, I think Bennett found a little bit of time on his last lap, but it still wasn't enough to get uh, within a second. Let's confirm the timings then. Richard Bradley, top spots in the Aston Martin Speed Model Red Dragon with the 142. Three ahead of Gareth Burnett in the Alta two-seater and then Michael Birch in the Talbot, uh, the big green machines uh, rounding out the top three. Then it was uh, Blakeney Edwards who we saw have a little uh, off in the grass right at the end in the Fraser Nash ahead of Robert Beebe. Christopher Mann in the first of the Alfa Romeos was sixth. Uh, Retamaya in the Maserati. Then we have another Fraser Nash, a Squire and another Alfa Romeo 8C2300 Monza of uh, Rupert Cleverley. Rounding out the top 10 in this uh, Trofeo Nuvolari practice. Then it was David Cook in an Alfa Romeo, ahead of another Talbot, the Lego T23, Max Sowerby, Otten, Bradley, uh, BMW and Aston Martin making up 13th and 14th. BMW's Bentley's in there as well, the Overington Bentley in 18th, ahead of another Talbot and William Medcalf 20th in his Bentley. And it's a big field, really. The uh, Christopher Lund Talbot in 21st, ahead of a Maserati and Aston Martin. The Lancia was in 24th. Alex uh, Herndon at the wheel. Another phrase in Ash. The MG K3 Magnet of uh, Richard Frankel in 26th. Holly Mason Frankiti in 27th, ahead of Paulson, Laub, and Annette Mason, who you saw right at the very end, leaking water from the very beginning of this session, ending up pulling off uh, on the circuit uh, just as the chequered flag fell. Well, let's take a look back then at this first session for the Trofeo Nuvolari sports racing cars of a type that raced up to 1939, full of Alfa Romeos, Fraser Nashes, Aston Martins, Bentleys, Talbots, Maseratis, you name it. And it was a little bit of trouble early doors for the number 21, Aston Martin Ulster of Annette Mason. That ultimately, uh, with that water leak, proved fateful right at the very end of the race, pulling off. But it was uh, really Richard Bradley in the number 41 that was finding the best lap times uh, right at the very start of the session in his Aston Martin Speed Model Red Dragon, finding all the time in front of Burnett in second and Birch in third. But it will be Richard Bradley who will start on the top spot.
Well, we're in Park Fermi, where you can smell the cars behind us. The pre-war 1930 sports cars of the Trofeo Nuvolari race, or the practice we've just had there. They smell pretty special, don't they, David? Oil, petrol, rubber, all the best smells of good, good wood on a meeting. I don't think. But we've had some great action already as we're almost nearing an end to day one here. Obviously, the sun is shining, which is beautiful. But we've seen some special action. Obviously, we had the Halewood Trophy. That was the two-wheel race, which happened a little bit earlier on. Scott Carson took first place in that one. Obviously, it's a combined results from tomorrow's race as well. But he's looking in a pretty good position so far. The Gurney Cup, we saw that as well in action. And... Uh, a marshal just walks through there. They're allowed to. We'll forgive them on this occasion. Uh, Dario Franchitti went pretty well in that one, didn't he, David? Yeah, absolutely. I was in the assembly area before that race. I spoke to Dario, so he converted the pole into a, a quite convincing win. He got a 10-second penalty, but he, he was that far ahead. He still won the race. And, of course, uh, Gordon Seddon and Rob Huff, I was speaking to those guys before, very relaxed, very happy, but they had a hell of a battle into the last few laps for third place. Gordon just getting it by a car's length on the finish line there. And a bit of a DNF for Steve Parrish right here as well. Yeah, Steve Parrish's first time on four wheels. He was looking quite confident. He said he'd gone he here. Always is. <laughs> yes, he confident. He said he chose four wheels because he didn't want to go two wheels because he thought the weather was going to be bad. Who knew? We got bright sunshine, but yeah, sadly a DNF on his first four wheel outing. And we obviously just saw the demonstration as well of that Brabham BT52, which was pretty special. Five laps around there from uh, David Brabham as well, and it was uh, something to behold, wasn't it? Well, we were in the assembly area again before that, and your head was rattling. I've never heard a noise like it. Patrese obviously hasn't been in the car since 1983. First time. He said the setup was as if, as if he just left it. I actually spoke to Ricardo after that when you might have uh, seen it. If you're just tuning in, you would have missed it. But he was very emotional after that, and he said that's exactly what the, the Duke of Richmond's able to do, bring these cars from yesteryear, these absolutely incredible machines, to this circuit and get someone like Ricardo to go back in and relive his glory days. And those cars look so difficult to, to drive. I had a little uh, look inside of the car there, David Brabham there. It's so narrow, it's so tight, looks so difficult to drive. And of course, in quality trim, almost 1,500 horsepower those cars had. Hand grenade engines, they just put the engine in, let it run, qualify, and throw the engine away after it's blown up. Yeah, it's pretty special. Well, I think the marshals want to clear Park Ferme here. Uh, that was made a little bit clearer earlier on, wasn't it? Let's get out of the way and go down to Ed Foster, who's in the assembly area. You and Sergius, and we always say that Goodwood is for all ages, but what an amazing sight, a four-week-old baby. Yeah, and this is his third race meeting already. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's got to fit into our lifestyle. But... Um, and is he enjoying it? Well, he seems to just sleep a lot, really. That's all he does, he eats and he sleeps, but the noises don't really bother him, but when there's the start too many cars up, we've got his little ear defenders on. Now, ahead of the Tony Gaze practice, um, How's the car going? Is it all running OK? Yeah, I drove it here with its, in its original format, I think it was four years ago, and we did all right, but we, it raced at Monaco last year, and it had the, the original engine that it should have in it and the original gearbox and original brakes, so hoping to get better lap times this time. Enjoy it, the both of you. Thank you. Well, uh, certainly uh, getting busy down there in the paddock once again because we're nearly ready to go for our next session and it will be the Tony Gaze Trophy, the official uh, practice session for that. Everyone's happy getting the snacks up, get the cheese and the crackers out. Absolutely sit back and relax for the next bit of action. Uh, we've got road going sports and GT cars of a type that race between 1948 and 1954 on the way for you, which uh, celebrates uh, the first flourishes of the Goodwood Motor Circuit's racing life. Of course, Tony Gaze, known as a bit of the grandfather of the motor circuit in some way, a former World War II fighter uh, and racing driver who suggested to Freddie March that the current Duke of, uh, the current Duke of Richmond's grandfather, that the perimeter roads of the uh, Goodwood airfield might make for a pretty decent racetrack, and I don't think he was wrong. He certainly was not wrong. The undulations really, really add to the nature of the place, and it's a, such a technical track. It's not one you can arrive at and be quick straight away. You've got to grow into the circuit. And don't forget, a lot of these drivers and riders competing here jump from vehicle to vehicle. So having to learn the, the vagaries of the circuit with the vagaries of the particular car. And it's always intriguing to me when you get a contemporary racing driver being put into one of these and having to completely put a different chip 
into their brain as how to drive them. And with these cars, a lot of them didn't have a huge amount of horsepower, these sports cars, uh, from the early days of Goulden. So precision and carrying momentum was absolutely key. It certainly is, as uh, they make their way out onto track. So uh, you'll see, uh, once again, a huge variety of brands, from Freight and Ashes to Porsches to Aston Martins. Uh, Austin Healy's in there as well, a Jaguar, uh, and a, uh, a couple of Austin Healy's too. So there is something uh, for everyone. We've also got the Connell L2, and we, uh, you saw um, uh, Ed speaking to you and uh, Justin over uh, earlier as we had a little bit of an excursion there for, for one of our drivers just on the outlap. Absolutely so. So that was, uh, again, possibly someone else moved and uh, ended up where he didn't expect to be. That's car number five, which is um, that was Bobby Verdon Rose. Let's just double check that's Bobby's helmet. I know he's hyper enthusiastic. He'll be out later in the Lister storm that he drove uh, back 20 plus years ago in the GT1 exhibition. But uh, the car made its way back onto the circuit, for which we say great thanks. Martin Hunt pulled alongside and went past. He stayed on the black stuff. Sorry, Martin Hunt's car with Pat Blakely Edwards on board. In fact, this is the one we're riding with PBE on the helmet, many stickers. And, uh, from where he's raced in the organising clubs, but he's uh, doing that thing you need to do, get some heat into the rubber. He certainly has. Uh, that car that ran off was an XWM Jaguar XMC34 from uh, uh, 1950 uh, as we ride on board with this uh, Fraser Nash Le Mans replica, where you say with uh, Patrick at the wheel, getting heat into the tyres, the weather holding firm once more. We could enjoy these glorious vehicles uh, and all the variety of colours uh, as well. Look out for the uh, the number 431 car as well. It's an Aston Martin DB2 out on track as we uh, see the 38 car. That's uh, the uh, blue um, uh, Pinard Junior Roadster making its way in the head of this little gaggle of cars. You know, when I look down the entry list, I always look for things I don't think I've seen before. And I think this very much falls into that. Couldn't be more quintessentially French if it tried it looks like it's been a body dumped on top of uh, a chassis, effectively. Maybe that's effectively how it's made, but it was raced extensively in the States. Great circuits, Watkin Glens, the bumpy Sebring and the wonderful mid-Ohio. In fact, all the way from the 50s up to 1987, it was still competing in the Bahamas Speed Week. But it's unusual, and to my eyes, it's the first time I've seen it. I love uh, the helmet as well of uh, uh, the uh, driver. That's uh, Ryan uh, Morgan. Uh, at the wheel of that, so uh, beautiful hel helmet design uh, that he's making his way around there. You can see the sort of side, uh, the, the, the passenger side covered with a little bit of uh, tarpaulin, a little bit of material there, and uh, similarly just behind it, different car, but very similar colour by the looks of things. Yes, and again, the tonneau cover, you can see it flexing a little bit, but that's far better than having the cockpit being, you know, full of billowing air. That's what also makes the car a little bit more streamlined as well, but certainly more comfortable to drive. Certainly is. Uh, now let's have a look at this. This is the uh, number 18 Fraser Nash Le Mans replica car. Uh, Oliver uh, Marquet at the wheel of this from 1952. And uh, once again displaying a very different uh, kind of uh, uh, car on track for sports and GT cars that race between 48 and 54. So uh, a big selection covered here. Well, this one actually, uh, John Breslow over oh. from the States racing that. But the Le Mans replica, such a popular uh, Fraser Nash car. And uh, they're not all the same, because the one that Pat Blakeney Edwards uh, has the onboard camera with was a, a, a narrow body made specifically for competition use. So they, they weren't all the same. And really, that's the story of cars from the 40s and 50s. Uh, yes, they didn't have big production runs, but uh, they had development all the time, evolution. So here we have Pat Blakeney Edwards coming across the start finish line. The target time, no one has put a flying lap on the board. Pat has. Bobby Verdon Rowe goes to the top with a 1 minute 38.0. Bear in mind on his outlap, he was on the grass. There's Bobby just turning into Madgwick in the HWM. You mentioned that's car number five. So he goes top, 1 minute 38.0. Next up is Olivier Marseille. Oh, it's Marseille, sorry, I corrected you and I need correcting. I've got an older entry list for which I should stand in the corner for 10 minutes. Car 18, uh, Marseille, not jo owner John Breslow. Uh. It's OK, ten and a half minutes uh, remaining of this session and the fast lap times are coming in. Uh, we're looking at the number five of Bobby, Ver uh, Bobby Vernon Rowe, who has just gone quick speed, going very slow there, so just wondering if he had a bit of a problem there, or is he just getting out of the way uh, of the traffic? Doesn't seem to be too perturbed. No, Bobby doesn't get language. out of the way. People get out of the way for Bobby, that's how it works. But uh, he's at the side of the circuit, maybe being cautious. Now, why would he be driving so far off the edge of the circuit? He's not seemingly doing that thing where drivers look down in the cockpit for inspiration and things that may have gone wrong but I think Bobby's detected he's seen something on a gauge that maybe is a little bit uh, not yeah. as it should be but he did have that off on the opening lap as they were getting out from the pits and that certainly might not have helped the bumps across the grass 
yeah, he's bringing that one home. Well done, Bobby. Better do that than uh, have anything on toward occur. Absolutely. Well, he managed to set the fastest lap time in the meantime. So uh, as he cuts onto the grass and uh, will try and make his way back home, uh, if he can, we'll uh, keep you abreast of how that uh, unfolds as we uh, take a look at the number 20 car out on track. And that is an Austin Healy uh, and uh, Jonathan uh, Abacassi. Abacassis. Abacassis. There we go. You were here for a reason, Bruce. No, I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> Jonathan here, uh, racing around there in that uh, beautiful colours. Quite a lot uh, of uh, a few Austins actually out on track too. Um, but the number 20 coming into uh, the chicane, really hounding that steering, trying to carry as much speed and momentum as he can uh, and across the line. And of course, the Abacassis family, if you look up the his racing history of George Abacassis, I still think he's at the head of any A to Z of Formula One drivers. Maybe he is the same. <laughs> yes. That would uh, certainly make sense, I think, um, just behind Aaron Aardvark, but uh, we'll see how that one pans out. Oh, is this the end of the day for uh, Bobby Verd and Rowe? Well, if it's the end of the day, we hope it's the end of the today, and that he'll get that out into the race tomorrow. Bobby climbing out in the, the Marlboro overalls, because uh, he won a historic Formula One championship in a McLaren M23, which, of course, had Marlboro livery all those years ago. But uh, Bobby, arch enthusiast. Uh, just stepping aside, but I think far better to have stopped in that. A bit of a heat haze coming off the bonnet, but obviously any racing car when it suddenly comes to a standstill has heat to dissipate. Another one diving into the pits, car number 35, another Fraser Le Mans, Nash Le Mans replica, that's uh, Tim Crichton. That was driven in period uh, by George Duff at Le Mans, where he raced there and then continued on the way down to the Riviera for a holiday in the same car. Oh, delightful. And in fact, while he was down there, he thought, let's go home, but let's do the Alpine Rally on the way home, and he won that. So that is a multi-purpose car. That's uh, efficient with his uh, time and travel uh, plans as well. Uh, just popping up into third spot for the 143.5 is the uh, number 28 car. That's John Urey and another Fraser Nash uh, replica, 1952. One of the first of seven Mark II cars um, built uh, with a really unique body as we uh, ride on board with uh, Blakeney Edwards in the uh, number two. Yeah, he's just not wanting to take any risks. He wants to be sure the driver of the Austin Healy has seen him and not seen him. He has done so. Now the hand comes up between Woodcote and the chicane. You can go through. One of the two glorious Porsche 356 this is up ahead. But Pat Blakeney Edwards will have all the speed in the world. Great on board footage. He's pulling out. He's, does, the Porsche has a bit more acceleration than coming out of the chicane. But Pat is a super fast driver. Uh, let's see what happens when they get to Madrid. He wants to know for sure that he can go up the inside. No, don't know fully that that's the case. So back it off, save it for another day. You can see the 356 just moving between Apex 1 and Apex 2 wide as it goes into compression, comes up. Now let's see if the slipstream will work for Pat Blakeney Edwards. The next corner is, to my mind, the toughest on the circuit. Ford water, it really is. Draw the breath and go through. Don't think about it. Oh, and he's and don't think about going up the inside. There is no inside, unfortunately. Wheel on the grass as well there, but he did come across the line and set a quick lap time. But it got him up to fourth briefly before being displaced uh, by the number 32. Uh, now that is uh, Cliff Gray at the wheel uh, of another Fraser Nash as well. So uh, really, the times uh, in that mid pack uh, certainly quite tight. But uh, it's Verdon Rowe still out front, although he is now out of this session with about a three-second advantage, 138.0, uh, his fastest time. So really, it looks like. It might be a battle for uh, second and behind. We shall see six minutes uh, on the clock remaining of this session. And uh, that Porsche 356 uh, certainly not getting out the way of many people. Well, someone's just put up a cloud of steam for the drivers coming in behind. But poor Pat Blakeney Edwards, number two, is just blocked entirely by the traffic. It's taken him several laps and he's just got to be calm. He can't take a risk. He's had a look up the inside of the Porsche 356 going into the first turn, it wasn't there. So at Madrick, he backed out. Now he's got an Aston Martin across his nose. That's number 431, a, a db 42 from Guy Verstoff for Hofstadt. Now, Pat Blakeney Edwards, he doesn't know how much time's left, but I can tell him if he wants to know, five minutes, 40 seconds, but he's got to get clear of this other 356, and then, only then, can he set about doing what Pat Blakeney Edwards does so very well. Thank you very much. Oh, and he gets quite close, saying hello there, for sure, as he passes the 1955 built uh, pre Porsche from 1955, yeah, one of the most celebrated and well-documented 356s in the UK, owned by, uh, well, it was owned by Dennis Jenks, Jenkinson, a prolific writer uh, back in the day, travelled all over Europe, featured in many of his uh, uh, articles that he wrote at the time, reporting on uh, uh, important events uh, of the period. But finally, Thomas Pede, who was driving that, uh, that 356, uh, gets out of the way, 
of Blakey Edwards, who he continued to ride on board with just under five minutes, and he'll try and find a bit of clear track. But before you know it, he'll be back onto the rear of the car in front. Yeah, but the car in front was the one that's been um, puffing steam at various points. Through St Mary's, it's running a little bit wide. He will have the traction. Oh, maybe it was the Jowick Jupiter, pale blue, and pulling off the track that was uh, puffing uh, steam out on the circuit. Can't see as it's so low to the grass if anything's coming out from underneath, but it's over and out for the Jowett Jupiter. Disappointment there for Richard Gain. Car number eight at a standstill. How quick was it overall? 16th place, but uh, to give you a spread of time, a pole man Bobby Burden Row is clear by three seconds. This car that was just outside the top half of the field is uh, 15 seconds behind, 17 seconds behind. That is a huge margin from top to middle. You were right, though. I think it is this 67 car that is still puffing out the smoke that the Aston Martin uh, DB24, you can just see it there. Three abreast, almost, and uh, getting out of the way, uh, that being driven by Chris Mayhew. Um, so definitely still smoking. Might be a separate issue, then, for, for Richard Gain in that uh, Jarrah Jupiter, a homage or a replica to the Le Mans class winner from 1951. Well, the aim of the game for Pat Blakeney Edwards is to set a quick lap. The best way to do that is to get a very clean exit line from the chicane onto the start finish straight. This time, Pat Blakeney Edwards has done precisely that. He's got a fairly clean line through the first part of Madrid. That wonderful controlled drift towards the outside of the second part of the corner. Now down the straight towards Fordwater. He's got a car in front of him. Will it get out of the way? It's the Panhard. The Panhard gets very nicely, nicely out of the way, but it does give Pat a tighter entry line to Ford Water than he would have had, would have chosen if he was there on his own. More traffic up ahead of him, but he's got a good flow, and you know how good it is? It's his fastest through the first sector of the circuit, still way down on um, Bobby Verdon Rose, best sector time. Bobby can't respond, his car parked at the side of the circuit, and for Pat, three minutes remain. He's got to put this lap together, and then preferably one that's even quicker next time around. A George Abacassis, number 20, uh, in the Austin, Austin Healy 100, going supremely well. He's second fastest at the moment. He just banged in the fastest first sector of his time, the fastest terminal speed going through the speed trap in sector one as well. That red and white number 20, Austin Healy, going beautifully in Abacassis' hands. Yep. Last time around, had about half a second the gap between uh, Marquet and the number 18, currently in third spot. So it really is going to be a battle right to the very end, I think. Um, our timing screen lighting up a tad, but uh, still, it's uh, the number 20 crosses the line, should stay in second spot, but does it extend its advantage over third spot. So it was half a second. It's now uh, quite a lot bigger than that. All point one. Pat Blakeney Edwards are back on board with him. I could watch him all day because he was sideways coming out of the chicane and his determination to get the best exit. He seems to spend his life behind Porter three five sixes. He at the moment is down in sixth place. His time is 3.6 seconds off the ultimate pace. That's still in the hands of Bobby Burton Road. We're inside the final two minutes. The Porter Sort of keeps out the way. That's uh, number 356 with uh, Simon, sorry, uh, Robert Barry at the wheel. But uh, that Porsche 356 is quick. And where is Barry overall? He's eighth overall. His best time, though, is five seconds down on Pat Blakeney Edwards. So Pat has to get past if he wants to set a quick lap. Well, with a minute and a half left, it's going to be, uh, well, uh, difficult as he does get through just, but now he has to finish this lap and then start another one in time uh, and try and claw his way up the timings. This one isn't going to do, unfortunately, so you can see him really hounding uh, the steering wheel of that number two, Fraser Nash, the Mon replica 1953 car. Well, speed is fabulous, but precision really does aid that. And Pat Bla Blakeney Edwards, as he left St Mary's, went down into the dip. His right-hand wheels were absolutely on top of the tiny, narrow white line at the edge of the circuit. And any further beyond that is that thing called grass. We've already seen a few uh, drivers take a little bit of grass uh, home with them to the paddock for uh, uh, a bit of a, a take-home prize. Glad we're back on Jonathan Abacassis in the Austin Healy because he's improved. He's set the f his fastest second sector time. He's 1.6 seconds down. He's now 1.4 seconds down on Bobby Verdon Row. Looks like the track is quite clear ahead of him. So the driver with the black helmet and the black glasses for the low light really pressing on. It looks though for his final flying lap. He's got clear track. It's what the drivers want. It's what Pat Blake, the Edwards, has absolutely prayed for. It hasn't come his way. He's down to six. Little look down to the cockpit though for uh, Abacassis. Cool shades on, feeling cool, calm and collected. 
effective, but absolutely handing uh, that Austin through, trying to find more and more time. He's got a look in front of him, 1.4 seconds to try and pick Vernon Rowe for the top spot, but he's got Mark Cage just behind him, who's been finding time and time. But for Abacassis, he's found a lot of time in the first sector. Can he carry uh, that momentum through into the middle sector of this uh, uh, 2.4 mile, 3.8 kilometer motor circuit here in Goodwood for the 80th members meeting? And he's getting a little bit of traffic as he makes his way around the right hander. He might just get away with it. But uh, will that slow him down ever so slightly? It's the number 15 car, that's the Jaguar, uh, the XK120, which cuts across him, but then does get out of the way. But how much time did that cost him? We wait to see when the split times uh, come up for the middle sector. But will that first sector be enough to carry him forward? Clear track for the time being. 138.0, the fastest that time at the moment. Abacas is currently on a 139.4. Well, I think it's going to hurt him mortally simply because if you don't get a good exit from the second part of Lavent, it costs you the whole way down that King Strait to Woodcut. And as hard as Jonathan Abacas is pushes through Woodcut and then out of the final corner, the chequered flag will greet him. It is now being waved. He couldn't quite get another lap in. His best lap so far, 1 minute 39.4. Then he did one minute 39.7, so he would have improved if he hadn't had, unfortunately, that uh, Jaguar XK120 across his bowels between the turn in to the second part of the Lavender Corners. Well, the chequered flag then flying. Last lap times being put in uh, Gray in the number 32 going quickly too. That's the Fraser Nash of uh, Cliff Gray finding a bit of time in the first sector, the second sector. The personal best for him. Can he find a few extra tenths to try and hop up the leaderboard? We'll see how far he can do. Uh, and here he is in the number 32 through the chicane. Steely eyes of concentration, getting a little bit of uh, slipstream from the other Fraser Nash in front. Crosses the line. Can he find a bit of time? He can. He goes up to third spot for Gray. Yeah, that was very good indeed. He was uh, had John Muir ahead of him, but that on the track and on the timing sheets, but uh, definitely moving up in the final roll of the dice to third place overall. Jonathan Abacas is second in that uh, red. Austin Healy with the uh, white stripes up its nose, but Bobby Verdon Row, a mixed session for him. There he is, he's not smiling. You have got pole, Bobby, it's all right. Let's hope they can uh, uh, fix that car in time. He's got his phone out, so uh, might be just checking the results, double checking. Yeah, light timing. The fastest lap time. Uh, and you have, indeed, by 1.4 seconds. So you had it in hand, and uh, traffic management really proving difficult for some of our faster drivers finding themselves behind slower drivers who are also trying their best on their quick laps so it is a little bit of give and take around this uh, Goodwood motor circuit and uh, we'll get confirmation then as we have another look at the beautiful surroundings of the Goodwood motor circuit. Bobby Burton Rowe then didn't make it to the end of the session but he did enough in the early stages to take the fastest time a 138.0 in his Jaguar ahead of Jonathan Abacassis and the Austin Healy was trying for all his might could only do second in the end. Cliff Gray jumping up right at the very end in the Fraser Nash uh, in third ahead of Oliver Marquet and John Urey rounding out the top five on board. We were riding with Patrick Blakeney Edwards for a long time in the Fraser Nash. He ended up in sixth ahead of Tom Crichton. Four Mortima in the Austin Healy. The Porsche 356 of Robert Barry was ninth ahead of another Austin Healy. Vincent Janssen's in tenth. The Morgan Plus 4 was 11th in front of a Porsche, and then we have an Austin Healy heading up a, uh, a quartet of Jaguar XK120s. David Brazell, Guy Harmon, Steve Ward, and Hans Martin uh, Schneeberger. Then it was Richard Gain in the Jaguar Jupiter, who was having a few issues early doors. Chris Mayhew and Ryan Morgan in the Panard was 20th. The Healy Silverstone of Rob Hubbard was 21st, and it was Guy Verhofstadt in uh, the 22nd place in the Aston Martin DB2. Michael Hibbert in the Buckler. The Connor L2 of Ewan Sergeson was 24th. Then it was Neil Collins and Rudolf Ernst rounding out the field in 26th. Well, the first bit of action then for the Tony Gaze Trophy for road going sports and GT cars racing between 1948 and 1954. A huge selection of cars out on track from Fraser Ashes, from Porsches, Jaguars, Austin Healy's as well. A few cars uh, coming up with problems in the early stages. The man who set the fastest lap time, Vernon Rowe, uh, setting it and then struggling with his car and having to pull to one side, keeping Abacassis and Gray at bay. But he did enough despite pulling off early doors.
It's like motoring heaven here. It's motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's assault sort of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then... <laughs> Well, we're in Park Fermi here with these wonderful Tony Gaze trophy cars from the 40s and 50s. Bobby Verdon Rowe took pole position. He hasn't made it to Park Fermi. He had a little problem out on track. But I'm here with the second place driver, Jonathan. You happy with that? Yeah, pretty happy. Uh, so it was a kind of busy track out there. So hopefully there's a bit more to come tomorrow and I can uh, have a crack for the win. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. Great track and uh, great weather. Well, we still haven't heard out about what Bobby's problem was. So, you know, you might even be on pole position. You never know. I'll take it, you know. <laughs> well, you're certainly looking the part. Tell me a little bit about this car. Thank you, sir. I, I brought it from the States, where it's been uh, it's been raced since the 50s uh, by, by amateurs. Uh, it was owned by uh, a good close friend of the Heelys uh, for over 20 years. It's autographed in the, in the boot lid, uh, and I've been racing it since 2011. Well, it certainly looks fantastic. And what sort of power are you putting out in this car? Uh, I don't actually know because my uh, they, they did some tweaking beforehand, and they haven't shown me the dyno run, but probably probably at 150. We see lots of different uh, you know, cars, faster on the straight, cars in the corners. Where's, where's this sweet spot for this car around a circuit like this? Yeah, I mean, this is just very nicely in the middle, right? It's kind of uh, just under a ton, medium power. So, you know, something like the XKs, they can outgrunt you on, on the straights. But then you've got the lighter cars, the Fraser Nashes will, you know, be better in the corners. But, you know, this is kind of quite good everywhere. It makes a lot of fun to drive. So what's going to be the, uh, what's going to be the policy tomorrow, the strategy of uh, probably the front row of the grid, obviously? Get in front and stay there, I think, is uh, <laughs> try, try not to overthink it. <laughs> Look cool, put the shades on, and keep everyone behind you. Is that what we need to do? Pretty, pretty much, pretty much. So. Well, look, best of luck with the race. Enjoy it. It's the sunshine. I'm hoping for another lovely day tomorrow, and uh, we'll, see you, we'll see you for the race. All right, thanks a lot. Hope to see you tomorrow. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, right, guys, well, uh, I'm not sure where we, uh, we're going to have a look around this track here. We've got um, all the cars learning out there. Driver's coming back. We're going back down, I think, to believe now, to the assembly area. Yeah, we're getting ready for the uh, next bit of action out there with the SF Edge Trophy for the, the really ancient cars, going back to the early 1900s, 1903, some of the earliest cars that we're looking at. That one you're looking at is Mark Walker's number 200, the Darak. That's going to be on the front row of the grid. Um, also, Ben Collins, the number three car. Um, he's sitting in his car at the moment. Uh, you can see Mark Walker there as well so we're getting ready for the sf edge but there's so much going on here at goodwood and one of the interesting aspects of it all is about the goodwood houses the different teams that are competing here let's take a look at how all that works part of the competition aspect of the members meeting is to split the drivers and attendees into four separate groups to battle for the honor of what is known as the house shield just like Hogwarts in Harry Potter's youth, there are four houses, and it's even more random as to who ends up where. Each house is named after titles belonging to the Goodwood Master, the Duke of Richmond, and there are house captains from famous racing backgrounds. Peugeot Le Mans factory driver in the 2000s, Nicolas Minassian, is captain of House Albigny, which is represented on the shield by the Fleur de Lys. Ex-Formula One driver and Le Mans winner, Jochen Mass, is the front man for House Darnley, for which the crest is the boar's head. Former British touring car ace Anthony Reid is captain of House Methuen, represented by the lion's head, while five times winner of Le Mans, Emmanuel Ipiro, is head of House to Bolton, which is celebrated by the harp. Every driver at the event scores points according to how they finish in each race. But it's not just about track action. Anybody who attends the event can dive into some fantastic challenges and also score points. Fancy some laser clay shooting? Or what about axe throwing? Perhaps Skittles is more suitable, or even sheep herding amongst loads of options. 
There's also the important house group tug of war, where the house captains take a grip. As usual, there is no I in team. The house shield is about everyone at Goodwood. So there we are, all part of the members meeting here at Goodwood. But we are now getting ready to see some of these beautiful uh, historic cars. Let's just see how the, the uh, Goodwood House points are going at the moment. And it is Darnley that is leading, 8698 points at the moment. Uh, it's all quite close, though. Uh, Aubigny losing out a little bit at this stage. Maybe they'll be able to catch back up. And, of course, it all depends on the results in the races, but also what's going on uh, beside the track, too. So we'll be looking forward to that developing as we go through the rest of the weekend. In the meantime, we're getting ready for the SF Edge Trophy. Let's go to Ed Foster, who is down in the assembly area. He's got a chance to uh, catch up with some of the drivers. Julie Majib, it's wonderful to see you at the front of the grids. I guess with a couple of um, speed record cars behind you, you want to try and keep them behind on the straights? Yes, I think so. I mean, we managed to do pole uh, on the last lap, apparently. But uh, uh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, so I would say uh, my, my, my engine's a lot smaller, although it's more efficient. But they've got a lot more grunt. So I'll, I'll have the handling and they'll have the straight line speed. So I think it'll be really interesting. I'm expecting them to leave me at the start and then hopefully I can catch them up. <laughs> is this a bit of a nightmare to get off the line? Uh, no, no, uh, uh, no. I mean, it spins the wheels and whatnot, but it doesn't have the grunt that, uh, you know, 20 litres have. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little bit of engine envy yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, no, but I think it's going to be a really fun race, and it'll be over before it starts, almost, yeah. Well, we're all looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Bye. We are indeed looking forward to it. Perfect conditions. And uh, there's all three of us up here to enjoy uh, this at the moment. So uh, Bruce Jones is alongside me, Alex Powell. We're looking forward to all this uh, getting underway with some rather amazing devices, I have to say, Bruce. They make me laugh when they're standing still, but once they get driven around the circuit, that I cannot stop smiling. And Alice is looking on in absolute abject horror at these cars as they're about to come out because they couldn't be more different from your racing world, Alice. No, certainly. I mean, I'm just looking forward to seeing them getting them off the line. You know, that looks like a big task in it itself. There's uh, When we, we watched the, the demo earlier on with, with Archie going round, it, that looked a challenge, you know, um, with lots of different things behind... The wheel you could say you could say it's a cockpit can't you really so i'm looking forward to seeing how they deal with it during the races okay it's only five laps long but that's i'm sure that's that's long enough because there seems plenty to be going on but yeah i'm looking forward to seeing them getting them off the line and just to let you know that uh, some of the cars they, they thought uh, there was no need to have braking at the front of the car so they only have brakes at the rear which has its own idiosyncrasy but then again look the long tail of number 25 the sunbeam Indianapolis on pole you can't describe the bodywork on the direct because there isn't any whatsoever but i love the description from driver mark walker earlier when asked what it's like driving on the road does he see people waving he said it's such a difficult thing to drive i did he say i can't look away for more yeah. than half a second i can quite imagine that particularly driving on the road it must be a real challenge to do that so so you've got the uh, pole sunbeam there, that's the silver car, that's going to be starting from pole position. And uh, then you've got that uh, cream coloured, the Blitz and Benz, the Benz 200 horsepower. It's very much developed for land speed records. Uh, th that particular period um, into sort of 1907, 1908, they actually stopped some of the big races they were doing because it was getting so dangerous. But the land speed record became a big thing. And this Blitz and Benz actually held on to some of the land speed records for many years. But interestingly, right behind it on the grid is the huge Fiat, which was bought, which was actually built as Fiat took on what Benz had done with the land speed records. And uh, they did manage to beat some of them, but not the, the flying kilometre, which I believe at the time was the, the key one. It, it really was, but I, I suppose like all things motor racing, it moved around. What has prestige, something else will come up to supersede it. But I don't care what it was going for. To have that out here racing, it's nearly two metres tall. It's absolutely... It's as though a cartoon car has been dropped into this. And just to give you some stats, four cylinders, seven litres each, 28 litres of grunt and flame. It's a magical, magical car. And what I love, too, is, is the difference you see in, in these cars, Alex. You've got these huge cars with some engines of sort of 28 litres, but you've also got some quite nimble-looking machines from that earlier period. Yeah, and some that I would probably say you don't look very safe to drive around in, for sure. But I love it. They've got flames spitting out the side. You know, one 
I mean, the yellow one there, unsure of the number, it looks a little bit like a, a boat at the rear end there. So, so many yeah. different shapes. And I just think it's fantastic, you know, to see, see these out. But what shocks me even more is the speeds that you can get up to at Goodwood and then driving one of these and they're not strapped in or anything like that. It, it's just mad that, <laughs> that back in the day, this is what they, they raced. And I'd say they're pretty mad to, be, to have been racing them as well, especially in the wet. But imagine they would have been racing them on roads. Um, you know, yeah. there would have been all sorts of dangers around them, wouldn't there? Things to hit all the time. Well, Being on a race circuit like this is actually much safer, of course. As, as a, exactly. As a colleague of mine said, he described them as um, scattering grannies and chickens, which is pretty <laughs> much what they did from whether it was Paris to Vienna or Paris to, to Madrid. They were phenomenal times. You think of the surfaces of those roads. They didn't probably deserve the name road. However, we are the beneficiaries of that. We got a grid that could not be more diverse and uh, different. And uh, I will celebrate all of that. And we're riding, actually, our onboard camera is the younger Collings. That's Archie Collings, 17 years old, the first graduate, if you can, uh, from a Setrington Cup race into another series. That's the race for pedal cars. This is not a pedal car. It's and lovely that Archie's getting ready for the start of this. There he is. Lovely onboard shots. Uh, this is the Mercedes 60 horsepower, which was uh, a, a race winner, a very key race winner. In fact, it was based on a road car. Mercedes had been hoping um, to build a slightly different machine, but it didn't quite come off. So they had to they had to run this car, uh, the Mercedes 60 horsepower, and end up winning a key event. Uh, that was the days of the Gordon Bennett Trophy. Um, and it was the French and German brands that were doing so well at that time. Oh, unfortunately, it looks like we've got a problem for one of the Collings. Is that is that the driver we've just been mentioning? Is that Archie Collings getting down? Uh, Certainly a driver. No, it's not. But it's a, I don't think it's a driver in green overalls. Anyhow, he's got back on, clearly. I think they were just, just pushing, just looking up. out my window. I think they were just, yeah, or either pushing them back because a few of them struggled to see where to line up because they're sat so high and there's so much in front of them. Well, here we go on the uh, formation lap then to get everybody... Oh, actually, it's the, it's the race start. Sorry, it's my fault. Yep, they've gone straight into the race start. And we've, we've got uh, a chance to see the cars go into action. It wasn't actually a great start for the huge beard. Um, in fact, a couple of the front runners have not got off the line quite so well. Well, that's a typical case, Ben, of the, the big heavy cars struggling to get away and the lighter ones getting uh, clear. But it's the Hudson leading the way, car number 66. That's James Collins and... Uh, the Morse is there, looking back at the narrow nose of that. Fabulous, fabulous shots. But pole starter Julian Majou falling back to second place. But remember these cars, they really have variable performance according to whether the brakes feel like working or not. This is looking over the back of Archie's uh, car, actually, because it, it, it looks like it's about to carry stuff. I think Ben Collins is... He's now in... Yeah, he's in, in the front. lead. He's moved yeah. past um, the Hudson into the lead. Julian Majou down to third place in the Sunbeam Indianapolis. But the first six, at least, have got through St Mary's. Yep, so all good so far. There is the fit. You can see the beast is quite a long way back, but it's got the speed that will gradually pick up. So there's the pole sitter, uh, Julian Majoub, in the sunbeam. So he lost out a little bit, but that top three are actually all pretty close together now, you have to say. And there is a, a chance. Ben Collins has that initial advantage. James Collins in the Hudson is about to be passed, I think, by Julian. He's going around the outside and catching them now is Mark Walker in the Dirac. And he really is a, he's a feisty driver. Well, I said this field always gets juggled up at the start. Mark Walker started from second. He's back in fourth. Julian Majoub started first. He's back in third. But Ben Collings leading the way in the Blitz and Bens. And again, they look to position their cars long before they get to the corners. And braking seems to be an optional extra, Alice. <laughs> it certainly does. I like how they're looking over their shoulder as well, because they don't have any mirrors. There's one in the, in the middle um and one actually on the the left hand side of ben's car there as we see what car number is that hard to read but pulled over to the side yeah i'm wondering is that the no yes i can't quite spot which car that is but it just looks like a number 15 perhaps oh right okay that would be the straight the squire no, well through how davis is if that's the car right coming forward wearing his purple and or mauve and yellow bike leathers to to keep the airstream away from him. Mark Walker was second, fell back to fourth, is up to third. Now it's really getting tight at the front. Julian Bajou sticking his nose up the inside of the Blitz and Benz. The Blitz and Benz on the right-hand side of your screen. And the driver who is in second place is back down to fourth, so the Hudson going forward and then back. But uh, Ben Collins, he really knows this Blitz and Benz settling into this battle. And Julian Bajou, you can't see his face, but if you could, there's a massive beam. He <laughs> absolutely adores this racing. And look how Mark Walker's hunkered down behind, with no bodywork to hide behind, just a steering wheel to keep the airflow off him. Uh, got a nice lean there. I mean, I'm guessing that's intentional to try and uh, 
guide it round the corner. Yeah, but we were saying earlier, look, he's got no support from his seat whatsoever. Yeah, Nothing for the shoulders true. to go against. That's why the, one of the reasons why these cars are so physical, and also another reason why you need a great big steering wheel, just something to hang on to. So out in front, it's the Sunbeam now that's got the lead. It's a car that raced at Indianapolis. The Indianapolis race started back in 1911. Sunbeam uh, took their cars along there. Uh, next couple of years and developed uh, bigger engines specifically for the Indianapolis and it's going well but look at this this is Mark Walker now getting past Ben Collins as well and Mark uh, in the Dirac or on the Dirac I should perhaps say is definitely still chasing after the race leader certainly is it's a classic scrap and Mark Walker doing the attack by the way in terms of housekeeping it was kind of a 16 the sunbeam of Marcus Black that was off the circuit it's rejoined it's running just ahead of the race leader so we'll see it very shortly as Mark Walker does what he does just attacks everything that sits in front of him. At the moment, there's only Julien Majou between him and the leader of this race. Look at number 200, there is the Derek. Just like gauging his every muscle in his body, especially his core, hanging on through the chicane. A little bit of breathing space down the, the straight now as Phil starts to slowly spread out. He has a little cheeky look over his right-hand shoulder and again, that lean hanging on for dear life. But he seems fully in control. And isn't it lovely how you can watch the engine working away, you can see the valves being opened and closed off the top of the engine there, uh, with no cover over the top, and there's a little pump on the side, that's to increase the fuel pressure, make sure that there's plenty of fuel getting to the motor. The driver's input could not be more vis visible and obvious than it is with these wonderful Edwardian racers, but uh, the thought of those charging to set land speed records or race from city to city is still something I really struggle to get my head around to imagine the sheer scale of what they did but what they're doing now in the also in the spring sunshine is provide a cracking race for the lead it does look as though Julian Majoub and Mark Walker having got their elbows out have recovered the lost ground and now they're starting to pull away but this is far from finished we still have two and a half laps remaining they reckon it's about 300 horsepower but about a thousand pound foot of torque in the engine in this number 200 machine and that's that's very typical of this era isn't it it's all about low revs but massive amounts of torque and the key to that was uh, Mark Walker says he makes one gear change that's leaving the grid and he stays <laughs> in there and he said torque is his friend but he says at idle it can do 30 miles an hour he even gets a little wave past there Alice doesn't he he does <laughs> cheeky wave but actually Julian set the purple first sector but now always oh, he's, he's not giving up is he? he's having a little look Back down the inside there. I think we've got a nice little battle on, but here they keep exchanging purple sectors. So uh, this could be quite entertaining. There's still three laps left to go. Well, they want to keep it really smooth, but I noticed Julian Majub in number 25, the Sunbeam Indianapolis, when he got in front, he kicked the tail out. You see Mark Walker and the Derek kicking the tail out, but Julian is normally very, very smooth. That shows how hard he was trying when he went into Woodcut. But when you change positions going into Woodcut, you're inevitably not quite on the right line, and it's such a difficult corner. We've got some back markers as well coming up, and we've seen in the Gurney Cup and other, other races today how that can, can really affect Imagine affecting oh. this car. Oh, I guess you can't get out of the way, can you? You can't get out of the way in those movements, corrections of the steering wheel that you need to make, especially in, in cars like these. As we saw, Julian gave a perfect demonstration there. You can't change direction very quickly either. You, you really can't, but Mark Walker, I think, has got the momentum building up for him. He lost a little bit as he got caught behind the back marker going through between the first and second parts of Madwick. And in behind, Ben Collins has been falling back, back a little bit in the Blitz and Bens, and uh, that's a bit of a surprise. He went back to third play, third to fourth. Now he's got uh, the man car, number 23, pushing very hard indeed, which is driven by Christopher Mann, a car that's been owned by their family since the 1950s. I love that. Yeah, very, very beautiful indeed. Uh, so we're looking at the Talbot, the number 13 car here, Talbot 25, back with the leaders, though it is still close between these two. We've got a good contest for uh, the win, and let's see how they're going to be able to hold on uh, or not. And certainly there's no doubt that Mark Walker is pushing on again. He's got that straight line speed down this section, which is what we saw before. Can he just run around the outside? Yes, he can. But then what we saw last time was the Sunbeam, very good on the brakes. So I think he has to brake quite early, Mark, in the Darak. So here you go again. He perhaps starts to ease off a little earlier and the Sunbeam comes down the inside. It does, and of course their brakes are so marginal in these. And it's a question, it's only a five lap race. Has Julian saved us a little bit better or has, or has Mark got a little in hand? We've still got uh, another lap to go after this one. They're both, in fact, just seeing Mark Walker looking over his shoulder. No one near him. They're a good uh, nearly four seconds clear of the best of the rest, which is the Hudson, number 66. So. 
It's super tight. What's the gap between first and second? Oh, just a tenth of a second. That's how we like it. Yeah, very close. So it looks like could be another carbon copy. Um, if we have a game on this uh, one lap to go, but uh, Julian will know that he does seem much more stable on the on the brakes as Mark just wiggles about a little bit more. So I'm sure Julian, the clever racer, will know another pump there from Mark. He'll know, right, I just need to make sure I hit my braking point, get, keep it nice and smooth, because he does seem to be driving much smoother. Obviously, that's a big difference between the cars, clearly. And if he can manage to do that, he'll try and get the cut back get down before the chicane. It's interesting, on that last lap, they did virtually identical lap time, 155.7, both of them. Uh, now they're pushing on a little bit, and there's no doubt that Julian in front, is pushing, he's done a very good first sector. He's, he's trying to just open up that gap on this last lap because what they don't want is traffic and the long shot as they approach the first part of Lavent. The track seemed clear ahead of them, but their pace is such they will catch other cars, one feels. Then it's a commentator's nightmare. Collins and Collings fighting yes. over third place. I can't tell you in which order. Yes, I can. It's the Hudson 66 of uh, James Collins that holds it down, but it's only a second between them. There's less than that between first and second. Here they we have the carbon copy. Before. They seem closer than before. So let's see if Mark can get it stopped. Can he? Can he? Maybe he should stay slightly. Oh, there's another right. car up there as well. Is that going to complicate it? That's the same story. Yeah, so he's done it again. Can he get the cut back? No, because he's really fighting on the wheel, but there's a back marker that's going to come into play. Yeah, they want to get past this cleanly into the chicane. Yeah, he's aware, very aware that they're coming up behind. Good observation and the checker flag is being prepared. It's all about the acceleration now out of the chicane. Ran slightly wide. Yeah, and he this ran is slightly wide. The Darak, the Darak is very fast in a straight line. He's going to get across the line ahead. <laughs> well done to Mark Walker. Wow, what an acceleration out of the chicane that was. Enough to get across the line ahead. What I love, the, the long shot looking back, when he'd taken the checkered flag, he could almost see Mark going, oh, I might do a bit of breathing now and relax. But that was phenomenal. But again, that straight line grunt of the Derek, that was fabulous racing. This is going to go all the way to the finish. It will be Ben Collins now in third. He's taken third place there where he's got to got through and uh, well, in fact he hasn't taken it yet they've got to get to the, to the finish line but uh, really really tight but that was fabulous at the front I really thoroughly enjoyed that and you can be sure that Julian Maju and uh, Mark Walker loved every second That's Julian was stuff. even moving in his seat like they're doing go-kart races to try and get a bit more momentum we're gonna have something similar across the line here no nope, not as close but yeah, Julian just ran slightly wide on the exit there and Mark took full advantage yeah, he timed that beautifully, didn't he? And the, the sheer torque coming out of that chicane. So let's have a look at it. This is just a... Uh, this is really all about straight line speed. That's what they were built for in some way, especially the, uh, the land speed records. And it accelerated over the line. It's got a, a bigger engine and it worked beautifully well, didn't it? That was absolutely fabulous. And again, the trouble for Julian Majoub and Mark Walker coming up at the back marker, it meant the track as they went into Woodcote was half the width it normally would be. And therefore that really compromised yeah. the pair of them. Always makes life a bit more complicated. Um, just seeing that Archie Collings has dropped back a little bit. I don't know if there was a problem with the car on that uh, on that last lap. I think he has just gone across the line now. So that's good news as well uh, in this combination of machinery. But this one that has won is always one of the most remarkable machines of all of them. With this huge V8 engine, the water tank sitting on top of the engine. Uh, land speed record car, broke a a land speed record the first time it was ever uh, competing in France back in 1905 and uh, it did a lot of events a lot of uh, sprint events and record events and now it wins at Goodwood in the SF Edge trophy lovely to see that and we will see these cars back out again over the weekend well that was enormous fun and I remember when these cars first came on the uh, race program here we weren't sure what to expect but it exceeded our expectations in the first year and it's got better and better as more and more machinery is back out to play and the applause from the crowd warm applause from a crowd that's probably quite warm in the spring sunshine so a great way to power through the saturday afternoon here at the members meeting lovely images so you can really uh, the fun thing about this car in a way is you can see every element of it because there's no bodywork the chassis the suspension the every aspect to it and it has worked extremely well here today to take that to top spot. Three tenths of a second in the end across the line with the acceleration out of the chicane working to perfection.
And uh, there we are. There's the final result then. Mark Walker, the winner with the Dirac. Uh, Julian was in second place. Ben Collins got third in the Blitz and Benz. Then James Collins uh, further down. The Alfa Romeo in fifth place. The Fiat dropped back a little bit after that uh, start, as we know. So uh, Duncan Pitaway finished down in tenth position in the, in the huge Fiat in the end. Uh, the Oakland Romano of James Baxter, that was in a good seventh place. That's uh, one of the smaller machines, but still has a, an aircraft engine from the First World War. Quite a few of these cars actually have engines that were aero engines from the First World War and uh, were put into cars to try and make them as fast as possible afterwards. Archie Collins finished in 16th in the end, his first race in a motored vehicle, having won here at Goodwood in the past in a pedal car. Archie brought the Mercedes 60 horsepower home in 16th position. And Marcus Black had a, a few troubles with his car, but he ended up finishing in 20th position. So there we go, that's the SF Trophy, uh, SF Edge Trophy. Let's just take a look, the first part uh, for this weekend. And the start was a, a key aspect of it, as expected. And it really was a very slow start from Mark Walker. He dropped a huge number of places. Yeah, he, he fell from the middle of the front row to about seventh, but thereafter he was uh, in the hunt and he was picking up the other drivers. It was a big jumble at the front, but then it sorted itself out and the somebody in Indianapolis, Julian Majoub, worked his way forward. Unfortunately for Duncan Pitaway in the giant beast of Turin, the tallest car in the field, he started well and... Uh, Sadly, went a little bit backwards, but great images from uh, the rear view camera on Archie Collins car. But the, the lead battle with the Blitz and Benz, the Hudson uh, 6 as well, were, was very, very entertaining. But after a while, it was those first two coming through. Julian Majoub pulling away from Ben Collins. There's Ben in the Blitz and Benz. And uh, behind, of course, there was Mark Walker on the charge. Lovely to watch. Now, I love the awareness that they have to have, as you were saying, you know, without mirrors, that they're, they're looking around, they're always constantly aware of where everybody is. Yeah, and they've got their clear visors on as well, so you can really see the concentration in their their eyes as well. As this is, we saw this several times, so I couldn't even tell you which lap this was on. <laughs> Carbon copy move of them going past each other and swapping positions as well. So fantastic racing, battling all the way down to the very last lap. Yeah, it went all the way, didn't it? But uh, that run across the line worked perfect for Mark Walker in the end. We thought that Julian Majub was going to get the, the, the victory, but Mark did just enough to get across the line by three tenths of a second and take the victory in the SF Edge trophy. So let's go down and hear from our winners. David is down in that area now. Well, they may be over 100 years old, but these cars certainly deliver. Congratulations, Thank Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a, a great race. Um, I was lucky Julian had a bit of traffic on, literally coming into the chicane on the last lap, and I was at, able to out drag him to the finish line. But it was a close, close thing. I thought it was all perfectly planned. You were just waiting to pounce on the last corner. Well, I was, and then there was a the traffic in anyway. It was a bit more exciting than I anticipated. Now, you may not have to change many gears here, I think, once. Only change gear once, yes. So first to second off the line, it's a very difficult... I got overrun at the start line. It's very difficult to get off the line. Um, and then when I got it going, into second gear and stayed there for the whole race. Well, I was going to say, you only have one gear change, but you're certainly having a workout there. So you're leading across, yes. pumping... I had to pump the fuel and the brakes aren't very good, uh, but it, it, you know, it pulls, it pulls well. A little bit hot and sweaty? I'm a bit clammy, yeah. Yep. Well, a well-earned ice cream yeah, thank you. Yeah. for the winner. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner. Congratulations. <laughs> Julian, you had it in the bag to the very, well, not even the last corner, the last few feet of the racetrack. Well, uh, well, Mark did overtake me on some of the straights, but I had it on the handling and whatnot. We both got fairly crappy brakes, but only rear wheel brakes and whatnot. But, um, but on the very last, I mean, we were so close, and I, I just need, I, I was quicker through some of the corners. I could leave him through Ford Water, but he, he had so much grunt. And, and we got a back marker, we both got past, but that kind of slowed me a bit too much, and uh, he just had the grunt out of the. Little error at the last corner, or was it? Uh, no, uh, uh, yes, well, I, uh, by the time we got past the back marker, I was in. Uh, I, I, so I wasn't in the right gear, but I got in the right gear, but I just didn't have the oomph out of the. Uh, out of the chicane. Well, it may not be first place, but you're still smiling and you gave us a fantastic race. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I know, I would say I enjoyed it as much as if I'd won, honestly. Uh, it was really fantastic. Yeah. That's good to hear. Congratulations. Ben, 
You were leading for some of that, right? You got off to a bit of a flyer. You had the whole pack behind you, but you still managed to get on the podium. Yeah, no, I, uh, the start was good. I did, it goes off the line really quickly, and uh, it's 21 litres. And Mark's, even though it's 25, he's only got two gears, so I'm, it's good off the line. And then the front wheels were a little bit out of balance going through Ford water, which was a bit scary. So I, where I normally have that huge speed advantage, I couldn't really use it. But it was, I'm really happy to come third, and hopefully Arch finished the race. And... Well, we heard Arch came 15th in his first race, which is uh, 60. So he's finished the race, so I'm sure he'll be very happy with that. Oh, that's great news. That's good to hear. Uh, but no, glorious weather, and it just couldn't be more perfect. Fantastic. Well, congratulations, Ben. A great race there for them. Old, amazingly old cars, 100 years old, but fantastic. We're going to go over to Ed. Jake Hill, you're on pole position for the first heat in the Gordon Spice Trophy, but it wasn't without its, its moments. No, I mean, if you uh, look down the left side of the Capri, yeah, she's, she's seen better days, shall we say, but yeah, one of those. I mean, I thought it was me that made the mistake, um, but it seems like there was a lot of oil down, apparently. A load of fans have come and seen, and a couple of my other competitors have come and said, oh, I went through just after you'd gone off, and it was super slippery. So it puts me at ease a little bit that it wasn't totally my fault, but nonetheless, um, I was just so, so upset. I've never ever got out of a car before and just burst into tears because you're that, you care so much about the car, you know? Um, but the Rickwood Motorsport, guys and girls have done an absolute astonishing job. You know, whole front left corner, beating the bodywork back into shape. And we're here, we're on the race, yeah, we're on the race start. Amazing, so is it just the bodywork? I guess everything else is okay? Yeah, the, um, it just seems to be bodywork. The front suspension, the left front suspension was ruined, so we had to put a whole new left front on it. Um, but the bodywork, yeah, we've just beaten it as best we can to back into shape and we go again. But everything else, mechanically wise, the shell, engine, gearbox, all that sort of stuff, seems to be fine. So, yeah, we'll go again. Fantastic. All to play for then. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great to hear from uh, Jake Hill, who will start on pole position for the Gordon Spice Trophy Heat 1 race about to come up. Of course, you might be familiar with this race, the Jerry Marshall Trophy, but after 10 years, uh, it's had a makeover and now celebrating the life of seven-time British saloon car champion and four-time Le Mans class winner. The race is now called the Gordon Spice Trophy. And here is how they line up. It is Jake Hill in the Ford Capri on pole alongside the Rover of Michael Whitaker and the Chevy Camaro Oliver Hart. It's five Chevy Camaros on the first three rows with uh, Jack Tetley and Rob Huff just behind, along with Oliver Bryant and uh, James Thorpe and uh, making a sandwich of the Ford Mustang of Fred Shepard uh, in the middle on row three. Uh, then on row four, it will be uh, Graham Scarborough uh, from ninth in the Ford Capri alongside uh, the another Ford Capri of Mike Whitaker. Then it is Stuart Graham in the Chevy Camaro from 11th spot on the grid, just in front of Jack Young and Tom Waterfield in the uh, Ford Capri. John Spears behind them, along with Nicholas Padmore. And then it's another row, th row of three for row seven. Nick Sleep in the Rover alongside Alex uh, Thistlewaite in the Ford Capri and Craig Davies in the Ford Mustang. 19th and 20th spots are two Ford Capris, Mark Fowler and Raphael de Vorman. And then it's Nick Jarvis, Adam Brindle and James Colburn, a Ford Capri, a Rover and a BMW make up row nine. And then uh, row 10, we'll see. In 24th position, uh, Reardon Welby in the Rover alongside Richard Maines in the Ford Capri. The penultimate row, Rob Jarvis in the Rover on 26th spot. John Saunders in the Rover and Simon Drabble in the uh, Ford Capri. And at the back will be Ludovic Lindsay in the Ford Capri as well after his practice times were disallowed. So he starts from the back. But of course, he was saying in that practice session that he hasn't had much testing yet either. So this is really his testing ahead of the race. Harry Benjamin uh, back with you in the commentary box. A little bit of a commentary change. But Bruce Jones remains alongside me. And I think we're looking forward to this one, Bruce. Oh, yes. Very much yes indeed. Right, just to refresh people's memory or inform perhaps in the first place. The first of two heats, this is for the large engine cars and the top 15 finishers will go through to tomorrow's final. Then we'll have the second heat for the smaller engine cars. So the fastest 15 finishers in that will also go through to the final when we will combine little and large and smiles all round. So these are the steps that have to be taken. Of course, the further up the order you finish, the closer to the front of tomorrow's grid you will start the race. But these cars are touring cars. They're made to be raced side by side and I cannot wait for the start of this one.
No, it's looking good. Great to see that Jake Hill was able to uh, get out. You were hearing from earlier, he was able to basically bend and bruise that uh, front left of the Capri back into position. Uh, and I saw them working on it around the back as well. So they've done that uh, in quick time as well, because it was a bit of a hefty shunt that he ended up having, especially uh, when he was so quick. And it certainly looked like it really gutted him as but, well. But we, absolutely so. But we also had... Um... Olivier Hart, third fastest, uh, going off. He'd gone off earlier, and he too was uh, working on his car. It was being prepared, not so much in the public gaze. That was a, a gaze. It was uh, out towards the back of uh, the paddock. That was being fixed. He was sorting out the headlights while the crews looked after the difficult bits. But uh, the grid is starting to form up in the 3x2, three 3x2 by two, three by two formation that is so beloved here. And it looks absolutely brilliant. Of course, we'll have the different acceleration away from the grid, but the Chevrolet Camaros and the Ford Mustang Boss 302s, they've got a little bit of weight. They'll say, the drivers say, a lot of weight added to their cars to give them ballast. They can put it where they want, but they'd rather have none of it. And a lot of them saying, I think it's going to be a Ford Capri year. Of course, that's what Jake Hill will be hoping for, that repaired car on pole position. But it's going to be absolutely mighty race. Three different cars on the front row. That's the mix we like. Absolutely. A Ford Capri, a Rover, and a Chevrolet Camaro. The first three cars uh, you will see. We've got as uh, I said when I ran down the grid, Capris, Rovers, uh, Chevrolet Camaros, Ford Mustangs in there. We've got BM a BMW too. Uh, and uh, at the back lining up, uh, another Ford Capri as Ludovic Lindsay slots into uh, his uh, final spot. And uh, we await to get uh, underway shortly. It will be a 20 minute race that we have on our hands. Just spotted we're missing one of the cars I'd really hope to see, the Fabergé or Brute 33 livery Chevrolet Camaro that uh, was supposed to be Rob Huff driving, but uh, Stuart Graham, the driver who drove it in period, has uh, not made it round to the grid. He was parachuted in to drive his old car, but alas, it hasn't got to the start. There is a Brute car on the grid, but that's bringing up the rear. That's Ludovic Lindsay in his Capri. Absolutely. Well, uh, the marshal's clear, and uh, we'll await for the, uh, the green flag lap to uh, get underway. And uh, already, perhaps a practice start from Jake Hill, able to get up the line very nicely indeed. One of the Chevy Camaros further back looked like it had a little bit of a slow getaway, but Jake Hill now concentrating on getting heat into those tyres. A multiple winner in the British Touring Car Championship, now hustling this Ford Capri around across the weekend here as uh, we celebrate the 80th Goodwood members meeting and uh, the new look uh, trophy, the Gordon Spice trophy getting underway. But everyone making it off the line, always a good start. Absolutely so, but uh, Gordon Spice died early this year. The great raconteur, brilliant driver, and always when I think of Gordon Spice, of course he had all the successes at the Mall. I think of a red Ford Capri with motorcraft and autocar on the flanks, and it's great to see we've got one of those out. Car number eight in that livery, that's Mike Whitaker. He's uh, just down in 10th place, just uh, he should have been just one position ahead of Stuart Graham, who's not there in the Camaro. And again, you can see the damage has been repaired to the tail of the white Camaro. There it is, number four and sticky tape holding the back together where it uh, went around, hit the uh, tyres at the edge of the circuit. Uh, that had to be rebuilt. That was the first of our two red flags, but uh, well done to the Hart crew. Father David owns the car and son Olivier doing the racing of this one. Absolutely. Well, that car will start uh, on the far right-hand side as you look at it from the starting grid when they line up. You can see the, uh, the rear left as well. The headlights completely covered up by all of that tape. And... Uh, Good to see everybody getting back out on track, though, uh, after that. A bit of a truncated uh, practice session, too. A bit of a messy red flag session, as we, we alluded to there. Uh, and we've got also the Mazda RX-7 a little further back in the uh, pack as well. Well, that'll be in, uh, the other uh, race, I should say, the uh, slightly smaller engined race. So look forward to that uh, after this as well, as we celebrate the Gordon Spice Trophy. And uh, the weather getting better and better as the day has gone by. I think it's actually had a bit of a peak right now. Blue skies, not too many clouds. The sun getting lower in the sky, which just bounces off of these beautiful cars and makes these retro historic liveries uh, look even better. Yeah, I remember the cars and I remember pretty much all the liveries as well. A few few that have raced outside the UK weren't in races like the Spa 24 hours with different race liveries, but uh, Gitan, of course, raced it largely in France, but Sanyo was definitely one of the main players in period as the sponsors and uh, again i just love the fact we've got a capri we've got a rover sd1 and the camaro z28 on the front row they've all got different amounts of power we've also got all different amounts of curb weight as well you can pick your favorite car this though 
is a race to get into the top 15 to go through to tomorrow's finale when the small cars cars will be added as well. It's 20 minutes, it will go in a flash. It certainly will. Watch out on the second row as well for the number five Chevrolet Camaro of Rob Huff. He's been looking very quick as well. But on the far left on pole position, it is Jake Hill in the Ford Capri. In the middle, uh, going from second, is Michael Whitaker in the Rover. And on the far right-hand side, it will be Olivier Hart going from third spot in the number four Chevrolet Camaro as the last couple of drivers line up on the grid. It will be Simon Drabble in the Ford Capri and Ludovic Lindsay rounding out the back. But we await for uh, the green flag to fly at the back of the field as the cars await and start revving their engines the green flag flies here in Goodwood for the 80th members meeting Jake Hill on the far left starts from pole and it's a very good start from Jake Hill for the Gordon Spice trophy he won not a good start for the rover in the middle Michael Whitaker falling back into the pack Olivier Hart had a good start as well he slots to second but watch out for Rob Huff in the number five red Chevy Camaro going side by side with Michael Whitaker trying to make up for lost time as they all cleanly make their way through turns one and two. Yeah, Graham Scarborough going very well in the yellow Capri, number 24. The one, one who went backwards was the rover from the middle of the front row. That's gone from second to about fifth place for Michael Whitaker. The first two making a break already. Why is it the cars that crashed in session in qualifying are the ones that pull away? Clearly the fix has been good so far, but what you want in this is not to have anyone near you. And the first two are doing it very well. Jake Hill and Olivier Hart already on the exit of St Mary's and the smoking Rob Huff uh, Kamara I think let's have a look did it get up into third place it's Bastos livery it's five on the door that's the man last year's winner the Oymig car number 28 the Camaro over Jack Tetley back down to fourth place. All playing fairly nicely for the time being. Nicholas Padmore uh, in the BMW further back in the pack has made up a few spots or one spot. And going around the outside, you just saw he's in the yellow BMW. Uh, back up front though, chasing down Jake Hill in the lead is Whitaker in uh, is uh, no, Whitaker lost though. It's Olivier Hart in the Chevy Camaro, and then Whitaker losing time battling now with uh, Rob Huff. Jack Tetley as well uh, making good start from the second row in the number. 28 Chevy Camaro he's currently uh, in fourth spot as well so good start but maintains his position for the time being as we come to the end uh, of lap one through the chicane we go all playing fairly nicely it must be said the number 88 of Nick Sleep in the Rover making his way steadily through and a little maneuver between the two uh, Chevys the number 31 making its way past so in this early stage in the race the grunt of the Camaro Z28 has propelled them up to the front wait for the Capris to start to come through because already we heard this morning from Jack Tetley going after two laps, my pedal is going to the door. He's talking about his brake pedal. They're pushing hard at the moment, but they may yet be hampered. It's only a 20-minute race, but uh, it could yet be a factor. But certainly the grunt of those Chevrolets has really pushed them up to the sharp end of the field. But it is a Capri that's leading. Not by much, though. Jake Hill out front. Well, 1.3 seconds, and Rob Huff getting up into third as well. This place is Jack Tetley. He, Huff is really hounding hard for third play, uh, for second and third at the moment. Here is that battle, uh, the number five... Uh, of uh, you know, this is the number 31, I should say. This is over six and seven. So this is Thorpe and Ryan battling it out uh, for six and seven at the moment. But Huff now still right up behind Hart, uh, dropping back to about half a second for P2. So battles everywhere you look at the moment. The Chevy Camaro is certainly getting a good run out. Well, they have a fabulous load of grunt to deliver. In fact, the, the door, the passenger's door on the number 31. Camaro flapping in the breeze as it came down the Labyrinth Strait. It's the, the side away from us, the right-hand flank of the car. So look for that. So that's uh, showing how much flexion's going through these cars. He's got the grunt to accelerate away. It stays true as he accelerates away, but that's a slipstream that he really wanted. He's got it going past the pits. Can he get the drag down into Madrid Corner, working hard? Oliver Bryan is the car trying to overtake the Chevy Camaro, the 31 versus the 21. Can he go around the outside? No, he cannot. The car in front placing it exactly where he needs. Uh, Thorpe at the moment just keeping him at bay in that 31. But uh, this battle brewing, 16 and a half minutes remain, two laps down. And that gap at the front, though, between uh, first and second has gone down. It was over a second. It's now just six tenths of a second. So Olivier Hart fighting back on Jake Hill in the Ford Capri. Good thing for Olivier Hart, he's got a bit of a gap back to Rob Huff, but it's coming down, it's under a second now. So the first three cars cut by one and a half second. The Camaro's in behind of Thorpe and Bryant. Bryant trying to get up the inside, but Thorpe in 31 holding on. That's sixth and seventh, they're fighting hard. They're certainly not saving their brakes. They're using every last bit of retardation 
when they just dab and try and balance the cards for the per first part of Labyrinth. Can they keep that up, though, over the next 15 minutes? We shall see. One of the big gainers further back in the pack was uh, uh, the Ford Mustang boss. That's the number 17 uh, car. He's made up three positions. Uh, that is Fred Shepard further back. So he is now all the way up to 19th spot. So he's made up some good ground. Biggest gainer of the field so far. Yeah, however, sadly for him, he uh, lost. He started seventh on the grid. So he lost an awful lot of positions at the start. And then he's been fighting his way up really hard. Now, we haven't really talked too much about the number eight Capri. That's worked his way forward. A couple of positions, that's Mike Whitaker, son of Michael. Michael is ahead of him up in fifth in that Sanyo Rover. And for the moment, delighted the battle behind him is fighting so hard. The Thorpe and Brian uh, tussle between the Camaros, a bit of uh, regicide between them. But uh, at the moment, he's sitting quite pretty in the number 19 Sanyo Rover in fifth place. And some of the great liveries, the SO and Tristan Troll uh, sponsorship as it was in period. That's car. One of the many Capris, that's car number six, being driven very well indeed by Mark Fowler, who just loves his Capris. Certainly is. Uh, that battle raging on for six and then seventh between Thorpe and Bryant. As, uh, as they fight, though, there is a little bit of a gap developing to the number eight of Whitaker further back, who's heading the next gaggle of cars, which uh, goes back to Scarborough and Waterfield, a couple of seconds behind them. So certainly big battles happening in this top 10 placing. A reminder, it's the top 15 that will go through to the final on Sunday. OK, so we talked about the advance of Fred Shepard in the must, must, Mustang Boss 302. Not in the top 15, he's 16th, but he's catching... Uh, very tidily the car in front which is the Capri number seven of Alex Thistlesweight that's holding on for the moment but uh, it's a question of time surely but time isn't necessarily different we've got 14 minutes remaining who's got brakes who's got grunt who's got traffic in the way well, certainly, uh, Nicholas Padmore, we see in the 25 uh, BMW, uh, 530 uh, I making its way through, as entered by the Sadler family. He's uh, in a little bit of a sandwich at the moment, but he's in the top 15. He's 11th right now. He's about three and a half tenths back uh, from Waterfield in front, but Young just behind him, the number 27 uh, in the Volvo, keeping him at bay. Uh, Padmore, though, trying to make up those positions, and I think Young is falling down the field quite dramatically by the looks of our timing screen. Yeah, another person who could be in trouble... It Yes, is Waterfield because he got hooked the Hertz livery de Capri off the circuit, got it back on, but he had to lift when he didn't want to. He was in the top ten, he's not now. Down to 11th place, Nick Padmore just grabbed the opportunity with both hands. Up front, Olivier Hart is still keeping that gap just below a second to Jake Hill. Four laps passing by, uh, 13 minutes on the clock still to run, eight tenths the gap up front for the time being, but it's Rob Huff in third place who's setting the fastest lap times at the moment, trying to catch up to that battle. In fact, he's only three and a half tenths behind second place, Matt Hart. So Rob Huff not giving this one up without a fight. We'll see what the split time is when he comes through the second sector, but you can see it's certainly a battle brewing. You, here it is, the number four versus the number five. That's handy. Right, there have been mechanical problems. Simon Drabble's just brought his Capri into the pit lane, but uh, Craig Davis, I noticed, set off on the green flag lap in his... Uh, his Mustang car number 15, but never made it round to take the start. But anyhow, this, that's for another time because uh, Jake Hill comes through the first three now, fully clear. But Olivier Hart just five, five tenths of a second down and a similar margin over Rob Huff. So it's a Capri. And then the number four Camaro, there it is with a repair to its tail. And then immediately getting on his tail, ever tail happy, Rob Huff loving it on. Rob loving Huff, it all. He really is loving it. The World Touring Car Championship from uh, years gone by. And this is the uh, uh, number 17 car that looking at. This is Shepard uh, currently in 15th spot, so this is the battle to get through to the final, he's currently having a, a great battle with the Volvo uh, of 27, that's Young who uh, has lost quite a few positions since the start of this lap, so the Volvo unfortunately going backwards in this race, but a Ford a BMW uh, and a Volvo all involved in this great scrap, a great mixture of brands here, but it's Jake Hill under pressure up front now, Olivier Hart hasn't looked this close in quite some time, he's under at 6 tenths of a second and closing and closing, Jake Hill leading in the Ford Capri, being chased down by the Chevy Camaro of Olivier Hart and they've just escaped Rob Huff for the time being but here comes Hart trying to remove round the outside is he going to get the grunt is he going to get the straight line speed they both break for the braking zone now but it's Hill that manages to get deeper on the brakes can he keep it in look at the rear of that Ford Capri just about holds it through the right hander that was excellent. Bravo, Hill keeps the lead for now. Yeah, and you could just see there how much the heavier Camaros have to break about four or five car lengths earlier as they approach Woodcut. I think there was a slight mistake from Rob Huff in the background. He's fallen off the tail. He's now 
got no one to confuse him. He's just got to set off after them. He almost caught them. He lost ground. But my big question is how much retardation is left on offer for the Camaro drivers. But Jake Hill, his cornering line through Woodcut was absolutely optimal. To the edge and not an inch, not a scintilla of a centimetre beyond. He is not giving up, though. This Camaro looks like a mean machine behind the Ford Capri. He gets right up behind him. He tries to go on the right-hand side. Jake Hill defends, has to put the Camaro on the left-hand side. But still, Hill's car is there through the right hand of King, Hill is not budging. It is so tight up at front, and this is all allowing Rob Hart to just try and recover from that mistake. Can Hart find a way through? No, he can't. Touring cars, tight racing, sunshine going slightly sideways. Yes, 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 let's have some more, and we certainly will through to the end of this one. Jake Hill, a masterclass in front. He hasn't got the grunt, he's got the precision, he's got the braking potential, but again and again out of lab, and you see the sheer force of that Chevrolet Camaro grunt pulling him past. He's going to try and do exactly as before, but with a better end. But then he's off, he coming off the power onto the brakes. Jake Hill back in front again. He's got to think it's like the race before, the SF Edge trace race, handling versus <laughs> sheer grunt, and the handling with the Capri just. The grunt is definitely with the Camaro in second place. David Hart, his car in with the hands of son Olivier into the bright light as they go past the pits. And Rob Huff, have you got an answer to this in the Bastos livery Camaro in third place? Well, Rob Huff must just be sitting there hoping that one of these two makes a mistake and he can nip through. And then Olivier Hart is hoping that he has to force Jake Hill into a mistake because as we've seen in that braking zone, the Capri just has all the supreme power. But these three are just escaping the rest of the field as well. Previous winner, Jack uh, uh, holding uh, fourth place at the moment is quite 10 seconds nearly detached from this spot. So the top three escaping, Rob Hart clinging on, but it's Hart versus Hill for the lead of this race. Seven laps have passed, nine minutes remain. And well, here's the whole midfield gaggle, and that's uh, looking spicy. The Volvo, that's the number 27, and uh, that is fighting over the top 15. And I think the Volvo missing out there. Yeah, well, the confusing thing, I think there's a transfer, there might be a penalty for Jack Young in the number 27 Bastos 242 Volvo, because he keeps, you can see where he is on the track, he's right with number 17, but his position on the timing screens is sort of way below that, so we'll keep an eye on that. Now it's been adjusted, he's back up into 11th place, and uh, Fred Shepard, we saw him work the number 17 Mustang back into the top 15. It's crucial to finish in the top 15, or you don't go through to tomorrow's combined finale. Yeah, at the moment it's Thistle uh, Waite and Fowler who are off the bubble in 16th and 17th right now, but that battle is tight, as is the top three. Rob Huff has closed in on Olivier Hart, and Jake Hill has escaped up the road a bit. Has Olivier Hart gone too hard too soon? Has he used a little bit too much rubber uh, for his liking and is now just having to look in his mirrors a little bit more than what he'd like to? Laser focus, Rob Huff. He will put this car sideways if he feels like it. Lots of smoke now started to come out of the back. Unfortunately, the Bastos Camaro keep an eye out on that. Puffing out of the sides over the sort of fairly gnarly rear end of those big American racers. But uh, they became hugely popular in Europe in particular. The Z28 uh, used to have loads of them entered in the Spa 24 hours, which was the big touring car race of the year. They just scream America as well sometimes. They just look like American muscle machines. But of course, these racing uh, in uh, touring car style. Uh, seven tenths of the gap still out front. Rob Huff still trying to catch them further down the field, though. Battles left, right, and centre. Well, the one who's making the charge is uh, Fred Shepard. Uh, in his father, one of the cars from his father's garage, Bill Shepard. Just anything big with a Ford logo. And uh, they're battling in number 88 is the car at the edge of the drop. It's the. Uh, the it's, Rover. It's the Rover that won the French Touring Car Championship. Uh, but there is quite a gap back to the car in 16th. He's got uh, eight seconds back to the Thistle's weight, number seven, Capri. So Alex Thistle's weight is going to ask for a miracle to get him into the, the finale tomorrow. But you never know, with these cars racing so close together, one little bit of contact and it could all become very different indeed. Absolutely. Well, we're looking at uh, just ahead of the 15th battle. That's the number 22 car of Spears. Uh, currently, uh, the Ford Capri in 14th, just in front of Nick Sleep. Uh, who is uh, trying to find a way through. The last thing they want to do is uh, take each other out. Both not have a chance of racing in tomorrow's uh, final. We've got the uh, Heat 2, the slightly smaller engine touring car, Group 1 saloon car types that's happening 
shortly after this in the top 15 and that will also go through so there'll be a mixture of uh, touring car power in Sunday's final. What does Jake Hill not want? A car in front of him. What's he got? A Rover SD1 in front of him. It's had its problems. It's nearly a lap down and that could be critical. He has got to place his car where he possibly can. Get past the Patrick Motorsport Rover up the inside. He goes just about well done to the driver at the tail of the field because uh, that was very done by well done by Ruud and Welby kept out of the way didn't compromise the race lead the car in second the car in third but the Capri a little bit sideways on the exit that means the acceleration won't be there he already has inferior acceleration the Camaro of Olivier Hart will come past again but let's see when it comes to braking who breaks first it's Olivier Hart in the big heavy Camaro I feel I'm feeling a sense of deja vu every lap that happens and it just looks like Hart has it and he gets a taste the carrot is right there for the taking that has been dangled every time but then Hill just nicks it under braking and carries on half a second the gap nearer and nearer about so Rod Huff not able to quite find a way through either he he's closer third, but he is this is the closest we've seen Rod Huff in quite a little while Can eight he tenths find a way through eight tenths of a second covers the top three point four of a second between first and second point three of a second between second and third and still the Bastos Camaro puffs out smoke is it bodywork rubbing or is it the engine going you know what I'm not feeling entirely well I'm not sure it could be from any matter of cars but there's definitely smoke I can smell in the commentary box as well swim no, that's me that's me <laughs> that's it Bruce oh brilliant but it is pure racing this and how fantastic to see these cars out in anger as they should be they shouldn't be locked up and kept away hidden they should be out racing at some of these brilliant motor circuits around the country right here there is in traffic Europe. in front again another rover st1 but being driven very well staying hard to the left-hand side of the circuit doesn't interrupt the flow of the top three I still quite fancy Rob Huff in this he's been looking and waiting and again and again much in the SF edge race it's really strange to compare a race of Edwardian cars with these great touring cars from the 70s and early 80s but again we had Mark Walker in the Derek very good in the straight line that's the equivalent of Olivier Haas and the car with the handling Julian Majoub that's the equivalent of Jake Hill in the Capri. Uh -huh, Rob Huff looking up the inside. That could be really good news for race leader Jake Hill. He needs the pressure off his tail. This is not a hard one either. He's been the one that's been applying the pressure in second spot. But now he has to look at his rear view mirror because Rob Huff is coming. And you said the time was passed by quick, Bruce. Less than four minutes remain of this race. Where has the time gone? Uh, further back, it's the battle for the top 15 to get into the final, and it is still Sleep who holds that quite firm. 15th place, got 11 and a half seconds back to Thistle Sway, so uh, he should have that one covered in the 88. But up front, it's anyone's guess right now. Don't forget, if you finish 13th in this race, you'll start 13th. Sorry, 13th in your respective field as they get combined. You'll be down towards the tail of the field. So every place gained by any of the drivers in the top 15 will give them a little bit more of a foot up or any place lost. Again, conversely, goes the opposite way. But at the moment, it's Jake Hill in the car, just passing the corner where he put it into the tyre wall when he hit oil in qualifying. <laughs> and Olivier Hart, who had already gone off at Woodcut earlier in the practice session this morning, getting it right to the edge of the circuit. That was quite a recovery. Another couple of centimetres, the tyres would have been on the grass and round he would have gone. But here comes the chance to Rob Huff, surely. He had a much tighter line coming through there. Can he get the runs, the slipstream through the back of Hart as Jake Hill escapes up the road a bit. He tries to dart to the right, has to go to the left hand side they're side by side is this the way Rob Huff gets through for second place it looks like he is into the breaking zone can he hold it down yes he can Rob Huff up into second spot next target Jake Hill for the lead I'll just wind the commentary back a lap ago I said I think Rob Huff is going to start making the moves he's done precisely that but the clock is not his friend two and a half minutes remain in this race so one further lap plus a bonus lap two more laps to the finish of the race it's the first of the two heats for the Gordon Spice Trophy, and it's really lived up to all expectation. But more traffic ahead, though, for Jake Hill to have to deal with. How well will this car get out of the way? Traffic's been fairly kind to our leaders so far. Will it be, continue to be that? Looks like it has, and that's the full three just getting out of the way fairly nicely as well, so not too damaging, but I think Hart has managed to claw back on Hart through that little sector. Less than two minutes remain. Jake Hill escaping up the road, but Rob Huff is hounding him down, but we've seen this before, just with a different type of car. Under braking, Jake Hill has it. Certainly does, but looking at the momentum that Rob Huff 
in the Claro, carried through Ford Water, through St Mary, still smoking. Gosh, who knows what his gauges are telling him. It may not be a pretty story. He's got this lap and one more. There may yet be a chance for Olivier Hart, but I think it was a, a real case of patience from Rob Huff, and he might just try, try to take an attack in a different position to Olivier Hart in this challenge to the race leader, Jake Hill. It's fabulous touring car racing. Jake Hill, uh, uh, modern-day multiple winner in the British Touring Car Championship versus uh, the World Touring Car Champion uh, from 2012, Rob Huff, who is trying to find a way through under braking, almost has to nudge Jake Hill through the corner. They get so close, dips a wheel a little bit onto the grass, but stays with him through the, the through the corner, gets a little bit of a wiggle on the rear. Into the chicane we go. The uh, whites of Jake Hill's eyes light up as he crosses the checkered flag line, but 55 seconds still remain. Yeah, but what Jake knows, he has to get a good exit from the chicane every single time. He doesn't have the grunt of the Camaros. He's got to cover it off when he gets to Madwick. He's done the first part. The tails of those cars will come round. Huff's more. Oh, oh, he's almost taking the paint off the back of the Capri. There's traffic up ahead. This could be very juicy. The damage on the flanks of the Capri, that was practice. The team Rick Woods crew worked valiantly to get the car ready for this race. They'll be loving it but also they'll be holding their breath so much this is not good for if you want a nice peaceful afternoon don't want the heart rate to go up and down no you, you want that don't watch this because it has absolutely spiked but no has traffic ruined a uh, rob huff's chance and that's the 18 car and getting out of the way is forced onto the grass and that's the rover of uh, uh welby getting out of the way and spinning and doing so but huff still right on the back five seconds remain of this race so this should be the final lap we get who is going to cross the finish line first will it be jake hill who has led from pole position or will it be rob huff who started behind them but has slowly and surely made his way through he has a little bit of grass through the kink, more traffic ahead. Rob Huff is trying to find a way through, but I think Jake Hill might have just done enough. Well, Jake was always going to be able to break a little bit later, but Rob Huff doing a supreme job in the Camaro. You see some tyre tracks across the daffodils in the background. He hasn't got time to look at that. There's the BMW 530i up in front of them. It should just about get out of the way, the, the Mac 4 car. And it's the time for Grunt to the finish line. Will there be enough for Rob Huff to pull past the Capri? It's going to be super tight. The, the BMW's in the way. Victory in the first heat to Jake Hill. Oh, boy. For a driver who was uh, sobbing by his own admission, having dropped the car in practice, the car was repaired brought it through to win, not just a win, an outstanding win against two rivals, Olivier Hart and uh, Rob Huff, on top of their games in those mighty Camaros. Now we need, of course, to see who is going to complete the top 15. The last driver at the moment is uh, car number 22 in 15th place, the last of the qualifiers, and uh, we'll see where, where the Spears can stay in that position, but well done to Jake Hill, fabulous, fabulous racing. That was well earned from Jake Hill, you have to say, uh, ahead of Rob Huff and uh, Olivier Hart. Jack Tetley, a fairly lonesome race in the end, and fourth uh, in front of Oliver Bryant, also with a bit of a lonely race. But this should be our 15th place finisher as that uh, gaggle of cars in the midfield pack make their way through the chicane. Scarborough, Young, Padmore, Waterfield, uh, Sleep, and then it should be John Spears in uh, the number 18 Rover, or in the Rover. 22, John Spears in, in, the, 22. The, in the Capri. Oh, sorry. Should just complete, they, they shuffled around, he hasn't made it through to the finish, there was quite a gap from sleep in the morning Almost delivery car, and let's just see who's next across the line, oh, it's very tight indeed, but will it be John Spears, no, no. this is the has got past with Ludovic Lindsay, who started stone last, just missing out, having charged from the back of the grid, so unlucky for Ludovic, the first winner of the revival back 25 years ago, and boy what wow. a start, it opened the floodgates and historic racing here just gets better and better. Well, that was only one of our Gordon Spice Trophy races. We've got another one to come uh, shortly after this. Well, the Camaro drivers had to save their brakes. We're going to have to save our voices. There was plenty to talk about there, and uh, do give them a wave as they come around. They worked supremely hard, and not one of them will have been thinking, I must save a bit of the car for tomorrow. Not one. No. Well, Jake Hill had to uh, recover quite a bit of his car after uh, qualifying this morning, but uh, considering they had to rebed and rebuild uh, that uh, Ford Capri, well, they've certainly done it to a top spec, and there he is. Is Jake Hill, multiple winner in the British Touring Car Championship, racing that Ford Capri, and you can see how much that means to him. You could enjoy the smile on his face, just behind his helmet visor. And uh, Rob Huff, though, pushing all the way. He held his time. He held. He by this time, though, mature driving from Huff. He didn't force his way through on Hart early doors, but maybe he could have done. He almost let Hart have it. He almost let Hart have it and, and run out of steam a little bit.
he was thinking, when do I want the most performance from my car relative to my rivals at the end of the race? That's why Rob Huff has won so many touring car titles and a, a great charge to second place. Of course, we don't know the, the leading Capri of Jake Hill and the, the chasing Olivier Hart, how well their cars were handling. They were both damaged this morning, but uh, top-level crews got them ready to come and play. And for Fred Shepard, who started, it was way down the order. He started seventh, fell down to, I think, 19th place, got up to eighth place in the number 17 Impressive, Capri. Yeah. Uh, Escort, uh, sorry, Escort, what am I talking about? The Mustang boss and Simon Hill there in the background, lifting up his son, delighted, second generation racer. And Simon won't mind, takes a little bit better than Simon was, but the passion in that family runs super deep. Now that's uh, one way to reward your team for uh, helping rebuild that car and uh, going off and winning the race uh, and uh, brilliant scenes down in uh, the paddock for uh, Jake Hill in that Ford Capri. Well. A short moment to breathe then as we confirm the results. Hill on top in the Ford Capri, just ahead of Rob Huff in the Chevy Camaro, uh, Camaro and Olivier Hart rounding out the top three. Jack Tetley, a former winner here, only fourth this time around. Oliver Bryant in the top five. Then it was uh, the first of the Rovers with Michael Whitaker in sixth. James Thorpe uh, in the Chevy seventh. And Fred Shepard, as we mentioned, had that great recovery drive uh, having started seventh. Down to 19, finishing eighth in his Mustang. Boss ahead of the Ford Capris of Mike Whitaker and Graham Scarborough. He rounded out the top 10. And a reminder, it is the top 15 that go through to Sunday's final. So the Volvo of Jack Young, the BMW of Nicholas Padmore, the Ford Capri of Tom Waterfield, the Rover of Nick Sleep, and just nicking it at the end, it's seen the Ford Capri of Alec, uh, Alex Thistlesweight made it through just ahead of Ludovic Lindsay, who sadly, having started from the back, made it all the way up to 16th. Very impressive, but uh, fortunately couldn't quite get through ahead of DeBormont, Jarvis, Means, and Colburn in 21st in the BMW. And then it was uh, three Rovers at the back. Adam Rindle, Riordan Welby, and Rob Jarvis in 24th and last of our classified finishes. And I believe now we can head down to David. Well, I'm going to stop the party here, but gentlemen, the first Gordon Spice Trophy, well, it really delivered. Congratulations, Jack. And a Capri one. What a coincidence. Yeah, I mean, it's um, awesome to commemorate Gordon Spice in that way with being a Capri, but... Yeah, I mean, what an amazing race, racing these two. You know, it was awesome. I just held on, despite Huffy's best efforts. Uh, and Olivia gave me a really hard time throughout. So, uh, but yeah, fantastic race. And what a result we're going to have tomorrow for all of us, I think. Rob was breathing down your neck pretty heavily towards the end there. I knew it. He was just waiting there. I thought, he's waiting. Little sneak. He's just staying there. I'm, I'm driving the socks off this battered and bruised Jatan uh, Capri. But yeah, it was, um, it was an awesome race. I absolutely loved every second. Well, it's been an up and down day. Were you glad you got out there in the end? Yeah, I was over the moon. You know, it was a, a huge, huge credit to all of Rickwood Motorsport for pretty much rebuilding the front of this car after my little off this morning. So, yeah, it was a really nice way to repay them. Well, it might be, not be the prettiest Capri, but a Capri won the first Gordon Spice Trophy. Well done, Jake. Well done. Rob. I mean, mega, right? You no, did brilliant. That's, that's what Cooper's all about, right? Yeah, you just can't create that kind of stuff anywhere else in the world. And, uh, yeah, I mean, huge congratulations to Jake and the whole team for, for getting this back out because it, it was looking pretty second-hand this morning. Um, for me, I just I took it easy at the start. You know, it's the first laps I've done in the car, pretty much. We'd had three laps in qualifying. Um, but, yeah, when I say a huge thanks to, to David Clark for letting me drive his, his, his princess this weekend. Uh, hopefully he'll be back with us very soon. But, uh, yeah, obviously do our best tomorrow. It was coming to us, the race. BMW got in the way on the line on the last lap. But, uh, yeah, pretty confident. I think he blocked you on purpose, Eddie. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. It's probably, Jake, Jake's probably best mates with him. A little bit of smog, anything to worry about? No, we, we had it this morning as well. It's just, uh, I think we've just got a bit of a, a little leak. You know, these, these things, they're not, you know, brand new. Um, yeah, nothing to worry about. It was pretty smoky in the car, I was just keeping an eye on it. But I was just hoping we were going to get the meatball flag and, 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 and taking off. So, no, really tough for that. Brilliant. Well, you did great. Fantastic race and uh, best luck tomorrow. Thanks. Olivia, so close. It looks like you were fighting for the win at one point there. You were breathing pretty hard down Jake's back there. Yeah, first of all, I want to uh, thank the team that they uh, fixed the car. Um, I had a small mistake uh, in the end of the straight here, so the problems were the, the braking, and sadly I still had that problem. So when I came by uh, for first, I was like, okay, maybe <laughs> maybe let him by, because if I don't make this corner, there will be two cars in the wall, and that's, that's not what I want. So I just uh, finished the race easily, and uh, I also had some problems with the engine, so uh, in the high revs, 
the engine wasn't working that well, but I had a very nice race and a very nice battle with these two good <laughs> racers. So uh, I'm happy. Let's try uh, tomorrow again. So a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, is it? Well, you came still on the podium and you got another try, try to tomorrow. I'm, I'm happy I drive more than three less with this car finally. So uh, that's, uh, that's really good. <laughs> well, there you go. Well done. A spectacular first Gordon Spice trophy there. Sliding touring cars at the best. We're going to go and see some highlights now. It certainly was a fantastic first Gordon Spice trophy and a great start for pole sitter in the Ford Capri, uh, Jake Hill, who was able to get up and in front of the Rover of Michael Whitaker who had a poor start and Olivier Hart, who managed to slot in behind second for a long time. It was Hart versus Hill and uh, Hill just managed to keep it going in front of him. Grunt versus handling and the ability to break late for Woodcut always was in the favor of the Ford Capri and Jake Hill just kept his car in front through the kink important kink on the laminate straight the nose of that white and black Camaro would go in front but look which car break first no prizes for getting it was the Ford Capri but then it was about balancing the cars through Woodcut and what's that in the background it's red it's white it's smoking slightly but it's Rob Huff in the second of the Camaros he thought that battle looks fun let's join it he absolutely was stalking the rear of these two just biding his time allowing uh, the white and black uh, Camaro of uh, Olivier Hart to battle hard with Jake Hill and ultimately it was Olivier Hart who ended up falling by the wayside because the red and white of Rob Huff was slowly closing in and would eventually through the smoke try and find a way through. Up front though, it was all neat and tidy from Jake Hill, who kept it clean. And then this was the moment that Rob Huff managed to slot himself up into second. Better exit from the second part of Lavent used his extra acceleration to get by. There were a couple of back marks in the way and Riordan Welby had a scary moment when he rotated between first, second and third at St. Mary's. But at the end, it was victory just from Jake Hill. It was an absolute belter, but two Camaros on the tail. They get to do it all again tomorrow. We cannot wait. I can't stop smiling. Well, everybody said it's so exciting. You get to see all these cars, not just look at them, but you get to see them in action. That's cool. Goodwood Revival is all about make, do, and mend, vintage style, not vintage values, and of course, sustainability. Not only is there the motor racing, but it's everything else, the shopping, it's the fun fair, it's the look, it's the period, and that is what the Goodwood Revival is. It's just a fantastic day out. It's like motoring heaven here. It's motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's a sort of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then... Well, welcome back to the 80th Goodwood members meeting and uh, hope you've had a chance to catch your breath. We certainly have and we're ready to do it all over again uh, for the second heat of the Gordon Spice Trophy Group 1 saloon cars that race between 1970 and 1982. But it doesn't look like it's a good start for one of our races. Yes, yeah, the number 32 Dolomite Sprint, uh, famously in period. They, they were fabulous, great handling cars, but uh, haven't always had the reliability and uh, really very sad there for Robert Spencer. He's parked... His yellow Dolomites matches the daffodils, but it's not going to be going anywhere. So that means one of our runners out of a field of 28 is not going to be challenging for the top 15. On pole position, we have the brilliantly 
driven Jim Morris Volkswagen uh, Golf, Mark 1 GTI, and uh, the car from the family stable is third on the grid. It's the BW Sirocco in between the great entertainer Nick Swift in a mini 1275 GT. So they've got the complexion of this race today, Harry. Racing against cars of similar performance, and then tomorrow you got to go up against the big guns. And around a circuit like this, someone like Nick Swift just carries momentum where they have to do braking, he doesn't bother with it. So another mix, but sadly. Uh, for driver number 32, Robert Spencer, he didn't even get to the start in his Butch Taylor's liveried uh, Triumph Dolomite. In fact, two cars with that race livery, but only number 32 on the sidelines. Yeah, he was supposed to be lining up towards the back in 24th position, but it looks like he won't uh, get to do that either. Uh, certainly, this uh, if you've just watched Heat 1, well, the difference is, yes, as you say, Bruce, these are the smaller engined uh, saloon cars that race between 1970 and 1982, and it is the top 15 that we're looking for to go through and join the big boys in Sunday's I'll final. I'll throw something into the mix. Two cars uh, suffered eligibility problems had all their qualifying times removed they're starting at the back of the grid it's one of the data post liveried uh, Ford Fiestas it's white yellow and blue that is in the hands of Simon Goodliffe and Alex Taylor in the yellow and blue RX-7 look for those cars coming up they've got a 20 minute race to get from the tail of the field it's about 27th and 28th positions up into the top half up into the top 15 to qualify for tomorrow's finale well, it certainly will be uh, a great battle as we wait for the green flag uh, lap to uh, get underway. That will be your front row on pole. On the far left, as you look at the screen, is the uh, Volkswagen uh, Golf in uh, pole position. Jim Morris at the wheel and then Nick Swift in the mini, the number 60. In the middle and on the, on the far right will be the VW Scirocco piloted by Tom Shepard, who is on the far right. So that will be our front row. Who will get the best start? We shall see. Green flag lap underway, and uh, the Scirocco practicing for a good start. We saw Jake Hill in the uh, Heat 1 get a great start on his green flag lap, uh, and that boded well for the race start as the uh, number 26 uh, car of Miles Poulton in the Triumph Dolomite further back uh, gets a decent getaway as well and just has to stop into place. But now the crucial moments begin, getting heat into the tyres, making sure you're happy with everything set up and hoping that the car makes it round the full back. And also hoping that uh, Rob Huff's smoking Chevrolet Camaro wasn't dropping any oil towards the end of the previous heat, the first of the two heats. Now for fans of Vauxhalls, uh, there's a DTV Vauxhall, but sadly for them, it's down towards the back of the field. It's the Magnum in the hands of James Alexander and uh, the very tail of the grid. Just look out for the number 02, the yellow and blue Mazda RX-7. That was the car that won the championship, the RX-7, in 1980 in the hands of Wynn Percy and 1981. Then he moved on to Toyota Corolla. That's in the field as well with his famous number plate, Win One. That's the Toyota Corolla that we're starting down towards the tail. Well, in the second half of the field, around halfway actually, David Green starting from 11. So let's check when they come round that all the cars will be there. We know number 32 is not going to be taking the start. That is pulled off to the side, but here's the grid. Here it is then, and it is on pole position. It will be uh, Jim Morris in the VW Mark 1 Golf GTI, just in front of Nick Swift in the Mini uh, 1275 GT from 1978, and the VW Scirocco GTI in third with Tom Shepard. David Devine was going well uh, in qualifying practice earlier on in the Ford Escort. He starts fourth in front of Rupert Dick in the Mini uh, from fifth. Then it's James Dorlin in the Ford Fiesta, Ben Colburn in the Alfa Romeo, sixth and seventh. Harvey Deep in another Mini going from eighth. Mark Burnett and in the only a state car out in the field from ninth and in tenth it will be Lawrence War, who will uh, also go in his Mini GT. Then it is the first of those Toyotas with David Green, the Corolla, uh, in 11, just in front of Malcolm Harrison, the Austin Metro. Peter Smith in the Ford Escort RS2000 from 13th in front of uh, the first of the Triumph Dolomites uh, from 14th. Paul Clayson in another Alfa Romeo from 15th. Kerry Michael, Mark Wilson and Mark Bevington in the second Toyota, but that is a uh, Seneca car from... 18th position and then it's uh, Ken Clark uh, and Timothy Morley double triumph dollar my action Peter Fisk in the Opal Commodore from 21st and then it is Robert Spencer Miles Poulton, two Triumph Dolomites making up 22nd and 23rd. James Alexander in the, Vol the Vauxhall Magnum from 24th. Colin Sota in the Triumph Dolomite. Tim Crichton, 26th. And as you said, right at the start, Bruce Simon Goodliffe in the Ford Fiesta and Alex Taylor in the Mazda RX-7, starting from the back due to uh, eligibility issues from the practice uh, qualifying earlier on. And that uh, Mazda RX-7 having a, a great bit of history as well, the one that uh, uh, really was the, the bit of a nemesis 
apprentice to uh, to Gordon Spice uh, in the 1980 championship winning season and uh, just prevented him uh, from taking the title in the end. We'll see how quickly they can come through the field as they start to make their way uh, through the uh, chicane and back onto the main straight and it will line up at the front. But the sun's starting to get lower and lower. I wonder how that might affect the drivers in visibility. They'll have the suitable uh, visors, or hopefully they will, in the car. Uh, but a hand up at the back of the pack. That's number 23, Tim Crichton in the Triumph. Dolomite, hand up. Is he peeling into the pits? I think he is. Problem there for the Triumph. Yep. Sloking. So one Triumph down. That might be two Triumphs down. Yes, he's driving back into the paddock. So really unfortunate that Triumph Dolomites. You were asking me about them earlier, and I said, alas, they do sometimes suffer from reliability problems. So looking at those at the front, it's not a case of loads of grunt. It's a case of carrying your speed, and that VW Golf on pole position with Jim Morris on board did it very well in qualifying. Ended up uh, only three tenths of a second clear, though. Who's going to make the best start? Yeah, Jim Morris on pole on the left-hand side. How good did this start be? It's not as good as the Scirocco, though, and Tom Shepard. But is the golf going to come back? The Mini certainly is in the middle, piloted by Nick Swift. He'll have the inside line coming into Turn 1, and he does. The Mini takes the lead, and the Golf GTI is fighting back. The Scirocco has to run out wide, so advantage Mini and the Scirocco has to force back to fourth place as well as the other Mini uh, gets, it, gets itself moving. That's Rupert Deeth getting up into third. Is it Deeth or is it the data post car of James Dorling? Either way, there's a Mini leading. That's the Patrick Motorsport livery with the inimitable Nick Swift. But the golf is coming back. Jim Morris taking a look, but he's only going to be off of the outside as they get St Mary's. And it's, in fact, you're quite oh. right, 69. How side was would you like? That was a big twitch followed by another onto the grass. You were quite right. It was Deeth, Rupert Deeth. He's bouncing, but he's keeping going. The Marshall and Fraser estate version of the Clubman Mini goes through with the Alpine Alp Napolina Alpha Sud alongside, but it went super wrong. And that short wheelbase on the Mini gave him nowhere to go. Yeah, couldn't even quite rejoin in the proper manner either, having to calm the car down on the grass before he could safely rejoin that Mini then. All the work to do. This is a 20-minute race. We're already counting down. 18 and a half minutes. But up front, uh, it is Morris uh, trying to come back. Here he is uh, in the uh, VW Golf GTI. Retakes the lead from uh, Nick, uh, Nick Swift in the Mini. So, after a bit of a poor start, the Golf finds itself back in front. I must say, the Golf was watching it intently in the official practice today, which is qualifying for this event. And the handling of that car is superb. Nick Swift is comparatively all over the place in the Twitchy Mini in second place. Uh, between them, what's the gap? It's a quarter of a second. Then we've got uh, David Devine up in car number 63, the Ford Escort into third place. And uh, just trying to see how far back... Uh, the 69 Mini went <laughs> uh, down to 15th place. So he's on the cusp, having been challenging in about fifth place when he uh, got it a little bit too sideways. Rupert D gathered it all up at St Mary's at the first, second and third time of asking and is continuing. He will work his way forward and look too for the 0-2 Mazda. Came through in 21st position. This is one that started stone last in the hands of Alex Taylor. It will continue to advance, but... Now, ahead of the lead battle, we've got yellow flags. Someone has gone off at Laban. That's the exit of St. Mary's. A data post car, is it? The Metro. That's car number 77, if my memory serves me rightly. Yes, Malcolm Harrison's car. That didn't make it round to the end of the first lap. Oh, it's, it's still going around, but super, super slowly. Malcolm, very experienced, keeps out of the way. Slight advantage there, gained by just pressing on for Jim Morris. But the first three are uh, out clear at the lead of the race. But have a look at both sides, if you wish, of... <laughs> Oh, dearie me, the 69 Mini, Rupert Deeth bouncing here, bouncing there, bouncing everywhere. But he did eventually get back onto the track in about 20th place, and all the good work has been undone. Undone. We tried to rejoin there, but then thought better of it, and then just about managed to get two wheels, and then four wheels back onto the tarmac, but that surely would have woken him up. And this is how Jim Morris retook the lead in the VW Golf from Nick Swift in the Mini. The Golf, who started on pole position, lost out, retakes the lead, but... Swift is keeping him very close indeed. Less than a tenth of a second between the top two as David Devine uh, tries to catch them up further back uh, in the number 63. That is a Ford Escort RS2000. So the top two just escaping up the road a little bit. Where have we seen that before? Will third place come through and let them fight it out in these early stages?
Well, Sirocco is attacking, and uh, I talked of Alex Taylor working forward, but the other car that started in the back row of the grid, having times taken away, Simon Goodliffe is up to 13th. He's uh, managed to get already into the top 15, the 15 that will go through tomorrow. So look out for the data post number 51, Ford Fiesta. There it is, two of the cars in the race, 51 being driven really well. And I guess your dander is up if you've been put to the back of the grid. You've got something to prove. He's going to have a chance to race in tomorrow's event, but he's not going to stop here. 13th is fine, but he's going to keep on working his way forward. You can be sure of that. Yeah, Alex Taylor already in the Mazda RX-7, right on the bubble of the top 15. He's in 16th spot now in that RX-7. I mean, started from the back, so great stuff from them. You can see the yellow and blue Mazda making its way through as well. Uh, so a reminder, it is the top 15 that get through to Sunday's final. So at war under pressure in the 64 Mini, Lawrence War. Now, if you can see the driver's face lit by the sun, that means they can't see a great deal. And that's what you find when they leave Madrid, go down towards Ford Water, the most fierce corner of the circuit where you want to be brave, but they'd like to be able to see the circuit. Now, variety is always the spice of life, I'd say, and the, the Marshall and Fraser, many common estate, not many estates in touring car racing, of course, famously Volvo had one, uh, several... Uh, many years later, but Mark Burnett driving beautifully, and uh, we've got a slowing, retiring Clark. Triumph Dolomite. That makes three, and that's the Clark car that is being brought in. So big shame there, 93. Not going to make it to tomorrow's finale. Yep, smoke billowing out, pulls to the side. It's, it's right by the pit lane if it can uh, hobble its way back in. Uh, and I think it is doing so. We look out the left-hand side of our comic box window, and it is in. Uh, now, we look at the battle here, further back in the pack. Is that the 64 car? I think it was. It's it's the battle for third place. It's David Devine ahead oh, of Shepard. And Shepard, don't forget, started from the outside of the front row in the, in the Sirocco, briefly led the race before the other two came back past. But he's fighting hard, and it looks as though fourth place is going to be thrown away shortly to become third. But uh, certainly... Uh, David Devine is not too keen to let him through. The bluff-nosed uh, Ford Escort still in front of the lower sleeker VW Sirocco. Yeah, the Sirocco is still trying to find a way through on that uh, uh, Ford Escort, but none such doing for the time being. 14 minutes remain of this race. We've had about 30% of it so far. Three laps have gone by. The top two separated by less than four tenths of a second. This the closest battle on the track then uh, between third and fourth. Devine and Shepard currently. Uh, and a little look down to our top 15. That is still ch uh, ch chopping and changing uh, with Taylor now up at the 13th spot. So starting from the back, he's already up and into the top 15 in that Mazda RX-7. Right, the driver in fourth place, Tom Shepard, he started third in that wide, remarkably plain-looking VW Sirocco. He's quicker than David Devine, but he's got to get past, and David Devine driving very well to put his car where he needs to. The Escort's still in front of the Sirocco, both of them blinded uh, by the sun as they work their way down towards St Mary. They went through the worst part, which is Ford Water, in terms of lack of visibility. Now in St Mary's, remember we had the bouncing Mini just there on the opening lap of the race, the first part of St Mary's, but Devine puts his car where it needs to be. Absolutely, so far he is not making any mistakes. Planted driving uh, throughout this uh, Gordon Spice Trophy second race that we've had uh, today. Up front, though, that battle has nearly reached a second, the gap now. Uh, so Swift has either made a bit of a mistake or Morris is able in that VW Golf GTI to put his foot to the floor and get a rhythm and start pulling away. You can just see them in the distance of the shot as Devine tries to catch up and keep Shepard at bay uh, for third and fourth. Then it's Dawlin uh, in the number 61. That's a Ford Fiesta, the first of the Ford Fiestas in the field. Uh, a little bit more detached in sixth. Uh, but let's look at the two recovering cars as well. The Mazda RX-7 uh, in the yellow and blue. That's the number two car up into 13th. And uh, Goodliffe up into 11th. So having started both plumb last, well and truly on the fringes of the top 10. Yeah, but the Mini you're looking at there is the one that went bouncing and showed us all its flanks. That's uh, Rupert D started in fifth place, had the biggest moment of all at St Mary's on the first lap, now working his way forward, and the Mazda will go with him. They will work their way through the field. But what have we got there? But not quite at halfway. We've got almost, well, we've got just under 12 minutes, the 20-minute race still to go. These two, 69 Mini and the 02 Mazda RX-7 in that bright yellow and blue livery will work their way forward. How high can they get? That will be the question. Uh, and uh, Deeth getting up into 12th, Taylor in 13th, Wilson 14th, War uh, in 15th. And that is the top 15, the fight for 15th position currently going. War's way at the moment, but he'll have to keep uh, uh, looking at his rearview mirror because the number 40 of Green is coming up behind him in the 
Toyota Corolla. David Green trying to find his way into the top 15, into the one of only two Toyotas uh, in this field. So again, it's about getting as high up the finishing order as you can within the top 15. But again, when you look at these little minis, looking now at Rupert D in car number 69, they've got so much space on the track relative to the giant Camaros they'll be competing against tomorrow. They can pick and choose their lines, but we know they're twitchy. Rupert D certainly knows they're twitchy and bouncy. Very bouncy. Uh, the number 78, the uh, Mini Club and Estate, the only estate in the field uh, in the hands of Mark Burnett, currently running well in eighth spot at the moment, trying to uh, find, a, oh, trying to find a way through uh, on uh, TJ Green Racing livery car, and uh, they're both uh, trying to find that's the number 29. I think the Ford Escort, Peter Smith, trying to find a way through. So. Is that a bit of traffic in front as well? Who's trying to find their way through in the chicane? This gaggle of cars, 10 and a half minutes remaining, and at the front of it is the 29 that is uh, leading this uh, gaggle of cars. That is Smith up in ninth position, and then it should be uh, in 10th behind him, the 34th Clark. But the one you want to watch is the fifth car in that gaggle, just, just joining, because that's Simon Goodliffe in the uh, number 51. Fiesta getting closer and closer from the back of the field up to 11th. He's catching uh, the four cars in front. He could be up to 7th place. And the 72 Mini apparently has got a bonnie that, bonnet that's a little bit loose, which will be a little bit uh, of a concern for Harvey Dia at the wheel of that. So let's take a look. Oh, a wide moment. John Maguire racing Sirocco. Been fighting so hard for David, for David Devine, matching lap times to the tenth of a second. And then he rather blew it. Just ended up going a little bit wide at Madwick, followed by a little bit more wide. But importantly, keeping it away from the tyre wall on the outside. Oh, the prayer were made so easy to just be sucked into the walls here at Goodwood as soon as you dip a wheel onto the cars and we think this is what caused him to go wide a little bit of contact then uh, with the number 63 Ford Escort of David Devine so while they were battling it really was nothing between them and in the end Devine winning out that one but uh, a little bit of touring car Tough love. Actually, to be honest, I, I, I'm not 100% sure there was any contact. They were very close. I think it was adjustment of line, realising the Escort wasn't backing off and it had two wheels on the grass where there wasn't enough of an inside, but David Devine clearly made a tough stuff. Hang, hung in there, but that means uh, we now have the 61 Fiesta of James Dorlin up into fourth place. Tom Shepard in the Sirocco down to fifth, but he looks so he's got the fight in him. He'll be working his way back. I am sure of that. Up to 15th, uh, we're watching with the number 39 VW Mark 1 car versus the Toyota uh, of, uh, I think that's the Corolla in front. It is, it's a David Green driven car that's just moved into that final position to go through to tomorrow's joint finale where they'll join the big bangers. So 15th place now in the hands of the Hughes of Beckenfield Toyota Corolla and the Akai Livery Golf, the Akai Golf as it says on the side. Car number 39 just out of the reckoning for now, but let's see what Mark Wilson can manage to do in the fight back. Look at this, brilliant racing, the sun setting, the glints of the, the sun reflecting off of these cars as they battle tooth and nail in this mid-pack. We've got the Mini Clubman uh, State in there as well, the Ford uh, S Court, uh, the Mini that went off right at the start, bumping along the grass and rejoining, lost out a huge amount of positions. All of this uh, being headed up by the number 29. So it's Smith in the battle for seventh place. So there's about five, six, seven cars involved in this battle here, yeah. all in the top 15. But right now, it's the Ford Escort that has the best view in the house. But only just for now, because the number 51, Simon Goodliffe driven data post, Fiesta's worked his way onto the tail of that quartet. He then joined the quartet. He's now moved up to second in the line. But he hasn't, didn't get a good exit from Lavington. It means another data post car, but the Mini really challenged him. But late, late, late goes good lift. Look how much later he break going into Woodcut, right on the tail of the Escort. The best of the Dolomites just in the background of that pack. They should all, if they finish, and that's a big if at the moment, uh, be able to finish in the all-important top 15. But some fantastic scrapping. They're not at the very sharp end of the field, but they are still heading for tomorrow's finale. Across the line, seven minutes to go, eight laps done, and it is still Peter Smith holding the fort in this battle for seven, just in front of Goodlift, but Deep is trying to find a way back through in the 69 Mini. That was the Mini that went bouncing across the grass right at the start of this race, and then they've also got Clark in there as well, the number 34, that's a Triumph Dolomite, so one of the 
few remaining Dolomites we have in this Gordon Spice Trophy race. Six and a half minutes remaining. Who's going to come out of this battle? Up front, it is also starting to heat up. Less than six tenths of a second. Swift has clawed back on Morris. Uh, the uh, VW Golf starting to come under a little bit of pressure now. And so is Peter Smith in the 29 Ford Escort. Can the Mini find its way through? It's trying hard. Well, Rupert Deeth, I think there was possibly contact there at St Mary's, which sometimes doesn't bear thinking about. It gave, the gave a, a chance there for the number 51 Data Post Fiesta to go around uh, Rupert Deeth's Data Post Mini Car 69. The Mini's back in front and tucked in behind. You've got uh, number 72 Mini, Bonnet still flapping away. They are all in the top 10. In fact, uh, Bobby Diaz is in 10th place, the white, blue and green Mini in the background. But for now, resolute defence from the 29 Ford Escort there, staying just for now in front. Yeah, huge amount of pressure for the Escort to be under as well. The, the two data post livery cars dicing it out on track. One uh, a, a VW and one a, a, a Mini as they uh, make their way through the chicane once again. And the Escort, uh, the Fiesta, or the Escort, I should say, still at the front of this field. And at the moment, it has the straight line speed advantage. Yeah. Up front, battle for the lead. Absolutely. It was six tenths of a second almost to the moment. It came down to 0.229 of a second. It's about that at this moment. So nine laps on the board, nine and a half laps on the board. Jim Morris still leading, but Nick Swift smiling as he attacks. He's pushing super hard. Here comes the kink on the Labyrinth straight. Yes, I know that's an anomaly, but it's all the same. But for... Nick Swift and the Patrick Motorsport Mini, he just needs to try and get, he doesn't have the grunt, but he's got the handling and he's got the attack. That's Nick Swift encapsulated. The Mini certainly seems maybe a little bit more nimble, perhaps, than the VW Golf, but there really is not too much in it. He's going to try and have to force Morris in the Golf into a mistake through the chicane we go. But at the moment, oh, has Morris run a little bit deep into there? Maybe, but right now, Swift all over the back of him as they come onto the main straight to start another lap. Four and a half minutes remaining. He is oh so close. Mere thousands of a second between them. Morris holds on into turn one for now. Last time around, it was 0.229 of a second. This time around, it was 51 thousandths of a second. But from Jim Morris leading the race to the driver, trying to take the paint off the back of his car. That's Nick Swift attacking super hard, as only he knows how. The number 60 Mini, such an over take overtaker, an entertainer here over the years. But he's got his focus now, but he's got a little something on his shoulder, the little angel going, remember, there's a race tomorrow. Uh, these two have rather got away from uh, Shepard in the Scirocco, who has in turn got in front of uh, Devine. Uh, after running out wide and losing out to uh, the 63 car, the Ford Escort. So, uh, Scirocco, a little bit of recovery, but still about 11 and a half seconds back from this uh, battle at the front. We now look still at the battle for seven that rages on, and uh, this Mini cannot find a way through on this Ford, and there's more still coming into the fray as well. The two data post cars really fighting tooth and nail. Three and a half minutes left on the clock. Well. Peter Smith has driven really well on that RS2000 because... Excuse me, the excitement got the better of me there. But the data post cars behind are their own worst enemies. They both want to be predominant. The Harvey Rupert Deeth and the 69 Mini attacking the driver that came up from the back of the field, Simon Goodliffe, and as they fight, it just gives a little bit of a breathing space to Pete Smith. But through the second part of St Mary's, they catch right onto his tail. Right, 51 thousandths per second was the gap between first and second. It's advantage this time, surely. It's Jim Morris, yes, he's gained 0 0.04 of a second. Nearly a tenth of a second clear. It's down to that little. These two Gordon Spice Trophy races that we've been treated to here on the Saturday of the 80th Goodwood members meeting have been absolutely spectacular. And the brilliant thing is we get another dose tomorrow where we combine the big guns with the smaller engines, uh, touring cars. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. But for now, we've still got this one to figure out. Just looking at the peripheries of the top 15 as well, it's David Green and the Corolla who now finds himself in 15. He's about two and a half seconds back from 14th place. So war safe for now. But two and a half minutes, still a lot can be done. Uh, the Mazda of Taylor has made its way up into 12, but kind of holding firm. He's stuck in that little midfield gaggle at the moment. So we'll see how much more progress that Mazda can make. But from the back, certainly proving uh, very well indeed. The right, the front rages on. Rages on, and what they're going to catch is uh, one, two, three, four cars. I saw the Opal Commodore in there. They will catch it. What's left on the clock? Two minutes. They've got this lap 
that follows and one beyond. They will catch that quartet of cars. It's how they get through. Will Jim Morris leading the way in the golf find a line that cannot be followed by Nick Swift in the mini? But Swift will be looking at this thing going, it could give, but it could take away. And he's super, super close. They're going to get very busy when they get down to Madwick, the, the older Toyota Celica of uh, Hughes of Beaconsfield. That will get out of the way. They will go hard to drivers left and hopefully those in front. The Alpi Lati Alpha. So, have we, yes, we may have time just to squeak in two more laps by the skin of their teeth. And uh, for Jim Morris, he must be going, I should have been a second slower there, then we wouldn't. Quite possibly, but I have to say, they've managed that traffic fairly well. Still got a couple of cars in front of them. Uh, that's the Alfa Romeo in front of them as uh, uh, Morris tries to find a way through. Goes to the inside, but can Swift follow him through? Or is he going to get stuck? Can they both make it through? Yes, they do. Both squeeze past uh, the number 14 Alfa Romeo GTV. So Paul Clayson doing some good driving there, but they've still got another one to go. I think it's the uh, 38 potentially. Is that a Triumph Dolomite in front of them? Yeah, the Morley so branded one. Triple X 38, it is. Still in front so is this Swift's chance he gets up alongside Morris can he find a way through is he using the traffic to his advantage to try and find a way through on the golf it's golf versus mini but the golf wins out once again well done Morris holds on well Morris was far more compromised than Nick Swift but it was a case of just forcing his nose up the inside into the first part of Lavent but that compromised him slightly for the second part of Lavent and now we've got Nick Swift coming back at him not quite close enough there to get the slipstream so somehow just somehow Jim Morris has hung on 22 seconds remaining on the clap on the clock this is the final lap they didn't quite squeak through uh, fast enough to get round one more time or did they through what could they go it's the golf in front of the mini time surely has run out for nick swift the traffic may well have slowed them down five seconds they make their way through the chicane will this be the final lap but morris has gone wide is that going to allow swift to go through he's on the grass is swift going to nip this on the line no, I didn't see the checkered no, flag. I think I. we're going on one more time. So wipe that smile off your face, Nick Swift, and keep the pedal to the floor. Oh, that's what you do anyhow. Jim Morris, I thought he was going to clip the end of the pit wall. He was so wide on the grass, where the, where the wall comes out just before pit in. So he's got to refocus and see what he can do. What lies up ahead? That could be the key to how they get to the end of this race. That could have thrown it all away. I think the clock time down to zero just as they crossed the line. So we do indeed have this uh, uh, additional lap still before we get to the checker but for Nick Swift it's uh, working out at the moment but can he keep that golf behind him who has led the majority of this race and what's happening next well Lavin's corner is happening next and there's a waved yellow flag I noticed at the side of the circuit there someone is I can see some tar marks someone's put it off down there might have been uh, in the last lap or so but for now that's great news for Nick Swift that defense his lead he's only got three more corners to go I think there's a problem for the 36 out for a Mayo it's falling down the field I'm not sure if it's a transponder but you said the yellow flag that might well be the reason it's falling all the way down to 15th at the moment so uh, uh, trouble there for the out from ever here comes the golf straight line speed through on the mini that was power back into the lead can he hold it he made the mistake coming through the final chicane he could well do it again it'll be playing on his mind he's got to try and keep it clean coming into the chicane this is where he lost it all or he could have lost it all morris is right up uh, into the lead again can he find a way through it's going to be over the line side by side but i think the golf just nicks it ahead of the mini morris wins ahead of swift but what a battle well they're both applauding each other there and how Nick Swift lost so much ground coming down the Lavin straight. I know he doesn't have the grunt, but that was the best performance out onto Lavin straight from the driver who made the mistake just under a lap before the erstwhile race leader who does finish as the race winner. And uh, for Jim Morris, well done. And for, for Nick Swift, as ever, what an entertaining race. At the end, 0 0.026 of a second. It seemed less. And it felt, well, I, yes, it felt like less, didn't it? Well, both uh, Gordon Spice Trophy races certainly leaving us with uh, um, a time that needs to be uh, a, a time of relax, I should say. Uh, but we don't get that because we've still got cars uh, finishing the 15th place cast. This is the final car that will get through into tomorrow's final is the number 39 and it's the Mark 1 Golf GTI and that will be Mark Wilson, the Akai uh, Golf because we think there was a car uh, that fell all the way down the field. Well, I think we lost Tim Morley. Uh, I think he had a problem in the in the best of the Dolomites and um, he, car number 38. Let's wait for confirmation. Certainly uh, David Green's got through the number 40 uh, Hughes of Beckenfield's uh, Corolla tucked in behind is Tim Clark. Sorry, he was in the best of the uh, Dolomites. Now we're waiting for two more cars to come through. Car 39 has made it, and that, uh, of course, was the other Golf GTI. Mark Wilson and 15th place waiting for confirmation. Well, it should be.
the car that we were waiting for, which has fallen down, but has it actually finished? It's the RX-7, the Mazda, the yellow one, that started at the tail of the field. Alex Taylor got it up to about 12th place, but has he actually been a classified finisher? We'll have to wait for that, but we know for sure. Well, he's parked at the side of the circuit, so the answer to that on the last lap is no. No. So that promotes shame. the driver in 16th place, who we thought had just missed out. It's the driver of car number 38, and that is Tim Morley in the ex-Jerry Marshall Dolomite Sprint. So he squeaks in, and unfortunately for the driver from the very back of the field, just came up short. It was a very good effort, and what a shame. It all came uh, to an end just before the chequered flag. And so sadly, that Mazda will not make it through into the final, but the Volkswagen Mark 1 Golf GTI certainly will. Jim Morris, it could have been, well, second. It could have been through the chassis, uh, through the chicane, and, uh, well, into the wall, but he held it together and managed to retake uh, the Mini of Swift after a race-long battle, and I think uh, everyone enjoyed that. The fans are looking pretty happy here. This was that uh, mistake there by Morris onto the grass and almost hit the uh, tire wall that enters into the pit lane. That could have ended a lot worse. And uh, the Mini then skating through and off and away into the lead, but... I, I'm certain that as they crossed the chequered line, uh, it, the time went down to zero and that we got the extra lap. But if that had been a, a thousands of a second different, that could have well been the chequered. It, it certainly could. But just looking could, at the delight on the face of Jim Morris, immediately uh, applauding Nick Swift, who likewise hand out of the mini mini's window. Second place for now. They will fight tomorrow. They'll be first and second in the small engine grouping in tomorrow's race. Uh, but that was an absolute cracker. Two touring car races completely different to each other, but just as tight. I've never commentated a touring car race before, so that was exhausting, but thoroughly enjoyable. Jim Morris winning out in the Volkswagen Mark 1 Golf GTI just in front of Nick Swift in the Mini. Then it was Tom Shepard, uh, which ended up being a little bit of a lonely race towards the end for the Scirocco after a great battle with David Devine and the Ford Escort rounding out P4. James Dorlin in the Ford Fiesta is in the top five. Rupert Deeth made it up into sixth, and then this huge battle for seventh that went on and on and on. Simon Goodliffe winning out in the end in the Ford Fiesta in front of Peter Smith, who kept them at bay for so long, ends up eighth in the Ford Escort. Mark Burnett in the Mini Clubman Estate. Ninth and Lawrence War, he rounds up the top 10. And a reminder, it is the top 15 that go through to Sunday's final. So Harvey Deeth in the Mini, David Green in the Toyota Corolla, Tim Clark in the Giant Dolomite, uh, Mark Wilson in the other Mark 1 Golf, and uh, Timothy Morley, we believe, will make it into uh, the top 15 in his Triumph Dolomite after the Mazda uh, couldn't cross the chequered flag. So uh, that falls to the back. Clayson in 17th in the Alfa Romeo. Peter Fisk in the Opel Commodore, ahead of Mark Bevington in the second of the Toyotas in the field in 19th spot. Well, time to catch our breaths and we can head down to Ed. Jim Morris. Well, I'm going to dive in here, guys. Jim, did you think the race wasn't quite exciting enough? No, what happened? No, I thought I'd just, you know, throw it away on the last one lap and see if we could get past him again. I thought I was going in the wall. I just couldn't believe the way the curb, grass, creek, grass. Oh, God, we're going for the barrier. And then Nick's there and there's nowhere to go. <laughs> you, thought, you thought you were going in the wall, but you kept your foot in. I kept my foot in. I was, no, I, wasn't, I was not relenting. I've worked so hard and I've seen the side of this car in my mirror for 13 laps. That's all I've seen is number 60 like this. <laughs> it's been fantastic. And, you know, Nick's Mr. Goodwood. Nick's the mini man around Goodwood. So, you know, my little VW, and we've always had a bit of needle, but I've worked bloody hard for this. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and, and, and it's, you know, it's an honor. It's an absolute honor. Oh. Absolute honor to race this bloke. So long may it continue. Absolutely. Nick, let's come to you. I mean, there was, you didn't, you didn't have anything else to give, did you? No, that was it. And everything, everything I could possibly give. Uh, and it was, Jim was right, I mean, my, or whatever that is, left rear tyre was gone completely. And coming through Woodcut, I was thinking, oh, my goodness. I can see this is, this is quite sideways. Uh, the throttle stuck open uh, on the last two laps. So, uh, unfortunately, not fully open, only on half open. So, uh, we'll see what's going on there. But the car was faultless, absolutely brilliant. And it's just a pleasure to race with Jim. Uh, you know, that thing is a 
bullet, you know. And I, but I could see him losing his front tyres and he was getting slightly further away and I thought, right, just bide my time, bide my time and then I'll try and have a, a last attack. Uh, and then he made life very easy by throwing himself off at the chicane. I gave him lots and lots of room. I just thought, you know, I've been on that, you know, one me to you, me to you. I thought I'll get well over to the left, give him plenty of room just in case he comes back on. Uh, but yeah, it just wasn't enough. The power of the VW was just outpowered the Mini down the straight and that's it. Well, it was great to watch. Wonderful drive. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. That's fine, Tom Shepard. Here we go. Tom, what, what drive? You had a bit of a grassy moment, but I mean, you made it exciting. Yeah, definitely. I just sort of got a touch on the back corner from David Devine, and then I was, oh, here we go. This is <laughs> for deja vu. But it stayed together this time, and then I had a bit of a tussle to get past him properly. The uh, little es uh, fiesta was giving me a bit of grief as well. But once I got past, I was all right, but it was too late by then. It was a fantastic drive to the podium. Well done. Thank you very much. Right, that is everything from the podium, and let's go and see what Rachel's been up to. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Well, you never know who you're going to bump into at members' meeting, and I found uh, Andrew Strauss, actually, former England cricket captain. He was just wandering around. I noticed you a bit earlier. I thought we'd be rude to interrupt then. You were having a bit of a chilled afternoon. I thought I'd ask you about members' meeting, and have you been here before? No, this is my first time. Very much a step into the unknown. A slightly unfamiliar territory for me, if I'm honest with you, but it's been... An absolutely glorious day. I've loved every moment of it. Obviously, incredible weather today, but just being up close and personal, watching the races, meeting a few of the drivers, seeing these incredible machines, uh, and also the tinkering in the background and people making sure the engines are working and everything. It's just been a very, very special day. Yeah, it's a special meeting, and you know the Duke of Richmond sure does know how to put on an event. Uh, in terms of a highlight? Can you can you pick one from the cars or the people you've got to meet today? Um, well, I've got a friend who is who is in one of the races. So and it was it was a brilliant race, very close at the end. So that, that I think that was a highlight for me. And then otherwise, just meandering around and seeing some of the cars. And I've sort of now feel like I want to go and buy seven of them. But unfortunately, we know they're not cheap, are they? But um, uh, yeah, it's just I, I really sort of whets the appetite to to get into classic cars a little bit I think um, and and just understand the whole thing a bit more. Well you could always ask a mate because uh, the Gordon Murray a T33 Spider. I mean that's a cool 1.5 plus million but one of his more affordable cars so maybe you could ask you and a mate and you could go halves on it. Yes I need one of those guys that are playing for the in the IPL they, they might be able to uh, lend me a few quid. Have you always been fans of kind of cars and I guess old school cars at that? Yeah, I, I think sort of growing up, I had a sort of a fascination with Jaguars and I always had that ambition to get an E-Type, like I suppose so many people do. But um, but actually today, you know, I think just seeing the, the sort of the breadth of different cars from different eras has been really special. And um, and obviously they all go, don't they? And um, and the, the, the TLC and the love that goes into preparing those cars, you know, you can see why it's such a passion for people and why it sort of takes over people's lives as well. So yeah, it's been it's been a really special day. We, we've got uh, dinner tonight as well, so we can go and have a couple of nice glasses of wine and, and finish the day in, in the right sort of style. Well, now you're retired. Maybe you can go and get your license and we can see you racing around here in the future. But I know you're also a fan of Festival of Speed. You've been here before. Uh, what's your plan? like for the Goodwood calendar this year? Will we see you back here at any of the other events? Um, yeah, I, I'm hoping to come to the Revival, actually. I think that would be special. I haven't been to that before, and, and to see some of those cars would be amazing. Um, uh, but, yeah, hopefully weather like this again, and uh, I'll be back here many times in the future. Well, you've picked a perfect day. On that note, as the cars go racing out on track, we'll say thank you and goodbye. Andrew, thank you for your time. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Let's take a look back then at the Gordon Spice Trophy Heat 2 for the Group 1 Saloon cars between 70 and 1982. And the pole sitter in the Black 44 VW Golf GTI didn't have the best of starts. And it was uh, uh, Morris in the Mini that managed to uh, make the most of the games. But then the 69 Mini finding the grass and couldn't quite find the tarmac in time. A very bumpy ride uh, for Rupert D. He did eventually make his way back onto the track and have a good recovery drive, finishing in the top six. It's the top 15 that have to make it through to Sunday's 
final and the battle was really between these two. The Golf versus the Mini, Swift versus Morris for a race long battle. The Scirocco of Shepard in the background kept them honest in the early stages but then fell back with his own battle with the Ford Escort of David Devine but they ended up having a few wars themselves through the chicane. It was the number 29 of Peter Smith who was in this brilliant fight for seventh place for so long, keeping about seven cars behind him, including the bouncing mini early doors. The two data post cars try to find their way through. In the end, Smith fell foul to good lift, but only by one position. And look at this, the traffic ended up quite possibly costing uh, the race win for Swift. And this then could have very much ended his race in the barrier, but he kept it out. But unfortunately, that allowed the Mini to skate through. But on the final lap, it was the Golf who just managed to get in front of the Mini, who had uh, led for so long in this race. The Golf back up in front. And in the end, it was certainly a win for the VW Golf GTI for the Gordon Spice Trophy Heat 2. We race tomorrow as well. It's like motoring heaven here. It's motorcycles, cars, helicopters, planes. It's a sort of assault on the senses when you come here. I know, but it's the best kind of assault. To hear them start and then... <laughs> Well, the sun is almost setting on what has been a glorious first day here of the 80th Goodwood members meeting. And what a day we have had, David. I mean, it's been about so much more than just the action on the track. I've been racing around all day and I've been over at the, the Ferris wheel. I've been in the daffodil enclosure, which is kind of a nod to springtime here in this country. There's been so much to look forward to. And I guess for me, the take home conversation has been about just how up close and personal you can get with all the drivers and the cars here at members meeting. It really is that special, isn't it? Well, we talked about it being the season opener, but it's more than that. It's a bit of a get together. It kicks off the season of motorsport for the year. And it's people saying hello to everybody. You know, they haven't seen them for a few months. And like you say, fans getting out there and seeing mega star drivers just walking around, having a chat, getting their photos taken. A fantastic atmosphere on and off the track. Megastar cricketers as well. Let's not forget, I just had a chat to Sir Andrew Strauss. Very good spot. Very good spot. He said, don't bring that up. I was like, well, you know, I'm going to bring it up now while he's not here to embarrass him. But uh, yeah, you never know who you're going to bump into here at members meeting. But in terms of what you've been up to today, David, you were quite lucky. You went out with Alice Powell in a Porsche earlier on. How was that experience? Yes, there's been a lot of celebration for Porsche this year. It's the 60th anniversary of the 911. And uh, Alice and I went out in a very fetching green 911 GTS and uh, we went out along the track. Alice has never driven around this track Couldn't before. You wouldn't believe it if you pulled out the pits for that, that's for sure. I thought, just you know there's a corner coming up here, but she was absolutely fantastic. Took to it straight away and gave me three fantastic laps around the track. Really, really enjoyed that. Yeah, and another first uh, this year was the Gordon Spice, the newly named Gordon Spice trophy, of course, and that was quite thrilling, wasn't it? 
Unbelievable. I mean, in its old guys, it's a Jerry Marshall. It always delivered. And we had two heats today, the big engine cars and the small ones. The, the first race, I mean, you know, Gordon Spice was a hugely popular, hugely successful race in the 70s, mostly in Capris. And it was really fitting for that first race for Jake Hill to bring that rather battered car in just, just ahead of Rob Huff in, in that race. And it is super important, isn't it? We kind of just say, oh, you know, they're racing around Goodwood here. But it is kind of a, a nod to them actually getting to compete again against people in their touring car class. They get to kind of on the weekly basis. They get to do it in a little bit of a fun environment, but it's still super competitive. Unbelievable. And Jake, you know, he's a hugely successful driver. And Simon, his dad, came running over to me at the end of the race. He went, look at that. He just held off a world touring car driver. And, uh, you know, so it means a lot to him. It's a huge, he was, he was sweating. He was worn out. He didn't have another lap in him, I don't think. So that car will live to fight another day tomorrow. And I'm really, really looking forward to the, the final of that race. Yeah, well, the top 15 qualified, didn't they, from Heat 1 and then the top 15 from Heat 2. So they'll combine and go out again in full force tomorrow for the final of that Gordon Spice trophy. In terms of whatever, what else we saw, let's talk about the big demonstration, the Brabham uh, GT52, which we saw a bit earlier on. That was pretty special. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, to see Ricardo Patrese step out of that car, first time he's drove that car since 1983, 30 years ago. And he said he jumped out, you know, again, talking about fans coming around, couldn't believe to see the car, never mind the driver, the sound of the car going around the track here. And he had such a broad smile on his face, welcomed by the Duke as he came out of the car and just said the car felt exactly the same as it did the last time he stepped in it. Well, tears as well, I think. It was quite the emotional experience for him. As you mentioned, he hasn't been in that car since 83. He said it still fitted like a glove for him. And I think it just uh, brought back a whole range of emotions, didn't it? Which is what the Duke is able to do, bring these special cars back and re reunite them with their owners. Absolutely. And that's, that's what Goodwood's all about. And we had demonstrations from GT1 out on the track and obviously the Porsche demonstrations, Bentley out there, an absolutely fantastic first day. We still have one more demonstration for you as well. The Ferrari Pro 550s are out on track and Ben Edwards uh, has a rundown for you of them. The Ferrari 550 Maranello is a two-seater V12 that was built between 1996 and 2001 and marked Ferrari's return to a front-engine rear-wheel drive layout 23 years after the Daytona had been replaced by the mid-engined Berlinetta Boxer. Although not intended for motorsport, some privateer teams took it upon themselves to develop the 550 for use in various series. Commissioned by Frederick Dawes Company, Care Racing Development, in 2001, British motorsport company ProDrive built a racing version of the 550 for various sports car series, despite receiving no support or even the blessing of the Ferrari factory. A total of 10 cars would be built over the next four years, campaigned by the ProDrive team as well as privateer customers. 2003 would be the best year for the cars as ProDrive won the GTS class at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, giving Ferrari its first GT victory since the 1981 race. They also took second in the GTS class championship in the American Le Mans series with four wins, while BMS Scuderia Italia gained the FIA GT championship winning eight races. The ProDrive built Ferrari 550 Maranello will likely go down in history as the final 12-cylinder Ferrari to win at Le Mans, and it remains one of the most successful Grand Touring sports cars of the modern era. Down on the start-finish straight at the moment, and very helpfully, we have two races. Where are you going, Marino? Don't you go anywhere. Um, Darren, this, I mean, for so many of us, it was such a great era of GT racing, but for you especially, with two Le Mans class wins. Yeah, I mean, the, the, obviously the Aston Martin DBR9 was uh, an amazing experience to be part of that programme right from the beginning, but it all started with the, the 550 over there. So both of these cars on the front row, I've had a chance to race at Le Mans, um, and this was the, the car that we uh, won in 2007 in, so uh, very special to me. If I won the lottery, this would be the one that I'd go for. Well, interestingly, on my entry list, it has entrant Darren Turner. But I guess that's not right. No, that's definitely not right. I wish when uh, Karun sent me the, the picture of the, uh, the entry list and I was like, oh, only if it was true. <laughs> if only that was true. But it's really great that the owner trusts me to come down here and, uh, and drive it at Goodwood. So it's like magic car for me. I love being here at Goodwood anyway. So, uh, yeah, the chance to drive this car around this circuit is going to be really special. 
Brilliant. And Marina, you're in the Corvette, which you were just saying you've, you've never driven before. Brand new set of tyres. Um, how was the, the warm-up lap, I guess it's called? Pretty terrifying. Freezing cold carbon brakes and uh, brand new slicks is uh, quite, a, quite a recipe around here. But it's interesting, I raced against the later car in uh, ALMS. In, I was in a, a private privateer Viper, which was terrifying in itself. And it's just interesting to see how well put together this car is. Even just getting it, everything works. It's just easy. Um, it, it, moments like this, though, make me understand how it's easy to be jealous of Darren Turner when you look at these two cars. This is, this is incredible. I can't wait to get out there as it starts to get dark with the big lights on and hopefully make lots of noise and kick out some flames. Darren, you were saying just before that you went out and the power steering wasn't working or something, but you remembered how everything works. Uh, yeah, so as I left, I was like, I don't think it was, no, I think I've got weaker, but I don't think it was this stiff to, to turn the steering wheel. And then I was like, oh, maybe there was always a little thing, a little trick. So about halfway round, I sort of played with the little aircraft fuse that did the power steering and yeah, it That's reset. Yeah, and it reset. And then as I was down, down the back street, I had a little grin on my face because I was like, oh, yes, I used to be uh, position three on the power steering. It started to flood back and, you know, we spent so many hours at the wheel there. Um, but it's been so long, you know, since you were racing it competitive in period. So it's just a few more laps and a few more things that start sinking back in the, in the memory. And, uh, yeah, it's just a joyful cockpit to be in. Well, it's great to see them. I'll let you guys get on. We are going to just launch ourselves down here and see who we find. Thanks, guys. Right, follow me, Lee. This is going to be a voyage of discovery for myself and for all of you. So let's see. We go. Oh, Johnny Molem. Here we go. As, as if on cue, we have another racing driver. Sorry, I'll just squeeze in there. Johnny, lovely to see you. Um, so, uh, I mean, this, is, this is your kind of stuff, isn't it? Oh, absolutely loving it. I was just saying to, to Mark Sumter here that I haven't sat in this car since I got out of it at Le Mans in 2006. So uh, it, it was uh, a little bit alien initially, but then driving it around, I've forgotten how much torque it has. It's like 700, 700 horsepower, like 2,000 revs or something. So I was like wheel spinning in every gear all the way around, doing about 30 mile an hour. So it was an amazing car. It's such a pleasure to be back. And I managed to actually dig my old overalls out and I still fit in them. In fact, they're actually huge on me. I was actually going to say they look quite baggy. Well, that's, that, see, that shows the difference in style nowadays. They're like spray painted on, aren't they, Ed? Whereas back in those days, we used to wear like the Jacques Villeneuve, like really bulky and large and everything. So that's the difference in style. Plus it's got the NASCAR, NASCAR bottoms, just like the Corvette boys. Very snazzy, very snazzy. I mean, you know, we're celebrating GT1. It was, looking back, it's easy to not realise at the time, but looking back now, it was such a great era, wasn't it? Oh, fantastic, because you had the Maseratis, the Astons, the Ferraris, the Corvettes, you had the Vipers, you had so many really cool cars, and there's so much horsepower. Like, they were all 650 to 750, touching 800 horsepower, especially in the early days before they started restricting them. Amazing cars, all the manufacturers involved, top drivers. I mean, it, it, was, it was a hell of a show. And I, it's like everything, you don't appreciate it when you're in it but then now looking back I mean these are amongst the toughest cars I've ever had to drive because they had a reasonable amount of aero but not like a prototype they had a reasonable amount of mechanical grip but not like a GT car and so you were kind of in that halfway house so when you did a quick lap in one of these you really knew you'd done a quick lap it was really really cool well look, enjoy it this evening thanks Ed great to see you Right, let's carry on, Lee. Follow me. Um, everyone enjoying themselves here? Are you enjoying the cars? We are loving these cars. These are fantastic. I think we got some American cars finally, so can't get better than this. <laughs> what do you mean we came from? Yeah. So the, the Duke of Richmond has very kindly said that you can take one home, which are you taking? I'm, I'm taking that one right there, the saline. That's going home with me. Absolutely. I, I, is it mine then? Is it a, a, well, yeah, good luck with the shipping. Ah. We'll take care of that ourselves. We'll just take that car then. Right, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's let's carry on. See who else we can find. It is um, somewhat busier than a Formula One grid, uh, but the key is it doesn't matter if you accidentally knock into someone, but don't knock into something. Um, right, another DBR9. The DBR9. I think there's six here. Um, there's Gregor Fiskin in one, uh, who and he raced that car in 2007. Um, but let's try and squeeze on through. Um, and it was just, for so many of us, it was so amazing seeing Aston Martin winning the class at Le Mans because it you know, it's got such a big history at Le Mans as a manufacturer. Um, and to come back 2007, 2008 with Darren, who we were obviously talking to earlier. Um, let's carry on through. The, the drivers are quite thin on the ground down here, but let's, let's plow on. Um, obviously, the very famous Gulf liveried cars, uh, which have very specific Pantone colours. Um, woe betide anyone that gets it wrong. I think it's actually illegal to have golf livery car colours on your road car. Um, but that was maybe perhaps just a rumour. Hi, guys. How are we doing? You having a good time? Always. Always having a good time, mate. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Uh, here we go. 
Sorry, I'm so sorry. We've got a, we've got a massive accident with the pram. Um, squeeze on through. Here we go. I'm so sorry. We need to talk to a Ferrari driver. I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in. What a wonderful thing to be driving around the Goodwood circuit on a, on a Saturday evening. It's brilliant. It's great to be driving this into the sunset. We haven't had this car out for 20 years, so we just, we just restored it, and it's brilliant to bring it here. And am I right in thinking that there was no Ferrari manufacturer backing, so they bought road cars and then converted them into race cars? This was a road car bought in Chiswick, left-hand drive road car bought in Chiswick and taken up to a pro drive and turned into what it is today. And they were so successful as well. They were, I think, the most successful V12 Ferraris in terms of number of race wins. So it sounds proper as well. And it sounds proper. Hence, I need my earplugs. <laughs> well, I'm very jealous. Um, let's, let's see if we can squeeze on through. Sorry, guys. It's so a wall of uh, smiling faces. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, just want to. I want to try and get a little bit further back because um, there's. I mean, the cars just keep going. It's such an amazing selection. Here we go. Here's Gregor Fiskin. He made the the error of catching my eye. Gregor, we talked to you so many times in the assembly area, but certainly never next to your 2007 car. Do you get to drive this much? Do you know, this is the first time I've driven it since 2007. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's like it all kind of comes flooding back. And the noise inside, it was, without doubt, was and still is acoustically the greatest car I've ever been in. This front engine V12 Aston Martin engine, you know, when you blip it, it's just, it's amazing. It's, it is a phenomenal car. And I, I don't think at the time we realized GT1 was what it was, the last great, you know, it was really when the, when the greatest petrol engine dinosaurs went to battle. And, you know, I was just remembering in 2007, there were six of us in Aston in DBR9s. And it was to Pro Drive's great credit that all six cars finished the race. And it was an amazing, amazing season. We, we finished taking this car to Interlagos and we, we won the 1,000 miles of Interlagos, which I think was the last great 1,000 mile, 1,000K race that the DBR9 did. Then it went on and did this car did the GT1 World Championship. And uh, I don't think it's like it'll ever be seen again. And it was a privilege to be in it then. And it's amazing to be at Goodwood and in it again tonight. You alluded to just how much racing these did, you know, all over the world. But for you to go on to the Mulsanne Strait for the first time behind the wheel of an Aston. That must have been one of those, one of life's moments. I think I had imposter syndrome. <laughs> I was sure someone would say, Gregor, get out of it. We need someone better than you. But no, it was uh, lucky me that I was in it at the time. And, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, following vintage Bentleys and Birkin and Bonato and LM10 and LM9 and all the great pre-war Astons and Moss and Collins. And of course, I had the privilege of racing the Le Mans winning DBR1. So to be in the DBR1 in historic racing and then to run the DBR9, it's great that Aston continues. It's a British brand. We, now they've launched the Valkyrie. It's a shame the Valkyrie's not at Le Mans yet, but maybe someone needs to take it there. But, you know, we're, you know, we're, we, you know, we're in a golden era again now. But the era of GT1, I'm not sure we'll ever quite see that era again. I agree. Well, look, Greg, I'll let you, I can see people are clearing the grid, so I'll let you get on, but enjoy it. Okay, thank you very much. Right, let's just see if we can just get a couple more words, because we've spoken to Aston drivers, we've spoken to Ferrari drivers, Corvette drivers, uh, and then back here, uh, we have no drivers. Of course we don't. Uh, let's just have a wee look. Is there a driver? Oh, yes. Excellent. Um, which, which car are you in? Ah, oh, excellent. The Marcos. This Marcos... I mean, it's the ultimate Marcos, isn't it? Is, is it as scary to drive as it looks? Well, you, you need balls to <laughs> drive it, so uh, I'm not scared about it. And how, obviously, it was a sort of quiet outlap, but um, does it feel good? Yeah, it feels good. The, the car finished a week ago, and uh, we did a shakedown at Sandford with it, and it performed immediately well. So uh, uh, I'd be happy to hear to show to the crowd that uh, they missed that car so long. I mean, it's got a lot of grunt, hasn't it? Yeah, it is, uh, it's a 7-litre Chevy engine, uh, at about 650 horsepower, so uh, it, it will move. Well, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Right, well, I think that's everyone getting cleared from the grid. I'm at the back of the grid, where I belong. Uh, so I think that's everything from down here.
Thank you very much, Ed. So uh, we're all back together. So Ben Edwards here with you now. Harry Benjamin's with us and Bruce Jones. We've all got a, uh, an interest in these beautiful GT1 cars. It's lovely. We're going to see these cars in a little while actually going round the lap here on a perfect evening at Goodwood, uh, just to remind us of uh, many of the 24-hour races that they would have done. And Bruce, I just want to come to you first because I know this was very much a period for you uh, for uh, both as a journalist and commentator on GT racing, and it meant a lot to you to, to see these cars all back together again. It does, and the right faces in the right places. There's Ron Dennis, I mentioned nothing to do with these cars, of course, but he, they would have drawn his eyes, and David Richards in front, very much to do with these yeah. cars. Pro drive with the Ferraris and the Aston Martins, but it's just fabulous to see how they still draw the crowds. A special spectator grid walk, which is now being cleared, but for anyone to get there, but to me, it's that moment when you go into dark, into, into the evening light that is very special. You think about where these cars competed, the long races. But what I love is that comment, the comments from the drivers, the visceral element of these cars. They didn't have as much handling as you might think from the outside, but they certainly had enough grunt. And that's a fabulous mixture in my book. It was all about a, a bit of a change of rules at the time, wasn't it? And Harry, it, it was 2000 they brought this rule in. And they were they made sure they were kind of road-based cars. So, so we can actually pick up that these are cars, beautiful race cars, but they're road-based cars. Well, that's the thing. They're almost relatable, although they're huge beasts that you wouldn't see on the road and you might get a bit scared of if you came across one of them on the M25. Uh, they are relatable, and if they can go racing and good racing, then that's what makes them so well-loved. You know, I wish, I wish I'd been born a little bit earlier so I could have seen these cars in race action as they were happening. Because, you know, lots of the drivers that Ed was speaking to, you don't hear anymore uh, that this era is going to be recreated. You know, what? where do you see Chevrolet, Aston Martin, Dodge, Maserati, yeah. Ford, Nissan, you know, Celine, Lister, Lamborghini? The only thing I could possibly maybe make a small comparison to is what we're about to enter into Hypercar in the World Endurance Championship, where you have got some of those names returning. But I think it's that road-based look-alike that GT1's had, which means actually it, it's, it's non-repeatable and irreplaceable. We're just looking at one of the Vipers there, actually, Bruce. And in fact, they were of this sort of group. They were the early part of it all, weren't they? Because they, it was actually the late 90s that they, they were already winning. Uh, so very successful, 99, 2000, 2001. Very, very strong car. Uh, they really were, and they, went, they did go like trains. In fact, they were built like trains in many <laughs> ways. That massive V10 engine up the front, taken out of a truck initially, and it was all about power. And then eventually, for the driver's point of view, they managed to get a bit of handling to go with it. But again, I think... Harry's absolutely hit, hit the nail on the head. It's the fact these cars are relatable. And I think they stand the t test of time better than cars that aren't as relatable because we can still look at those and know precisely what they represented and to whom. Yeah, well, there is uh, one of the Vipers. That's the number two car. And as I say, they, they had a really strong time in the late 1990s. They, they won the Le Mans class in 1998, 1999 and in 2000. Uh, successful all around the world, of course, as well. Uh, Sebring, the Spa, 24 hours, 24 hours of Daytona. They, they, they were winning all sorts at that time. They really were. Whenever I look at those cars, I expect Justin Bell to jump into shot. But, yes. Uh, not here this weekend, I'm afraid, by the looks of things. We've got a couple of big names in the uh, driver lineup, though, for these GT1s. We heard from Darren Turner earlier, of course, is in the Aston Martin DBR9. Uh, we've also got Le Mans winner Benoit Trellier out there as well in the Viper. Uh, and Emanuele Piro, uh, to name a few, in uh, one of the Maranello Ferraris, which I think Ed was checked to one of the drivers in the other one, which has been completely rebuilt by uh, ProDrive and, and 14 class wins in the end makes it one of the most successful Ferraris uh, to compete in GT racing. So some big names in the driver front combined with some big brand names. It's going to be a fantastic demonstration. You can see the lights coming on the cars now as it starts to get a little bit darker here at Goodwood, which I think just amplifies how good these GT1 cars look. And in one of the other cars that uh, we'll be seeing a bit more of as they go out are the Corvettes as well. You can just see uh, one of the yellow Corvettes and a couple of them just behind uh, the safety car, one of them just behind the safety car as they go off on the demo lap now. And that was another absolutely crucial aspect of the GT category. So here we go. The demonstration on track begins as the sun is uh, disappearing here at Goodwood. This is for some classic pictures. And I'm actually loving seeing these cars all going together. They didn't all race together during that period because we're basically talking about a 10-year period and different cars were competitive at different times in that. Yeah, that needs to be remembered, but right now I don't really care so much. It's just a fabulous, fabulous sound. And again, the image as the, as the field streams away. A V12 racing engine, it still works for me. I was looking at one of the Ferraris earlier, 
actually, Harry. I, I was when you look when the bonnets open, they had they had some bonnets open. The engine sits so low and so far back in the car, it's almost like a mid-engine car. I mean, it's, and and also some of the others like the Lister, the driver has the engine right alongside him from the front. It's incredible. But well, what I love about GT1 already is just even though built to the same regulations, racing across different periods and years though is that is the difference that all of these cars bring in the brands and the uh, innovations that were being brought in at the time by each brand you know even uh, we sadly we don't have a maserati out there but you know that uh, being one of the main stays in gt1 racing you know based on a ferrari enzo wasn't it the, the main winning one eight teams constructors titles uh, between the fia gt and gt1 championship so that was a mean feat but of course it was based off of well they're now owned by the same people of course up in stellantis but ferrari enzo back then so there's there's hints and glimmers of each other's car that cross over, but also you've got unique innovation design, which again just makes GT1 one of the best championships that, that ever was, probably. Yeah, fascinating. And those uh, those Corvettes saw a great deal of success for a British driver, Oliver Gavin, of course, Bruce. He uh, he had a wonderful time. Oh, didn't he? Just he's still involved with Corvette, uh, pushing the European program for them, and uh, yeah, he. he... Chevrolet really with Corvette Racing so loyal to their drivers and when he signed for them he'd have been delighted but if they said you're going to be there for a, at least a decade he'd have absolutely bitten their hand off but what an ambassador and uh, again great to see the cars and from my point of view the fact they're in in the full yellow hues is a good thing too because you like the cars to be as you remember them. Oh, it's great to see. We've got, we've got models of both the C5R and the C6, uh, but they sort of followed each other along and um, hugely successful. A combination between General Motors and Pratt and Miller. They were the, the Pratt and Miller team were the ones who basically constructed it as a, a race car. They were the sort of uh, American version of ProDrive, doing the building a race version, weren't they? Yeah, they were. And what I loved when you used to stand in the pit lane at the mall in the middle of the night and look into their garage. They couldn't be from any other country than the States, the way they dressed, the way they acted, and, and the sense of fun. And always, uh, just when you thought it was getting quiet, they'd fire off the klaxon from their garage to make you jump in the pit lane at the mall. So uh, what you need is the national pride. And then, of course, yes, was this Marcos made in Westbury? I don't think it was, but uh, certainly, as we heard from Corroys, are still such an arch enthusiast. Driving that car, rebuilt just now, seven litres of Chevy power under the bonnet. And these raced on for years in the Dutch Supercar Challenge as well. So it's great that Core is remaining loyal to the brand. You know, another thing about GT, these GT World cars is, is deliveries. And I've, I've barked on about this all day because I just don't think you really get this in modern day racing anymore. There's such distinct, bright and bold liveries. You know, occasionally you get maybe, you know, in Formula One, an Alpine comes in with a pink or something like that. But when you look at these cars out there, you just don't see anything like that. You know, we saw some PlayStation livery cars earlier on. We've got some absolutely fantastic liveries and it all just heightens the sense of this is almost a cinematic review of, of motorsport history gone by. You know, that Corvette coming through, that Dodge Viper, I, I had those cars as, as little toy cars as kids, you know, and I, I think people would still have those toy cars. I wouldn't. I don't think they'd go for the modern day version. Yeah, I, I get a Lister Storm and use it as a door wedge. It Indeed. couldn't be more wedge shaped. It's about as wide as it's long. Yeah. Sorry, Peter Snowden. I know you love racing one, but uh, Bobby Burden Road. In fact, his car is for sale. So. Uh, oh, is it? I didn't know. He's had it for quite a while. He has. Yes. And um, there it is with the Newcastle United race livery on it. And again, that was a strange element yes. crossover before we had Super League with their single seater. Football club tie-up, but uh, for Newcastle United, Sir John Hall, who was pushing the brand up there, he had the, he started the new Fo Castle Falcons rugby team from Gosworth Rugby Club, a big, big push. But for me, a metallic moss green Aston Martin. We're looking at 006. That's Gregor Fiskin's car. He shared with Roland Burville and uh, Patrick Bornhauser, and he still, as we heard when he was speaking to Ed Foster, deeply, deeply loves it. But again, a lot of these cars, you had that that moss green metallic. And then little trims that just told you which team was running it, which I really like. Yeah, so this was the very first Works Aston Martin DBR9 that was built. And uh, Works Entry in 2005, the Sebring 12 Hours. It was a tourist trophy winner as well. So it's got great history to this car. I think Darren um, Turner as well, who was, we were talking to earlier, Ed was talking to on the grid earlier. Very interesting because he went from Ferrari to Aston Martin. And he has explained how when he went into the Aston, it was so perfect straight away. The, the Ferrari was an adapted road car um, and it had a little bit more unpredictability to it, but when he got in the Aston, he loved it. Yeah, you know, the DBR9 was a very, very special car. I think it was more special than its results 
which seems strange to say, really proved the drivers who drove it adored it. And, and for them, him to get back in, I love the glint in Darren's eye when he said, I just suddenly remembered that was the setting I had the steering on. <laughs> you know, that muscle memory element of coming back, but also just the knobs being in the right positions. I mean, lots of drivers, I'm not including you in this, Ben, necessarily. Oh, no. Of course, not that level. are quite ADHD, <laughs> aren't they, in terms of things have to be just right for them. But then, of course, the precision is what makes them get that extra fraction here and there. They, they actually had a win on the debut with the DDR9 at Sebring, uh, but it took a couple of years to get the Le Mans wins, but it did work out for them. Yeah, well, that, that 006 that we were following, that scored the DBR9's first and last international wins, and, and Darren Turner's one, which uh, he's in another, uh, the 2007 one as well. Well, that has, uh, that's the only race the DBR9 chassis at 10 entered in the 2007, was 24-hour Le Mans, which it won, won in yeah. class. <laughs> so not too shabby. Well, and another thing that isn't shabby at all is the fact that these cars are, as with Goodwood demos, starting to pick up the pace. They're running at a, a respectable speed, making the right sort of noises, looking as dynamic pretty much as, as they could be. And this circuit, for some of these drivers, a lot of these drivers have driven here a lot, but some haven't very much. So going down in the setting, the falling light in a car like this, they'll have to focus. And I think from what you, what you were saying just then, actually, we can hear it a little bit in our comp box, but the, the sound of these engines, the Astons in particular, but they all have a very unique sound to them, don't they? I've had to turn you up in my ears, Ben, because <laughs> I couldn't, I'm sat right next to you and I couldn't hear you. So uh, it is, uh, the, the, the sound is unbelievable and even the smoke is starting to come up and steam our commentary windows a little bit as uh, dusk starts to set uh, here uh, in Goodwood for the 80th members meeting. And what a way to finish day one with the GT1 demo. Well, what we're going to do in that case, because we're enjoying the sound so much, we're going to shut up for a few Good idea. Shut the commentators up. Let's listen to some proper engines. Lovely sounds. There is Bobby Bertrand in the Lister Storm, and this really has great heritage as well. They only made a few uh, of these, and the road car, literally, I think they only made four road cars or something, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, these things sort of get a little bit lost, but Lawrence Pierce was a driving force of Lister, and, um, you know, teams like Creation Automotive came in as, oh, and, uh, as well, and they grabbed these cars, but they just... They drew so much attention because they are they are the Batmobile of the field. They're the meanest looking bit of kit out there and uh, prodigious to drive. But again, to me, it was the smaller marks like this. They're being able to take it to yeah. the Aston Martins, the Ferraris or whatever they were up racing against. Jamie Campbell, Walter and uh, Julian Bailey were stars in Listers. I think that's what you've lost over the years. It's, it's more of the, you always have the little guns taking it to the big guns, but then eventually it is always the, the big brand manufacturers that tend to win out all the regulations change and suddenly they get on it. And I like to think that's maybe, you know, coming back to, to my hypercar analogy, you know, you have the likes of the, the Glickenhouses and the uh, the Van Walls who are trying to come in and, and take it to the Ferraris and to the Porsches uh, and the Cadillacs and then the Toyotas and whatnot. So that's the only similarity I can really make, but you know what? If you're watching this on TV, I mean, it, it's already a brilliant experience, but this is my first time being trackside for GT1s, and it is something else. So if you ever get the chance, you've got to make it happen. Yeah, it is lovely to see. And they, uh, they're all behaving themselves, all having a lovely time. They, they, they really are. And in fact, you know, it's getting darker and darker yeah. out there. And as the headlights start to 
it's a bit more like Le Mans, that moment you're trying to pick out which make is coming towards you. And of course, when we allowed you to listen to the engines, I'm sure you identified them all. Of course, the first one was a Corvette. That was that deep Basso Profundo rumble. But uh, again, just subtle different, little differences from the others. V8 versus V12 versus the V10 of the Chryslers. They never knowingly sounded anything less than a rumble, did they? No, they were always a remarkable sound with that 8 meter engine. And the Celine is out there as well, which is uh, a slightly more unusual of the cars. But again, it was uh, very successful. Uh, in this particular kind of category of racing. Uh, that has a 7-litre V8, with again, around 600 horsepower. Very loud. This is one of the, the loudest of them all. And uh, won the four different GT titles in 2001. It's a USA manufacturer of sports cars, the Celine uh, team. The Steve Celine was the man behind it all. And uh, it was in the early 2000s where they had a good time. And here in the uh, British GT, actually, very successful. Graham Nash Motorsports uh, winning the title in 2002 with Ian McKellar and Thomas Erdos. So we've seen a lot over the years with it. Oh, that's sort of broken my heart. That was 21 years ago. It doesn't, it, to me, it seems a decade ago, but the cars still look brilliant now. And I think all three of us would agree if it could be a historic racing series for GT1s, that would draw huge attention. Sign me up straight away. <laughs> what, I love, what I love about this as well, you know, it, it does kind of tell the history a bit of GT1. I know we've got a mixture of cars from across the years, but you know, that first decade saw the like, what, Chevrolet and, and Aston Martin really fighting out. And that's continued through as GT categories have developed to GT2 and even modern day GTE racing. So the DNA of GT1 still very much travels through the years into what we see today which is really nice, unfortunately, we don't quite get the same loudness and the same um, boldness that are, I, I, in my opinion, uh, in the current GTE regulations uh, that we do in here in GT1. So a historic GT1 race, yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, and you know what? It, to me, it's the fact that uh, you get the changes in, in format of these championships. If they're two seconds a lap slower, it doesn't matter as long as all the manufacturers are having a real tilt at it, which is why I think GT3 racing is so good now, because they've really balanced the performance. And, you know, for the crowd, a lot of people come to racing, haven't, they're not really experts, they just come along because they heard there's some fantastic cars, and if the racing is good, that's a big tick in the box. And they can recognise the cars that are on the tracks as well, so they have that relatability once again. So, someone's missing a trick here, I think. Bring it back. Yeah, but one thing I was talking earlier about how if you have a Pro-Am championship, which is effectively what GT racing is, you have to have a car that the Am could cope with without being scared. These don't necessarily fall into that box. Yeah, no, that's a good point. They, they are some, somewhat different. You could hear that from Johnny Molan when he was talking about it earlier, that to drive these to their limit, uh, always a challenge. They don't have a lot of downforce. They have some, but not a lot of downforce. They have a lot of power. Uh, grip level is good, but it, it, it's not everything. And you don't have all the little tweaks that you get nowadays with uh, on the GT car. So, yeah, it was lovely seeing Johnny talk about how much he had enjoyed driving at this level. Um, the Celine actually, although it was very successful in the early 2000s, funny enough, it took its only Le Mans class win in 2010, um, much later on. So it sort of lasted in and out of the box quite well, that one. Certainly did. The drivers are really starting to find their feet now. They'll not have quite a tear in their eye, but look, to suddenly be driving the car you drove 20 odd years ago with the rival cars around a track like this as the sun goes down, they're going to be quite emotional out there, I warrant. And rightly so. Cor Corroyser in the Marcos. It's lovely to see, actually, that he's still got Callum Lockie's name on it because this was the, the car that uh, Callum Lockie won the British GT class in 2000. And uh, uh, I spoke to Paul briefly earlier, I didn't know, but he was telling me that this car in 2000 was racing both in the British GT Championship and the Spanish GT Championship, being shipped from one to the other to the other. And they won both championships. So I'm not sure who the drivers were in Spain, but Callum was driving it here. He, he won the British, but the same car, which they've only just rebuilt. He was telling me now that this is really, it's only just been all put back together again as it is. I now know what's going to flash into my brain at two in the morning. I'll sit up straight, not wanting to wake up, but that'll be the names of the Spanish drivers. <laughs> you set the hair running. Well, I'm sure I have. Yeah. I think he also raced in America as well, doing Daytona. So it's, it's been all over uh, the world, uh, that Matt Cross and uh, uh, Core at the wheel. Uh, certainly seems like a, a character as well from Ed chatting to him at the start. Uh, but as he said, recently rebuilt that car. So uh, first outing in, in quite some time looking 
like it belongs on the track. And it was actually redesigned, that, uh, that version, by Wheat Heidekopfer, who very sadly we lost last year. He was, a, he was a great designer. He got involved with Porsche as well. Um, but he was involved in that. That was, that was the sort of Evo version, wasn't it, of the, of the mark? Yes, it's not quite how Jen Marsh had designed the model, but of course the Marcos models went on for years and years and years. Started with the wooden frame and uh, just very, very popular cars. But in racing, Coroyza, really, his name is written large above the door because he's such an arch proponent. He would race every weekend of the year if he possibly could. I've seen him all around the world turning up with lotuses and things, but still cut him in half. And for all his racing, it still says Marcos. Yeah, lovely to see another of the... Uh... Chrysler Vipers here, Dodge Viper or Chrysler Viper, depending on whether it's racing in uh, USA or racing in Europe, it would either have the Chrysler name or the Dodge name. And as we mentioned, this was the slightly earlier part. Checker flag is coming out, though. So uh, we will see these cars out again tomorrow, but this is the big demo because it's going into night time. Well, it's absolutely great, and for the drivers, even in the, in the sort of 15 minutes or so of their run, the light has changed. It looks uh, much brighter when you see it on TV. The cameras add light in the most extraordinary way because the sun has gone down, and the drivers have just made sure a lot of people stay trackside. They might be going to the fun fair later, going to eat or whatever, but it drew them to the banks. Even the pheasants love them. <laughs> Getting a good view there. Goodwood's got something for everybody, hasn't it? Uh, that's certainly what I've learned here. My first members meeting, and it, you know what? The on-track action is, is a given. It's, it's brilliant, but it is everything around it that encompasses what the, what the event is. It's absolutely perfect. The historical significance, but also the fun, the accessibility, and the reaching out cross-generationally as well, because I think it's very easy to kind of sort of store GT1s as, you know, this was our era of racing, but actually anybody can appreciate this, no matter who you are. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think, and there may be some youngsters out there this evening listening to these wonderful noises, thinking, what's that? Well, I hope you've all enjoyed it. For those of you who uh, have been here at the track with us today, it's been a lovely opportunity to watch and listen to these remarkable machines. And if you're watching online with us as well, I do hope you've been able to turn it up a little bit and enjoy the sound and the sight of these cars. As they now are slowing down behind the uh, pace car, the safety car, which will be leading them back into the pits, the little paddock area where they'll be all gathered. And it does give everybody who's here this weekend a chance to walk along and have a really close look at these machines. They are beautiful. And uh, as I say, we're looking at that Ferrari earlier with, with the bonnet off, just seeing how low that V12 engine sits, how far back it sits in the car. Absolutely remarkable. And uh, yeah, lovely to watch. So all heading back in. I think uh, all the cars have survived pretty well, which is good to see. And, um, Let's just uh, hope they've all managed to have no problems out there. Ah, oh, look at this. Oh, Ooh. my goodness. <laughs> that was a close one. It was, but it was well avoided. It was very well avoided by the uh, safety car, so I'm glad that it, <laughs> it got the opportunity to get out of the way. That's good news. Lucky it wasn't the GT1 coming at it. <laughs> yes. Might have been a different outcome. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Might have heard the GT1 coming a little <laughs> earlier, one feels. But anyhow, still happy, still lightly confused in that pheasant sort of way. Good livery too, though. Love bold, <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> traditional, stands the test of time. Indeed. Probably quite fast around this track. That's worked well, yeah. Well, there we go, everybody. I, I do hope you've enjoyed that demo. We've certainly had a lovely time seeing uh, memories of GT1 racing from the uh, 2000s, the early 2000s up to sort of 2010. And there's some great drivers and opportunities for them to have a play in their cars again after, for some of them, as we heard, for Gregor Fiskin, it's been a long time since he's been out in that car. So uh, really good stuff. So we are beginning to wrap up uh, the Saturday of the members meeting. Um, so let's go back to Rachel, David and to Ed for the full wrap up of what we have thoroughly enjoyed today.